Hey, how's it going, everyone? I just wanted to welcome you to my Python API development course. So in this course, I'm gonna walk you through building out your very own API in Python. However, keep in mind, this course is so much more than just building out a simple API. In fact, as I'm sure you saw the video length, this course does come out to a whopping 19 hours in length. And so you're probably wondering, well, what exactly are we gonna be covering for 19 hours? We don't need 19 hours to create an API. Well, first of all, we're gonna build out a fully featured API that includes authentication, CRUD operations, schema validation, and we're gonna set up documentation for our API because that's very important. However, the learning doesn't stop just there. This is, course is going to extend well past just basic API development. We'll also learn all of the tooling that surrounds building a complete and robust API. I've dedicated a large section of this course to learning SQL. And I've noticed that a lot of the other API and web development courses, they just quickly gloss over SQL without diving into the nitty gritty of how SQL databases work. And for this course, we're going to cover SQL extensively and we're going to start from the absolute basics. So you don't need to know a single thing about databases or SQL in general. But by the time you complete this course, you will be very proficient at generating database schemas. You'll know core SQL concepts like primary keys, foreign keys, table constraints, and you can pretty much be able to generate SQL queries to grab the exact data that you're looking for. And on top of that, I'll show you how to integrate your SQL databases in your API using two different methods. So we'll cover both uh, using raw SQL queries as well as ORMs, so that no matter which method you ultimately prefer, you'll have all the skills and resources to start building out your own projects. We'll also familiarize ourselves with database migration tools like Alembic, which allow us to make incremental changes to our database schema to track changes in Git, just like we can with our regular Python code. We'll also learn how to use tools like Postman to construct HTTP packets so that we could test our API during the whole development process. And when it comes to testing, I've added about you know two to three hours of content going over how to set up automated integration tests so that when you make changes to your code, you can run these automated tests to verify that your code changes haven't broke any pre-existing functionality. And then after testing, we're gonna move on to the deployment phase. We're gonna actually deploy our application. And I didn't just include one method of deployment. I've actually included two different deployment scenarios. The first scenario is probably um, the most common scenario, which is deploying our app onto like an Ubuntu machine that can be hosted on any cloud provider like AWS, GCP, Azure, or even DigitalOcean. And you know we'll cover things like how to set up Nginx to act as a reverse proxy. We'll, co uh, we'll configure our own system D service. We'll set up a firewall to block all non-HTTP traffic. And we'll even set up SSL so that our application can handle HTTPS traffic. Um, but after that, we'll also take a look at how we can deploy our application onto Heroku, uh, just because if you don't have, um, you know, maybe you can't afford to pay for uh, cloud services um, or you just don't have the ability to sign up for an account or something like that, I do want to make sure that uh, you still have a way of uh, deploying your application so that you can show off to your friends and family what you created. So I added the Heroku section because they've got a very, very nice and convenient free tier where we can deploy our entire application for free. We don't need to sign up with the credit card. So that's why I included that second deployment scenario. And since all the cool kids are hardcore into Docker today, I'm going to show you how to Dockerize your API in case that is your preferred method of deployment. And then finally, we're going to wrap things up by building out our very own CI CD pipeline uh, using GitHub Actions. This will allow us to push out changes to GitHub, resulting in our pipeline running, which will pull our code, run all of our integration tests, build all of the necessary images. And if all the tests ultimately pass, it'll actually push out our changes to our production environment so that we can do all of this in an automated fashion without having to manually go in and run each step manually. So let's take a look at our tech stack. Since this is a Python API course, we will be using Python to build out our API. There were a couple of different web frameworks in Python that we could have used, most notably Django and Flask. I decided to use neither one of them, and I decided to use a newer framework called FastAPI. And the reason why I chose to use this framework was because it has APIs uh, kind of built in mind, right? It, it wasn't there to address like the model view controller type scenario. It really is all about building out APIs. And on top of that, it is really fast, right? But when I say fast, it's not just fast from a performance perspective, which it is, but it's also fast from the fact that it can, it makes it really easy uh, and quick to spin up new APIs. And one of my favorite features of this framework is the auto documentation functionality. When you build an API, you have to document how your API works. And this is a very cumbersome task um, because anytime you make any changes to your API, you have to remember to update your API or then the front end can be making the wrong request. Fast API automatically documents your API for you so that you don't have to do it yourself. It's truly a game changer. And finally, the most important reason why I chose Fast API is because of this. You see this magnificent beast? 
This is the creator of the Fast API framework. And my mom always told me, when someone with a mustache as glorious as that creates a web framework, you use that damn framework. Now, as I mentioned, we will be covering SQL extensively, and I've decided to go with Postgres. Uh, it doesn't really matter what type of SQL database you use. They're all fundamentally the same with only minor differences. I chose Postgres because that's my favorite, and who doesn't like elephants anyways? For our ORM, when we do eventually migrate to ORMs from using uh, raw SQL queries, we will be using SQL Alchemy. Um, I decided to use that because that seems like that's the most standard one for Python. I really could have chose any of them. I didn't really care which one I used, so I just picked the most popular one. So that covers our tech stack. Let's now take a look at the project that we'll be building. Now, I would love to show you some cool flashy website that you can show off to your friends. However, we're not building a website, we're building an API. And unfortunately, APIs don't really have a visual aspect to them. So I don't really have anything to show you. I mean, I could, I guess, construct a couple of HTTP packets and send it and verify that we get the proper JSON response, but that's not really exciting. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you our documentation for our project so that you can see all the different features that we implement. And the nice part about the documentation is these are interactive docs. So from the documentation, I can actually send HTTP requests to my application and get a response back. So you can really see all of the different features, things like the authentication and the crowd operations that we'll be performing and setting up in our API. So the app that we're going to build for this course is going to be a social media type application where users can create posts, uh, they can read other people's posts. They'll be able to perform all of the CRUD operations, so they'll be able to create, read, update, and delete posts. And we'll also be able to uh, vote on posts. So, you know, most social media apps have some sort of like system or voting system. Uh, and so we will be able to like other users' posts as well. So this is the built-in documentation that comes with Fast API. And you'll be able to see all of the API endpoints that we're going to create in this course. So we're going to have all of the post endpoint, which is going to be responsible for retrieving all posts, creating posts, uh, retrieving an individual post, updating a post, as well as deleting a post. Then we'll have the user specific um, endpoints so things like creating a user, getting a user's information. Uh, and then we've got our authentication, which is going to be used for logging in. And then finally, we've got the one for voting. So when you want to vote on a specific um, uh, a specific post that you like, you can go ahead and like that post. So let's just use the documentation to actually, uh, you know, test out our API. So first things first, uh, let's actually try to retrieve any or all of our posts. So if I hit this get button right here, we can actually try to send a request to our API with the built in documentation. So you could just say execute, right? And you'll see that we got a 401, which means that we are right now not logged in. So we are unauthorized to retrieve any of the posts. So uh, the API that we're going to build is going to require all users to be logged in to be to even be able to read the posts. So let's actually go ahead and create a user. And so we'll go down to the user's endpoint uh, under create user. And I'm going to do try it out. And it's going to give us an example of the structure of the data that we have to send to our API to create a user. So we need to provide a username or an email and a password. So I'm going to create an email. I'll call this john at gmail.com. And the password is going to be something simple, just for demonstration purposes. And we'll execute that, right? So it'll actually send that data back to our backend. You can see we get a 201, which means we were successfully able to create it. You can see the ID of the user account that was created. We can see the email is what it is. And then we can see the date that it was created at as well. And so now we can actually log in as this user. So there's a couple of different ways to log in. I can go to the login endpoint, or we can just go up here at the top and just do authorize. And then we can provide that information. So I'll do john at gmail.com. And we'll provide his password. And if we do authorize now, uh, we can see that we have successfully logged in. So I'll close this out. And so now if I try to retrieve the posts and then hit execute, you could see that we were able to retrieve all of the posts in our database. Right now there's only two, um, but you could see that these were created by some other users like uh, Sanjeev in this case, and then Sanjeev123. And if we want to create our own post, we can go ahead and do that. So I'll go to the create post endpoint and we'll do uh, try it out. And it's going to give us an example here. So we have to provide title, content, as well as is this post going to be published or is it going to be a draft? And uh, you'll actually see uh, the structure of this uh, schema uh, right down here. I think it's at the bottom, actually. Uh, so if you go to post create here, this is going to show us the, uh, the schema that we have to pass. So we have to provide a title, a content. So this, the asterisk means it's um, required. The published is um, not required. And you can see that it defaults to true. So if we don't provide a value, it'll default to true. So let's test that out. And so I'll just say, um, 
favorite foods is going to be the title and the content is going to be pizza and burgers. And I will remove the published section because it is optional and it'll default to true anyways. And we'll hit execute. And if we take a look at the response, we get a 201, which means it successfully created it. And you can see what the post looks like in our database. You've got the title, content. We can see the published got defaulted to true. We can see the ID of the post when it was created. We can see the owner ID, which is you know who created the post. And so that's the ID of our account, which is 17. And we can see the information about the owner. So this is john at gmail.com. And then, you know, as usual, we could perform all, perform all the other CRUD operations so we can retrieve an individual post, update it, and delete it. And then once again, um, if we go down here, we can also vote uh, to like a post as well. Uh, and so, you know, this kind of forms the backbone of a traditional social media type application. So once you can really do this, you can really create any application you want. And I think this covers uh, enough things from an API perspective, as well as from a SQL and database perspective, that you will have a solid foundation to really build out any API that you're interested in building out. And so I think that's enough talking. Let's get to actually start coding out our application. In this video, we'll take a look at how to set up Python as well as VS Code on a Mac machine. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to just search for Python. And the first result should take us to the main Python page. And what we want to do is select Downloads. And it's automatically going to give us a button to download whatever the latest version of Python is. And the nice part is it'll automatically detect uh, what platform you're using, so it'll know that we're on a Mac. And right now it says that the latest version is 3.9.6, so it's going to offer me that. Keep in mind, if you're watching this video in the future, it's going to show a different version. And it's okay for you to download a newer version. As long as it's later than 3.7, you should be okay for this course. So I'm going to select this, and it's going to download it like any other application. Once it's finished downloading, I'm going to select that and then select the file that we just downloaded. And then this is going to take us through the Python installation process. So we'll hit continue. We'll hit continue again. Continue. We'll hit agree. And then install. And then it's going to prompt us for a password. All right. And so once you get this pop up, it means that Python was successfully installed. So we can then close that out real quick. And then we can move this to trash. And the next thing that we want to do is uh, go up to your search bar at the top. And I want you to search for the terminal application. All right, and it should find that. Just double click on that so we can open up a terminal. And with our terminal, what we want to do is we want to type in Python 3 dash dash version. And the reason we spe um, specify Python 3 is that you can actually have a Python 2 and a Python 3 version simultaneously. Uh, installed simultaneously on your machine. We want to make sure that we got Python 3 successfully installed. So if we type this in, it should then print out the version that we installed so we can see that we did successfully install Python 3.9.6. So we should be set from a Python perspective. And now that we have Python installed, let's go ahead and install VS Code. So like I said, VS Code is going to act as our text editor or our IDE. And so what we're going to do is just search for VS Code. And this is going to take us to the Microsoft page. And then once again, Microsoft will automatically detect that we're running a Mac. And then we could just go ahead and select Download Mac Universal. All right. And once that's done installing or downloading, we can select that and open it up. And you'll get this warning. Just go ahead and select Open. And so this is going to open up our VS Code. And what we need to do is uh, VS Code is just a very basic text editor. However, it comes with extensions that we can install that make it significantly more feature rich. So it'll almost act like a traditional IDE. And if you select the extensions icon, which is uh, this icon right here with the extra blocks, select that. And I want you to search for Python. And the first result should be the one you want, and it should be the one um, that's made by Microsoft. So this is going to provide things like linting, IntelliSense, debugging, and a few other features that are going to come in handy when it comes to writing Python code within VS Code. So go ahead and install this. All right, so now that it's installed, what we want to do is select this icon to go back to our folder menu, and we want to select Open Folder. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a folder to store all of our project code. So I'm going to select Open Folder. Now, we haven't created a folder uh, to actually store our application, so I'm going to go under uh, my traditional users, Sanjeev, and then I'm just going to store this within my document. So I'm going to make a new folder called, um, I'll call this, uh, we'll just call this Fast API. So I'll create that, and then we're going to open up the Fast API folder that we just created. And so this is going to open up all of our project code. Right now we have no files, and that's to be expected. But what I want to do is I want to right-click here and select New File. 
And what we want to do is type in main.py. And before we hit enter, I want you to look down here. So when I hit enter, you'll see that something's happening. So it's activating the Python extension and it's automatically going to select a Python interpreter. And so, like I said, you can have multiple different versions of Python. So technically we could, you know, for any one of our projects, we could be running 3.9.6, or maybe we're running 2.7 if we want to stick to Python 2. We can actually select which specific Python interpreter we want to run on a per uh, project basis. And if you ever want to change this, or for some reason it wasn't able to find this correctly, just go ahead and select View, Command Palette. And then it automatically uh, found the most recently used ones, but you would just search for Python Select Interpreter, select this, and it shows the currently selected interpreter, but you can also enter in the path to find a specific interpreter. So you would just find wherever Python 2.7 was installed if you wanted to use that, or if it was unable to find 3.9.6, go ahead and just uh, find where Python 3.9.6 was installed on your machine and point to that python.exe file. Well, actually, it's not called .exe uh, within Mac. I forget what it's called on a Mac. I actually use a Windows machine for most of my things, but that's all you have to do. Uh, and so at this point, we've got Python set up, and then we've got our uh, VS Code set up. So once again, uh, anytime VS Code closes, you want to open it back up and then um, open up the folder Fast API in this case. In this video, I'm going to walk you through setting up Python as well as VS Code on a Windows machine. So the first thing that we're going to do is within your web browser, just search for Python. And then we're going to select the first result. So this is going to take us to the main Python page. And we want to go to the download section. And so here, Python, uh, the website's going to offer you up whatever the latest version of Python is. In this case, it happens to be 3.9.6. Keep in mind, if you're watching this video in the future, it's going to show some other version. And that's okay. Go ahead and just download the latest version. As long as it's later than 3.7, you should be okay. So I'm going to just hit download Python 3.9.6. I'm just going to download that. Once it's finished downloading, I'm going to select that, and it's going to open up the installer. Now, with this installer open, it's very important that you select add Python 3.9 to path. Do not forget to do this or then you're going to run into some issues. So make sure that's selected and then hit install now. If you go through the installation process and you realize you forgot to do this, technically there's a way to fix it afterwards. But um, instead of me explaining to do that, the best thing to do is just uninstall Python and reinstall it. So we'll hit install now. You'll get a pop up. Just go ahead and hit yes. All right. And once you see this message where it says setup was successful, that means Python was installed. And the next thing that we want to do is just quickly verify that Python's up and running and working. So what we're going to do is we're just going to search for CMD. So it's going to open up our command prompt or our terminal. And then in here, just type in Python dash three dash dash version. Sorry, it, we should actually type in Python py dash three dash dash version. All right. And so when you type this command in, uh, it's going to tell us the specific version that we installed. So we can see that I was successfully installed Python 3.9.6. If you get any kind of error um, or any message saying that this command is not available, that means that Python wasn't installed successfully. So just go ahead and redo that process just in case. Now, the next thing that we want to do is install VS Code. So let's open up a new tab. Just search for VS Code. And then we'll select this. It's going to take us to this page. And you'll see that uh, VS Code will automatically detect what version you're running. So you can just select Download for Windows. And then once it's finished in uh, downloading, go ahead and open it up. Hit the uh, accept agreement, hit next, 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 and then you can leave everything as default. And then go ahead and run install. All right, and then go ahead and finish. It's going to automatically open up uh, VS Code. Uh, now there's a couple things I want to do. So uh, VS Code at its core is just a basic text editor. However, we can install extensions that give it extra functionality, extra features that'll make it operate a little bit more like a full blown IDE. So go ahead and select this icon right here. This is for extensions. And then what we want to do is we want to search for Python. And we usually just want to select the first one. It'll have a star and it's going to be the one made by Microsoft. You'll see that there's other ones made by uh, other users, but we want the main Microsoft one. Hit install. And so this extension is going to give us IntelliSense, linting, debugging, and a few other features that are going to make it a little bit easier to start working with Python within VS Code. All right. Uh, and so now that it's done installing, we can just close this, close this, and then select this one to get back to your main file browser. And uh, right now we haven't opened up any folder. So what we want to do is we want to create a folder to store all of our application code. So select open folder. 
and then figure out where you want to store your application code. So I'm just gonna store this in my documents. You can store this wherever you want. I'm gonna create a new file or a new folder. I'm just gonna call it fast API, but you can name your project whatever you want. So just select folder. And so that's going to not only create not only create the folder, but it's going to open it up within VS Code. If you get this error, just select trust the author and just select yes. And then we can close out this welcome menu. And so now what we have is uh, we've opened up, whoops, uh, we've opened up VS Code and within VS Code, we've opened up our uh, project code. So right now there's no code that's to be expected. But I, what I want to do is I want to create a new file real quick, just uh, for testing purposes. So I'm just going to right click, hit new file, and I'm going to name it na main dot py uh, and so we want to name it dot py because this is going to be a python file and before i hit enter i want you to focus your eyes right down here and you'll notice something happens down there so when i hit enter you'll see activating extension so it's activating the python extension and what the python extension is going to do is it's automatically going to uh, select the correct python interpreter or it may not be correct depending on what happens on your machine for me it automatically detected python 3.9.6 was installed on this machine so let's select that one for me Keep in mind, if you have multiple versions of Python installed, it may select the wrong interpreter. So what you can do is if you ever want to change the interpreter or specify a specific interpreter, go to view command palette. And what I want you to do is search for Python interpreter and then look for Python select interpreter. So right now it's going to highlight where um, the current Python interpreter is, which one selected and, and what's the executable for it. But if you want to change that, you can select enter interpreter path and then provide the path to the specific version that you want. So you can obviously change it, but usually it's able to detect the latest version. So you should be good to go. Uh, and so that's all I wanted to do from a setup perspective. There's one more thing that we'll cover uh, later, um, but we'll get to that in the next section. Um, but right now we've got Python installed and we've got VS Code set up and we've got our project directory set up. So we should be good to go. So now that we have Python and VS Code set up, the next thing that we have to do is set up our virtual environment. Before we do that, we have to actually talk about what are virtual environments and what problem do they try to address. So let me give you a little bit of an example scenario of the issue that we can run into when working with specific packages within Python on your local machine. So let's say that we created a project and this project is called Project 1. And what we need to do is we need to install FastAPI version 1.2.1. So what do we do? We install version 1.2.1 on our machine so that we can actually use that version. Now let's say later down the road, we start a new project called Project 2. And let's say this version uh, requires us to run Fast API version 2.4.3 because we want to try out some of the newer features. Well, at this point, if we need to try out a newer version, we have to upgrade Fast API to version 2.4.3 on our local machine. And this may or may not be a problem. It really just depends on if version 2.4.3 is backwards compatible with version 1.2.1. Uh, because if version 2.4.3 has breaking changes, then ultimately that's going to create issues with our project one because that project expects us to run version 1.2.1. And so if we can't upgrade, well, we're in a little bit of a pickle because one project needs one version, the other project needs another version. We can't have two different versions installed on our machine. So what exactly do we do? Well, this is where virtual environments come into play. So with virtual environments, let's say we want to create a project. So we create project one. And what we do is we create a virtual environment, call it whatever you want. And so this is a isolated environment that will not affect any other environments. And within this environment, we can install any Python packages running whatever version we want. And it's completely isolated to this project. And so when we create a second project, what we can do is we can create its very own virtual environment as well. We'll call it virtual environment two. And within this virtual environment, we can install any version of any package that we want. So then we can install version 2.4.3. And so both of these virtual environments are completely separated, completely isolated with one another. And so we can essentially install multiple different versions of a single package for each of our projects. And that way our projects don't end up stepping on the toes of other projects. And so now that we have a basic understanding of virtual environments, let's go ahead and figure out how we can actually create our first virtual environment and use it within our project. In this video, I'm going to walk you through setting up a virtual environment on a Windows machine. Now, if you already closed out your VS Code window, go ahead and open up a new one and make sure you open up the specific directory we created a couple lessons ago. Now, what we want to do is we want to select Terminal and we want to select New Terminal. And this is an awesome feature with VS Code. It allows us to have an integrated terminal within our VS Code window. 
And this terminal is fundamentally no different than a regular terminal within Windows. It's just built into VS Code so that we don't have to keep flipping between different windows. And if you actually take a look at this right column, we can have multiple terminals open and we can even use different terminals. So the default one on this machine happens to be PowerShell, but you can also use command prompt if that's what you prefer. So if you select command prompt, it's gonna create a new terminal. And you can see that this is a traditional command prompt. So I'm gonna use this one because that's the one I normally use. However, if you're more comfortable with PowerShell, feel free to use that. Now the command to actually create a virtual environment within Windows is py-3-m dash dash vnv, so that stands for virtual environment. And then you wanna give it a name. So give whatever name you want for your virtual environment. You could name it after your project name, or you could just do what I do, which is just call it vnv. And what I like to do is for all of my projects, I give it the same exact name. And that's perfectly okay because this virtual environment is going to be isolated to this project directory. And so even though this project has a virtual environment named VNV, I can create another virtual environment in any other project with the same exact name. And they're all gonna be isolated to that specific project folder. So go ahead and hit enter and take a look over here. You'll see that a folder was created called v uh, virtual environment or VNV. And that's gonna be, the name of this folder is always gonna to refer to whatever name you gave it. So if I named this cookies, this would open up a new folder called cookies. And if you want, you can take a look at what's in here. And if you go under script specifically, you'll notice that we've got our Python executable. So this is going to act as our new interpreter. Uh, and so what we wanna do is right now, we are using our global interpreter and we wanna change that. We don't wanna use the global one. We wanna use the specific one in our virtual environment. Uh, and that way we can install packages that are exclusive to just this specific virtual environment. And so to do that, go ahead and select view once again. And we want to go to command palette and then search for Python select interpreter as usual. And then you'll see the one we're currently using, but we want to pass in our newest one. So select enter interpreter path. And then we want to give it the path to our interpreter, which is the path from the root of our project directory to this python.exe file. So we're going to say dot, which is our current folder. So this is going to be the fast API folder. And then within here, we want to go into uh, scripts. And then within scripts, well, sorry, we want to go into the virtual NV folder, then scripts, and then python.exe. Go ahead and hit enter. And then if you look down here, you'll see that this gets updated. So now we're still using 3.9.6, but we're using our virtual environment. Uh, and so that's all we need to do. And it should remember this every time we open up our project. However, double check every time you open them just to make sure you're using that. If it's for some reason moved back to the default one, just do the same process. Now, the second thing that we need to do is we need to make sure our terminal is also using the virtual environment. Uh, and so what we want to do to do that is just type in uh, the path to this specific activate.bat file. So this is going to activate that virtual environment within our command line as well. So I'm going to say uh, virtual NV. And then we want to pass in our scripts folder and then activate.bat. Hit enter. And then notice what's changed, right? So when you're using a virtual environment, right, you're gonna see the name of the virtual environment to the side of it. So always double check whenever you start up VS Code and you start up your project that this is enabled. If you don't see this, then just run the same exact command and that's gonna reactivate the virtual environment. And so at this point, we are good to go with our virtual environment and we can start coding out our project. In this video, I'm gonna walk you through setting up a virtual environment on a Mac machine. Now, if you've already closed out your VS Code window, go ahead and open it back up and open up the folder that we created a couple lessons ago. Now within here, what we wanna do is we wanna access our terminal. So we can access our terminal just by selecting this and then this is our terminal. However, VS Code has a feature where we can access the terminal directly within our VS Code window. So if we select terminal and the new terminal, that's gonna create a new terminal for us, all right? And so this is fundamentally the same thing uh, as this terminal right here. It's no different, but at least by having it built into VS Code, we don't have to keep flipping back and forth between the two. So you can use either one, whichever your preference is. Keep in mind that when you open up the terminal within VS Code, it automatically moves you to the, um, the directory folder of your project. So you don't have to move there yourself. Uh, you can use whichever one you want. Now I'm actually using, I'm running Mac on a virtual machine right now, just because I, I natively use a Windows machine, so I don't actually own a Mac. So this is a little bit buggy. 
you know, if you see me type things, you can see it vanish. So for demonstration purposes, I'm just going to use the regular terminal, but I strongly recommend you use the one built into VS Code so you don't have to keep flipping back and forth. Now, to actually create a uh, virtual environment, there's one command that we have to run. So you run Python 3 dash M VENV for a virtual environment, and then you have to give it a name. So what name do you want to give your virtual environment? You can technically give it any name you want. You can name it after uh, your project. Uh, you can give it some arbitrary name. What I like to do is I like to name all of my virtual environments VENV. And so for every project that I create, I just create uh, the same exact virtual environment name uh, VENV. And that's not going to create an issue. It's perfectly okay to name all of your virtual environments the same thing because it's all going to be exclusive to this specific project folder. So no other projects can access it. So it's okay if they all use the same name. It's just easier. And so that way, uh, you know, if I ever create a uh, git ignore file, I can automatically add venv and I can make sure to just use the same exact git ignore template across all of my Python projects. So I'm going to use venv and I want to make sure that you pay attention right here because after I run this command, take a look at what happens. It creates a folder called venv and that's based off of the name of the virtual environment. And if we take a look at our virtual environment, you can see a couple of different files. Uh, you can see the, um, the Python file as well. So if you go under bin, this is going to be the new Python file or the Python 3 file that we're going to use for our interpreter. So down here at the bottom, you'll see that we are still using the global interpreter. We no longer want to use the global one. We want to use the one in our virtual environment. That way we don't you know, cause any issues with other projects. We want to use the virtual environment. So to do that, what we want to do is we want to select a view, command palette. And then we want to do the Python select interpreter again. So we'll select that, right? And so right now it shows us that um, we are using the global one. However, we're going to pass in the path to our specific interpreter within our virtual environment. So we'll select enter interpreter path. We'll say dot for current directory. And so that's going to mean uh, the current fast API directory. Then within there, we want to go into the virtual environment folder. And then within there, we want to go into bin and then just say Python. And so we'll hit enter and then take a look at what happens down here, right? You notice that the uh, version still says 3.9.6, but our interpreter is actually pointing to our local virtual environment now because we changed the interpreter to use this specific Python file right here. Uh, and so this is what's going to allow us to install our own specific fast API version, as well as any other version of any package that we want. So it doesn't actually install it globally on our machine. Now we're almost done, but there's one other thing to note. Uh, if you look at our terminal, our terminal isn't using our virtual environment. So if I run pip install any package, it's not going to install it for our specific virtual environment. It's going to install it globally. So we have to enable the virtual environment for the command line as well. And to do that, all you have to do is type in source. And then we want to pass in uh, the path to this specific activate file right here within bin. So we do venv slash bin slash activate. You hit enter and then notice how our command line changes. Now it's prepended by the name of our virtual environment. So since we named it venv, you can see that it shows it right before the terminal. And so that's all you have to do. Our virtual environment is set up. Keep in mind, if you close out your terminal and then reopen it, you, you'll notice that your virtual environment is gone. So you have to run that same exact command every time you open up your terminal to ensure that you are in your virtual environment. And anytime you close out VS Code, make sure that when you reopen your project, it still points to the virtual environment. If for some reason it changes, then just go back to that command palette by going to view command palette and then selecting the interpreter that you specifically want. Um, but that's all we have to do, guys. So our virtual environment set up. And so at this point, we can go ahead and get started on coding out our project. So now that we got our environment set up, it's time to get started coding out our project. And what I want you guys to do is, first of all, go to the fast API documentation. This is really important. What I want you guys to do is really get a solid understanding of how the documentation works. So pull up the fast API website and then head on over to the tutorial section and then select the intro part. So this is going to walk us through setting up our project. And what we will need to do is, first of all, we need to install the fast API package. Uh, and so what we can do is we can either do pip install fast API or we can do pip install uh, fast API all. When we do uh, pip install fast API all, it's going to install all of the optional dependencies as well. 
which we may or may not need depending on what features we want. We're going to go ahead and use the all option because we're going to use a lot of them and there's no point in having to go one by one and install them. So that's what we're going to do. So here uh, in our command line and make sure that we are in our virtual environment and then just type in pip install fast API and then we'll pass in all and we'll let that run. Now it's moving fairly fast, um, but if you kind of scroll through the history, you'll notice a lot of packages and a lot of dependencies that are getting installed. So we'll take a look at those once it's done just to see what are the different dependencies that were installed. And so now that that's done, if we type in pip freeze, this is going to show all of the packages that were installed. So it's not going to be just fast API. It's going to include a lot of the optional dependencies as well. So if we take a look, um, you can see that we've got uh, GraphQL installed if we want to use any GraphQL. Uh, we have Bcrypt, UV coin, that's going to be like our web server, WebSockets, if we want to work with WebSockets. So it already comes bundled with a lot of things that we're going to use. Um, and I just wanted to make sure that you guys understood what's happening when we pass in the, that all flag. And if you want to, if you open up your virtual environment folder and you go under lib, you'll see all of the uh, the code associated with those packages that we installed. So that's where all of them are going to reside. They're all going to reside within the lib folder. All right, so now that we've got uh, FastAPI installed, the first thing that we have to do is we have to import FastAPI. And to import FastAPI, we just say from FastAPI, which is the name of the library, we import FastAPI. All right, so we've now successfully imported FastAPI. Let's create an instance of FastAPI. So we'll say app equals fast API. And then we'll call that function. Uh, keep in mind, you can name this anything you want. But if you take a look at the documentation, and just follow along, uh, you, you can see that it's going to name an app. So I think it's best if we just kind of follow along with that convention, then what we're going to do is we're going to just copy this code right here. So this is going to be what's referred to as a path operation. And we'll go over what that means in a bit. And we'll just paste this here. I want you to save your code. You'll see if you get this uh, warning or this message saying formatter auto pep eight is not installed, go ahead and hit yes. Uh, and so this is nice because it'll automatically format our code. So if we ever put too many spaces or things like that, you'll see that as soon as you save it, it's going to snap into place and make everything look nice and pretty. So let's save this. And so once we've got our code, let's actually start our web server up. So how do we actually start our web server? Well, once again, let's go to our documentation. Uh, so we're going to make use of the UV coin library. So because we installed a uh, fast API with the all flag, um, it automatically installed UV coin. If you didn't use the all flag, then you'll have to do pip install UV coin as well, but we already got it installed. And so let's go back here and let's run our API. So we do UV corn. Then what we have to do is we have to uh, reference the name of our file. So this is their entry point into our application, which is our main file. So here we're going to say main. Keep in mind if this file was named anything else, you don't have to name it na main. You can name it anything else. You would just want to pass the name of whatever the file name is. Then you do colon. Then you pass in the name of your fast API instance. So we named it app. And so we'll do app. And then we'll start that. Right. And so this is saying that we started our server. Perfect. And we could see the URL that our server is running on. So it's going to say HTTP colon slash slash 127.0.0.1. So if you guys don't know what that address is, that means um, it's this machine. So whatever IP address this machine runs on, that's what this is going to be. Uh, so it's just saying, hey, we want to refer to the local host and it's going to run on port 8000. So if you want to, you could just copy this URL, go to your web browser, paste it in here and then see what happens. And then look at this. I'm going to zoom in for you. It says message. Hello world. And that's coming from our code. Right. And that's coming from this return statement right here. Uh, so that so this kind of verifies that everything worked perfectly. All right, so now that we've got everything up and running and working, and you can see that when we go to our website, uh, we can see that we are properly getting back our message. Uh, let's pause this video, and in the next video, we'll take a look at exactly what each line of this code actually means. All right, guys, so let's take a look at the code that we added and actually dissect what each line means. So we've got these three lines of code, and if you take a look at the fast API documentation that we were on, it's going to define those three lines of code as a path operation. So that's the terminology it's using. It refers to this as a path operation. Now, the name itself doesn't really matter. Uh, you'll see that in other web frameworks, uh, especially in other languages, sometimes they refer to this as a route, um, but they, uh, within the documentation for fast API, refer to it as a path operation. So you'll see me flip between those two terms, but they fundamentally mean the same thing. 
So let's actually take a look at this specific path operation. And we can really see that it's made up of two components. The first component is going to be the function. And the second thing is going to be the decorator. So we'll come back to the decorator in a bit. Let's take a look at this function. So this function is fundamentally no different than any other Python function. It's a plain old function. Uh, you'll see that there's this async keyword. Technically, this is optional. This keyword's only needed if you're going to be performing some sort of asynchronous task. So something that takes a certain amount of time. So things like, uh, you know, making an API call, things like talking to the database. If you want to do that asynchronously, you do have to pass in the async keyword. But we're not doing that right now. So what we can do is we can actually just remove that. So I'm going to delete that and just remove that. And so now it's just a regular function. And you'll see that the code behaves exactly the same. So we have a function. Um, we give the function a name. So the documentation just shows an arbitrary name of root. Keep in mind, the name itself doesn't matter. So if I wanted to name this, you know, uh, get user, then that's going to be fine. It's not going to change anything. It's an arbitrary name. However, I do recommend you name your functions, your path operation functions uh, to be as descriptive as possible. So if you're trying to log in a user, uh, then maybe you should call this login user or just log in so that it's as descriptive as possible. But keep in mind, the name that we put here does not matter. So I'll change this back to root for now. And then we have, so then within this function, you can perform any kind of logic. So if this function is meant to log in a user, it's going to have all the code for logging in a user, whatever that may be. So maybe, you know, checking the passwords in a database to make sure that they match and to make sure that the credentials are properly accurate. Uh, and then after that, you know, just like any other function, we can return something. So whatever we return here is going to be the data that gets sent back to the user. So if we go back to the website, go to our web server, if you take a look at this message, hello world, that's exactly what we sent. And if we change this to be whatever we want, it's going to get returned back in the same way. So here we're just returning a Python uh, dictionary, I guess. And what happens is fast API will automatically convert this to JSON, which is the main universal language of uh, APIs, right? We all talk to, we use JSONs to send data back and forth between an API. So it converts this to JSON and it sends it back to the user. And that's why we see that on the web browser. Now, the next thing that we have is this decorator. If you're not really familiar with decorators in Python, it's okay. You don't really actually need to understand, you know, the core concept of a decorator. Just understand that when you apply a decorator to a function, it's going to perform a little magic to this function. Because if I remove this decorator, if we just comment it out, take a look at this code. This code has nothing to do with fast API. It's a plain old function. So how do we actually make it, you know, act like an API? Well, we have to use this magical decorator. This decorator turns this into an actual path operation so that someone who wants to use our API can hit this endpoint. Uh, and so you just specify at the at symbol. That's what the, uh, that's how we clarify that this is going to be a decorator. Then we reference our fast API instance. And then we have a couple of different options. So what here we pass in is the HTTP method that the user should use. So this is a get method, which means that we have to send a get request to our API. And, but we can use plenty of different HTTP methods. And I strongly recommend you actually take a look at the different HTTP methods. If you do HTTP methods, we can select this one. This is the Mozilla page. You can see all of the different HTTP methods. So there's get, post, put, delete. So those are the main ones. There's a couple of other ones that uh, are sometimes used, but for the most part, those are the core ones. And so here, once again, just the HTTP method. And then finally, we have the path. Uh, uh, and so this is the root path. Uh, and, so, and so it's a little bit hard to explain the path, but it's basically the path after the specific domain name of your API. So if you take a look at our... Uh, our URL, our web server is hosted on this specific uh, URL. If I go to this page, let's open up a new link and just paste it in here. So, so the URL and the path in this case is just slash. So that's the equivalent of just hitting enter right here or putting a slash, which doesn't change anything, right? Right. Whether the slash is there or not, it's basically going to take you to the same URL. It's very similar to going to, you know, google.com. Right, that's going to take us to Google.com. But if we go to Google.com/slash, it's it's the same thing. So it's the root path. So whatever um, domain name our API is hosted on, whatever URL, it's just saying it's the root path. You know, if I change this to, um, you know, log in, right? That means that this path operation will only apply if the user goes to our URL and then goes to slash login. So. That decorator, this path right here, just references the path that we have to go to in the URL. 
And so if this is actually changed to, um, how about posts and then, you know, like vote. So maybe this is the URL for voting on a specific post, then we would have to go and do the same thing here. So we'd have to go to post slash vote. So nothing too complicated, but those are the two pieces that make up a simple path operation. You've got the function, then you've got this uh, decorator where you have to pass in the specific HTTP method and then the URL you want it to go to. And I'm gonna change this back to the default. And now what I wanna do is, let's go ahead and make a simple change. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna change this. I'm gonna change the message to be, um, welcome to my API. We'll save this. Go back to the root URL, because we changed it to the root URL. Let's hit refresh. Notice how it still says, hello world. Nothing changed. So what gives, right? It, you know, our code's changed, I saved it. Why are we not updating it so that it returns welcome to my API? Well, the problem is, is that anytime you make a change, we have to restart our server. So to restart our server, you hit control C, which is going to stop it. Then you could just hit the up arrow key so that you can find that command that you ran before and just run it again. And so now if I hit refresh, we can see that it updated. And I'm sure you're thinking, well, that's a little annoying. Every time I change my code, I have to do a control C and then an up arrow and then hit enter just so that I can, you know, make sure that the server actually implements those changes. And it is a little annoying, but there is a workaround. So if we go to the documentation, you'll see that when they run UVCorn, they pass in the dash dash reload flag. And the dash dash reload flag will actually take a look at your code and monitor your code. So anytime that you change your code, it'll automatically restart your server for you. So let's try that out. I'm gonna do a control C. I'm gonna hit the up arrow and I'm gonna pass in the dash dash reload flag. So we'll hit enter. And now what I want you to do is make some changes. So it doesn't really matter what you change. I'm just gonna add a couple of exclamation points. And then I'm gonna hit uh, save. And I want you to focus what, on what happens down here. So if I hit save, look at that. It automatically restarted the server for me. And so now if I go back to my website uh, or my API, hit refresh, you can see that the exclamation points are there. So moving forward in a development environment, only when we're in a development environment, we're gonna pass in the dash dash reload flag. When we go to production, we don't need that. We're not going to be setting it up because we're not gonna be changing our code in a production environment. And so I think that's a good stopping point here. Uh, in the next video, we'll just quickly review exactly what is a path operation so that we could just reinforce what we learned in this lecture. All right, guys, so let's quickly recap what we learned in the previous lecture. I wanna make sure that you guys have a solid understanding of the different components of a path operation because ultimately, that's all your API is. It's just a bunch of path operations. So first things first, we have our decorator. So our decorator has the little at symbol uh, and so that's what signifies it as a decorator. And then we reference our fast API instance, which we called app. And then we have our HTTP method. So in this case, this is going to match only get methods. And then we have the specific path or the URL. So this is the root URL in this case. And then below that, we've got our specific path operation function. So this function is going to contain all of the logic for performing some kind of task. And when it's going to return some data, and that's the data that gets returned to the user when they hit this specific path operation. So now that we have a solid understanding of how path operations work, let's see if we can create a new path operation. And let's say this one represents retrieving a bunch of social media posts from our application. So in this case, you know, there's two things that we need. So the first thing is our function, our path operation function. So we'll say def. And then we'll give this function any name. Uh, I think since we're gonna be retrieving a bunch of posts, I think a good name is gonna be uh, get underscore posts. Um, but keep in mind, you can name this anything you want. Like I said, it does not impact the behavior of anything. And then we wanna see, uh, so here we would pass in all of our logic for retrieving posts, but we don't actually have an application. So I'm just gonna say return. And then we'll just say um, maybe, I don't know, data. And this is going to be, this is your post. But in reality, we would provide a list of posts. So let's save that. And then there's one last thing. We have to pass in our decorator like we did before to actually make this turn into a special path operation function. So we'll say at, and we reference the instance, uh, the fast API instance. We'll do app dot. And then we have to figure out what HTTP method we want to use for this path operation. So when it comes to retrieving data, uh, you usually use a get operation. And if you don't know which one to use, um, you can just go back to this page right here and it's going to explain uh, what each one's for. So if you select get, it's going to explain when you would use a get. Uh, if you want to use a post, it's going to explain when you should use post. But 
Um, I already know that for retrieving data, it's usually a get operation. So we're going to keep it as a get method. Now for the URL, I'm going to say uh, to retrieve a post, we want to go to the slash post URL. So let's save this and then let's see um, if we can retrieve that data. So um, if I hit refresh here, it's going to say hello world, um, but that's because if you take a look at this, we're at the root path and that's going to match this specific path operation. Uh, and this path operation is on slash post. So if we go to slash posts and then hit enter, take a look at that. We have now got our data, which is our post. So we've hit that second path operation that we just created. And it really is as simple as that. You just define a function, you define the HTTP method, and then the URL. Now, there's one thing to note, and that is that, um, you know, the way that Fast API works is that when anytime we send a request to our API server, uh, it's going to actually go down the list of all of our path operations, um, and then it's going to find the first match. And as soon as it finds the first match, it's going to stop running your code. So uh, if I actually change this to just the slash URL, just like this one above, what do you think is going to happen? All right, they both reference the uh, get method, and they both reference the same URL. So which one do you think is going to win? Well, let's take a look. If I do just the slash again, it says hello world. So it looks like the first one uh, won. And the reason for that is that once again, Fast API literally just goes through the code and it looks for the first match. So there's really only two criteria in this case. What's the HTTP method? It's a get. So anytime you, go, you work in your browser, your browser is always going to send a get method by default. And then what's the URL? So the URL is a slash URL. So it matches this one and it does not continue past that. So it never runs this code. So it sends that back. Now, if I took this, copied it and moved it to the top, what do you think is going to happen? Which one do you think is going to run? Well, let's hit refresh. Look at that. So that one ran. So the first path operation that matches is always going to be the one that runs. Simple as that. So the order does, in fact, matter. However, if I change this to posts and, and leave this at the top, right? if I hit refresh, we get hello world. So what happened was Fast API went down the list, right? and it received a request that, uh, let me just put some comments. So the rec request comes in. Uh, sorry, that's not the way to comment in Python. Request comes in with a get method, and it comes in with the, uh, the URL is going to be slash. All right. And so these are the two things that it looks for to match. So it hits the first path operation. So this is a get. So those two match. And then it looks at the URL, which is slash. Uh, but that does not match. So it skips past with this one. And then it goes to the next one. Do you know? Does, and then it checks to see if that matches. So then get matches, the URL matches. So then it returns hello world. And that's why it returned hello world. And the reason I wanted to highlight this is that the order, in fact, does matter. So you have to keep that in mind and it can impact the way uh, your API ultimately works. So I'm going to just take this, move this to the bottom. Um, but in this case, the order doesn't matter because they're hitting two different uh, paths or two different URLs. Till now, we've been using our web browser to generate HTTP requests to test our API. And that's fine for now. However, once we start getting into more complex um, path operations and routes, so things that involve um, having to send a HTTP put or patch uh, or any of the other methods and having to send data to our API, it gets very complicated because there's no way to natively do that in the browser without generating or building out a complete full front-end application. And to test an API, you shouldn't have to build an entire front-end application to do that. That would be, you know, unmanageable, unscalable. And so there's a lot of different tools that we have uh, that we can use to um, test our API. Uh, and so one of these tools is called Postman. So if you go to postman.com slash downloads, uh, you can download this app. So go ahead and just hit the download button. It's going to automatically detect what your um, operating system is. But this is a very simple tool. It's just a tool that allows us to construct our own HTTP request. So we get to specify the individual uh, fields of an HTTP request. So we could specify, you know, what is the HTTP method? What's the URL? Uh, what are the headers that we're going to apply? What's the body? Uh, what kind of data is that going to carry? Is it going to have any authorization headers? So all of these things we get to construct in a nice GUI so that we can test our API. So go ahead and download this. Now I've already got it downloaded. But once you've got it downloaded, open up the uh, desktop application and you should see something like this, right? Everything should be relatively empty. And what we want to do is 
If we want to create a new HTTP request, all we have to do is hit the plus button. And before I do that, what I'm gonna do is, um, let's change this to dark themes. So themes, I think this looks a little bit better. Yeah, that looks a lot better. And I'm also going to zoom in for you guys. Uh, let's make it a little bit more, there you go. Hopefully that's nice and easy for you guys to see now. So what we wanna do is let's create a new HTTP request. So hit this plus button. And you can see that this provides us all of the fields that we need to actually create an HTTP request. So the first thing that we need to do is specify what's the HTTP method. So if we go back to our code, right, we only have get requests. So whether we wanna hit either one of these path operations, it's going to have to be a get request. So we're gonna leave it as get, but you can see we have all the other, whoops, we have all of the other options. Then we have to specify the URL. So this is no different than the URL that we went to in our browser. We just copy this URL. And we actually need the uh, HTTP in there as well, probably. So um, if we actually go back to our server and see where we started it, and actually the best way to get the URL is just to stop it, start it, and then that's gonna give us the URL. So we just needed the HTTP beforehand. And then we just paste that in there. Okay, and so if I leave this as the, um, you know, the root path, whether I include the slash, it doesn't really matter actually, I can just hit send. And you look at this, this is the result that we got back from our API server. So it says message, hello world. And once again, you guys already know where that came from. And that came from this specific return statement. And so you could see that this is so much easier than using a web browser. Well, you guys may not notice how easy it is at this point, but once we get to constructing more complex path operations, you'll see that it's so much easier to use a tool like this. And keep in mind, this isn't the only tool that does this. There are plenty of other um, applications that also do this. This is just the one that I'm familiar with and the one that I use, but I don't wanna you know, force any specific application down your throat. You guys can use whichever one you want. So if you already use one that you prefer, feel free to stick with it. But before we wrap up this video, let's just test out our other um, specific path. So this one's going to reside on slash posts. We're gonna try that and we'll do slash posts. We'll hit send and look at that. We got our data that says this is your posts. So now we were successfully able to test both of our path operations using Postman. And moving forward for the rest of this course, we're no longer gonna use the web browser. We're gonna use Postman to test out our API. Till now, we've only been working with get requests. So all of the HTTP requests we've sent to our API all have been get requests. And so now we're gonna learn about post requests. And they're a little bit different and I wanna kinda of highlight what makes post requests different than get requests. Now, we're gonna compare the two right now and I've drawn out a little diagram for us. So at the left side, we've got our web browser or it could be our mobile device depending on whatever the front end is. And on the right side, we've got our API server. So this is our fast API server. Now with a get request, what we do is we just send an HTTP get request. And then we send that to our API server and then our API server sends back uh, some kind of data depending on what they're trying to get. So if they're trying to get a whole bunch of posts, we send back the posts. Now with a post request, it's gonna be similar except there's one minor difference. And that is that with a post request, we can send data to the API server. So in this case, a lot of times what you'd use a post request for is for creating things. So if I want to create a post, I would, and when I say post, I mean like a social media post, not post as in post request. But if I wanted to create a, a social media post, I would send an HTTP post request and I would include all of the data needed to create a post on my API server. So we'll send that data over to the API server and the API server will send back whatever data it thinks it needs to send. And so in real life, if we were trying to create a post, you, we would include whatever data we needed for a post. So in this case, we would include what's the title of the post, what's the content of the post, what's the user of the post. We send that to the API server. The API can, server can then talk to whatever database to actually create the post, and then it can send back some data, You know, something like, hey, I've successfully created the post, um, and then here's the final post after I create it, and then send, that de send those details back to your web browser or your mobile devices. So think of it like this. A get request is basically saying, hey, API server, give me some data. Whereas a post request is saying, hey, API server, here's some data, do whatever you need to do with it. So it's like, so it really controls the direction uh, of flow of data uh, between the front end and the API server. So get requests are getting data from the API server, whereas a post request is sending data to the API server. 
So now that we have a basic understanding of how POST requests work, let's go back to our code and see if we can create a path operation for a POST request. So let's go below our last path operation, which was for getting POST, and let's create one for creating POST. So first things first, let's uh, let's just actually create our decorator first. So we'll do app dot, and instead of guest, uh, sorry, instead of get, we're gonna say post. So that's all it takes to convert a traditional get request to a post request. You just say dot post, and then once again, we're gonna say whatever specific URL the user should go to to actually create the post. Uh, now I'm gonna do something a little bit bad. I'm gonna say the path that we want to go to is called create post. And if you've ever worked with APIs, this is kind of going against best practice, but don't worry, we'll correct this in the next lesson um, because there are certain best practices. It's not going to break our application by any means. Uh, we'll say this and then we'll say def and then here we'll just name our function. I'll just say create post. Like I said, the name of the function never matters. And then here, which we're, all we're going to do is we're going to return, uh, we'll say message, whoops, message. And then uh, we'll say successfully created posts. So let's save that and let's go to our uh, postman. And so we've got already one request, so I could just change this to post. And then uh, we have to change the URL in this case. So we'll go back and see that create posts. So it's going to be at create posts. And let's hit send and let's see what happens. Look at that message successfully created. So we have successfully sent a post request to our API. Now, one thing I like to do with Postman is that you can create multiple requests and then have them saved. So um, I'm going to actually change this back to just go to posts and then go to get and then we'll keep that. And what we can do is we can just add another request. And so I'm just going to copy the URL here. I'm going to paste this. And then this is actually going to be create posts. And then this is going to be a post request. And so now we can hit a get request and then hit a post request really quickly because they're essentially, uh, we've got them in two different windows. And let's just quickly double check that still works, that's good. And then let's double check a get post, that still works, perfect. Now that's cool and all. However, the whole idea behind a post request is to send some data to our API server. So how do we do that? Well, let's go to our post request. And what we want to do is um, we want to send some data in the body of the request. And to do that, within uh, Postman, you would go to the body section right here. And then within body, what we want to do is go to raw and then select the type. And normally, when you're working with APIs, um, you want to use JSON. However, you can use a XML and a few others. However, most people use JSON. So we'll select JSON. And then we'll do, and, and JSON looks very, it, it operates very similarly to a Python dictionary. So it's, uh, you know, curly braces, and then it's going to be a whole bunch of key value pairs. So here I'll say, what's the title of my post? Well, the title of my post is going to be, say, uh, we'll say, top beaches in Florida. And then the content of the post is going to say, check out these awesome beaches. beaches. All right, and so now, if we hit send, let's see what happens. Great. So it says successfully create a post. We successfully um, hit this endpoint, but in our path operation, how do we actually extract the data that we sent in the body? How do we retrieve that body data? Well, what we can do is within our path operation function, I can say, uh, I can just assign it some variable. So what variable do we want to store all that body data? You can pick any name you want. I'm just going to say this represents payload. Although it could be something like body or anything else. So we'll say payload. And then what we want to do is colon. And then we want to say it's going to be of a type dict. And we want to set this equal to body. And we want to import this. So this is actually something that comes from the fast API library. So if you do tab, if you hit tab, it's going to automatically import it. Or you can select it. So you hit body. And then do that and then triple dots. And just to keep in mind, right, if you see that from fast API params, it imported body. So what this is going to do is uh, it's going to extract all of the fields from the body. It's going to basically convert it to a Python dictionary and it's going to store it inside a variable named payload. Pretty simple. And all we have to do is let's say print. 
Let's just print out payload. Now, if we hit that post request again, look at this uh, right here. We can see that it converted into a Python dictionary and we extracted the title field as well as the content field. And so that's how we extract the data from the body of the payload. All right. And just to quickly recap, once again, we imported body from fastapi.params and we let VS Code do it automatically for us. I always recommend letting VS Code do it for you so that you don't have to memorize uh, and remember, you know, where in the fast API library uh, this uh, this property is stored. So we're taking this, taking the body, and, and then we're converting it into a dictionary, and then we're storing it inside a property called payload, but you can name this whatever you want. And so what we can do is we can take this data and then we can say, um, let's say we're going to return back a new, a new post, and then we're just going to send the data. So we'll say title, and we can actually change this to a F string. And we'll say title. And then we can pass in payload. Uh, and you'll see that it's, uh, we can just reference the title property. Because it's just a regular Python dictionary. And we'll say that the content is going to be payload content. So let's save that. And then now let's hit send. Now look at this. We got our new post and it sent, whoops, it looks like I made a mistake. Yeah, no, actually that's correct. Title, top beaches in Florida, content, check out these awesome beaches. So that's pretty simple, guys. I showed you guys how to not only send data in the body within a Postman request, we're also able to extract that data and send it right back to the user. Now, in a real application, we would take the data and then we would normally store that data inside our database so that we can create a new post stored in the database. And then now, anytime the user tries to retrieve the post, we can fetch that data from the database. We don't have a database set up just yet. So for now, I'm just showing you guys how to extract that data and then send it back in the request. In the last lecture, we learned about how to work with post requests. We learned about how to send data in the body using Postman, as well as how to extract that data within our path operation so that we can perform some logic. And there's some issues that we're running into at the moment uh, based off of the way we've kind of set up things. All right, and the first thing is, it's kind of hard to get all of those values from the body. We have to you know, extract each one individually. Uh, on top of that, the client can send whatever data that it wants. And this is a big issue, right? I don't want the front end to send arbitrary data. If the user is trying to create a post, I want the title, I want the content, nothing else, right? I don't want them to send any extra data, right? And on top of that, the data itself isn't getting validated, right? So how do I ensure that the user is sending what I want, right? What if the user sends a blank title? I can't have a post with a blank title. So how can we validate that the data that the user sends is actually valid, right? And ultimately what we want to do is we want to force the user into a schema that we can expect, right? That's the term that we always use at the APS, a schema, where we want to define exactly what the data should look like so that it's almost like a contract between the front end and the back end saying, hey, the back end sends a message to the front end saying, listen, I expect my data to look like this. If you don't send me the data that looks exactly like this, I'm going to give you an error. And that's the way you want to work with APIs. You want to explicitly define what the data should look like so that the front end can send you exactly what you expect it. So let's see how we can do that uh, using FastAPI. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to make use of a library called Pydantic. Now, we've already got this installed because we used that all flag when we did pip install FastAPI. So if you actually go back to your code and go to your lib folder, uh, you should see Pydantic somewhere in here. And you can see that Pydantic is already installed. So we can make use of Pydantic to define what our schema should look like. So let me quickly show you how to work with Pydantic. It's really simple. But keep in mind, technically, Pydantic has nothing to do with Fast API. It's its own complete and separate library that you can use with any of your Python applications. Fast API um, just makes use of it so that uh, we can define a schema. So let's import Pydantic. So we'll say from Pydantic, import base model. 
And so if we go down to our, um, you know, our create posts um, path operation, uh, you know, ultimately what we want to do is we want to tell the front end what a post or a new post should look like. What data do we expect? So let's figure out what data we want for a specific post request. Uh, so two things that we want, we want a title, which is going to have, which is going to be, you know, a string essentially. And then we want uh, the content, which is the content of the post, which is going to be, you know, some sort of string, All right? And so we want the, we expect the user to send both of those things. And then we don't really want anything else. We don't want the user to send any other piece of data. We just want these two things. And we can put in any other pieces of data we want. So if we want the user to pass in something like, uh, you know, what is the category of the post, we can include that. Uh, we can maybe include um, uh, maybe uh, the number of, I mean, I don't know. You can really think of anything, maybe a Boolean that kind of represents, you know, is this a published post or do you want this to be saved as a draft? So you can construct it however you want, but we're just going to stick to title and content. So the way that this works is, I'm going to remove this comment right here. We're going to define a class. So we'll call this class and then we'll give it whatever name we want. It's going to represent what uh, a post should look like. So I'm just going to call this post. And then this is going to extend base model. So this is what makes it a special pydantic model. We just extend the base model. And then here we pass in the different properties for our post. And like I said, we want a title. And we also want a, the content. Uh, now, what we pass here is going to be what is this type of data? So if we go to this pydantic library, uh, you'll see that there's the different field types. So we can set things to be a Boolean. We can set it to be an int, float, string. So all of the common Python types, list, tuple, it's all available within Pydantic. So we know what a, um, ultimately what a, uh, a title should look like. So what do you guys think should be the field type for the title property? Well, I think it makes sense. It's, it should be a string because this looks like a string. It's got some text. It probably should be a string. So let's set this to be string. And the content should be the same thing. It should also be set to string. And now what we can do is let's take this model and go down to create posts. And instead of extracting the payload, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, reference that post pydantic model. And then I'm going to save this as a variable called post. Once again, they don't have to match, um, but since this will represent the post, I can call this maybe uh, new underscore post or something like that. And then, uh, and, and then reference the post pydantic model. So what's going to happen is because we pass this into our path operation, fast API is automatically going to validate the data that it receives from the client based off of this model. So it's going to check, Hey, does it have a title? If so, is it a string? If it if the title doesn't exist or if it's not a string and maybe we pass an integer, then it's going to throw an error. It's also going to check for us if content's available. If it is available, it's going to make sure that it's a string. And if content's not available or if it's not a string, it's going to throw an error. So it's doing all of the validation for us and it's defining the schema of what it should look like for the front end, uh, what kind of the data should the front end send to us. So we're going to remove all of this nonsense. I'm just going to, for now, just say data, I don't know, new post for now. And now what I'm going to do, instead of print payload, we're going to say print new underscore post. So let's save this. And then I'm going to send a post request. Okay, so that updated fine. But let's take a look at what this printed out. So take a look at what it printed out. Look at that. It automatically extracted all of that data for us. So now we can access, you know, post.title and we can get the title of the post. And we can also access post.content to get the content of the post. And just to prove that to you guys, we'll say post.title. So we'll save that. We'll send a request. And now look at that. Look how easy it is to extract that data because it's already assigned to that new post variable. And we can just access each property based off of what the model is defined as. Now that's great and all, but let's check to see if it's actually performing all of that validation. So if I go to my um, Postman 
and I remove title. Let's see what happens. I'll hit send. Look at this. Look at this. It's saying that the inside the body, there's a title field and it's saying a value error. It's missing. Now we didn't tell fast API to, to send this, but it automatically does the validation for us and sends back an error message. And then it sends uh, back a status code. So this is the status code of the message. It sends a 422. We can change that later. Don't worry about that. But it's automatically performing the validation. And that's what's awesome about this. And if we, uh, if I add the title back, uh, what was it, top beaches in Florida? And instead, actually, if I change this to be um, a one or something, and I need that comma, let's see what happens. If I hit send, it looks like there's no errors. And that's because the number one can actually be um, converted into a string. So it's not going to throw an error on that. And that's perfectly fine. And I'll, uh, and that's perfectly fine. So that's not a big deal. Um, but let's change this back. Like I said, it's going to try to convert whatever data we give it to a string. So as long as it's able to convert it to a string, it's okay. And any integer that we pass can be converted to a string. So I'm going to change this back and I'll add uh, top beaches in Florida. Oop, Florida. Let's see what happens if we remove the content now. If I hit send, look at that. Now it's saying the content is missing. Perfect. So our validation is working exactly how we expect it to. And then I forget what, what was it? Something, something beaches. Or, I can't remember what it was. Now let's say that we want to um, uh, assign a property uh, that's optional, right? Like what if we want it to make it so that the front end can either choose to send some piece of data or not send a piece of data. So let's say that we want the user to be able to define if a property uh, if a post should be published or not. Well, we can create a field called published, which is going to be set, uh, which is going to be a type of uh, Boolean. And we can say, um, you know, first of all, we can say if the user doesn't provide us a value, we can give it a default value. So here I'll say true. And so if the user doesn't provide published, a, then it's going to default to true. If it does provide published, then whatever value you give it, that's what we're going to use it as. And I'm going to go down here and we're going to change this to, we're going to grab the published value. And then down here, we'll say published. Whoops. It's going to be set to true. So let's hit send. And we can see that it got set to true. That's good. If we set this to false, hit send. We can see that it's false. And then if we remove this altogether, move that comma as well, hit send. Look at that. It defaults to true. So now we've created an app, an optional field for our schema. So the user doesn't have to provide this and it's going to default to true in this case. Now, let's say we wanted to create another field. However, instead of giving it a default value, if it's not sent, we want it to default to none. So we want it to be completely optional and we're not going to store any value uh, if the user doesn't provide it. What we can do is, let's say the field is a rating. Let's say the user can give each post a rating. What we can say is optional. And we're going to have to import optional uh, from typing, from the typing library. So import optional. And then we have to pass in the type. So what is it going to be? Uh, in this case, a rating, I think an integer makes sense. And then we can say equals to none. So this is going to be a fully optional field. And if the user doesn't provide it, it's going to default to a value of none. And so here, I'm just going to get the, uh, the value of our rating. And so if I hit send right now in our body, we don't have a rating field. I hit send, you can see that it defaults to a value of none because we set this to be optional none. However, if I pass in a rating field, I need to give it a value, some kind of value. So I'll say, we'll, we'll give this maybe like four stars or something. 
I hit send, we can see that now look, the value of rating is set to four. And then finally, the last thing I want to note is because we set the type to be an integer, so even though it's optional, we still have to specify the type. If I give this a value of a string, so, you know, something like hello, which is not a valid rating, take a look at what happens. Look at that. It says in the body, the rating field, the value is not a valid integer. So it wasn't able to convert whatever value we sent into integer. And so that's why it's throwing an error and saying like, this does not match up with the schema and it's throwing an error. And so that's what's awesome about this is now we can ensure that our front end is sending the exact data that we expect by using these pedantic models. So moving forward in this course, we are going to really make use of pedantic models to ensure that the schemas not only receiving data from the front end, but also sending data back is all um, matching up with our organized schema. And actually, there's one last thing I want to show you guys, and that is that when we actually um, kind of extract that data and save it into new post, uh, it actually stores it as a pydantic model. So it's a specific pydantic model. And each pydantic model has a method called dot dict. So if I do, um, if I print new post below this, what we can do is if you ever need to convert your pydantic model to a dictionary, all we have to do is write the name of the variable and we say dot dict. So this is going to take that pydantic model and then it's going to convert it to a dictionary. So let's print that out. Let's save it. Let's hit send. Whoops. And I forgot to, it's still throwing a validation error, but that's to be expected. So we'll say change that to four. All right, take a look at the two different things. So this is a pedantic model that's just printing out the different uh, properties of that, of that model. Whereas this is a regular Python dictionary. So we can just send back a dictionary if we want to. So we do return new post and save that. Now, if I hit send, we're just sending back a dictionary. And so now we send back the data with all of the different properties. And so you'll see that this is actually a nice little handy tool to be able to convert it to a dictionary, uh, which is something that we'll be needing to do in some of the future lectures. So I wanted to make sure we just cover our bases real quick on that. And also, I don't like calling this new post. I'm just going to change this to post for now because I think that's a little bit better, in my opinion, because it is just a post. We don't need to know that it's a new post. It clearly is. And let's just double check that everything works. Let's hit send. Perfect. In this lesson, we're going to talk about what a CRUD application is, as well as what are standard conventions when it comes to creating an API for a CRUD-based application. So CRUD is an acronym that represents the four main functions of an application. So any application, regardless of what it is, needs to be able to create things. So in our case, since we're building a, you know, a social media type application, we need to be able to create posts, make new posts. We need to be able to read posts. Uh, and so that includes, you know, retrieving all of the pre-existing posts. We need to be able to update a post if we want to implement that functionality. So if we decide to change what our post says, we would use the update functionality. And then finally, we need to be able to delete a post. And so the CRUD, that represents the four main functions of any CRUD-based application. So it's nothing more than an acronym. However, I created the slide so that you guys can understand what are standard conventions when it comes to creating an API for a CRUD-based application, because there are certain best practices that we need to follow. And so when it comes to naming the URL and the paths for each operation, there's a standard convention. And the first thing that I want to point out is since we're working with posts, it makes sense to name all of the URLs, all the paths uh, with slash posts. And it's important that you use the plural form of posts. You don't want to do slash post you want to do slash posts as in plural. This is standard convention for APIs. And if we were working with users and we want to do, be able to create, read, update, and delete users, it wouldn't be slash user, it would be slash users. So always use the plural, that's standard convention. Now, when it comes to creating a post, right, that's always going to be a post request. So we've got the create functionality right here, and we can see that we have to send a post request. Standard convention. Anytime you want to create an entity, it's going to be a post request. And the URL or the path for that specific request is always going to be slash post in this case. And if you want to see what that looks like for the decorator in Fast API, it's pretty simple. You just do app.post slash post. So this is something you guys already know. 
Now, when it comes to read functionality, which would be, you know, reading or retrieving pre-existing posts, there's actually two different path operations we're going to create. So the first one is going to be slash posts. And this is going to be for retrieving either all of the posts or multiple posts, depending on what filter that we use. And so when it comes to retrieving information uh, from a database or anything like that, retrieving data, it's always going to be a get operation. So you send a get request to slash posts. And if you want to see what that face uh, the decorator on FastAP would look like, it's just app.get slash post. Once again, we already have this set up in our application so far. However, there's also going to be another path operation for reading, right? And that's if you want to get one individual post. So if we want to get detailed information about one specific post, we're going to send a get request to slash posts slash, and then we've got this ID right here. So anytime you create something, uh, what's going to happen is uh, anytime you add something to a database, the database is going to give it that specific item a unique identifier so that we can uniquely identify that specific entry. And so if I want to get detailed information about a specific post, I would just send a request to slash posts and then pass the ID of that specific post I'm interested in. So that's what this ID represents. And within Fast API, if you want to see what that actually looks like, you would just do app.get slash posts and then you do curly braces and then ID. And that'll allow you to extract the ID from the specific URL of the request. And then we can, you know, take that URL, uh, sorry, take that ID and then, you know, send it out to our database so that we can retrieve the information. So there's always going to be two specific path operations for read functionality. Then we have update. Uh, so this would involve updating uh, a pre-existing post. So maybe we, you know, posted out something and then we realized we said something offensive and we want to update it before anyone takes a screenshot of it. Now, when it comes to updating, right, there's two different HTTP methods that we can use. We can use put or patch, and it's really a matter of user preference. The only difference is that I, wanna, I don't want to spend too much time on it is that when we use put, that you, the idea is that you pass all of the information for updating it. So all of the fields have to be sent um, to, the, to the API server, whereas a patch, we can just send just the specific field that we want to change. So put, you want to change the entire thing, you have to pass every every field, even if it's going to be the same and most fields don't change, whereas a patch, we would just change the one specific field. So as an example, uh, as a, you know, if we're working with users, actually, if we're working with posts, and let's say I wanted to change the title, all right, I want to update the title of a post. If I used a put request, I'd have to give the new title and I would have to give the pre-existing content, right? Because the put, uh, the idea behind put is that you have to provide all of the same information so that we can, on the back end, just take all the information and then update the entity. Whereas a patch operation, I can just send the title and then my backend should know how to just update that one field. We're going to stick with put, I believe, uh, in our application, but really at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. It's just a matter of use of preference. But with update, just like when it comes to retrieving one specific post, we have to pass in the ID so that we know which specific post we want to update. And for the decorator in Fast API, the only thing that we change is it's going to be app.put. Uh, and then we can pass in the ID like we did before. And then finally, we have delete. So if you want to delete a post, once again, you're going to send a delete request. So that the HTTP verb is going to be delete. And then we have to pass in the specific ID of the post as well. And then this is what the fast API um, decorator is going to look like. So it's actually not that hard. It's fairly simple. And you'll see that once you create one CRUD API, creating another one is almost a matter of copying and pasting, really. Uh, and so in the next video, we're going to make a few changes to our API so that we can make sure that we follow uh, this naming convention, because right now, I believe when it comes to creating a post, instead of just using slash post, we called it slash create post, which once again is not following best practice. So we'll update that in the next video. All right, guys. So in the last lesson, we learned about best practice and naming conventions for an API. So what I want to do is quickly go into all the code that we have and make changes so that we follow best practices. And so if you take a look at our get request, you can see we say send a get request to slash posts. That's perfect. Uh, we don't need to change anything to that. However, the issue is, is our uh, create post functionality. So the path for creating posts, we can see that we send it to a URL of slash create posts. That is not going and following best practice. So what we do, just change this to be slash posts. And that's all we have to do. Uh, and so we'll save this. And, um, We'll, we'll just double check inside our um, Postman just to make sure we update that as well. So this is going to be to slash posts. And then we'll just test this out to make sure we didn't break anything. And it looks like it's still working just fine. All right, guys. So if we take a look at our code, you can see that for our create post path function, 
uh, we're not actually doing anything with the data. We're not actually saving the post anywhere. Right now, we just print it out and then send it back to the user. So that's not exactly how a real application would work. And so what I want to do is I want to start saving these posts. I want to start turning this into a real fully functioning application. Now, ideally, we're going to save this uh, within a database because that's how any application works. You want to take a post, you want to save it in a database so that you can persist that data. However, we're not quite ready to handle working with the database. It's a little complex. We're going to get to it in this course. However, I want to keep things simple. So what we're going to do is we're going to save the posts in memory. And how do we do that? Easy. I'm just going to create a variable uh, just globally that's going to store all of our posts. So I'm going to say my underscore posts. And this is just going to be an array. And so this array is going to contain an, uh, a whole bunch of posts objects. Right? And what each post is going to be is going to, it's going to be essentially a dictionary. And the dictionary is going to look kind of like this. So we're going to have a couple properties. So we already know that our post is going to have a title. And then that'll have, you know, whatever, you know, title of post one or whatever. And then we're going to have the content, of course. And I'll just say content of post one. This is just an example post. And then what we'll also do is, like I mentioned before, anytime you save an application, save a uh, piece of information within a database, the database is going to create a unique uh, identifier, an ID. Uh, now, since we're not working with databases, there's no uh, ID. However, it's going to create issues because, uh, you know, if you remember when it, when it comes to working with um, CRUD-based APIs, we need to be able to fetch data and update data based off of the ID of the specific post. So we do need to still have an ID so that we can uniquely reference any single item uh, within this array. So we're going to have another field called ID. And then this is just going to have, you know, be some random integer, you know, one, two, three, four, five, it doesn't matter. It's just got to be unique. That's all that matters. So this is what our post is going to look like. And we're going to just store it in this array. So we're going to have multiple posts. And I'm going to keep this one hard coded in here because every time we change our code and hit save and refresh, guess what? It's going to clear this out because remember, this is just stored in memory. So every time our application restarts, we're going to lose that data. So just to keep things simple, I'm going to hard code another, uh, another entry. So for this post, we'll say the title is uh, favorite foods and the content will be I like pizza. And then we'll just give this an ID of two. All right, and so now that we actually have some place to store our posts, we can actually test out our get post functionality to see if it works. So I'm going to save this. We're going to go back to Postman. So find the one with the get operation where we're retrieving the posts. And then we'll hit send. Let's see. Well, when we hit send, nothing happens, of course, because we actually have to update the code to send that data. So let's go back to our code and let's go to our get posts. So right now we're just sending back this information. So let's update this so that we return my posts. And this should be fairly straightforward. What we can do is we can just keep this property called data and then we can just remove this and just pass along my underscore posts. And so what's going to happen is fast API is great because if I pass in a, an array like this, it'll automatically serialize it. So it's going to convert it into JSON. JSON has something that's also very similar to an array, and it's going to change that into a JSON format so that we can send it over our API. So that's all we have to do. We just have to pass in the array and it's going to send that. So now if we try this, look at that. So we get the data property and within here we have an array. So this is JSON also has a concept of arrays. And then within here, you can see we've got our post one and our post two. So um, that's really as simple as how to work with our API, how to actually retrieve posts. In the next video, we're going to update the um, create post path operation so that we can figure out how to add a new post into our My Posts array. All right, guys, so let's update our create post path operation function so that we can uh, retrieve the title and the content uh, from our front end and then create a brand new post and store it within our My Posts array. So how do we do that? Well, we already know that we can retrieve our post by referencing this post variable because this will take our schema, which remember we defined with Pydantic. It's going to do all the validation and it's going to store it within post. And so this is still going to be a, a Pydantic model. However, our, um, our array is going to be an array of dictionaries. So we have to convert that to dictionaries. And we already know that we can convert any Pydantic model to a dictionary by doing dot dict 
uh, and then that'll turn it into a standard Python dictionary. And at that point, uh, it's pretty simple. This is just standard Python at this point. We can just do a my underscore posts dot append. And then we can append post dot dict, just like we did before. We don't, we can remove these print statements. They're just cluttering things up. However, there's one little issue. Like I said, we need to have an ID for every entry. Uh, and normally the database handles that, but since we're not actually working with a real database, we're going to have to do this in software. So what I'm going to do is we're just going to assign it a random integer. Um, not really that reliable, but if we pick a random number between one and you know 10 million, the odds of us hitting the same number twice is almost next to none. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the random package. Uh, so we'll say from random import ran range. And this is what we're going to use to uh, create a random number or a random integer. And so instead of doing this, I'm actually going to remove this for a second. And I spelled append wrong as well. What we're going to do is I'm going to say post underscore dict, which is going to be the um, post pydentic model converted to a dictionary. I'm going to set that equal to post dot dict. Okay, so this is going to be the dictionary. And so now that we have a regular Python dictionary, what we can say is post underscore dict. And then I'm going to reference the ID field that I'm creating. And I'm going to assign that to be a random number. So we're going to give it a range of zero two, and then just pick some really, 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 really large number. So this is going to ensure that pretty much any entry won't, for development purposes is going to be unique. But we'll append that to the array. And then here's the thing when it comes to how a usual API works is that when a front end sends the data to create a new post, after we create the post stored in our database, we should send back the newly created post, including the brand new ID. So let's send that back. So in this case, I'm going to send back post underscore dict because that's going to be the brand new post that we uh, add to the specific and add to our posts array. So let's try this out. Uh, let's go to our post request that we have. And let's see all of our data. So we've got a couple of things, title, content, rating. I don't really care about the rating, um, but I'll just leave it in there for now. It shouldn't matter. And then we'll just hit send and let's see what happens. And it looks like we got an error, so let's see what happened. All right, it looks like there's an, and, and I already see what happened. I forgot to actually include post underscore dict. We actually have to pass in what we want to append to the array. Let's save that. Try this again. Hopefully no errors. Look at that, guys. So it looks like we got back the newly created entry, and we can see that it has an ID of whatever that number is. And if we do a get request now to retrieve all of our posts, we should see that newly created entry. So let's take a look. So we've got post one, post two, and then we've got that brand new post. Look at that, guys. So we are a little bit less than halfway done with creating our CRUD based application. Now, before moving any further and writing any more code, what I want to do is I want to actually save these requests because right now they're just kind of stored in memory. If we close out Postman, it'll still remember it, but what we can do is we can create a collection. So here I'm going to select create collection and I'm going to give this a name. So I'm just going to name this after my project. So I can call this, you know, fast API course, or, you know, since this is a social media app, we can call it whatever we would call it. I'm just going to call it fast API course. We'll save that. And then what I want to do is I want to save these two requests so that I don't have to remember this in case they accidentally get deleted. So I'll hit save, save as. We'll save it and then um, you can give it any name. So this is going to be, um, I forget, this is the get request. So I'm going to say, I'm going to call this get posts. I'm going to store it inside this collection. Right? And so now within this collection, you can see this request is stored in there. And I'm going to do the same thing for the post request. So this is for creating posts. So we'll do save as again. I'm going to say uh, create post. And then it already remembers the most recent uh, collection, but go ahead and select the collection if it didn't remember that. And then we'll hit save. And so now they're both saved in here and we can easily bring these up anytime, even if we close out all of our requests. So I closed everything out you can bring that right back up. It's going to remember everything. And then the same thing with the post request. If I go to the body, it even remembers the fields. So Postman, one of my favorite tools uh, when it comes to working with APIs. And, you know, as this course goes along, you're going to continue to learn more and more things about Postman. 
Okay, guys, let's continue building out our CRUD application. The next function I want to implement is retrieving one individual post. And so let's define a function for that. So here I'll call this uh, uh, get post. Keep in mind that this is singular. So I call this get post, whereas to retrieve all posts, it's get posts. But like I said, the name of these functions don't actually matter. It's just more for, for you, more for readability. And the decorator is going to look like this. And so this is based off of that slide I already showed you. So it's going to be a get method. And then here, the URL is going to be slash posts ID, right? Because the user is going to provide us the ID of the specific post that they're interested in. And so that's going to get embedded in the URL. So they'll send a get request to slash post slash and then whatever ID. So if they want to see the information for uh, post one, they'll pass in a value of one. And what this is actually referred to, the proper terminology for this is that this is called a path parameter. So this ID field represents a path parameter, and this parameter happens to represent the ID of a specific post the user is interested in seeing. And so what we can do is FastAPI will automatically extract this ID, and then we can pass it right into our function. So now our function has access to whatever value was in that URL right there. And so if we want to, I can do a quick print of ID, and then we'll just return some hard-coded data. So I'll just say data. Actually, we'll call this, uh, how about post underscore detail? I'll say, this is the post you're interested in. Or even better, what I can do is uh, we'll change this to an F string and I'll just say, here is post, and then we can just pass an ID. So let's save that. We'll go to Postman, and what we wanna do is we wanna create a new post, but let's create it in our collection. So I'm gonna go in there, select add request, give it whatever name you want, I'll say get one post. And then for the URL, just copy the get posts URL. And then we want to pass in the ID that we're interested in. So we just do a slash. And then in this case, I'm going to get the post with an ID of two. And the reason why I'm doing that is because we've hard coded one of our posts to have an ID of two. So I know that's always going to be there. And then we could just try sending this and see what happens. So it says post detail. Here is post and then post number two. So it looks like we were successfully able to extract the ID, uh, the path parameter that was passed into the specific URL that the user sent a request to. So we now have access to that. At that point, we can just find whichever um, entry in my post has that specific ID. Now we have to implement the logic for actually getting that post. And so there's many different ways of doing this. And I'm telling you right now, this is probably not the best way of doing this. I'm not really even a Python expert. I'm sure there's much better ways of grabbing this information. However, uh, keep in mind, the code's going to be changed later on once we start working with the database. So this, at this point, is just basic Python logic. Uh, and I do want to keep, I do want you guys to keep in mind that this may not be best practice for uh, the best way of retrieving an individual post. But I'm just going to create a simple function. And uh, it's going to be called find post. So this is how you find a post by an ID. So, the, so we'll pass in an ID in this function to retrieve the post. And what we'll do is we'll iterate over the my post. So we'll say 4p in my posts and we'll say if p so p represents the specific post that we're iterating over so if this specific post has an id which equals the id that was passed into the function then we'll return p we'll return that specific post And then at this point, we can call this function. So I'm going to remove that print statement and say post equals find underscore post ID. And then for this, we can just remove this and just return post. So let's save this. Let's go to back to Postman and let's try this out. And it looks like I got an error. So something happened. And let's actually take a look at our code. Well, guys, I think I found the issue. So the reason why we keep getting none, right? If I keep sending, hitting send, it says none. And what I did was I just printed out the post to see what we got. And uh, it actually just prints out none. So it, for some reason, we're unable to find post. And I think I know exactly why. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a print of ID again. And this is going to teach us an important lesson. So I'm going to send another request. And it prints out two. However, what we're going to do is I'm actually going to get the 
type of ID. So I forget how to do that. I think it's the type. I think I could just do type in Python. So I'm going to figure out what is the actual type of ID. And now if I send this request again, right, you could see that the type is actually a string and not an integer. And so when we pass this check in where we say if P uh, ID, so if we get the ID field and compare it to the ID that we pass in, it's never going to equal that because one's an integer, the other one's a string, they're never going to be equal. So the first thing that we actually have to do is before we call this function, we have to convert it to an integer. So I can just say int, that's going to convert it to an int, save that, and then at this point, if I send this, it should now work. Look at that. So keep in mind, guys, anytime we um, have a path parameter, it's always going to be returned as a string, even if it represents an integer or a number, we always have to manually convert it ourselves. So don't forget to do that. Now, there is one little issue with what we're doing. So everything's working, and if I actually change this to a one, we should get a different post. So everything's working great. However, what happens if I type this? Well, let's hit send. Well, we get an error, right? Because we're trying to convert this to an int, and it's going to throw an error. And then instead of sending back a nice, you know, built-in response, yeah, we just get an internal server error, and the user has no idea what exactly is wrong. So we want to provide it feedback. So how can we perform some kind of validation to ensure that whatever data that's passed into this path parameter can actually be properly converted to an integer? Well, we can perform validation with fast API. So here for ID, what we can do is we can say, I want this to be an integer. So what it's going to do is it's first of all going to validate that it can be converted to an integer, and then it'll automatically convert it to an integer for us. So we no longer have to convert this ourselves. So here I could just pass an ID because this will make sure that it's already converted. And so now, if I save this, and I change this back to a number first, let's make sure that everything's working so it automatically converted it to an integer. And now if I pass in, you know, a string, it's now going to throw an error. It's going to say for a path parameter of ID, you can see that this value is not a valid integer. And so now the front end has a good way of understanding what they did wrong. And, you know, this can be anything, right? So if you wanted this to, to be a string, right, we can have this automatically get validated as a string and convert it into a string so that uh, if they do actually send a string, no errors, right? And then if they tried to, actually, even if you put in a number, it's not going to throw an error because uh, any number can actually be converted into a string. But we want an integer, so I'm going to change this back to an integer. And then we'll just hard code this as two. Perfect. Make sure you save your request. And so now we've now implemented our third function within our CRUD app. So we've just got two more. We got to handle updating and deleting posts, but we've got all getting all posts, creating a post and then getting an individual post. And you'll see that uh, for the last two, it's pretty much the same thing, right? We just have to define our specific decorator and then define the logic for actually creating and deleting a post from that array or updating uh, a post as well. Now, before we move on, I do want to show you guys one potential issue that you can run into if you don't quite understand how these routes work and how order matters within fast API. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to create a dummy route and you guys don't need to follow along on this. It's just a quick little demonstration. And I'm just going to make this another get request uh, or handler for a get request. And then this one's going to be posts slash latest. So what this will do is when the user sends a request, a get request to this specific path, latest path, we're going to grab whatever the latest post is. And so here I'll just say uh, def get latest post. And so all I'm going to do is I'm going to reference our my posts list. And I'll say we'll get the length of my post. And then we'll just minus one. So this will grab the latest post. And then what we're going to do is just return that. Here we'll say detail. And then we'll pass in and actually let me store this in a variable post equals and then we'll return post. We'll save this and I'm going to show you what happens. So let's create a new request. I'm going to just copy the URL from the previous one. And then here we're going to change this to latest. Let's see what happens. Interesting. We get an error. So 
what exactly happened? Well, let's take a look at the error. It's saying that um, we have a um, path parameter called ID, and it looks like it's saying that this is not a valid integer. So I'm not even sure why it's referencing this error. I guess if we take a look at our code, right, there's, there's no path parameter here. So what is exactly happening? Well, let's take a look, right? Our request looks like this. So it's going to slash post slash latest. So when we send this request, what's going to happen is that we're going to start all the way at the top and fast API is going to go through the list of all of our, um, all of our paths and it's going to find the first match. So we have one at just the root URL. So it's not going to match that. We have one at slash posts. It's once again, not going to match that. This one is for a post request. So it's not going to match that because we sent a get request. But then something interesting happens here when we get to this get request, right? So this handles a get request and then it matches slash posts and then some variable. So technically that variable could be latest. You see the issue that we're running into because there's no way for fast API to know that that route was meant for, that that request was meant for this specific path, right? Because it does technically match on this. And then what happens is since it matches on this route, it then tries to perform validation on ID which is in this case, it's going to end up being latest. And then it's going to throw an error because latest can't be converted to an integer. Uh, and so this is the example of where order matters. So you have to be careful when you structure your API, especially with your, with your paths and your URLs, you want to make sure that you don't run into this type of issue. So, you know, one thing in this case you could do is just move this up. That would fix the issue because now if you save this and then run this, right, it works. And if you uh, try to reference a specific ID, that's going to work as well. Well, in that case, let's try one. Yep. And so that works as well because uh, slash post slash one will never match this one. It'll only match this one. Uh, so be very careful when it comes to the order. It always works top down. So anytime you're working with path parameters, it could potentially result in you guys accidentally matching other routes by accident. So, you know, there's different ways to get around this. Like I said, you can just move this up or if you wanted to change the URL altogether so that this is like a slash post slash, um, I don't know, you know, just put in another keyword, something like a, a recent or something, recent slash latest or something. Well, actually, even then that would, yeah. And so just keep, and so I just want to make sure you keep that in mind when you're structuring your API, because anytime you have a path parameter, it could result in you um, accidentally matching requests that were meant for a different, uh, for a different route. So I'm just going to delete this. This was merely just for demonstration purposes. And I just want to make sure that you guys understand the fast API, uh, just looks at all of your paths and just works its way down the list till it finds the first match. For our get post path operation, specifically the one where we retrieve one specific post, we do run into a little bit of an issue. So if we go to our postman real quick and, uh, send a request to get one post. But in this case, instead of doing one or two, uh, what I want to do is I want you to put in the ID, uh, put in an ID uh, that doesn't exist. So we only have right now um, posts with an ID of one and two. What happens if we send it with a ID of five? You can see what we get back. It says null, right? And I don't like that because it doesn't really give the front end any feedback as to what exactly is happening. Uh, so they don't actually know, you know, they don't know if some kind of error occurred or if we were unable to retrieve this information properly or if there's a server error or if this uh, item doesn't ultimately exist. And so we need a way to accurately tell the front end that, hey, the ID that you're searching for does not actually exist in our database. And the best way to do that is through a method that I'm sure you guys are already a little bit familiar with. So right here, I've got my uh, GitHub page uh, for our course. And uh, you can see it's just GitHub, my username, and then the name of the repo. But if I search for, if I put in a whole bunch of letters afterward, what's going to happen is GitHub is going to look for a repo with this name that doesn't exist. And let's see what happens. It gets a 404. And I'm sure you guys have seen a 404 error at least once before in your life. So that's a specific HTTP status code that represents that this item was not found, that it does not exist. And HTTP status codes are important. We haven't really talked about it in this course up to this point, but there's a lot of different status codes. And uh, if you actually just search for HTTP status code, you can just grab one of the top links. I'm going to go take a look at the Mozilla one and you'll see all of the different HTTP status codes and you'll see when to use them. Now, most of the time you're going to see that we get a 200 response back. That's the default one the FastAPI sends. That usually means that everything's 
good. Everything worked. That's why it says okay. However, we do have other ones that we do also commonly use. So anytime you create something, so uh, within your CRUD application for create, anytime you send a post request, usually uh, after you create that entity, you send a 201 back instead of a traditional 200. So there's a lot of HTTP status codes, and we're going to cover all of those in future lectures. But the ones we're interested in is for when we have an error. So if we scroll down, 400 usually means there's some kind of bad error, something happened. And most importantly, we want the 404 not found. So the server cannot find the requested resource. So that's the, exactly what we're looking for. Uh, keep in mind, there's also 500 status codes, which means, you know, some kind of server error or server, error or server failure. So what we're going to do is I'm going to go back to our code. And what we need to do is we need to manipulate the response because right now we're getting a 200 back. We're getting a status code of 200. If I send it, it says null and then it just sends 200. So that doesn't really give us a good idea as to what's happening. So how do we manipulate the response? Well, we have to, first of all, import the response from fast API. And then what we're going to do is we're just going to pass it in as a uh, parameter into our path operation function. So I'll just call this, uh, I'll store it in a variable called response. And so once you get access to the response object, we can tweak it however we want. So what I'm going to do is um, after we search for post, if we didn't find a post, I'm just going to do a quick check. I'm going to say if not post, right? That means if we didn't find a post, what we're going to do is we're going to set the response and then we're going to grab a property off a response called status code. So here we can tweak the status code of the response. And I'm going to say, hey, I want this to be a 404. All right, now let's save it. Now, if I hit send, it still says post detail none, but take a look at the status code. It's now updated to 404. And if I change this to an ID that does exist, right, we get the post properly and the status code changes to 200, which means everything is good. So that's one way of doing it. However, there's a slightly better way of doing it. Uh, same concept, um, but instead of hard coding the value or trying to remember it, what we can do is we can import um, from the fast API library, something called status. And so now instead of having to remember what to use, we could just type in status. And then it's going to show you all of the different HTTP codes. Uh, and so now you could just quickly just look through which one ever one sounds the most accurate. So we'll grab the 404. And now you don't need to worry about putting hard coding in a number. We can just reference, um, you know, I guess it's an, it's probably an enumerator, but I'm not really sure. So it doesn't really matter. Um, and then that's all you have to do. So let's test this out again. So 200 good changes to five, 404 perfect. Um, but the next thing I want to do is I don't want to return null. That looks ugly. So instead I'd like to actually throw an error. So in this case, uh, in this if statement, I'm just going to call a return that only is going to ever run if a uh, post doesn't exist. And we'll just say, uh, in this case, detail, or we'll say message. I'll just say message. F string, and we'll say post with ID. And then we'll pass in what was the ID. And we'll say uh, was not found. All right. And now if we try this. Look at that, we get our error, post with ID was not found, and that matches up with the ID that we gave it, and we got our 404. Now this was, uh, this is one solution. However, I think this is a little bit sloppy, and there's a better way of doing it. Uh, instead, what we can do is we can raise, raise an HTTP exception. So this is a built-in exception into Fast API that'll automatically, um, you know, you can pass in what the specific error code you want, as well as the message, and so that way you don't have to hard code all of this, uh, and it just makes everything look a lot simpler. So We'll go to the fast API up here and we're going to import something called HTTP exception. And now we can delete all of this nonsense code. Actually, I'm just going to comment it for now, just so I can reference it in a second. And all we have to say is we'll raise an exception. So we raise HTTP exception. And then we have to pass in two things. So first is the status code. So we'll set the status code to be status dot and then same thing, right? So far, nothing's really changed. And then here, we'll just pass in the value for detail, which is going to be the message that uh, Fast API automatically responds back with. And I'm going to pass in the same exact F string. And so now we've basically replaced this with just this one line right here, this HTTP exception. I think this looks a little bit nicer. 
I don't like having to do the set the response uh, and then having to pass in. Well, I don't like having to pass in the response into the path operation function, having to set a property and then having to return my message. We can remove all of this nonsense. And I can get rid of all of these comments. And I think this is just a little bit cleaner. And moving forward, we're going to be using these HTTP exceptions a lot because all we have to do is just pass in what's the HTTP status code and then the message we want to send back to the user. And then that's what's going to be sent to them. So now, once again, we're going to try this out. And look at that. All right, so we got the 404 and we got the message, uh, the detailed message. All right, a lot cleaner, a lot simpler. Now, before we move any further and before we wrap up this video, I did mention that anytime we create something, we should send back a 201. So if we go back to our create post and then we'll just create a new post again, we can just send this. We created a new post. Look at the status code that gets sent back. It's got, it gets sent back a 200 and that is wrong. Remember, anytime we create an entity based off of that documentation, we should send a 201. So how exactly do we send, how do we change what the default status code is for a specific path operation? Well, what we can do is we'll go back to our code and let's find our uh, create post. And if you want to change the default status code, uh, what we do is inside the, inside the decorator, we'll pass in another option. So we'll say status code here, and then we set this to be status and then whatever our specific status code is. So I want 201. And then that's all you have to do. So now, by default, anytime someone uh, sends a request to create posts, we're going to send a 201 created. So we'll save that and we'll give it another shot. If I try this again, now we get a 201. Perfect. So at this point, I think you guys will have a solid understanding of how to change status codes, whether it's because we're trying to throw an exception or if we want to just change the default status code of a specific path operation. All right, guys. So now it's time to move on to uh, deleting a post. So to delete a post, remember, we're going to start off with our decorator and it's going to request or it's going to require a delete uh, HTTP request, right? And then the URL is going to be the same. So it's going to be posts and then we're going to need the ID so we can figure out which post to actually delete. All right, then let's define our function. So I'm just going to call this delete post. And so here we have to implement the logic for deleting posts. So what are we going to do? Well, uh, for me, there's many different ways, you know, deleting a post is just a matter of trying to figure out um, which specific uh, dictionary within this array has a specific ID of whatever ID we give it. And then we just remove it from the array. So however you want to do it, go ahead and do it. I'm going to just show you the first way that I thought of. Uh, like I said, this doesn't actually have anything to do with fast API. This is more of just simply working with Python. So I'm telling you right up front, this may not be the most efficient way to do it. But like I said, we're eventually going to implement a real database. So it doesn't really matter how you do it as long as it works. And so the first thing that we're going to do is I'm going to look and to find uh, the index uh, in the array that has required ID. So we're going to look for what we're going to try to get the index of that specific item. And then all we're going to do is we'll do a um, my underscore posts dot pop and then just pass in the index. And so that's how we remove it from that array. Pretty simple. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually just define a function out here just to keep things simple. So this is going to be called find underscore index underscore post. And then we're going to pass in the ID that we're interested in. And then we're going to iterate over the array but we're also going to grab the specific index as we iterate over it. And so you do that by using enumerate. So this is going to iterate over it. We'll get the access to the individual post that we're iterating over as well as the index. And so we'll say if P, if the ID equals equals ID, and I forgot the in keyword here, we'll just return I. So this is going to give us the index uh, of the dictionary with that specific ID. So here we can just call that function and we'll set it equal to the index. So index equals find underscore index of post pass in ID. So we now have the index 
And at this point, I can just do a my posts dot pop and then just pass in index. And then we'll try to do a return. And then here I'm just going to pass in, uh, we'll say message. And we'll say post was successfully deleted. So let's give this a shot. So first of all, let's get all the posts. All right, if I do a get all posts, you'll see that we have two posts. And then I'm going to create a new request. And this will be called delete post. I'm just going to copy that URL, pass it in there. And so here I'm going to try and delete with a uh, post of a value of one. And I realized yeah, I still left it as get, so we're going to change the delete. All right, and so now it throws an error. So what exactly happened? Well, if we go back to here and then go back to our console, it says, it says none type object cannot be interpreted as an integer. And, uh, and I realized I forgot to actually pass in ID into our function. So that's why it was giving us that error. So now let's try this again. And we see that it, we get the message that says post was successfully deleted. That's good. However, um, you'll see that the status code is 200. And so if we actually go back to our status codes, you'll see that there's a uh, specific status code that we should be using for when we delete something. And that status code is a 204. And like I said, you know, you can read the documentation, but this is something that just, you know, comes with time of working with APIs. So you'll know that anytime you want to delete something, uh, you want to use a, uh, a 204. But before we actually do that, let's verify that it actually deleted it. So we'll go to get posts and I'll send a request and we can see that there's only one post. So it clearly did work. Um, but let's update the status code. So do you guys remember how to update the status code, uh, the default status code of a specific path operation? We just pass in status code into the decorator and then we'll do status and then we'll just get our 204. Now let's try to uh, delete something again. We'll try to delete, uh, where's my delete? We'll try to delete post one again. Let's see what happens. So you'll see here that we get the 204. So everything looks good. We didn't get any data back. And if we go back to our application, you'll see that we got a, an error, which says too much data for declared content length. And what's happening here is I actually had to look up this error. And that's because anytime you send back a 204, the idea is, is that since we delete anything, we shouldn't really be sending any data back. And so when we try to send this message back, fast API essentially throws an error saying like, listen, you're sending a 204, we should not be sending anything back. So that's how they kind of implemented fast API. Uh, and so the, what you should be doing is if you want to do, if you, what we should do is actually just delete this. We should grab the response and then just pass in status code status HTTP 204. Right, so basically we don't wanna actually send any data back anytime someone deletes something. We just wanna send a 204. And then one of the requirements for that to work is that we don't send any data back. Uh, I know it's a little confusing. Uh, if you actually just Google this error, uh, you'll probably get better explanation. Um, but 204, when you delete something, you don't wanna send any data back. That's kind of the expected result. So let's try this again. Let's send it. All right, so we got the 204, no data comes back and no errors. So that's all we have to do. So this is just something special that you have to do for delete uh, within fast API. Just keep that in mind. It's more of just a copy, a, a cut and paste type scenario. However, before we wrap up this uh, delete video, uh, we are still running into one tiny issue. If I try to grab a, uh, an ID that doesn't exist, let's see what happens. Well, now we get a 500 error and we get an error because well, none type object cannot be interpreted as an integer. So uh, since we tried to grab the index from this uh, find index post, it's going to return nothing because there's no post uh, that has an ID of five. So we get nothing. And then we try to pop with an index of none that creates an error. So we need to put in a simple if statement to actually catch that scenario. So we'll say if index equals equals none. So it'll return none if it doesn't exist. What are we going to do? Well, we're going to raise an exception again. So we can use that raise HTTP exception and we'll just say status code equals, uh, in this case, uh, we want to send a 404 like we normally do. 
So we'll say status.http404. And then we can send a detailed message. So in this case, uh, you know, we'll do once again another F string. And we'll say post with ID, pass the ID, does not exist. So let's try this out. Perfect, 404, post with ID does not exist. Let's just make sure we didn't break the original functionality. We delete it, perfect. And let's just double check there's no errors. There we go. So everything looks good to go, guys. Uh, so we'll wrap up this video. And then in the next video, we'll take a look at how we can update posts. All right, guys, we're almost done with all of our CRUD operations. The final one is update. So let's create a new request. We're going to call this uh, update post. And I'm just going to grab the URL from the delete post because it's going to follow the same exact structure. So we're going to pass the ID of the uh, post that we want to update. Now, since we are updating it, we need our front end, or in this case, Postman, to actually send the data uh, that we want to update with. So since we are working with posts and we take a look at our uh, structure of our posts, it's very simple. We just have title content uh, and then, you know, published as well, if you want to add that in ratings as well. And I'm actually going to remove that. So I don't actually want to have that. I'll actually, we'll keep it in for now. But we'll definitely remove that a little bit later on. And so if I go back to Postman, we can go to our body and then provide all of those fields. So we'll go to raw and then JSON. So this is just like when we were trying to create a post, we just pass that data in. And so here we'll get the title. And we'll give it a new title. So updated title. So this uh, this uh, this update request is go just going to update the title. Now we are going to use uh, the put method. So with put method, we have to actually pass in uh, the data for all of the fields, right? We want to pass in what the final post will look like after we update it. We don't just want to pass in the fields that we want to update. So if I go to let's say um, you know post one, right? We have the title, and then we have the content. So if I wanted to update just the title, right? I would make sure that I pass the content as well. So I'm just going to copy this. Since we're not updating, it, I'm just going to send back the same exact content. All right, and then this is going to be a put operation. All right, and so this is what the request is going to look like. Now let's go to our code and let's actually create our path operation for that. So here we're going to do app dot put. This is going to go to posts ID. And then we'll define our function. I'm going to call this update post. We're going to get the ID and I'm going to convert that to an int. Um, and then one other thing, right? Because we are receiving data from the the front end, uh, just like we did for creating a post, we want to make sure that it adheres to a very strict structure. So we have to use, so I want to use our schema again so that the, the front end can't just send whatever it wants to. Now I can create a new model called uh, class, you know, update post, and then we can pass in all the fields that we expect. However, it's going to be the same thing as the post because we expect a title content uh, and then um, any of the other fields, uh, depending on what we want ultimately, but it's going to be a post. So it doesn't make sense to create a new schema. We can just use the pre-existing schema. And so here I'm just going to pass in post and make this type of post so that it's going to make sure that the request comes in with the right schema. And then for now, I'm just going to hard code the return to be a, a message. And I'll just say updated post. And then here I'm going to do a print. Let's just see what the post looks like. All right, so we were able to extract all of that data, so perfect. Uh, and then what we're going to do now is uh, there's a couple of things. So first things first, 
I, I need to find the index uh, that of the post with this specific ID. So just like we did with delete, I'm just going to copy this. Actually, we can copy all of this right here because if that ID doesn't exist, we want to send a 404. So we can reuse all of that logic. But if we did find an index, that means we do need to update it. So what I'm going to do is uh, we're going to grab post underscore dict, which equals post dot dict. So that's going to take the data we receive from our front end, which is stored in post, and it's going to convert it to a dictionary. That's all it's doing. And then what I want to do is I want to set post underscore dict of ID to be equal to ID. So we're going to set the ID uh, inside this new dictionary to be that ID. And then we're going to say my underscore post. And then we're going to pass in the index uh, of the specific post we want to update and set that equal to post underscore dict. And then lastly, we're going to return, I'll say data, and then we're going to return our new post, which is going to be post underscore dict. So let's just quickly recap what's happening. So first of all, uh, the user is going to send a put request to the specific ID of the uh, post he wants to update. And we're going to just do a quick check. So we're going to see if we can find what is the index of that specific post within my, my, my posts array. If it doesn't exist, then we're just going to throw a 404. If it does exist, whoops, if it doesn't exist, it, we're going to throw a 404. If it does exist, well, first thing, we're going to take all the data we received from the front end, which is stored in post. We're going to convert it to a regular Python dictionary. And then we're going to add the ID so that this final dictionary has the ID built in. And then we're going to say, for the post within index, we're going to just replace it with our new post underscore dict. So that's how we update that specific spot in the array. And so let's give this a shot. So if I do uh, get all posts, right, we can see we have post one, and then the title is title of post one. And then let's go to our update, and we can see that we're going to change the title to be updated title. And let's see if that works. Okay, so it looks like it worked. Uh, we got back the new post, so let's do a get all posts again, and let's see if it actually did update. And we can see that it did, in fact, update. Now, just to, just to make sure everything else is good, let's also change the, uh, the content. So let's say this is the new content. Let's send an update. And then we're going to run this again, and we can see that the content is updated. So now we're able to successfully update each and every post. And that's going to wrap up all of our CRUD operations. So you can see that building out an API, building out your CRUD functionality is fairly straightforward within Fast API. Uh, we've got one more lesson where we're just going to restructure our code a little bit just to make things a little bit cleaner. And then we're going to start getting to the fun stuff, which is working with databases. So I'm going to show you guys how we can actually uh, get a Postgres database installed on our machines and running, and then we'll actually start saving data into an actual database. In this lesson, we're going to talk about one of my favorite features of Fast API, and that is the built-in support for documentation. So normally when you build an API, you're going to want to create documentation so that users know how to use it. And one of the challenges with that is that it's not exactly a simple process, and anytime you make changes to your API, you have to make sure that you update your documentation, and it's very easy to forget to do that. With Fast API, uh, Fast API automatically generates the documentation based off of the path operations that you've defined. So it does it all for you, and you don't have to write a single piece of code to actually get the documentation in place. And so to actually see the documentation, you just go to the normal URL, but you just do slash docs. And so this is going to show you the built-in documentation powered by Swagger UI. And so what's really nice is, and if you've ever looked at the documentation for our, um, some other APIs, you may have noticed something that looks similar to this, and that usually means that they used Swagger UI as well. So Fast API has built-in Swagger UI support, and it automatically generates all of the routes and the documentation for all of your paths. And so if you take a look at all of our operations, our path operations, we've got the one for getting all posts. We've got the one for creating posts. We've got the one for getting an individual post. We've got the one for updating an individual post as well as deleting a post. And what's really cool about this is if we do the hit the drop down, right, it's going to show you how to use this specific path. Uh, or how to use this specific API endpoint. So if you want to actually try it out, you can do that. So you could say try it out, and then you can just hit execute. Right? And so now it actually ran the query against our API server, 
and it shows us what the output is. So these are the two documents that we have, uh, or the two posts that we've created. And we can do this with all of the uh, uh, API endpoints. So if we want to create a new post, uh, it's going to give you an example of the data that we can pass in. So we can try try it out. And then it's going to give us all the fields that we have to pass in, and then we can just customize this. So if I want to say creating new post with documents, and then I'll just for content, I'll say oh, this is really cool. We'll give it a random rating. If we hit execute, right? It actually runs that. It's going to show you how to um, perform the same actions using curl as well. And then it's going to show you the data that we got back from our API server. And we can see that we got a 201 response code. And so I want you guys to just kind of play around with this. Um, get familiar with it. So there's going to be times where you may not even have to use a, a tool like Postman. You could just test things out uh, using Swagger UI and the built-in documentation. And what's even nicer about this is that uh, we have built-in support for two different types of documentation. So this is using Swagger UI, but if you use Redox, uh, sorry, there shouldn't be an S at the end. It's just Redox, right? You could see a different format of the documentation using a tool called Redox. Uh, so it's going to fundamentally do the same thing. It's just a different documentation tool. So it's going to look a little different. Uh, feel free to use whichever one you ultimately prefer. But uh, by having it automatically get generated by Fast API, you don't ever have to worry about updating anything. So if you take a look at like Create Post, right? We've defined the pieces of data that we need. And in the future, if we decide that the user needs to pass in another field, maybe like the date that they wanted to get published it'll automatically update this. You don't have to tell it. You don't have to manually go in and update it yourself. All right, guys, so we're going to make one slight change to how we structure our code. And what I want to do is, instead of just having my main file with, uh, within my base project directory, I want to actually create a folder called app. So that's going to store all of our application-specific code and then put that main file in there. So it's a very small change, but we do have to change a couple of things to make sure that it doesn't actually break anything. So I'm going to create a new folder. And I'm going to call this app. And so this, in Python, if you aren't too familiar with how Python works, uh, Python has a concept of packages. And a package is nothing more than a fancy name for a folder. However, for something to properly act as a package, Python requires you to create a dummy file. And this file is called underscore underscore init underscore underscore dot py. Right? And so that's going to turn this into a proper Python package. Just know that you have to add this file. You don't have to put anything in the file. But anytime you create a new folder, just make sure you create a file with this exact name. And that's going to ensure that uh, it is, in fact, a Python package. So now that this is an actual Python package, we can just drag this main file into our app folder. Right? And then now we're going to get an error. And that's perfectly OK. So we're going to cancel out of this. And I want you to take a look at the command that we run to start our application. So the command to start our application was we do uvcorn, we do the name of the main file, which is just main. And then in within main, if you take a look at what's the name of our uh, fast API instance, it's called app. However, now when we run this command line, uh, this command, it's going to look for a file named main. However, there's no file named main within our base project directory because it's now been moved into app. So to actually reference the main file that's inside of a Python package, it's pretty simple. You just put the name of the package beforehand. So you do app and then dot. So it's going to tell uvcorn to look inside the app directory for a file named main. So then we go in there, we see the main file. And then within our main file, we look for the app instance, which is our fast API instance right here. So let's give this a shot. Let's see if we broke anything. It looks like everything started up fine. I'm just going to do a couple of requests. So this is going to be just get an individual post. Looks like everything's good. I just want to make sure that there's no errors. And yep, everything looks good. So I think this is just a little bit better of a way to structure our application. We're going to put all of our app code moving forward inside of this app directory so that we can keep everything else separate. I think at this point, we have a basic understanding of how to work with Fast API and how to set up basic routes and work with path operations. Until now, we've been storing all of our posts in memory, and I think we've made it to a point where we are ready to now start working with databases. And so if you don't know what a database is, a database is a collection of organized data that can be easily accessed and managed. 
Uh, and so when it comes to any kind of application related data, so things like users that have registered, posts that have been created, all of these pieces of information are going to be stored within a database. So it's going to be stored on disk so that we can retrieve this information at a later point in time. Now, when it comes to databases, we never actually interact with the databases directly. Instead, what we have is a database management system that's going to sit in the middle. So when we want to perform an operation on a database, we're going to send that request to a database management system. That management system is then going to actually perform that operation, and then it's going to send the result back to us. So we never talk to the databases directly. Instead, we have a piece of software that sits in the middle and uh, acts as the brains behind the database. Now, there's two major branches of databases. There's relational and NoSQL databases. Relational databases are usually SQL-based databases, and we're going to cover that uh, in the next slide or so, but these are just some of the more popular relational and NoSQL databases that you guys have probably heard of. In this course, we're going to uh, work exclusively with relational databases, and more specifically, we're going to work with Postgres. Now, if you ultimately want to learn how to work with MySQL or Oracle or SQL Server or any of the other databases, Keep in mind that at the core, uh, they are fundamentally no different than Postgres. You know, 90, I would say 97% of the things that we cover when it comes to Postgres is going to be almost identical in all of these other databases because they all, at the end of the day, use SQL. Uh, however, SQL, there is a little bit of slight uh, nuances when it comes to each database. Each of them will implement it in a slightly different way. So you'll see that certain um, SQL commands aren't available in others. But for the most part, all of the core things that we cover from a SQL perspective, is going to be applicable to any of the other relational-based databases. Uh, and so let's talk about SQL now. So SQL, or Structured Query Language, is a language that's used to communicate with the database management system. Uh, and so, you know, when we want to perform an operation, we're going to send a specific SQL statement to the database management system. It's going to then take that statement and then perform the operation on the database, and then it's going to send that result back to us. So SQL is the language that we use to communicate with the database management system. Now, in the next video, what we're going to do is we're going to install Postgres on both Windows and Mac, depending on what you're using. And there's an important thing to note when it comes to installing Postgres or really any database. When you install an instance of Postgres, uh, what we can actually do is we can carve out multiple separate databases. Right? And this is kind of confusing at first because you're thinking, well, we installed Postgres, we have a database. Yes, but what we can do is we can actually create two different databases that are completely isolate, uh, isolated and have nothing to do with one another. And that way, uh, if I have uh, application one, we can create a database just for app one. And then if I have a second application that I create, this application can have a separate database as well. And there, these two databases are going to be completely separate and completely isolated so that they don't step on each other's toes. So it's pretty cool and it's a pretty awesome feature to be able to kind of carve out your Postgres instance to multiple databases. And keep in mind that you don't necessarily always create uh, a separate database, in, uh, database instance for each application, right? There are scenarios where you might actually create an app that's going to make use of more than uh, one database instance within Postgres. Uh, however, those are very specific situations, maybe if you want some sort of multi-tenancy or things like that. However, we're just going to create one individual database instance for our application that's going to handle everything that we need. Now, when we install Postgres, what's going to happen is that uh, the installation process is going to create a database uh, within the Postgres instance called Postgres. A little confusing, right? It's Postgres within Postgres, um, but it's actually going to create this database named Postgres. And the reason we need to do this is that if you ever want to connect to a Postgres instance, uh, what you have to do is you have to specify a database that you want to connect to. So some kind of default database that you want to connect to, you can't just connect to Postgres, you have to specify a database. And so that's why the installation process creates one database for you so that you can have something to connect to. However, we won't necessarily need that instance once we create our own. However, I usually just keep it in by default because it's not going to hurt anyone. In this video, we'll take a look at how we can install Postgres on a Windows machine. So let's go ahead and just search for Postgres. And it's almost always going to be the first instance. So just go to uh, postgresql.org. And then we can just select the Downloads button. Here, go ahead and select Windows. And then up here, just select the Download the Installer link. And so here, you'll see all of the downloads options. So right now, the latest version is 13.4. So I'm going to just download that one. You may see a newer version. Feel free to download that. Nothing's going to really change between each version. 
Once that's downloaded, start the installer. If you see this pop up, just select yes. Right, with the installer open, select next. Uh, you can leave the default installation directory. No one usually messes with that. Now here you can select the different components that you want to install with your Postgres instance. So uh, for the first thing that you have is the Postgres SQL Server. That's obviously what you want to download. The next one is PG Admin. So this is a GUI that can be used to manage your Postgres instance. We're going to be using that to actually manage Postgres. So you want to make sure that you've got that downloaded. Stack Builder, this is a um, an extra feature that can be used to install extensions and extra features within Postgres. We're not going to be installing any of those extensions, so there's no need to have Stack Builder. However, it's not going to break anything if you do leave it checked. And then uh, we'll, we won't be using any command line tools to manage Postgres. However, go ahead and just leave that checked just in case, you know, down the road you actually do want to use it. All right. And then once again, leave the default data directory. Uh, then you have to pass in the password for the super user. So uh, make sure you remember this password. Then you got to specify the port that you want your database to be listening on. Uh, the default Postgres port is going to be 5432. You can change it if you want, but you have to make sure that you update uh, everything else uh, when it comes to creating our code uh, to update that port number. I'm going to leave it as default as do most people. And then just hit next on this window and then next here, next, and then it's going to start the installation process. And once that's complete, just hit finish. And then, like I said, we're going to be using the PG admin GUI software to manage our Postgres instance. So if you just search for PG admin, you'll see that it's right there. Just select that and open it up. And then uh, at that point in the next video, we'll start taking a look at how we can use that to not only uh, create individual database instances, but also create tables and things like that. In this video, we'll take a look at how we can install Postgres on a Mac machine. So let's search for Postgres in Google. And the first result should be the one that we're looking for. And within the Postgres website, just select the downloads button. And this is going to show you the different platforms it supports. So we're going to install this for Mac. And then select download the installer. And then here we can see all of the versions that we can download. We're going to download whatever the latest version is. So in my case, it's 13.4. If you're watching this video in the future, it's probably going to be some other version, but it should all be relatively the same. So we'll just download under Mac. All right, and once it's finished downloading, just go ahead and select the DMG file that you downloaded, and then we'll set up the installer. And if you get this pop-up, just select open, and then specify your password. With the installer window open, select next, uh, leave the default installation directory. Uh, now within here, uh, by default, it's going to install four different components. I'm gonna walk you through what each of these components does. The first one is the Postgres uh, server. So this is the actual Postgres database. So we definitely want to install that. Below that is PG admin. This is a GUI that can be used to manage your Postgres databases. We're definitely going to install that because that's what we're going to use in this course to actually manage our database. Stack Builder is an extra, um, almost like an extra installer that's used to uh, install extra extensions that give Postgres some extra functionality. We're not going to use any of those extensions. So go ahead and uncheck Stack Builder. And the last one is command line tools. So we can manage Postgres through the GUI as well as the command line. Uh, in this course, we're going to stick exclusively to the GUI. However, I would still recommend downloading the command line tools just in case you ever do want to use them. And then specify the default data directory. That's fine. Then you want to give uh, the password to your Postgres instance. So this is kind of like the root user equivalent. Here we specify what port we want our Postgres instance to run. This is the default Postgres port. Uh, if you want to change it, you can do it, uh, but just make sure that, you know, whenever we get to actually coding out our uh, API and specifying what port we connect to the Postgres database, make sure you update those accordingly. However, I recommend just keeping it as the default. And then everything else, just keep hitting next, and then it'll start the installation. All right, and once that's complete, just select finish. It's going to be, uh, at that point, Postgres has been successfully installed. Then what you want to do is just hit the little search icon. And I want you to search for PG admin. All right. And so if you want to open up PG admin, which we'll cover in the, either the next lecture or the lecture after that, just search for it, select it, and that's going to open up the GUI tool used to manage your database. Before we get started with configuring our Postgres database, there are a few things that we need to cover. 
And one of those things is the concept of tables. And this is a very important concept when it comes to working with relational databases. So a table represents a subject or event in an application. Uh, and so what exactly does that mean? Let's use a example. Let's say we're building out a e-commerce application. Right, you're going to have a table that represents each part of your application. So you're going to have a table for all of the users that have registered. You're going to have a table for all of the different products that you will plan to sell on your website. And then you're going to have a table for things like purchases and reviews. So each table represents a different subject or event in an application. And what's amazing about these tables is that all of these tables are going to form some sort of relationship. That's why it's referred to as a relational database. And if you think about it, right, the tables that we have listed right here, they're all going to have a very basic and obvious relationship, right? Purchases, right, when a user purchases something, that automatically implies a relationship because every purchase order has to be associated with the user account that actually filed that purchase order. And a purchase order is going to have a list of products that the user wants to buy. So we could see right there, all of the tables that we have already formed some sort of relationship. And it's really important that when you design your database, that you figure out what are these relationships beforehand so that you can design a very efficient database, right? Just like if we're building a social media application, right? We are, you, we know we're going to have a table for users. We're going to have a table for posts as well. And we already know that there's going to be a relationship between the two because every post has to be associated with a user because users create posts. So you can see that, you know, all data has some sort of relationship with one another. Now, when it comes to tables, we have columns and we have rows. A column represents a different attribute. Uh, and so if we're building out a table for users, we would create a column for, for the name. So this column represents the name of the user. We might create a column for their age, their gender, you might create another column for the email that they use to sign up. You might have a column for uh, their billing or shipping address, right? It's up to you to figure out what are the different attributes we need to model a specific user. Then we have rows. Rows are very simple, right? Each row represents a different entry in the table. So if we have a user's table, then each row represents a unique user. So row one, this is the user, uh, Vanessa, Row two is going to be the user, Carl. So each row just represents a different entry within the table. Now, databases have data types just like any programming language. And the reason why this is important is that when you create a column within a table, you need to specify what kind of data type you want to use. And that decision is going to be ultimately based off of what attribute this column represents. Uh, and so we have data types uh, just like any other programming language like Python. And so if we were building out a table for you know, social media posts, one of the things that we might have is a column for what are the total number of likes or retweets. And so for something like that, you would want some sort of data type that's numerics, you know, a data type that models numbers. And in Python, you know, we have two main data types. We have integers and we have floats. Integers being whole numbers, floats giving you decimals. Well, Postgres has the same thing, right? It's going to have integers, it's going to have decimals and a few others. Keep in mind that uh, you don't need to worry too much about that. Just understand that there are numeric data types within Postgres that are just like Python. So when it comes to the number of likes of Postgres, you know, maybe we would use something like an integer because we're not going to have a half a like or anything like that. Then if you're trying to model, uh, you know, someone's name or email or address, right, we would use some form of text. And within Python or any programming language, you have strings that allow you to represent text. Within Postgres, we have the same thing. It's just called something different. We have uh, varchar, which is just short for varying character, which is once again, just a string fundamentally. And then we have text, right? They're both going to do the same thing. Don't worry too much about the differences. Just understand that Postgres does allow you to work with text, just like any other programming language. It's just called something different. Uh, and then uh, for Booleans, Postgres and Python, they both support Booleans. They're going to work the same way. It's either true or false, very simple. Uh, and then within Python, we have lists. So anytime you want to model, uh, you know, multiple instances, so a list of something, uh, we have arrays within Postgres. And you'll see that when you work with relational databases, you'll see that arrays aren't used very, uh, very much because a lot of times if you're using an array, it may be better to take that column and just convert it into its own table. Um, but like, like I said, you know, don't worry too much about that. We'll go over that in some upcoming, uh, upcoming lectures. When we create a table, we have to specify something called a primary key. And a primary key is a column or a group of columns that uniquely identifies each row in a table. 
So what exactly does that mean? Well, we need to tell Postgres essentially how can we uniquely identify each entry in our table, each row. Uh, and so we have to give it a special column that ensures that every entry uh, for that specific column is unique. And keep in mind that we can only have one primary key per table. You can't have more than one. However, a primary key can span multiple columns. However, let's keep things simple for now and just assume that primary keys are really just one column. And so a lot of times when you create a table, what we have is a column for a unique identifier. So anytime you create a new user, usually you're going to have an ID associated with that account, and that ID is going to be unique. Uh, and so the ID associated with John is going to be 77498. And that's how we uniquely identify uh, each user based off of that ID. And so it makes sense to select that as the primary key because we already know that each ID is going to be unique. So it fits the perfect definition of what a primary key is, right? And so the only requirement for something to be a primary key is that each entry must be unique, no duplicates. We can't have this same ID for another user. And so you're probably thinking at this point that, hey, we're going to create an ID column for every table and then make that the primary key. And I'm going to tell you that that's not quite correct. The primary key doesn't have to be the ID column always. In fact, your table doesn't even have to have an ID column, right? It's up to you to decide if you actually want to have that. There are certain instances where you may not want an ID column. Uh, and so you know, if you don't want to use the ID column or if you don't have an ID column, you need to ensure that you have some column that's able to uniquely identify each and every entry. And so one good example of that when sticking to the user's table example is that generally in an application, a user can only sign up with an email once. So we know that an email is always going to be associated uniquely with one account, right? We can't have two users with the same exact email. That's not going to work. That's usually not allowed. So we could definitely use our email column as a primary key. But there's plenty of other examples, right? Phone numbers, right? Generally, I can't sign up with the same phone number uh, for two different accounts. So we know phone numbers are going to be unique. Uh, for the guys that are in the United States, you know what a social security number is. Two people can't have the same exact social security number. Uh, and so there's a lot of different things that you can use to choose for the primary key. Uh, just keep in mind, it's not always the ID. So that's the main thing I wanted to focus on in this slide. Now, as we go through creating our table uh, and creating each of the individual columns that represent a certain attribute for uh, that table, uh, we can add in extra constraints for each column. So we can put in extra little conditions. And so we already talked about the column that's going to be the primary key. And we know that the primary key has to be unique for each and every row. But what happens if we have another column that isn't the primary key, but we want to ensure that each and every entry has a unique value for that specific column, right? So take a look at the name column in this case. Let's say that we, we won't allow two users to share the same exact name. Is there any way we can tell Postgres to perform that check for us? Well, we can add in what's called a unique constraint. So we can, when we create the table, say that I want to make this column unique by adding the unique constraint. And so that way, anytime I add in a new user, it's going to check the name and it's going to check to make sure that there's no other users with the same exact name. And if there is, it's going to throw an error. And we can do this with any column. Uh, you can do it with all your columns if you wanted to. Uh, that's not necessarily something you're going to do, but I just want to make sure you guys understand that, you know, we can perform extra checks for each entry um, by adding in a constraint. The first constraint that we covered is the unique constraint, but there are plenty more. Now, the next constraint is called the null constraint. And when it comes to creating columns, uh, by default, Postgres allows you to leave a column blank, essentially. So I can add in a new user and I can say that um, I can leave the name column blank. So instead of having Vanessa for the first one, I could just leave it blank and not put any data in. And so what Postgres will do is it'll put in a value of null because we didn't provide it. And I could do the same thing for age. I don't have to pass in an age by default and I don't have to pass in a gender by default as well. And it will put in a null value for each and every one of those. But let's say we want to tell Postgres to perform a check and say, hey, I don't want you to be able to create a user that doesn't have an age. So what we can do is we can put in a constraint and this constraint is called a not null. That means we are not going to allow it to be null, right? We are not going to allow Postgres to use a null value. So if we try to add in a new user called Carl and we don't give it an age, well, Postgres sees that this column is not allowed to be null and it's going to throw an error because it's not null. So that's the second constraint. And I think these are the two main things that I want to focus on. And I think at this point, we have a good enough understanding of the different things that we can do with tables, columns, and rows 
that we can go ahead and start playing around with Postgres and really digging deep into how tables are created and how they work. In this video, we'll start taking a look at PG Admin, which is the GUI that we use to manage our Postgres instance. We'll take a look at how we can define our tables for Postgres. We'll take a look at how we can create entries in our database, as well as how to modify and delete them as well. So go ahead and search in your, under your applications for PG Admin. And you'll see that once it pops up for the first time, it's going to ask you to set the master password for PG Admin. And it's important to understand that this password is for the PG Admin GUI. It has nothing to do with the password that you created during the Postgres installation. This is strictly for PG Admin itself. And the reason it asks for a password is that ultimately we can store our passwords for connecting to our different Postgres instances within PEG Admin so that we don't have to enter it every time we want to connect to our database. And so that's why we have to create a master password so that we could store all of the individual passwords for all of our Postgres instances. So uh, I'm just going to create a, a random password in this case. And keep in mind, it does not have to match the password that was created for your Postgres instance. These two have nothing to do with one another. Now, the first thing that we want to do is specify the connection details for connecting to our Postgres instance. And what's nice about PG Admin is that we can, it'll remember all of the servers that we've ever connected to so that we don't have to manually input this information every time we log in. Now, PG Admin has done a little bit of the work for us automatically. So if you see under the server section, this is where we define our individual Postgres instances. Just hit the little uh, drop down arrow and you'll see that there was a server called Postgres SQL 13 already created for us. So by default, when you install Postgres, we know that we're going to have a local Postgres instance running on our local machine. So it's going to automatically set up the connection details for that instance. The only thing you have to provide is the password for connecting to that instance. And so now we want to pass in the password for the Postgres user for the Postgres instance. And this password isn't the password that we just created a few seconds ago. This password is the password for Postgres itself. So this is the one we created during the installation process. So go ahead and put that in there. And then you can choose to save this password so that you don't have to re-enter it. Uh, I'm just going to skip that for now. And so now it's taken that password and it's now connected to our local Postgres instance. And so you'll see a little bit of information uh, about uh, things like, you know, what's the sessions, what are the transactions per second. So you'll see a, not, a lot of nice little pretty charts. However, I want to make sure that you guys actually understand how to define a new server instance. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to create this from scratch. So I'm just going to select this. We're going to select remove server. And we're going to do this straight from scratch. So I'll do create server. Let's give this a name. I'm going to call this um, my local Postgres instance, because that's what it is, local Postgres. Then we have to specify the connection details. So here we give the IP address uh, that the Postgres instance uh, runs on. Uh, because this is running on our local machine, we can just say local host. However, if this was running uh, within AWS or some cloud provider, uh, that cloud provider would, have, would provide you a pass, sorry, an IP address or even a domain name to connect to. And that's what you would specify here in this case. But since we're connecting to our local machine, we just say local host. Then here we give the Postgres password. Uh, right when we did the installation for Postgres, we used the default port, so that's why we could just leave this as 5432. Uh, and then as I mentioned, when we connect to Postgres, we always have to give it a the name of a database to connect to. We always have to provide the name of a database to connect to. Since this is a fresh installation, the only database that's going to be there is going to be a database named Postgres, so it's going to connect to that by default. Uh, then we have to give the username and password. Uh, and we haven't created a user yet. So there's always one default user. This is a super user. And the username for that user is always Postgres. A little confusing because the database name is Postgres. The name of the actual DBMS is Postgres. And then our username is also Postgres. So try not to get all three of those things um, uh, confused. Uh, then we here we could save in our password. So this is where we put in our Postgres password. And then if you want to save this for a future so that you don't have to enter in every time, you can go ahead and do that. And at that point, hit save. And then you can see that once again, we created this from scratch. Now within PG Admin, there's going to be a lot of menus, a lot of things that you see, and you may be a little overwhelmed, but I want you to keep in mind that a majority of the stuff we won't really even care about, right? So when you focus on just the things that we care about, you'll see that there aren't many things involved when it comes to PG Admin. And so, like I said, within a Postgres installation, right, we're going to have uh, individual databases, right? So we can create a separate database for each of our applications. So under our server, right, you'll see a section called databases. So this looks a little interesting. Let's click this. Right, and then if we 
drop this down or expand this, you'll see that we have our one default Postgres instance that was created for us during the installation process. Uh, now, we're not going to touch this. We're just going to leave this there. But let's create our own Postgres instance. So right-click on databases, hit create, and then database. And then here we just want to give the database a name. I'm going to call this, uh, I usually just name it after my application name. So since this project is called Fast API, I'm just going to call this my Fast API database. And you'll see that there's a couple of other windows. Uh, we won't touch any of these. However, go to the last section right here where it says SQL. All right, and as I mentioned before, SQL is the language that we use to actually talk to Postgres. And you know, since this GUI is here to manage Postgres, it's going to make our life a little bit easier. But at the end of the day, uh, it's just passing in SQL statements. And so because we created a database through the GUI, um, it's kind of abstracting a lot of the SQL away from us. However, what's nice about PG Admin is it's going to give you the underlying SQL uh, that's used to actually create this database. So we could see that it's just a command that says create database, and then the name of the database we gave it. Uh, here it's just specifying the owner, the encoding, and the connection limit. Uh, technically, we could remove all of these lines and just take the, uh, the semicolon and just put it right here. Uh, and then we can just do create database fast API, and that's how you do it through the command line. Um, I think it's just nice and helpful uh, that it provides this for us. However, ultimately, we won't need to do that because we do have PG admin, so we can do it all through the GUI. And uh, you know, if you guys are worried that we're not going to cover SQL, believe me, we will. But I just want to make sure we start off um, by you know taking a look at the GUI, learning it the easy way, then we'll learn how to do it the harder and proper way. Um, but once we got this set up, go ahead and hit save. And you'll see that we have our a new database right now there's an x but if as soon as you click on it it's going to turn yellow which means that we have now successfully connected to this database and then under this database you're going to see a lot of different options and like i said we're not going to touch most of these instead the only thing that we want to focus on is under schemas so under schemas and then under public and i'm going to move this over for you guys uh, you'll see that there's one important section called tables. So this is where we actually create and define our tables. So right click this. And actually, if we do it, if we hit the drop down, you can see there's no tables, but that's to be expected because this is a brand new database. And let's go ahead and create our first table. So we'll do right click, create, and then table. And then let's give this our table a name. So let's say we're sticking with the whole e-commerce example. So we're going to create a table called products. So this table represents the different products that we're going to sell. Don't worry about any of these other fields. Uh, it says the owner is Postgres because we're logged in as the Postgres user. However, uh, you know, if we logged in as a separate user, that, then you'd see the owner get updated accordingly. If we go into the column section, this is where we define our column. So this is where we're defining what is referred to as the schema of the database. So to add a new column, just hit the plus icon. Uh, and so now the first thing that we need to do is let's figure out what attributes does a product need? And, uh, you know, a product is going to need a name. So let's give it a name. Uh, and so we'll call this column name because it represents the name of a product. All right, then we have to give it the data type. As I mentioned, there's going to be different data types that closely resemble or match the data types of a programming language. So a name is going to be, you know, a certain amount of text, right? So we need whatever data type represents text. And so we've got a couple. All right, we do have text, uh, and then we also have a varying character or character varying. This is the one I'm going to ultimately use. So we're going to select character varying. And if you actually want to see the difference between these, I recommend you go uh, online, search, search for Postgres data types. All right, and then just, it's usually chapter eight of the documentation. You can select this, and then this is going to give you a breakdown of the different data types. And it's going to break it down based off of, you know, numeric types. We've got a uh, date time, a uh, booleans enumeration enumerated. We've got uh, you know if you want to represent IP addresses, we've got a data type for that. So there's a ton of different data types. Uh, definitely take a quick read over all of these. However, we're just going to stick to the basics. So uh, if you don't want to go through all of that, then we'll we'll stick to just the core fundamentals for now. So anytime we're working with text, we're going to use character varying. And then as I mentioned, we've got a couple of uh, options. So uh, we've got the not null, uh, and so right now it's set to no, which means that technically we can uh, leave this entry blank. So we can create a brand new product with no name at all, and then Postgres is going to put in a value of null if we do that. But if we think about our application, right, would we really want 
uh, to be able to create a product without a name doesn't really make sense. So I think we should set this to be yes so that it actually throws an error if we try to do that. And you'll see a flag for a primary key so we get to specify which a column is ultimately our primary key. I don't think the name of a product should be a good primary key. We need the primary key to be a column that really emphasizes what makes each entry unique. And I don't think the name actually does that. So we're going to leave that set to no for now. And we're going to add a new column. All right. And this time we'll add in, uh, let's say, the price. And so now we have to specify a data type. So for numeric data types, we have an integer, which is going to be whole numbers, which probably isn't a good data type for prices because we need decimals. Um, we do have uh, numeric. Uh, and there's a couple of other ones. Uh, so if we go back to our documentation, and hit um, numeric types. Right, we've got numeric, so this uh, allows us to specify uh, also decimals as well versus integers. And then we also have floating point types as well. Either one of these can be used. The, they operate a little bit differently, but both of them will work. But since, we, since I want to keep things simple, and I don't want to confuse you guys too much, I'm just going to use an integer to define a price. And I know technically there's no application that would ever use an integer to represent price, but you know I want to keep this simple. And uh, I actually want to show you guys something unique. Uh, so you see that there's a couple of different types of integers. We have, first of all, a plain old integer. We've got a small int, and then we've got a big int. So what is the difference between all of those? Well, it's the number of bits that we have. So a small int has the fewest number of bits, which means that the maximum number we can go to is going to be a lot smaller versus a traditional integer. And then if we need to go up to a really high value, we're going to use big int, uh, which is going to have the most number of bits. And if you want a good explanation, just search for what is the difference between big int versus int. Right? And so we can see here the difference between them is you can see the minimum value and you can see the maximum value. And so uh, I think that's what minus 2 billion to 2 billion. So we get it in the negative and the positive direction versus a big int, which is nine, negative 9 to 9 billion. So you got to figure out what's the best fit for you. If you don't, if you don't think you'll even hit uh, 2 billion, then there's no reason to go to a big int. So I'm just going to leave this as a plain integer. We could definitely get away with the small integer, but let's not worry about that. I don't think we're ever going to have a product that's going to be $2 billion, but that's fine. All right, and then once again, um, we have the not null option, so uh, it doesn't make sense to create a product that doesn't have a price, so let's make sure that's not nullable. Uh, and then the length and the precision, this is for um, floating points, so you can say, like, how many decimals do you want to support it for? Um, for an integer, though, it, it shouldn't matter, and it looks like I didn't properly select this. We'll do integer. All right, and then the last thing that we need is um, each product should have a unique ID, uh, right? And a lot, like I said, a lot of our tables are going to have an ID column. So here we're going to create a column called ID. And so what kind of data type should we use for this? Well, I think what makes sense is an integer, right? An ID is just going to be some random number. So we could use int, big int, or small int. Uh, and so let's just say we'll use an uh, integer. I'm going to search for integer. However, I don't actually want to leave it like this. Um, I did mention in one of the previous lectures that uh, most databases support the ability to automatically generate a ID for you. So I don't want to have to be, a, be the one responsible for creating an ID and then putting that information into Postgres. I want to just provide the name and the price, and I want Postgres to generate a unique and random ID for that product. So how do we do that? Well, it's pretty easy. There's a, uh, there's a data type called serial. Uh, and so a serial is just a regular integer. However, it automatically creates a random number. And it's actually not a random number. What it does is it, the first product we create will get a value of one. The second one will get a value of two. And it'll just increment by one for each product we add. So it's going to ensure that every single product we create gets a unique integer value for the ID column. And like I said, you know, we do have, uh, you know, small ints, big ints, and regular integers. This is the same thing, but it's just auto incrementing uh, for those three kinds. So I'm just going to say it's going to be a regular integer that increments by one automatically. And then this is going to be what's going to be the primary key, right? Uh, we know that the ID has to be unique. I think that makes sense to make it the primary key. And I think for now, this is a good enough starting point um, to learn about SQL and Postgres in general. So let's save this, and we have then successfully created our first table. And so under tables, you'll now see our products table. 
So let's start playing with this product table. Let's create entries. Let's delete entries. Let's really start to have fun with it. Uh, so right click on it and select View, Edit Data. And then you can really select any one of these. If you select all rows, what it's going to do is it's going to fetch every single entry that we have in the database and show it to you. We don't have anything in the database, so it doesn't really matter. Uh, if you select first 100 rows, it's going to grab the first 100 rows in the database. And if you select last 100 rows, it's going to grab the last 100. Now, if this was a production server or something like that, we might have millions of entries. So you may not want to do all rows and then just get flooded with all of this data. So you may want to select one of these or filter out the rows based off of some criteria. But we have no actual data on it, so I'm just going to select all rows. And you'll see that within um, PG Admin, we have these different tabs. So it opened up a new tab, and you see that there's like a little pop-up window. So if you can pause it and rewind, it says that it actually ran a query. Uh, and so what it did is it ran a query to retrieve all the all the rows because that's what I selected, right? I select I selected you know get me all of the all of the rows by selecting all rows. And if you look at this query editor right here, this is the actual underlying SQL that it ran. So it ran select star from my products table, order by ID in an ascending fashion. So it's going to grab the first product with the lowest ID number and the next product with the second lowest ID number, and it's going to keep incrementing up. We've got nothing in our database, so it didn't return anything. But I think it's cool that it does show us the underlying SQL. Now, like I said, we don't have anything in our database at the moment. So let's go ahead and create our first entry. Uh, and so I'm going to create, select this column, and I'm just going to give it a name. So this is going to be, a, let's say, a TV. And let's give it a price. I'll say this is um, $200. And then the ID, this is going to be automatically generated, so we don't need to provide a value. Uh, and so at this point, you may be thinking, well, it looks like we created an entry, right? We have our TV price of 200. Well, not exactly. To actually store this data in the database, right now we're just proposing changes. We have to select this button right here. So if you hover over this, this says save data changes. So when you select this, this is actually going to push this data into the database. So let's do that. You can see that the data was saved successfully. And now it's actually in here uh, in the database. So let's create a new entry. I'll say this is a DVD player. I don't know if anyone uses these anymore. And then let's give this a price. I'll say this is uh, $80. And then we can, we can just keep adding as many as we want. So let's add in a uh, remote. This is going to be 10 bucks. Right, and you'll see that uh, anything that's kind of bolded, so you notice how TV isn't as bolded as DVD and remote. So bolded means we haven't actually pushed it out to the database. It's just proposed changes. So we can push out both of these at the same time by pressing this again. So we push that, and then you can see that they got pushed out. And take a look at the ID column, right? The first item got an ID of one, the second one got an ID of two, and then three, and it just keeps, it's just going to keep incrementing. Now let's have a little fun. Let's create a new item. This time let's create, let's make it a microphone or something. And let's leave this price column blank, and let's see what happens. So now if I press this, take a look at this error, null value in column price. So we left this value empty. So Postgres interpreted as null, but we set the column to be not null. So we, we told Postgres to do a check and say, hey, listen, if we ever don't provide a value, we want you to throw an error. So this is forcing us to provide a value for this because creating a product uh, without a price just doesn't seem to make sense. So let's give this a price. Save that. And so now that worked. And then this time, let's try creating a product with a price. Um, but no name this time, All right? So what do you expect to happen? Well, since we set the column to be not null, it's going to throw an error, or it should hopefully. And look at that, null value in column name. So once again, it's not going to be supported. It's going to throw an error. So let's just give it a name. Let's say this is a car, the world's cheapest car. Hit OK. Save that. It's been successfully added. All right, so now that we've kind of played around with it a little bit, let's make this a little bit more interesting. And let's add in a brand new column to our products table. So right click on the products table right here and select properties. Then under columns, we're going to add in a brand new column. So we're just going to follow the same steps. And this column is going to represent if an item is on sale. So I'm going to call this is underscore bull. Sorry, not is underscore bull. It's going to be is underscore sale. And it's going to be a simple Boolean as the data type because it's either going to be set to true, which means that the item is on sale, or false that the item is not on sale. So we'll do Boolean. Uh, and then everything else we're just going to leave 
uh, we're de by default. So for not null, we're going to leave this to be no. So we are going to allow the user to input a value of null in this case. However, what we're going to do is we're going to add in uh, an extra constraint, I guess. Uh, actually, we're not going to, we're going to set a default value. So uh, if the user does not provide a value for is underscore sale, we're going to give it a default value and say that by default, if a product doesn't receive a property for is sale, it's going to be set to false. So it's not going to be on sale. So let's hit save. All right. And then um, right now you don't see a new column, but that's because you don't see the new is on sale column, but that's just because we need to refresh this page. So let's go under object. I think we could do it here. Uh, I think it should be a refresh. I didn't do anything. So I think we're just going to do the same thing as we did before. Uh, there should be a way to refresh this, but it looks like if I just press it here, it doesn't do anything. So uh, instead, I'm just going to do a view, edit data, all rows again. It's going to open up a brand new tab. And now we can see the is underscore sale a column here. And what's awesome about this is that because I provided a default value, it went to all of the other items in my database that didn't, that were created before this column was created. And it provided a value of false because I said, listen, if, if the value is null or if we didn't provide that data, go ahead and put in the default value of false. And so now if I create a brand new item and I'll say this is for a uh, pencil and the pencil is probably only $2. Now, since this uh, can be set to null, I'm going to just leave that blank. And now if I save this, take a look at this, it gets the default value that we provided. So uh, you'll see that for a lot of your columns, you're going to want to provide default values if you expect it to be frequently uh, inputted without a value and you want it to receive a default value. And now once again, I'm going to actually create a brand new column once more. And then we'll go to properties. We'll go to columns. And then we'll add a column. And we'll call this column inventory. So this is how many of the items that we have in stock. Uh, and so here, I'm, this is going to be an integer. And uh, I think it makes sense for in our application to have a, a value for our inventory. We shouldn't leave it null. So I'm going to set it to yes. And I want you guys to see um, what happens when we hit save. Because the big issue is, right, this column doesn't exist at the moment. And so all of these items were created before there was an inventory column that was created. However, this column has a not null value, but it doesn't have a default value. Right, we gave is sale a default value, so Postgres was smart enough to go into all of these pre-existing items and give it a value of false. Well, what's going to happen with the inventory? I didn't give it a default value, so let's see what happens. If I hit save, it throws an error. It says column inventory of relation products contains null value. So it's basically saying all of these products that you had before don't have a value for inventory. So at this point, um, you know you have a couple of different options. Uh, you could delete your all of the the previous products if you wanted to um and since this is a development environment that's not a big deal if you're in a production environment that could lead to issues obviously you, you don't want to delete your production data um so we could just give it a default value like we did before uh, and so i can just go back into const whoops not there we want to select this little button go into constraints and we'll say the default value is um let's say there's going to be zero items so let's hit save and once again, uh, I'm just going to open this up. I still don't know how to refresh it. I know there has to be a way. Uh, I can't find it, so it's okay. We could just open up this again. And then we can just delete these. I don't want too many of these. And I don't know why it's got squished up like that. But because we provided a default value, uh, it, all, it got all values of zero. And so now if I create a brand new item, and I'll call this, and this will be a pencil sharpener. We'll give a price of $4. Is sale, I'll set to be true. Set to true. Uh, and then if we don't provide an inventory, all right, it's going to get that default value of zero. All right, so I think we've almost wrapped up our schema for our products table. However, I want to add one more thing, and this is uh, something that's pretty common. Uh, anytime you create an entry within almost any other table, you usually want some sort of timestamp, right? So what, when did we add this product? When did this user uh, create his account? When did this user uh, create this post, right? So anything that we add into our database or in our application, it is generally 
best practice to store uh, when that item was created because you never know when you need to know that information. So let's create another column and let's see how we can work with timestamps. So I'm going to right click on products as usual, go to properties, and then under columns, we're going to add in a new column. And we'll call this column created at. Uh, and then here we have to select uh, something that represents time. So uh, what I recommend you guys do is just go to the documentation uh, and then um, look at uh, date time types. So there's a couple of different ones, but what we're going to do is uh, timestamp with time zone. So we got timestamp without time zone and then timestamp with time zone. We've got just the date and then we've got just the time, but I want the date, time, and the time zone. So that's the most detailed. So I'm just going to search for timestamp and we want timestamp with time zone. All right. And we obviously want this field always filled in. Um, however, I don't want to have fast API be responsible for creating the timestamp. I want Postgres to automatically create the timestamp for when the entry was created. So I want to be able to just create a product. And then as soon as it gets added to our database, Postgres will just fill it in with whatever that current time is. So how do we do that? Well, we can go into this right here. So let's configure this, add a constraint. And then here, all we have to do is for the default value, I want you to just write now. So what this is going to do is uh, the default value for any product that gets added, uh, it's going to run this specific command on the CLI. So this command just grabs what is the current time. Pretty simple, right? Now, uh, I think it's pretty straightforward. What is, what time is it now, right? Uh, and so this will set the default value. So if I hit save at this point, all right, since we had all of these other items that were created previously before there's a timestamp, what it's going to do is it's going to set the created at time to whatever time it is now, um, which technically that's not accurate because that's not when they were added, but these were created before we were smart enough to actually have a timestamp. So uh, if we refresh this, so I'm just going to do a view edit all rows again. All right, you can see that they've all been given the same timestamp of whatever that current time was. And now if we add in a new item, and I'll add in, how about a keyboard? We'll give this a price of 28. Is sale, we can just leave that empty. How many in our inventory? We'll give it uh, 50. And then we'll leave this blank. And so let's see if, the, if it automatically fills in what is the current time. And it should be later than this time, obviously. So we'll hit save. And so if we just double check, yep, we can see that this is uh, about a minute later. And so now we've successfully added the created at timestamp. In this lesson, we'll run our first SQL command. However, before we do that, what I want you guys to do is create a few more entries within your database. Uh, and so you could see that off camera, I added about, you know, six or seven more entries. And you want to make sure that you provide enough um, varying data to your database. So make sure, you know, the price is all different. Make sure that the is sale boolean is, you know, a good mix of true or false. Make sure that the inventory numbers vary enough. And then try to create them at different times as well, if you can do that. Uh, that way, when we actually go to make queries, we can see a variety of different output. And that won't happen if you only have three to four entries. But once you do that, we should be ready to start our first query. And what we want to do is right click on your database. So my database is called Fast API, and then select Query Tool. So that's going to open up a brand new tab. And what we can do is we can run our query from here. So here we type out our query, and then we just hit the play button, and that's going to run our query. So how do we make a query within a SQL database? So first of all, let's start off with the most basic query. I'm going to type it out. And then after we type it out and run it, I'm going to explain to you exactly what each part of the command actually does. So here we'll do select star from products, colon. Then once we've typed this out, what we can do is just hit the play button and let's see what happens. So this is going to run the query. We got the same output here saying that it successfully ran. And it says 13 rows affected. Uh, and so what we can see here is it just printed out every single entry within our uh, products table. Now, we only have one table, so it's essentially just dumping out the entire database. But if we had more tables, uh, you would see that this would only print out whatever was in our products table. So this command right here does one simple thing, and that is it's going to give us every single row within the products database. So let's actually break this down. So first of all, we start this command with select. So we're basically saying, hey, I want to select these rows. Uh, ignore this for now. We're going to come back to this. And then what we do is we run from and then products. Uh, and so you say what table you ultimately want to run this command for. So you say from and then the table name. 
and then it's going to run that query against that table. If we had a table called users and we wanted to get every user, we could do select star from users. No different, right? So it's just a matter of providing your specific table name. So every query is going to be with regards to some table. And the thing about SQL is every single command is going to end with a semicolon. So if I don't put the semicolon, uh, it's not going to do anything. Well, in this case, it actually ended up working, but that's just because we're using PG admin. If you did this in the command line, it wouldn't have worked. So remember semicolon at the end of every command. Now let's talk about what this uh, star or asterisk actually does. And so you can see by default, we get every row and that's coming from this part of the command. Um, but what does this do? Well, uh, if you see here, we, we get every single column back from our table, right? And that's because we use the star here. However, uh, in an actual database, your tables could have 50 columns, maybe more. They could have a ton of columns. And if you're running a simple query to get, you know, some specific information, you may not want to get all of that data back. You may not care about most of the columns. You may only want one or two columns. And so we can filter out what columns we want returned back for each row. So the star means I want every single column. So we got every single column that we defined for the table. But if I wanted to run a query against the products table, but I only wanted a list of the different names of each product, I can specify just name. And so what this is going to do is this is going to grab just the name column uh, from my products table. So if I run this again, you can see we got the same exact data. We got all 13 entries, but it only returned just the name column. And then we can add in as many columns as we want. So if I wanted uh, the ID column as well and the price, I can hit run. And so now we got the ID and the price. And what's really nice is it's going to line up with the order that I write them here. So if I want the ID first and then the name and then the price, I could change this to ID, name, price. And so now it's gonna order it in that, in that exact order. So we got ID, name, and price. But if you do a star, it's just going to return every single column. Now, before we dig any deeper into SQL and how to structure SQL uh, commands, I want to talk about capitalization. Uh, and so you'll notice that when I ran this command, uh, the word select and the word from is capitalized. Uh, and I want to make this very clear. Capitalization doesn't matter. So if I make this lowercase and I make this lowercase as well and then hit run, you'll see that everything works just fine as it did when it was capitalized. So capitalization doesn't matter. However, with a, any SQL statement, we have uh, two types of words. We've got SQL specific keywords, which is part of the SQL syntax. And then we have our user provided information. Uh, and so let's quickly talk about what those two things are. So the user provided information is keywords that I'm inputting in. So I'm asking SQL uh, or my Postgres database, I want the information from my products table. So I'm passing in this data. And so that one, you just, you have to make sure you just match this up with whatever it's called within our table. But all of the SQL specific uh, words that I don't create that don't match up with anything in our database, right? Those can be either capitalized or lowercase. It doesn't matter. It's not going to impact your SQL statement, but you will see that best practice is to capitalize it. So we'll do capital select and then capital from. And the reason we do that is that we can much easier tell which parts of our SQL statement is user provided information and what parts of our SQL statement is just basic SQL keywords. So this just makes it a little bit easier to read. You may not notice the benefit of it now, but you'll see that these SQL commands can get really long. They can span multiple lines. And so having those keywords capitalized, it makes it a little bit easier to understand, but keep in mind, it doesn't actually impact how the command, how the SQL statement actually runs. So it doesn't matter. But if you want to follow along with what I do, I like to capitalize them. Now with SQL, uh, what we can do is when we perform a query, we can rename any of these columns. So if we find that this name is a little inconvenient and maybe uh, you know, renaming it makes it a little bit easy on our backend code to better interpret the data, we can pick any column we want and rename it. So let's say we're trying to fetch the ID column. I'm just gonna run this. We can see we grab the ID column and it's named ID. But let's say uh, this confuses our backend because we're retrieving uh, maybe data from another database that also, uh, you know, for users or something. And then we also have an ID field and we don't want them to get mixed up. I can rename this column and we can rename it by using the as keyword. So I say ID as, and then specify the new name. So I can name this uh, products underscore ID. So now if I run this, we can see that the column is now products underscore ID instead of just ID. And I can do this for any and as many columns as I want. So if I wanted to rename the 
is sale uh, column, I can save it as on sale. And so there you go, guys. It's really as simple as that. Um, keep in mind, I kind of continued with my normal SQL uh, format uh, of capitalizing the SQL specific keywords just because it makes it a little bit easier to read. All right, so let's clean this up a bit. I'm just going to change this back to star so that we can retrieve uh, every single column. I'm just going to run that just to make sure nothing's broken. And so till now, we've been retrieving every single entry in the table. And that's because we've provided no filter criteria, no filter condition. So let's figure out how we can filter the specific rows that we want based off a of certain criteria. So let's say I want to match all entries that have a specific ID of something, right? And we know there's only going to be one entry that has a specific ID because the ID field is a primary key. So we know that two different items can't have uh, the same exact ID, but you'll see one of the more common tasks when it comes to working with databases is uh, retrieving a, a row based off of a specific ID. So, you know, a lot of times our backend will be like, hey, I want you to retrieve the product with an ID of 10. So how do we do that? Easy. We add the keyword where, then we specify the column that we're interested in uh, that we want to match on. So we're going to use the ID column. And then we say ID equals, and then we pass in the value. It really is that simple. So if I want the ID of, and so if I want to get the product with an ID of 10, I just pass in 10. And remember to make sure you have the semicolon at the end, hit run. And look at that. We've now got our product um, that has the ID of 10. And then keep in mind, just like we did before, we can filter down based off of just the fields we want. So if we want just the ID and the name, we can do that. And it should work just fine. We'll change this back. And run that. And so we got that. Uh, if we want to grab the ID of product with an ID of three, run that. And so now we get the product with an ID of three. But what's nice about this is that we can choose any column to match on. So uh, let's say that uh, I first dump everything so I can just see what I've got. And let's say I want to match on uh, any product that has an inventory of zero. So that's basically saying like, which products do we not have inventory of so that maybe we can place an order? Well, we can just say where. And once again, I'm capitalizing the SQL keywords. And I can say where inventory equals zero. And so now we've got, we've got a list of products where we need to place an order. It really is as simple as that. Now working with numbers, you just place the number. So any column that uses integers or floats or anything like that, you could just say equals that. However, if you want to match based off of name, uh, the name column, it's going to be a little bit different because the name column uses, you know, varying characters or text or, you know, what would be a string in Python. Uh, and so for those, what we have to do is, first of all, we'll use the column name equals, but we have to wrap it in quotes, single quotes to be specific. So if I want to get the uh, prog with, uh, with the name of TV, I have to put in single quotes, search for it. And then now we get that. So keep that in mind, because if you remove the quotes, I believe you should get an error. Yep, and you do get an error. So just make sure when it comes to working with varying characters or any kind of text, you want to wrap it in quotes. Now, just like with most programming languages, we do have operators. And so till now, we've just been working with the equals operator. So if I need to get, um, you know, any product that has a price of, you know, 20, I would just say where price equals 20. And I don't look, it looks like I don't actually have any items with the price of 20. So I'm just going to do 200 because I see that the TV is 200. So if we run that, it works just fine. However, what if instead of doing this, I want to retrieve all of the items that have a price uh, of greater than 50? How do I do that? Well, it really is fundamentally no different than how we do it in Python. So I could say where, and I'll say price is, and then we have greater than 50. So this is going to grab any item that's basically 51 or higher. And it's not inclusive, so it doesn't include 50. And so now look, it looks like it grabbed all of the items that cost more than 50 bucks. Um, but if I wanted to say greater than or equal to 50, I can say just greater than or equal to 50. If I run this, we can see once again, it works just fine. But uh, I don't have any products that are priced at 50, so I'll try this again with just 80. So we'll say greater than 80. It should not return this one because 80 is not greater than 80. So we can see the 80 is gone, but then if I do greater than or equal to, we can see the 80 is back. And we get the same thing with the less than and less than equal to. So I could say less than 
80. And I could say less than or equal to 80 as well. And then the last operator that I want to discuss is the not operator. So if I wanted to grab any product that does not have a uh, inventory of zero, I can say where inventory. And we have two different ways of doing this. I can say not equals. So this is kind of the similar syntax that you see in some other programming languages, not Python, but um, other programming languages. I could say not equals and then zero. This is going to give me every product that we do have adequate stock for. And so now we see we get no columns or sorry, no rows with an inventory of zero, but we can also use this syntax. So the greater than, sorry, the less than, and then the greater than. If we run that, we should get the same exact result. All right, so let's move on to uh, performing multiple operators. So let's say I want to grab any item that we have inventory of. So any, any item that has an inventory greater than zero that also costs more than $10. How would we do that? And I'm sure you guys can probably take a guess at this, but we'll do inventory greater than zero. And then how do we add that next statement where we say greater than, I forget what I said, greater than 20. So we could just say, and simple as that. We do and, and then we pass in the next criteria. We'll say, and price is greater than 20. Let's try that out. And I realized I forgot the where keyword here. So that's why it's throwing an error. All right. And so now we got every single product that has an inventory greater than zero and a price of greater than 20. And just like with an and operator, we also have an or operator. Uh, and so if I want to see any product that is either uh, greater than $100 or less than 20, I can say where, uh, where price is greater than 100 or price is less than 20. And so now we can use two criteria, and as long as it matches one, one or both of the criteria, it's going to return that result. All right, let's clean this up a bit. And let's say I want to retrieve uh, products with an ID of one, two, and three. How would I do that? Well, I can do uh, where, where ID equals one, and then we'd have to do an or statement, and then we'd say ID equals two, or ID equals three. If we run this, it should grab just those three items. Now there's another way to perform this kind of operation. Uh, and instead of using all of these uh, ID equals one, ID equals two, and then just combining them with or statements, we can use the in operator. So let me explain how the in operator works. What we can do is we can say ID in, and then we can provide a list of values. So I can say one, two, and three. And once again, I forgot the where keyword. And so you'll, if you run this, you can see that we got the three items and you can see that that's way more readable instead of having to type out that entire command. And let me show you the previous command. I shouldn't have deleted it. So I'm going to use this scratch pad just to show you guys. And so it, before we did where ID equals one or ID equals two or ID equals three. So which one do you think is more readable? So both of them do the same exact thing. However, one's a little bit easier to read and it cuts down on the number of keywords that you have to type. Now, we, before we proceed any further, I'm just going to retrieve all my databases, sorry, all my entries once again. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a few items. And, and so all of these items are going to be named uh, very specifically. So I've got a TV items. Uh, and so I'm going to call, I'm going to create one called TV blue. And then let me give this a price. And then everything else I can leave default. And then I'm going to create a TV red. And then a TV yellow. And then I'm going to save these to our database. And uh, oh, I forgot to give it a price. We'll just say all of them cost. Actually, let's give them different prices. So this one will be 200. Yellow, no one likes anything that's yellow. So I'll give it a value of 50. And we'll save to our database. All right, so that's in our database now. And we know how to filter based off of items. Uh, and we can use the where keyword and we can do it for even columns that are based off of characters, like the name column. Yeah, so let's say that I want to retrieve everything, uh, all of my TVs. So this TV 
this TV, this TV, this TV. How would we do that? Well, we can't exactly use the where statement because I can say where, name, and then, I mean, we have equals, we have greater than, we have less than, but none of those really do what we want to do. Uh, so how can we match just on all of our TVs? Well, we can use our like operator. So we could say where, name, like, and then what we can do is we can pass in something very specific. So um, we pass in the text that we want, but then we can start using things that are kind of like regular expressions, uh, like we have in Python. So I could say TV and then percent sign. And what this is saying is that I want to grab every row that has a name that starts with TV and then the percent sign means any random characters afterwards. So this is just saying I want any product that has a name that starts with TV. So if I run this, you can see that we were able to grab all the TV. So it's very similar to re regular expressions. And uh, if I remove this and instead just uh, you know, add in the letter A, this is going to return all of my products that start with the letter A. And I don't have anything, but if I change this, I know I have one product that starts with an R. So if I try that, you can see that we get the remote. And we can also flip this. So I can say, you know, percent sign and then pass in some letters at the end. So if I want to grab anything that ends in the letter N, I can run that. It looks like I've got nothing that ends in the letter N, maybe E. Right? And so now we get all of the items that end in an E. Right? And then we also have the ability to do the opposite. So this matches anything that ends in an E. But if I want to get every line that doesn't end in an E, I can say not. So that's just going to give me the opposite. So that's going to give me every row except for those two rows. And what we can also do is if I want to get any line that has the letter EN somewhere in the name, I can do the percent sign before and after. And so we just look for these two characters anywhere in the name. So if I run this and it looks like I got an error and I'm not sure what happened there, but I changed this. I, I just deleted it and retyped it. And so now it no longer gives me an error. So I'm not really sure why that happened. Um, could be a bug of some kind, or maybe there's a typo I didn't see, but this is going to grab any text uh, that has the letters E N, and then it can have any characters before any characters after. And then since we have the not operator, then it's going to um, do the exact opposite, but then I can also remove this so I can grab any lines that match just this. And then it looks like once again, I get the same exact error. Okay, there we go. Now, when we make a query to our Postgres database, we can also specify how we want to order the results. Now, by default, it looks like it's just going based off of uh, the ID, but it's not necessarily going to be like that. And so it's better to actually tell Postgres how you want to order the products. So in this case, I've got no filter criteria. I'm just returning everything. And let's say I want to filter or order the, um, the products that are returned based off of price. So if I say order by, I can then specify the price column. So let's see what happens when I run this. All right, we could see that it looks like it starts at the lowest price and then works its way up. So by default, when you specify the order by, um, keyword and then specify the column, it does it in an ascending order. Uh, and so you could specify the order at which you want to go, uh, the direction, I guess, by saying ASC. So this means ascending. So this shouldn't change anything because Postgres by default is going to always do it um, in an ascending order. So if I run this, nothing changes. However, if I want to do this in a descending order, I can say DESC for descending. So now it's going to start at the most expensive price and then work its way down. Now let's change this and let's say we want to order by inventory and I want to see which products we have the most of. So I'll say inventory and then descending because we want to start at the highest value and work our way down. So I'll run this and then we can see it starts at the highest one and then works its way down, but we've got a whole bunch of zeros. Uh, and let's say that between these guys, I also want to uh, specify a tiebreaker of some kind. We can also uh, specify the order uh, using a second column for these tiebreakers. So I can pass in another column. And so let's say that anytime there's a tie, I wanted to then order it by, uh, let's say price. So I'll say price. And then we'll say uh, the cheapest price. Uh, so ascending. Now ascending is always the default, so we can just delete that keyword. And so let's run this now. And I forgot to put a comma. So after each uh, column that you want to sort by, you have to do a comma. And so now we got all of our data. And so let's take a look and see if this actually works. So we can see we're sorting based off of inventory. Then we get down to zeros. So 
these are all tied. So we take a look at the second column that we pass. In this case, we're looking at the cheapest price. And so if we see the first one, it looks like the cheapest price is two. Then it goes up to four, 10, 30, 40, 50, 80, 100, 200. And you can pass in as many columns as you want uh, for your uh, sorting criteria. You don't have to just stick with two. And it's really just a matter of doing a comma and then passing in the next column and then whatever the criteria is. And you'll see that one of the common things to do is, let's say we want to get um, the most recent products. Well, I think it makes sense to just sort based off created. So that's the timestamp for when the product was created. So let's see what was the most recent products that were put into our database. We can just say created underscore at. And what order do you think we need? Do we need ascending or descending? If you don't know, think about it. And if you still don't know, test it out. That's the easiest way to find out. So we can see that the first one is, remember, this is always going to default to ascending. So when it's ascending, we can see that there's a one at 820. It was created at 820. And then the bottom ones are created at 821. So it looks like this starts off with the oldest one and then works its way up to the most recent one because that has a later date. You can think of the later date as a higher value. So if we want the, you know, the most recent products first, we would do descending. And so now we've got the most recent products. And with this order, uh, with the sorting property, remember, we can just chain this on to any SQL statement. So if I also wanted to, uh, you know, uh, get all of the products that have uh, a price of greater than 20 and then sort it by something, I can just specify my where keyword and say where price is greater than 20. And then for all of those results, I want to order by uh, who was most recently created. So we'll search that. And so there you go. And so that's the great part about SQL is you'll just keep chaining these different SQL keywords to uh, filter out the exact data in the exact order that you want. Now, in an actual production environment, our tables could have millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of rows. And so it would never make sense to just perform a query like this where we just dump everything because then all of a sudden we're asking our database to send back 100 million rows. And that's just unacceptable. And our software that we're using to even send the query may not even be able to handle that. And so usually you want to provide a limit of some kind. So you may want to say, hey, I want to grab, uh, you know, the first 10 rows that match this criteria. Well, we can do that by using the limit keyword. So we say limit and then pass in the number of rows that you want. So if I run that, you can see that we get 10 rows. If I lower this to five, we can get this, uh, we can get five rows. And you can chain this on to any SQL expression. So let's say I wanted to grab all of the products that have a price of greater than 10. Right, if I search that, you can see I get 10 results. And let's say I want to limit this to only the first two results. So if I hit that, you can see that now I get two results. So uh, all the keywords that we're covering, uh, including the order by uh, and any of the filter expressions, we can just keep chaining on to our SQL statement to further specify exactly the data that we want. Now with limit, there's another keyword that I want to cover. Uh, and so let's say that I want to grab all products and I want to order by ID. All right, so this is going to return it like it normally does, and it's ordered by ID. And let's say I want to set the limit to be five. So now we get um, products with an ID of one, two, three, five, and seven. Do I not have an ID of six? I'm just curious, actually. So let me cut this out for a second. I just want to see if there's an ID of six. There isn't. Okay, so that's, that's expected. So let me add that back. So we'll say So I'll do order by ID, and then we'll limit it to five. So we have the first five. Now let's say that we want to skip a certain number of rows, because every time we search this, we're going to get the same result. And let's say that we don't actually care about the first two results, and I want to skip past them. We can provide an offset. So I'll do offset two. And so what that's going to do is it's going to skip past these two first two results and then give us the next five. So we should see the first result be remote then microphone, then car, and then the two after that come after that. So if I search this, we can see that that first one is a remote and the last one is the pencil sharpener. And then if I do an offset of, um, you know, five, it's going to skip the first original five. And so then we get pencil, pencil sharpener, and keyboard. 
So you're going to see that, you know, when it comes to limit and offset, these are going to come in handy when we start implementing pagination in our API. We're going to definitely make use of the limit and offset keywords. Till now, we've been using PG admin to create new entries in our database by just going into the little GUI here and then just adding new values. However, when you're actually working with the Postgres database, you're never actually going to do this. This is more for administrative purposes, but a real application is going to use SQL. Just like we use SQL for making queries, we're going to use SQL for adding new entries. So let's take a look at what the command looks like for adding a brand new entry into our database. The command starts with an insert because we're going to insert a brand new row. And then we say into, and then we're going to specify the table that we want to add a new entry to. Now in our database, we only have one table, so it's going to be products, but here you would provide whatever table you'd like to add a new entry into. Right, then we have to do, uh, what we have to do is provide a list of columns that we want to provide data for. Uh, and so I'm going to leave this blank for now. We're going to come back to that. And then we specify values. And then here we're going to actually provide the values for each column. And so if we take a look at our products database, uh, we know that the name is required. We know the price is required. Uh, and then that's about it. All right. We can choose to provide an is sale, but it's going to default to false. And then we can choose to provide an inventory if we want to. If we don't, though, it's going to default to zero. So we have to provide a name and a price. And it's ultimately up to us to decide what we want to pass in. So we know we need a name. And we know we need a price. Now, let's say we're going to let Postgres uh, automatically give us the default is sale value to be false. So we're going to leave that out because we're not going to pass in any data. So this column is just for all of the columns we want to pass in data. But let's say we want to give it a custom inventory value instead of just defaulting to zero. Here we would provide inventory. And then in the values column, these are going to be the values that you want to actually provide for the name, the price, and the inventory. So let's go ahead and provide that. So let's create a brand new item. So let's give it a name. Uh, and the order in which you pass things has to match up with the order that we pass in here. So the first column that we're going to provide a value for is name because it's the first one here. So what name should we give it? And keep in mind, since it's text uh, or varying character, we're going to have to put this in quotations. And let's add in a tortilla. So now we're a grocery store. All right. And then the next one is going to be the price. So how much is our tortilla going to cost? Uh, we'll say it's $4. And then finally, we have to provide an inventory value. So let's say we're going to have a thousand tortillas. And then as usual, you want a semicolon. All right. And so at this point, this is all we have to do to create a brand new entry. So let's hit run and let's see what happens. So query returns successfully. Uh, and so we see this insert zero one. And so at this point, it says insert zero one and then query returns successfully. So did we actually successfully insert that something into our database? And more importantly, what exactly does this mean? So if you see insert 01, that means everything worked perfectly. There was no errors. What this means is that, first of all, ignore the zero. So this means uh, that we're using the default Postgres configuration. So this represents the OID, but I believe Postgres by default doesn't use that unless you specify it to. So it's going to give a value of zero. And don't worry too much about that. That's kind of outside of the scope of this course. We're not going to mess with that. But instead, what we want to focus on is that second column. So this means that we inserted one row. So that means our insert worked perfectly. So let's take this. And what we're going to do is, first of all, I'm going to copy this. Cut it out, actually paste it into my scratch pad for now. And then we're going to say select star from rows. Sorry, select star from products. And we're going to run that. And so if we go to our bottom, we should see our brand new tortilla. And so we provided the tortilla value, we provided the price, and we did not provide an is sale, so it defaulted to false, and then we provided an inventory. Now, if I copy this again and paste it back into here, right, and if I move the name column right after the price, well, now SQL is expecting me to provide the value for price first, then name, then inventory. So then I would have to take the price, move that over to the first column, and then move that, move that into the first entry, and then we have the name and then the inventory. And so keep in mind, the order here has to match the order here. So once again, I'm going to go ahead and just add this again, because why not? Uh, and so now, oops, it looks like we have an error. What happened here? All right, there we go. I guess we just needed that space. And so now it's in there. And you'll notice that once again, we get the zero one. So that means everything was inserted properly. So now we should have two items in our database with the name of tortillas. And when you're working with 
with Postgres, uh, and especially with a, an API where we want to create a new post, like in our application, the general convention in an API is once we create the new post, we want to return that data back to whoever sent that request to the API. So we want to get that brand new, brand newly created post with the new fields like the created at field and all the default values and send it back to the client or the front end. So how do we get Postgres to automatically return it? Because right now it doesn't seem to do that. And we could, you know, just provide two statements, right? I can add in a second statement that says select star, you know, from products. Uh, this is going to dump everything we could potentially, you know, filter on, you know, where name equals, you know, tortilla or something like that. And then at that point, we should have three entries, but uh, that's one way of getting back the result. However, there's a much easier way within Postgres. So first of all, I'm going to change the name. I'm going to add a new item and say this is a car, and I'm going to give it a price of 10,000. And what we can do is we can pass in a keyword called returning. So this is going to return the newly created item or items if you want to insert more than one item. And then here we have to specify the columns that we want for the newly returned items. So if I do star, that's going to return every single column. If I do ID, this is just going to give me the ID of the brand new, brand new created uh, item. I'm going to return every single column. So if I try this now, look at that. So it creates the new entry. We can see that it has an ID of 26 and it gives back the entire row. Now, if you want to insert more than one row at a time, what we can do is we just do a comma here after values and then just provide the data for the next row. So we'll do, um, we'll create a new item that had cost $50. And this is going to be a laptop. And then we'll say there's going to be an inventory of 25 of them. And then if we wanted to add another one, then we could just do another comma and then add some more values in. So we'll give this a price of 60. This is gonna be a monitor. And then we'll say we have four of those. And so here we can then go ahead and run. You can see that it added three items and then it returned all three because we have the returning keyword. And if you wanted to, we could just say, I want the ID. We could just say, I want the ID and the created at field maybe the name as well. If I run this, we can see it created another three new items and then it returned just those three fields. And so that's pretty much all I wanted to cover when it comes to creating new entries in the database and inserting new rows into a table. All right, so in the last lesson, we learned how to insert new entries into a database. Let's now figure out how to delete entries. So let's clear out this query real quick. And the command to delete a entry from a database is going to be delete. Who would have thought, right? Delete, then you say from, and then you provide the table that you want to delete a row from. So we'll say products. And then we want to specify conditions. So what is our match criteria? What rows do we actually want to delete? So we have to tell SQL, I, I want you to delete this specific row. So what do we usually match on? Well, if you take a look at our API, uh, our specifically our delete endpoint, uh, the user provides the ID of the product they'd like to delete. Or I guess in our application, it would be uh, the ID of the post we'd like to delete, but we're working with products. So we'll say, you know, just like with a regular select query, you say where, and we can say ID equals, and then the ID of the product we want to delete. So let's take a look at one of these products. I'll grab a product 10. And then let's run this. And then afterwards, let's actually do a select star from products so we can see all of the products afterwards just to verify that the ID uh, of 10 or the product with an ID of 10 got deleted. So you can pass in as many uh, um, SQL commands as you want here. So we'll run that. And so it ran. And then we can see that we um, the product with an ID of 10 was deleted. Now, I'm going to change this to 11 because there's no longer a product with an ID of 10. So I'm going to delete this product. Uh, but what we can do is we can tell Postgres to actually give us back the specific entry before it's deleted so we can see what that looked like. So we could just pass in the returning keyword just like we used uh, with the insert statement and then we specify the columns we want. So I'm going to say all of the columns and then if we run this we can see that it deleted uh, the product with an ID of 11 and we can see what that product looked like. And keep in mind if I don't pass any of this data and I just run this 
right? You'll see that it says a delete of one. So this is just telling you how many total rows it deleted. Now, let's say that we want to delete multiple products based off of a criteria. So let's say uh, we want to delete any product that has an inventory of zero. How do you do that? Same exact command. We just have to match on any product with an inventory of zero. So let's say delete from products table where, and then we'll just say inventory equals zero. So this should delete every single product with an inventory of zero. If we run this, we can see it deleted eight rows. Let's just do a select star from products. And you can see we no longer have any products with an inventory of zero. All right, so we saw how we can insert new data into our table, and we saw how we can delete entries from our table. I think the next logical step is to figure out how to update a pre-existing row. So the command for updating is going to be, as you guessed, update. And then we have to specify the table that we would like to update. Uh, and so in this case, it's going to be the products table. And there's going to be two things that we have to pass in. So first of all, we need to specify which entry we want to update. We can update more than one entry at a time. But you know, just like when it comes to deleting, uh, if you take a look at our API that we built so far, the user provides the ID of the specific post they want to update. So normally, we're going to update based off of the ID column. So we'll say where, you know, just like a, the select statement or the delete statement, we can say where ID equals and then the specific product of the ID and the specific ID of the product that we want to delete. So let's say we want to delete one of the tortillas. So an ID of 25, sorry, not delete, but update. So we'll say 25. Then we want to pass in all the columns that we want to update. So we pass in the name of the column and then what the new field should be. So let's say the name column, I want to rename this to be uh, flour tortilla. And then let's say I also want to update the price. So I could say the price equals and then 40. So right now the price is four and the name is tortilla. It's going to now be flour tortilla and 40. If I run this and don't forget the semicolon at the end. And I realized I forgot one keyword. So before you pass in all of the new values, we have to use the keyword set. So it's update products, then we want to set these columns. Then I run this and we can see that we updated one field and I'm going to copy this, put it in my scratch pad for now and just do a select star from products. And so if we take a look at our tortilla, so now it's called flour tortilla, we can see the ID is still the same because we didn't change that and the price got changed. However, all the other fields have all remained the same. So that's good. Um, but just like when it comes to inserting new data, uh, we generally want to return the newly updated product to the user. So how do we do that? We could just use the returning keyword. So I'm going to copy this again. And let's update a different product. So I'm going to update the car, which is a ID of 30. And let's just say I want to update one field. I'll, I'll remove all these and I'll just say I'm going to update the is underscore sale field to be to set it to true because right now it's set to false. We'll set that to true. And then we can say returning star. If we update this, we can see that we now got the car. We can see that the is sale set to true and it returned that data and it was successfully able to update that. Now let's say we want to update multiple rows. And let's say I want to update, uh, we'll just, let's just update everything, right? So if I don't pass in a specific condition, I can update every column or I can specify a condition uh, and then uh, update just those columns. So let's, let's say um, I want to match any, uh, any product with an ID of uh, 15 or greater. So an ID of greater than 15. And I want to set the is sale to be true. So if I run this, we can see all of the entries that it was uh, that it updated. So now all of these entries, which all have an ID of greater than 15, have all all have the is sale column set to true. And so that's how we update entries within a Postgres database. At this point, I think we have a good enough foundation when it comes to working with Postgres. We're able to successfully query a database, insert new rows, delete rows, and update rows. 
So I think it's time we finally started uh, to go back to our code and figure out how we can actually work with a database within a Python or a fast API application. But before we do that, I wanna do a little bit of cleanup. So uh, with our database, we no longer need our products table. So what you can do is you can go ahead and delete it. So you can just right click and then hit uh, delete or drop. Uh, technically, if you don't wanna delete this and you wanna keep it uh, for now just for reference, you don't have to delete your table. It's not going to impact anything else. So you can keep it, but I'm gonna go ahead and delete it because we don't actually need it anymore. So we'll just do that, hit yes, and then it's going to delete that and we should no longer have tables. And I'm also gonna move over to another machine. So uh, when we go to the other machine, you will see a whole bunch of other databases, but those are all databases from my other project. Make sure you just focus on the fast API database. All right, I'm back over to my new machine. You'll see that if I uh, take a look at my database, there's gonna be a whole bunch of other databases but I've got my main fast API database. So that's what we're gonna be working on. Don't look at any of these other ones. And within here, it's gonna be pretty much empty. I've got no tables. And so we're gonna go ahead and create our table for our uh, social media application. So, uh, you know, we've been working with posts, so I think it makes sense to create a table for posts. And before we do that, we have to figure out exactly what are the columns for our specific table. And to do that, I think it's best to actually take a look at what our application looks like at the moment. And so if we actually take a look at a structure of a post, we know that it's gonna have a title. We know it's gonna have a content. Uh, we're gonna, we know it should have a um, attribute called publish to determine if it's published or not. We're gonna get rid of this rating. That was just for demonstration purposes. So I'm gonna remove that for now. So it should have a title, content, published. And like any other item uh, when it comes to a database, uh, we're gonna have an ID column as well so that we can, we can uniquely identify each entry. And then we're also gonna have a created ad field to see uh, to track when the specific post was added to the database. So we've got essentially five columns. And then once we have that, we can go ahead and just do what we did before. We can go to tables, we can hit create table, and then we're gonna call this table post because it represents our social media posts. And then we'll go to the column section and start defining our columns. The first one's gonna be our ID column. And so with our ID, we want to do serial. So this is going to cause it to be an integer that automatically increments for us. And then that's gonna be our primary key as it was before. We'll add in another column for title. This is gonna be a varying character or character varying. Not null is gonna be set to true. We, can't, we don't wanna be able to create a post without a title. Uh, then we're gonna have a column called content. I believe that's what we called it here, content, yep. Uh, once again, this is gonna be uh, character varying. And once again, this is gonna be not null. Uh, then we're gonna have a published column. And this is gonna be a Boolean. Uh, this is also going to be not null. However, I'm going to provide a default value. So if I do leave it blank, it's gonna to default to true. And then finally, we're gonna create the created add column. And this is gonna be a timestamp with time zone. This is also gonna be not null. And then just like we did before with our products, we're gonna add a constraint so that it's gonna be uh, now. So it's gonna grab the current time whenever we add this entry and it's gonna automatically add it to that column. And so at this point, we've got our tables defined. We can go ahead and hit save. If we right click on posts and then go to view and edit data, we should have essentially what is an empty database. And for now, uh, we know how to insert data. We can do it either through SQL or we can just do it to here. I'm just gonna do it through here just because it's a little bit quicker for now. So I'm just gonna say this is my first post. And the content is, uh, we'll say, some um, interesting stuff. So just go ahead and just create a couple of posts. And then I'm gonna add my second post. All right, and then we can just hit save. And so now we have two posts in our database, so we can start working with that. When it comes to working with a Postgres database within a Python application, we're gonna need a Postgres driver. Uh, and so there's going to be a couple of different libraries that, gonna do that, that can do that. We're gonna use this library uh, right here. Uh, and I believe in a couple months, a version three is coming up, but right now this is the latest version. So head on over to the documentation and it's gonna show you how to just quickly set this up. And so if we go to basic module usage, this shows us how to uh, set up a connection to our database. And so we're gonna import the library uh, and then we're gonna set up a connection. And hopefully this is big enough for you guys. So you just say connection. And then here we pass in all of the data 
um, for our Postgres instance. So, you know, what's the IP address of the Postgres database? What's the Postgres database that we want to connect to? What's the port number? Things like that. And then we set up a cursor. So this cursor is what we use to actually execute SQL commands. And so you could just do cursor.execute. And then here we just say, you know, create table. Well, you guys aren't familiar with that command yet, um, but you can do, you know, insert into, you can do select star from test. Uh, and then at that point, we can then do fetch one, fetch all. And then if you ever want to make changes to a database, you just do commit. So it's a, it's fairly straightforward. So uh, let's go to our code and set this up. And, and so the first thing that we want to do is we want to install that library. So we'll do pip install. And I'll just copy that name. All right, and now it's successfully installed. So let's set up our connection. And so a connection to a database can fail, right? Maybe the database is unreachable. Maybe the database is down. Uh, there's a lot of things that could cause issues with us being able to connect to it. We could put in wrong passwords or something like that. So anytime you have some kind of code within Python that could potentially fail, we're going to use the try statement. So I'm going to say try, and then we're going to say connection equals. And then I realized the first thing that we have to do is we actually have to import the library. So let's just copy this line right here. And then I'm going to say PSYCOPG2. I don't know if there's a specific way to actually pronounce that. That's why I'm not trying to pronounce it. And then we call the connect method. And so here we have to pass in a few properties. So the first property is going to be the host. Uh, so that's basically the IP address. Uh, we also have to pass in the, the specific database we want to connect to. We also need to pass in the username that we want to connect as, as well as the password. And for now, we'll just keep that as such. So let's fill in these fields. So what's the host? So since this host is just our local machine, uh, for the IP address, you could just say localhost. That means our own IP address. I spelled, I misspelled database. And I'm going to set this to be Postgres because that's what, sorry, it's not going to be Postgres. It's going to be fast API. All right, so that database is just going to match up with the name of our database right here. Username, we've been using the default Postgres username and then password. I'm guessing you guys could have guessed what my password is. It is password123. All right, and then finally, there's one extra thing that we have to pass in. Uh, and so this library is a little bit weird. So when you actually make a query to retrieve a bunch of rows from the database, it doesn't include the column names. It just gives you the values of the columns, which, uh, you know, it's like, I don't know what, you know, what value maps to what column. So you actually have to pass in an extra field to get the column names, which kind of seems dumb, but that's the, way the, that's the way the library works. And so what we're going to do up here is we're going to import something else. We're going to do import, same library dot extras, import, and then real dict cursor. And this should be from. And then the last property we're going to pass in here, the last argument is going to be cursor factory equals real dict cursor. So like I said, all this does is it's also going to give you the column name. Uh, um, uh, it's going to give you the column name as well as the value. So you know which value map to what column or then it's just trying to figure the order and then mapping it to columns gets a little complicated. So this will just make it a nice Python dictionary when it returns it. All right. And just like it had in the, um, the documentation, we'll say cursor equals con dot cursor. So it's just calling the cursor method and then saving it in a variable named cursor. And so all this is going to do is this is what we're going to use to actually execute uh, SQL statements. And if it's successfully able to connect, we're going to say print, and then we're just going to print out something like a database connection was successful. However, if we weren't able to connect to it and we get an exception, we'll say accept exception as error. So uh, we're going to get the error uh, and store it in a variable called error. And then we can just say print connecting to database failed. And then after that, just for our knowledge, 
we can say the error was. There, right, we'll just print out the error. So let's save this. Okay, and you can see that we were successfully able to connect to our database. So it looks like everything worked well, um, but just as a quick test, I'm going to change uh, my password here. I'm gonna put it as an incorrect value. So let's save this and let's see what happens. All right, we can see that uh, the password failed. And so at this point, what the code does is it failed, it printed out the error, and then it just keeps going through the rest of our code. So then it starts up our fast API server. But at this point, you know, our application is not gonna work because the Postgres database connection failed. So really our application, our API, our web server can't do anything until we get a connection to our database. So just having it fail and then kind of gracefully handling that error doesn't do anything. We need to wait for that connection to actually go through before we do anything else. Or then at that point, there's really no point in having our server up and running if we can't access our database. So what I like to do is we're gonna set up a while loop. And I'm just gonna say while, and I want this loop to just continuously run until we successfully get a connection. So we'll say while true, which means we're just gonna keep doing this over and over and over again until we break out of it. And then I'm gonna tab everything over. I put everything in that while loop. All right, and so uh, while this is true, uh, if we successfully are able to connect to the database, I'm just gonna break out of the while loop. However, uh, if we fail, then it's just gonna go right back into that loop. And so now, um, one other thing is, it's going to do this really quickly. And I would like for, after an error, I would like it to kind of wait two to three seconds before it tries to reconnect. So what we can do is we can import the time module. So I'll say import time. And here I'll just say time.sleep. And I'll sleep for two seconds, use whatever time you want. And so now if I hit save, check out what happens. So it failed to connect because of wrong password and then it's just gonna keep retrying every two seconds. Now for a failed password, it's never gonna connect. However, if it's an issue with your internet, if it's an issue with the database has, having not fully initialized, then having it just kind of redo this until the database fully comes up uh, is a nice way of kind of handling that. So if I change this now back to the correct password, we see that we're now successfully able to connect. So this is our code for actually connecting to our database. Uh, and at this point, we can start working on actually um, writing our SQL code and then you know being able to manipulate our database from our fast API. And I do want to point out one thing. Uh, generally, when you're working with your code, what we did right here is very bad. We hard coded all of our database information right into our code. This creates a problem because first of all, when we check this into Git, now our database password is stored in there. And then we run into some extra issues because this is the connection for our development environment or our development Postgres server. Our production Postgres server is not gonna be running on a local host, maybe. Um, the database might be called something else, the username and the password are for sure gonna be different. So if we hard code it in, we won't actually be able to change it in the future. We need a dynamic way to kind of have our code change based off of if it's in our development environment or our production environment. So later on in this course, we'll figure out how to do that. However, for now, we're just gonna work on keeping things simple and just learning how to interact with the database before we start moving into things like environment variables. All right, so the first thing that we're gonna work on is retrieving all of our posts from our posts table. And so what we're gonna do is we'll go to our specific path operation for that, which is the app.get slash post right here. And let's figure out how to do this. So uh, if we go back to up to our connection, right, you'll see that we have access to this object right here, which is cursor. So we're gonna use that to actually make a query. So we'll say cursor.execute. And then this is where we go are going to pa paste in our SQL statements. So I'm just gonna put in three quotes right here and then we just put in our SQL statement. Uh, so in this case, right, to retrieve all posts, we just do select star from posts. Okay, and let's save this as a variable. So I'll just say these are my posts. And then let's just do a print 
post to see what we get. And so I'm just going to go to my uh, postman and we'll just find my get posts request. We'll send it. All right. And let's see what happens, right? We could see that it printed out none. So this doesn't actually do anything, right? This is just passing in our SQL statement. However, to actually run it, we have to do uh, cursor dot, and then we have a couple of options. We can do fetch all, fetch many, fetch one. So uh, when it comes to retrieving multiple posts, we're going to always use fetch all. Don't worry about fetch many. I don't think we're ever going to use that. Uh, and then if we ever want to find one individual post, uh, you know, like uh, finding a post by an ID or something, then we can use fetch one. Because I believe if you uh, want to fetch a post by an ID and you do fetch all, it'll technically get it, but it'll just keep searching through uh, the database for another post with that ID. However, we know that only one post can have that exact ID. So it's inefficient to kind of search through the entire database when we know there's only ever going to be one result. So for those, it's always better to use fetch one. But since we're retrieving multiple posts, we're going to use fetch all. And at this point, you know, we don't actually need to save this in a variable because it's never going to return anything. We can save the output of this to be um, posts. So now if we save this, run this again, and I realized I forgot to actually <laughs> call it. Let's try that again. Right, you can see that we got all of our posts from here. And so now, instead of returning my post, which is our old array, which uh, we're not going to use. We're going to return what we just fetched. So we're going to return posts. And we'll go rid of that print statement. It's not needed anymore. And hopefully this works. So let's hit send. All right. And so now you can see we've got our two posts from our database. And it's got uh, all the extra fields. So it's got the published, which is the default value. And then it's got the created at timestamp, which Postgres added. So now we've actually successfully been able to retrieve posts from our Postgres database, and you can see how easy it is to actually work with that. In fact, it was actually a little bit easier to do this than to actually work with a uh, just an array stored in memory. It really just comes down to understanding SQL, and since we spent you know the last half an hour or so really drilling into how SQL works, uh, you'll see that SQL is pretty easy. And then once you know SQL, you know fetching, you know retrieving, updating, deleting posts from a SQL database, even within your Python code, is dead simple. Okay, so let's now move on to creating a brand new post. And so if we just quickly take a look at the code that we have right here, uh, you can see that we have our schema. We're going to save that in our Pydantic model. And so we'll be able to access the properties from the body within this post object. So I'm going to clear this out and just delete all of that code for now. And for now, I'm just going to hard code some value. I'll just say created post. And so let's work on uh, inserting a new post into our database. So once again, we're going to uh, access the cursor object. So we're going to do cursor.execute. And then once again, we're going to use the three quotes. And we're going to use typical SQL. So to insert something into our database, we do insert. And then we say insert into. What table do we want to insert it into? We'll say the post table. Right. And then here we have to pass in the columns uh, of all the fields that we want to uh, enter in. So if we go look at our database, uh, they, we have to pass in a title and a content. And then everything else is optional. So we can also provide published as well. And then did the database creates the created that in the ID. So it's really just these three columns that we're going to uh, pass into here. And so it's going to be title, content, and then published. Yep. And then we have to pass in the values for those columns. And this is where things get interesting. You never want to do any kind of string interpolation and then pass in the values of post directly into this. Instead, what we want to do is uh, we're going to parameterize um, or sanitize all the data that we put into the SQL statement. So what you should do is do percent %s. Uh, and so this kind of represents a variable. And then we're going to do percent %s and then percent %s. Uh, and so this variable is going to be the value that gets passed in title. This variable, variable is going to be the one that gets passed into content. And this variable is the one that gets passed into the published column. And what we want to set these as 
uh, we're going to actually use a second item that we pass into the execute command, uh, the execute method. And so here we pass in the actual values. So this first percent %s, what do we want that to be? That's going to be post.title. So we're grabbing the title from the body. Then we want to pass in post.content. And then we want to pass in post.published. All right, and this may seem a little confusing. And let me correct that. Um, because I'm sure a lot of you thought we could just do cursor.execute. And then here we pass in just an, a, uh, an F string. And then I can just copy all of this. And then pass in here. Oops. And the values we can just do, you know, post.title. And then, um, you know, post.content and so on. And this would technically work. However, this makes you vulnerable to SQL injection. So if the user for the title uh, decided to, you know, if we go to the create post and for the title, he decided to pass in some kind of weird SQL statement like uh, insert into blah, 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 right? He puts in SQL instead of a valid title. This is what is a SQL injection uh, attack. And he could potentially uh, manipulate data within our SQL database. That's why it's never good to do it, to pass that data in directly into here. Instead, all of these, um, you know, SQL libraries, like uh, uh, like our Postgres library here, uh, they actually can sanitize the inputs. So when we do this percent %s method and then pass it in as the uh, second field into the execute statement, it'll actually make sure that there's no, you know, weird SQL commands in there. And it's going to make sure that we're not vulnerable to SQL injection. So that's why we never do it like this. And we always do it like this. And just keep in mind, right, these are just variables or placeholders. And then the values we want to pass into that will be passed into um, these parentheses right here as the second parameter into the execute method. So post.title, since it's the first one in this list, is going to go to the first percent %s. And then post.content is going to go to the second uh, percent %s. And then post.published will go to the third percent %s. So the order matters. They match up with whichever percent %s comes first. So if I took um, you know, post.published right, and then moved it all the way to the front, well, now post.published would go to the first percent %s. Post.title would go to the second one. That would cause issues because it doesn't line up with that. So that's why we want to make sure that the, the order really does, in fact, matter. And just like we had before, uh, anytime we create something in our database, we want to return uh, the created result. So we can use the returning keyword. And we'll return everything. Uh, and so you're probably thinking, you know, we, we can just save new underscore post equals that. And then since we're returning it, it's going to get stored into that variable. And that's not exactly correct. Uh, instead, what we have to do is to get that returned value, we have to do a new underscore post. And then we do cursor dot fetch one. So that'll get whatever we return from here. And then what we're going to do is we're going to say new underscore post is going to get returned to the user. Let's save that and let's see what happens. So go to our create post and then I'm going to clear that out and just say, hey, hey, this is my new post. And let's hit send. So it looks like everything worked, right? 201 created. You can see it's got all of these values. Let's go back to our SQL database. I'm going to just do a quick uh, query. So I'll just say query tool and I'll just say select star from posts. Let's run it. And if we take a look at the values, and the title should be, hey, this is my new post with an ID of three, you could see it's not in there. Uh, and so you might be wondering, well, uh, you know, the output of our, our API looks perfect. It sent it all back. Well, when you're working with uh, Postgres or any of these libraries, you have to actually do one last thing. You actually have to commit the changes. Uh, just like when it comes to working in our database, you know, if I create something here, pass in some data into the content, it's not saved in there. I actually have to finally save it. So to save that data, we have to reference, uh, instead of the cursor, we're going to reference the connection, and then we have to do a commit. So if we go down here, we just say con, which is my connection to my database, and just say commit. So that's actually going to push those changes out. So we'll save that. Now I'll try this again. All right, and so now we got, it looks like it has an ID of four. If I go to my Postgres database, I'm going to do another search. 
sure, it's okay if it deletes it. Uh, and so now we can see idea four, hey, this is my new post. So now it worked. So keep in mind, anytime you want to insert data uh, into your code, make sure you do a connection.commit to actually save it into the Postgres database, because these are all staged changes. So we're staging it, we can see the result of the stage, but we have to commit it to the database to actually finalize those changes. All right, so now let's move on to fetching an individual post by an ID. Um, I want you guys to take a crack at this, see if you can try to figure it out. It's gonna be relatively similar to the two other previous ones we've done. So we'll start out by referencing the cursor object as usual, and then we'll execute. And then here we're going to pass in our SQL statement. And so we're gonna do a select star from post. That's gonna grab every post, but we wanna grab just one post based off of the ID. And so you guys already know how to do that. We can say where ID equals, and then whatever ID that you want. Uh, and so let's take a look at our database. I have uh, an ID, a post with an ID of one. So right now I'm just gonna hard code it. So I'm gonna say post with an ID of one. And at this point, this is not gonna return anything. To actually return something, we'll say uh, cursor dot fetch. And then we're gonna use not fetch all, but fetch one, because there's only ever gonna be a post with an ID of one. Just, and so this is gonna make it a little bit more efficient. And then I'm gonna save that as post. I'll just say test post, not to get confused with the other post. And then we're gonna print that out just to see if it worked. So let's get one post. And it doesn't really matter what we send it as. If I take a look at this print statement, you can see that we were able to get just that one single post. So it looks like that worked. So now let's clear out all of this other code. I'm gonna remove the print statement. Um, actually, before we do that, first of all, let's not hard code the value anymore. Instead, we wanna use the ID that we passed in uh, from the path parameter. So how do we do that? Remember this, we're, we wanna always make sure that we're not vulnerable to SQL injection attacks. So we'll do percent %s. So that's gonna be the placeholder for the value. And then the second thing that we pass into the execute method, this is going to be the ID. So we take the ID and then that's gonna get pushed into this value. So it's do, essentially doing the same exact thing. So let's see what happens uh, when we try to run this again. And I'm gonna try to grab a post of one and let's see what happens. All right, so it looks like we got an error. So let's take a look. And it says that int object does not support indexing. So it's not very helpful. However, I'll tell you exactly what's happening. Because this is a string, we need ID to be a string as well. Right now it's an integer because we validated it as an integer and we converted it to an integer, but we need this to be a string or then it's not going to work. So we have to convert it to a string. It's pretty simple. You just do string. And that's all. And at that point that should fix the issue. And I'm sure you guys are a little bit confused because uh, when it comes in as a uh, path parameter, it's gonna come in as a string. We then convert it to an int to then only convert it back into a string. Uh, and so you might think, well, maybe we should just change this to a string, but if you change that to a string, then it could potentially open up it to us to issues where the user could type in something like this, which isn't a valid ID. So we do have to validate it as a number, uh, convert it to an int, and then convert it back to a string once again. So let's save this. Our error should go away, and let's try this. All right, no errors, so it looks like everything's good. And so now it's just a matter of cleaning up our code and getting rid of all of the other code. So I'm gonna rename this, so this is just gonna be post. So we can keep everything else the same. So if we didn't find a post, right, which means uh, you know the database returned nothing, it's gonna be set to none, and then we can raise the usual exception. But if we did find a post, we're just gonna return it. Now, if I get a post of one, you can see that we've got that post, which is clearly from the Postgres database because it has the created at field. And then if I try to grab a post uh, of an, if I try to grab the ID of a post that doesn't exist, try five, we can see that post with the ID of five was not found. And let's just double check to make sure that there is no post with an ID of five and there isn't, so perfect. And, you know, guys, one interesting thing, uh, later down in some of the next path operations that we work on, um, I did run into a weird issue where if I didn't have a comma right after this, even though there's nothing that comes after it, it led to an issue. I'm not sure why it did that, um, but keep in mind if you do run into some weird issues, just put in this extra comma 
for some reason or another, uh, it, it potentially fixes some issues. Okay, so just keep that in mind. I don't have an explanation for it. You know, maybe it's listed somewhere uh, within Stack Overflow, or so. I'm sure someone uh, eventually or occasionally asked this question, and I just couldn't find it. All right, so now let's work on deleting a post. I'm going to remove these comments just to clear up some space. We're going to do cursor.execute. You guys should already know the exact SQL statement that we need. So it's going to be select, sorry, not select, delete from post table. And then we're going to delete by ID. So we'll say where ID equals. And then remember, we don't want to pass in the, um, the user input directly. We want to do that placeholder again. And then we also want to, we want to do a returning. So we'll see what that post was before it was deleted. And then we'll pass in the value of the post. So this is going to be ID, um, but we want to convert it to a string so we don't hit that error again. And then I'm going to do that empty comma just to avoid any potential issues. And then we have to do a cursor.fetch1 to get the deleted post. And I'm going to save this as a variable. So I'll say um, deleted underscore post equals that. We can remove this. And then for this exception, when we try to grab a, the ID uh, of a post that doesn't exist, we can just say if deleted underscore post, which is the post that we fetched, wasn't found, we're going to throw an error. We can delete this. And remember, there's one last thing, right? Anytime we want to make a change to a database, we have to connect, uh, commit to it. So we'll do connection.commit. And then everything else, we can keep our code exactly the same. And then uh, I'm just going to run this just to get, so we have a post with an ID of one, two, and four. So let's go ahead and delete one of those. So if I delete uh, the post with an ID of four, what do we get? Oh, sorry, we're still under the get. Let's go to our delete. This is our delete. And then we're going to delete with an ID of four. 204, no content, so that's good. And let's double check our Postgres database to see if it got deleted. We can see that it's now gone. And then let's try to now grab the, with the same one. Let's try to delete the same post, which no longer exists. We should get a 404 post with ID of four does not exist. Perfect. And last but not least, the final path operation we need to update is the update post path operation. We'll grab the cursor object and we'll execute our SQL statement again. And so here we'll do uh, update posts. And then here we want to set the title. And what do we want to set our title to? Well, that's going to be passed in from the user. So any kind of data we get from the user, you know, we have no idea if they put in, you know, very suspicious SQL uh, data. So we always want to put the placeholders. Uh, and so all the fields that they can update are going to be the title, the content and published. So then the next one's going to be content. And the last one's going to be published. And then we'll pass in those values, and that's going to come from our post object. So we'll do post.title, post.content, and finally post.published. And uh, just like we had with inserts and delete, we can do a returning. So we can actually get the returned, we can actually return the updated object, the returning star, so we can get all the columns. And then to actually fetch that updated post, we have to do cursor fetch one. And then we'll save that in a variable called updated post. And then we can remove this. This is our previous code. And then for the little check to make sure that uh, we actually got a, an updated a post, we can get updated post. If we didn't, if it returned none, then we're going to send a 404 because a post with that ID didn't exist. And then we can delete all of this nonsense. And then what we return back is going to be updated post. Up, make sure you get updated with a D, or then if you just do update post, it tries to call it this own function, which doesn't work. And I'm just going to see what I have in my database. So I've got a post uh, with an ID of one, so we're going to update him. You can see currently the title is first post. So if I go to my update post, I'm going to send it with a ID of one. We're going to update that post, and then it's going to have an updated title. So if we see that get updated, 
then we know it worked. So we'll set and do a send. We can see what we got back. And so it looks like it updated, but let's actually double check with our database. And it did not update. And I'm sure you guys can take a guess as to exactly what went wrong. Remember, anytime you want to make changes to a database, we need to do the connection.commit. So let's try this again. All right, so we got the same result. Let's take a look at our database, run this, and then we've got updated title. It looked like it updated both. And uh, that looks like a bug. So what did we do wrong? Well, if you look at our code, we're updating every single post because I didn't provide a where condition. What post do I need to update? So that's a mistake on my end. So we have to do where, and then we'll say ID equals, and that ID is gonna come from this value. So we're gonna put another placeholder there. And then that last value is going to be the ID converted to a string just like we did before. So simple mistake. I'm gonna save that. And before I do that, I'm just gonna change this back to first post. And I'm gonna change this back to second post. And then it's gonna have some random text. And then we'll save that. Then let's update this. All right, so we updated our code. And then let's take a look at our database. We'll run this again. And we can see that it was updated. And you'll notice how that first post then moved down the list because it was most recently updated, but we updated just one post this time. And then last but not least, let's try to update a post that doesn't exist. So I'm gonna search for an ID of 23, try to update that. And then if I do that, uh, we can see that we get a little bit of an error. So what happened here? We got data equals null. Uh, and so uh, it looks like this didn't work and it looks like uh, it got, it changed back to update post. So make sure uh, you reference this variable. So I need that D and now let's try that. And now we get the correct 404. When it comes to working with a database within a Python application or really any application across any language, there's a couple of different ways of interacting with the database. Uh, and so we saw how we can use the default Postgres driver uh, to talk to a Postgres database by sending SQL commands. And this is my preferred method of working with databases because I'm fairly comfortable with SQL. And so it just makes sense to use raw SQL and send that directly to Postgres using whatever the default Postgres driver is for your specific programming language. However, there are other methods. Uh, and so you'll see that one of the popular ways of you know really working with databases is using what's referred to as a object relational mapper or an ORM. And so an ORM is a layer abstraction that sits between the database and our fast API application. Uh, and so we never actually talk directly to a database anymore. Instead, we talk to the ORM and then the ORM will actually talk to our database. Uh, and so some of the benefits are is that we don't actually have to work with SQL anymore. So instead of using raw SQL, what we'll do is we'll actually use standard Python code uh, calling various functions and methods that ultimately translate into SQL themselves. So let's see what that actually looks like. Uh, and so with our traditional application, which is what we have now, we've got our fast API server, and it's going to talk to our database by sending SQL using the default Postgres database driver. However, with an ORM, what we can do is fast API no longer has to talk SQL. Instead, fast API will actually use regular Python code uh, to send you know, specific commands to an ORM. And then the ORM will take that Python code, convert it into regular SQL, and then using the same database driver that we we're using for, it'll actually talk to the database. Uh, and then it'll eventually send that result back to us because the databases, they can only talk SQL. However, by doing like this, we can kind of abstract away that SQL complexity and make use of uh, very common Python uh, objects and various other Python features to actually generate and build queries as well as to create and define tables. So let's take a look at what an ORM ultimately allows us to do. So one of the first things is, instead of us going into you know, PG admin and creating the tables and all the columns ourselves, what we can do is we can define our tables as Python models. And so if you take a look at the code down here, what we can do is we can actually define what our tables in Postgres are gonna look like. And so you can see here, we give it the table a name and then we could specify each of the columns You'll see a lot of the common fields that we already worked with. So the type, so this is an integer, this is a string, 
We can also see if a field is nullable. We can see that the ID is set to be a primary key. So we're using standard Python classes to define our table so that we don't need to do it ourselves using pgadmin. And on top of that, queries can be made using regular Python code. So we can actually chain on different methods to construct various Python, uh, to construct various SQL queries. And so if you take a look at one of the queries down here below that I provide as an example, you can see we just do query, we provide the specific table that we want to uh, query, and that's going to be based off of the specific models. And then we can just pass in whatever filter commands and then grab the first entry. So you can see that there's no SQL anymore. It's just standard Python code. Uh, and so that makes it a little bit easier for some people who may not be as strong on SQL. Uh, and so they don't have to worry about writing these complex SQL commands. They can just chain on uh, specific methods to a, to a DB query to generate their final SQL commands. Uh, and so the, you know, there's a couple of different ORMs. I'd say the most popular one within the Python world is SQL Alchemy. And uh, one of the things to keep in mind is that this is a ORM that's a standalone library, right? So this has, this library has nothing to do with fast API. We're going to use it in our fast API application, but I want you guys to understand that it actually has no relationship with fast API. It's not part of fast API. It's its own library and you can use SQL Alchemy with any web development framework. You can use it with any Python application, even if it's not a web application as well. So in the next video, we'll start taking a look at how to work with SQL Alchemy and how to set up a database connection using SQL Alchemy instead of using the default Postgres driver. Okay, so in this lesson, we're going to start taking a look at SQL Alchemy and get that set up in our project. And so there's a couple of things that I want you guys to take a look at. So the first thing is, I want you to go to the SQL page. So if you just search for SQL, uh, you'll get to the main page. And then if you want to go to library and then references and then version 1.4, which is the one we're going to use. However, I believe they're going to come out with a version 2.0, which is going to be pretty different. So uh, if you are watching this video in the future, you definitely want to install version 1.4 so that you can follow along with this course. So you can click on that. Uh, and so there's a nice little tutorial you can follow. Uh, and then there's also some reference documentation when it comes to setting up the uh, ORM. So if you click on session, session usage, this will show you how to set up a session. Um, however, if you go to the Fast API documentation as well, uh, Fast API, they've got great documentation. So if you go to the documentation and then select SQL relational databases, this is going to show you how to set it up with SQL Alchemy. Okay, so first things first, let's go ahead and do a pip install for SQL Alchemy. So we'll do pip install and then SQL Alchemy. Now guys, I want you to remember that, um, well, first of all, I'm running 1.4.2.3, but the thing is SQL Alchemy doesn't know how to talk to a database, right? It has all the code for us to write Python uh, define all the models and things like that, but it doesn't actually know how to talk to a database. It actually needs a database driver. And so if you take a look at all of the packages that we already installed by doing a pip freeze, right, we, in the last video or in the last section, we installed our Postgres database driver. So whatever database you guys plan to use, so if you want to use a MySQL database with, um, uh, with SQL Alchemy, you have to make sure that you install the underlying driver as well, because ultimately that's what's used to talk to the database. Since we're using Postgres, we need to install this as well. But since we were using it originally in the previous sections, we, are had it, we already have it installed. So we don't need to worry about doing that. But keep that in mind, right? SQL has no way to talk to a database. It still needs the underlying driver to communicate with it. And that's usually how all ORMs work. Um, but now that we have that, on, inside our app folder, I'm going to create a new file. And I'm going to call this database.py. So this is going to ha handle our uh, database connection. And from here, um, what I'm essentially going to do is um, just really follow this documentation. So if you take a look at it right here, uh, we can just copy all of this code right here when it comes to importing statements. So this is just going to import all of this SQL Alchemy code that we want. All right, and then we have to specify a, our connection string. So where is our Postgres database located? And so if you take a look at how we had this set up before using the default Postgres database driver, right, we pass it into this connect function. However, uh, a lot of times when it comes to working with databases, there's a, a unique URL that you create to connect to any kind of database. And there's a specific format for that. And the format for that is actually pretty simple. So go to database PY, and then I'm going to create a variable called uh, SQL Alchemy 
underscore database underscore URL. So this is going to be a regular string. Uh, and the structure of the URL for a Postgres database, it's going to be PostgreSQL, because that's the type of database, colon, slash, slash. Then we have the username that you have to put in, colon. Then we have the password. And then we do at, and then this is going to be the IP address. I'll say IP dash address slash host name, whichever one you're using. In our case, that's going to be localhost. And then you have to provide the database name that you want to connect to. So that's the format of a uh, connection string that we have to pass into SQL Alchemy. And then what we do is we say we have to create a engine. So the engine is what's responsible uh, for SQL Alchemy to connect to a Postgres database. So you do engine equals, and then we're going to reference this create engine. And then we pass in our connection string. So we'll say SQL Alchemy database URL. However, this is not filled in yet. So we're going to fill in this data. So go ahead and put in your username. So if you haven't created a custom user, it's going to default to Postgres. Put in your password. So we'll do password one, two, three for me. The IP address slash host name. This is going to be localhost. And then the database name, this is going to be fast API or whatever you created your database as. So that's your connection string. And like I mentioned before, it's never good to hard code this value somewhere in your code because now you've got your password stored in your code and it's going to get checked into GitHub and then anyone can see it. So this is bad practice. However, we will change this in the future. All right. So like I said, the engine is responsible for um, establishing that connection. However, when you actually want to talk to the SQL database, we have to make use of a session. So we do uh, session local equals session maker. And then we just pass in a couple of values. So auto commit false, auto flush equals false, and then bind equals engine. All right, and all of these values, these are just some default values. Now keep in mind when you're creating the, uh, when, you use, when you use the uh, create engine function, uh, if you are using a SQLite database, you have to pass in this option uh, as the second parameter. So you do the database URL and then you do connection args equals check same thread equals false. This is something that's exclusive to SQLite because it's, I guess it's just running in memory. You don't need to do this for Postgres. You don't need to do it for any other SQL based database. And then you can see in the documentation, this is what the uh, connection string will look like. So it's just confirming what I already showed you guys. And so we can just kind of keep scrolling down and we don't really need anything else uh, except for this last line right here. So we here, we have to define our base class. Uh, and so all of the models that we define to actually create our tables in Postgres, they're going to be extending this base class. So we could just copy this. and then paste it into here. And when I was first doing all of this, you know, it was a little confusing and overwhelming. Just think about that. Just for now, I want you to assume that it's more of just a cut and paste job. It's just a copy and paste. The only thing that really matters that you're going to be changing is going to be that Postgres URL, but everything else for pretty much every project, you can just copy and paste to this entire code. And now within our database.py file, that's all we have to do. The next thing that we want to do is define our tables. Like I said, with an ORM, we no longer have to create tables within PG admin or any CLI utility. We can define it as a Python model. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a new file and this is going to store all of our models. We'll, and we'll call this models.py. So every model represents a table in our database. And what we're actually going to do is uh, let's take a look at our database and let's see how we can define this as a model within Python. So the first things first, we got to import a few things. And the main thing that we got to import is from our database file, we have to import base. So let's do import dot database. Sorry, that should be from dot database import base. And then we can go ahead and define our model. So 
Uh, right now, we have been dealing with only working with posts, so we're going to create a model for posts. And like I said, this is going to actually create the table within Postgres. So what we're actually going to do is I'm going to delete this table eventually, and then we're going to have uh, Python and SQL uh, and my fast API application and SQL Alchemy created for us on the fly. But I'm going to keep this table for now just so we can take a look at all the fields that we have. So here, I'm just going to call this post. And keep in mind, when it comes to classes in Python, you always want to make sure that they're capitalized. And then this has to extend base. So this is that base model from SQL Alchemy, and we just have to extend it. And there's a couple things that we have to pass in. The first thing is, what do we want to call this table within Postgres? Because we have this class name, which only Python knows, but uh, we can specify a specific name within Postgres. Now, our table name right now is called post, so I think we should just keep it at that. So we could say underscore, underscore, table name, underscore, underscore, equals, and then the name of the table you want. So here, we're going to name it posts. And then now we have to define all of the columns. Right, so just like we went within PG admin and went column by column creating it, specifying all of their constraints and things like that, we're going to do this within, uh, within uh, our Python code. So we'll say the first thing is we want an ID. So we'll say ID equals. And then how do we actually create a column? Well, we have to import something from SQL Alchemy. So we'll say from SQL Alchemy import column. So now I can create a column. And then there's a couple of different fields that we have to pass in. So the first thing is, what type of column is it? And so if you go back to our post table and go to properties, right? When we went into columns, the first thing they have to specify is what is the data type? Uh, and so uh, we have access to most of the ones that we see in here. Uh, and But we have to import it from SQL Alchemy first. So the ID column is going to be an integer. And so we have to actually import that. We'll do integer. And now I can pass an integer. And that was a mistake. Let me delete that. And then if we take a look at our ID field, we did say that this was a primary key. So we'll say primary key equals true. And then if you want to, you can also say nullable equals false. All right, so that's the equivalent of doing the not null. All right, then we can define the next column, which is going to be title. And then we call column. This is going to be a string now. But we have to import string from our SQL Alchemy. And once again, this is going to be nullable, set to false. So we can't leave that blank. The next column is going to be fairly symbol, uh, similar. Uh, we've got content. This is going to be a string, and nullable is going to be set to false. Then we got published. This is going to be a Boolean, but we got to import that from the library. And this one can be left as empty. And if you remember, we set a default value for our publish, so it's always going to be by default set to true if we don't pass in a value. And I believe that's how we do it. However, I'd have to double check just to make sure that's what it is. Now, the last column that we'll need to add is the timestamp, but we're going to hold off on doing that for now. And we're going to leave it as such, and then later we'll come back to um, adding that timestamp in. All right, and so we're pretty much done with our model. And what we want to do is, in our main file, we want to copy this command right here. So this create engine. So this is going to create all of our models. So we'll go to our code. I'm going to go to my main file. And somewhere up top, I'm going to create that right there. However, we have to import the right commands. And so the first thing that we want to import is our models. So we'll do from star import models. And then from our database file, we'll say from dot, which is current directory. So we're going to grab a file from our current directory. We're going to import, sorry, from our database file, we're going to import engine. 
And so at that point, that is good to go. And then finally, if we go back to our documentation, the last thing that we have to do is we have to create this dependency. So we just go ahead and copy this for now and just paste it in here. And we want to import session local as well. And we should no longer get any errors here. And so what this ultimately is going to do is the, the session object is kind of what's responsible for talking with the databases. And so we've created this function where we actually get a connection to our database uh, or get a session to our database. And so every time we get a request, we're going to get a session. We're going to you know, be able to send SQL statements to it. And then after that request is done, we'll then close it out. Uh, and so it's as much more efficient doing it like this uh, by having one little function. And we can just keep calling this function every time we get a request to any of our API endpoints. And so now that we've got our uh, dependency to actually get that session, for all of our path operations where we want to perform some sort of operation on the database, what we're going to do is with, with inside the path operation function, we're going to pass in another uh, parameter. And it's going to be uh, session equals depends, and then we're going to call this getDB function. So what that's ultimately going to do is this line right here, don't worry too much about it, but like I said, it's going to create that session to our database so that we can perform some operations and then close it once that request is done. And then we can repeat that process for every single one of our path operations. So anytime you send a request to any API endpoint, uh, you're going to have this being passed into the path operation function so that we can create that connection and then close it out. And like I said, a lot of this is just copy and paste. So once you write this down, even if you don't really understand it, you don't really have to touch it ever again after that. All right, so let's copy this. And what we're going to do is I'm going to create another uh, route or another path operation just for testing purposes because I don't want to mess up any of our other code. And so I'll just say at app.get. And this is going to be at slash SQL alchemy. So this is just to test to see if it works. And I'll say def test posts. And then we want to pass in that, uh, that code that we just copied right here. However, we don't have a session or depends in this case. So we're going to have to import those. So from our database file, our session is going to be from there. Actually, Sorry, that's not actually coming from there, is it? Do we have a session in here? We actually do not have session here. So instead, this is not going to come from here, actually. Instead, we're going to import that from SQL Alchemy. I'll say import sqlalchemy.orm import session. And I realize this should be a from. And then we also have to import the depends method from our fast API library. And so now if we go down to our route, we should get no more errors and it looks good. And then here we're just going to return uh, status success for now. And then finally, the last thing that we're going to do is we're going to delete our post table. I'm going to do a delete prop, hit yes. And we have no more tables now. I can close this out. Sorry, I didn't mean to save that. Close that. Don't save it. All right, now we've got nothing. So let's save everything. And pray to God that there's no errors and so it doesn't look like there's any errors. And uh, just by saving that code and restarting our application, what should have happened is once our code ran and we run this, I believe this should actually create the tables within Postgres. So let's refresh this real quick. I'm going to just right click here, hit refresh. If we go under tables. Look at that, guys. We now have our post table, even though we deleted it. So if we take a look at our post table and go under properties, columns, you can see it's got the three columns that we defined, well, four columns that we defined. And that all comes from our models.py. And so we've got the four columns that we defined here. And so uh, if uh, whenever we start our application, SQL Alchemy will check to see if there's a table called posts. 
If it's there, it's not going to do anything. If it's not there, it's going to go ahead and create it for us based off of what we defined in the model. Now, there's one last thing that I want to do just to kind of clean things up. Uh, in our main.py file, I don't like having this getDB function within here. I want to keep all of my database code, um, all of my database initialization code within my database.py file. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually cut this out, paste it into my database.py file, and then we're going to import this into my main file so that I don't have to uh, have that in my main file cluttering it up because our main file is already fairly large. So for my database file, I can import get underscore db. And now we no longer need session local because it's showing us it's grayed out. So we can remove that. And at that point, everything should still be working. So just as a, just to double check, I'm going to delete this once again. And then I'm going to save this, which is going to trigger um, a reload of our application. And then once our application reloads, if I refresh my database, it should have created another uh, data, uh, another post table. And it looks like it did. And let's just double check that all of the columns are there. And it looks like they are. So everything looks good. Uh, in the next video, uh, the one thing that we do need to change is that we have to add the created at column. So we'll tackle that in the next video. In the last video, we were able to get SQL Alchemy to generate our own post table. However, if we actually poke around with it, we'll see that there's a couple of issues. So if I go to uh, right click on it and select properties, and I go to columns, all right, we can see that all of these fields are set to not null, and the primary key is set to the ID field. So everything looks good so far. However, when I go to the published column and I go to constraints, I can see that the default isn't set. And so if we go back to our code, I actually uh, made one little mistake, right? This default is not going to give us what we need. Instead, what we need to do is we need to set this to server default um, because it's ultimately the, the Postgres server or the database server that's going to actually uh, send the default. So uh, I'm going to put it in quotations as a string. We can just set this to be true. And then if you haven't added this, go ahead and add nullable to false. I'm going to make all of my columns uh, not allowed to be empty. Uh, that's because the server is going to add uh, the default to true for this. So let's try this out. Now, if I hit save right now and I go to my Postgres database and then we can just right click on this, hit refresh. And then we do properties again and I go to column. And then we go to, uh, sorry, go to the publish column. We'll see that there's no constraints. And so this is kind of a limitation of SQL Alchemy because SQL Alchemy will generate your tables, but it does it in a very simple manner. What it actually does is if I go to my main.py file uh, and then it runs this code, I believe this is the code that actually creates the tables. What it does is it'll go through all of our models and it'll look for a table named called post. If it doesn't exist, it will then create one based off of these rules. However, if the table already exists, even though we've changed the uh, different attributes, the columns and things like that, uh, if it looks for the, if it finds a table with that name already in there, it's not going to touch it. So it's not going to help us modify tables and things like that. In fact, if you actually take a look at the documentation, uh, I've got so many tabs open. Let's see if I can find it right here. I search for Alembic. Uh, and so normally when it comes to creating your tables, when it comes to handling migrations, which is uh, a term that's used for changing the columns uh, and the schema of your tables, then you want to use another software called Alembic. Uh, SQL Alchemy isn't really meant for handling database migrations or making changes to it. So that's why we don't see it automatically make those changes. So for now, what we're going to do to get around this limitation is I'm just going to cancel out of this and we're just going to delete the table. So we'll drop the table and then we'll go back to our code and then I'm just going to hit save. And so now that it runs again, it's going to look for a table called post. Since we deleted it, it's not going to see it. It's going to then go ahead and create our table. And now if I just right click on tables, hit refresh, we should see that we have a post table. And if I go to properties, we can then go to columns, published. And then if we go to constraints, we can see the default set to true. So it looks like that fixed that issue. Now, the second thing I want to do is I want to add our uh, timestamp column because that's very important. We need to know when a post was created. So let's create a field called created, created underscore at. 
column. Now, what's the column type going to be? Well, we're going to use a column type of timestamp. So type in timestamp. We can let VS Code automatically import it. Um, but all it's going to do is it's going to import it from SQL, uh, sqlalchemy.sql.sql types. And then within here, we have to pass in a property of time zone equals true. So this is going to also add in the time zone. And that's going to be a capital T. And the next thing we want to do is provide a, it's going to be nullable set to false. So it can't be left empty, but we're going to give it a default value if the user doesn't provide it, which they never will. And so we'll do server default. But we have to do something a little bit different. Here I have to uh, import a function or a method called text from SQL Alchemy. So from this right here, SQL Alchemy .sql expressions, I'm going to do text. And then here we're going to do now, right? Just like we typed in within our Postgres database, you know, if we wanted to manually do this, we would just go under um, the column. Let's say we had it created a column. We can just go in there, go into constraints, and then type in now like that. And that's going to generate a timestamp. So we're doing the same thing, but we're just doing it through Python code now. So once again, we'll save this. I'm going to drop this table so that we recreate it. And then we'll save it one more time. This is going to trigger a reload and then a refresh of the table. We should now see it. So let's go into properties. Let's take a look at our columns. We've got the created at column. And then if I go under constraints, we can see the default is now set to the current time. So we've got that working. Let's just quickly test this out. So I'm going to go into view, edit all rows. And I'm just going to create a post. We'll save this and let's make sure all of the default values get set. Looks like that's good. And it looks like the time is set just right as well. So now that we have verified that SQL Alchemy has created the proper tables within Postgres, it's time to go ahead and create our first query. And like I mentioned in a previous lesson, with SQL Alchemy or really any ORM, the way we do queries is going, a little bit, is going to be a little bit different. We're no longer going to rely on regular SQL. Instead, we're going to use basic Python methods. Uh, and so go to your main folder, uh, sorry, your main file. Right? And we, we saw this uh, test uh, route that we defined. So what we're going to do is we're going to run our first query within this test route. And then afterwards, we'll, we can go ahead and delete it. And then we can update all of our uh, pre-existing path operations. And so like I mentioned before, uh, anytime you want to perform any kind of database operation with SQL Alchemy uh, within FastAPI, we want to make sure that we pass it as a parameter into our path operation function. So you just call DB. So we're saving it inside a variable called DB. And then we're just calling the session object and then we're calling the getDB function within depends. So this makes it a dependency. And so if you already forgot what that is, um, just go to your database. Uh, you can see that it's this function right here. So this is going to actually create a session towards our database uh, for every request to that specific API endpoint. And then it's going to close it out once we're done. Right, and then within main, there's one thing that we have to import, and that is models. So you just do from dot import models. That's going to import this specific model so that we can actually make queries to it. Right, and to make a query, right, we're going to access that database object, which is getting passed into um, our function. And then here we want to tap into the query method. And then we have to pass in the specific model for the table we want to query. We only have one model in this case, which is our post model. So that when we use this specific model, it's going to allow us to make a query to our post table. And here, so we'll call models dot post. So that's going to allow us to access that model. And then from here, what we can do is uh, we have a couple of different methods that we run can run. But since we want to query all of our posts, we just do all. So this is going to grab every single entry within the post table. And then here we could just save this as a, a variable called posts. And then for the ret return statement, I'm just going to say we're going to return data and then posts. So let's test this out now. And uh, I'm going to go to get posts. Actually, I'm just going to create a new test um, test route, so a new request. And I'm just going to copy the URL. 
and then this is stored in SQL Alchemy. So let's try this out, and this should result in us getting just one post. So let me just double check my Postgres database just to make sure that we only have one post. So I'm just going to open up the query tool. And we'll just do select star from posts. Yep, and it looks like I only have one post. And so that's why we only got one post in our request. And if I add a new post, and save that, and we make a new request, we should get two posts. So that verifies that we are successfully connecting to our database and we are successfully retrieving those posts. And so I want you to stop and really take a look at how the queries um, vary when it comes to working with an ORM versus working with regular SQL. Um, because if we actually see the uh, path operation for getting posts uh, at slash posts here, this is where we're using regular SQL. So here we do select star from posts. But if you take a look at this, there's no SQL here, right? We're just tapping into the database object and we're going to call a query. And then from here, we have to tell it what specific model, which in this case, remember these models represent tables. And then we just say, I want all posts. Now, what's even more interesting is if I remove this, and then uh, for now, I'm just going to hard code, you know, successful, just some random data. I'm going to do a print posts. So right here, we're calling the database object and then we're calling query. So what actually happens when we just do this? Well, I'm going to save that. We're going to send a request. We're not going to get any data back. That's to be expected. But take a look at this, right? We're actually taking a look at what the query object returns. And you can see that it's just returning a regular SQL statement. So it's saying, I want you to return post.id, and then it's just renaming it post underscore ID. Then I want to grab post.title. We're renaming it as post.title. So it's grabbing all of the columns. And then we're going to grab it from our post table. So it's really no different than just running, you know, select star from posts. Essentially, that's all it's doing, but it's just renaming all of the columns to be a little bit more easy to read. So you can see that these queries, this query object is just performing SQL. So it abstracts all of the SQL away from you and it handles all the logic of generating the SQL so that you don't have to know or you don't have to have as solid of an understanding of SQL. And this allows you to really focus on uh, building out the API. This allows you to focus on uh, working with Python and less with SQL and the databases themselves. So now we know when we call query, this actually creates the query. However, to run the query, we have to run a specific method. So there's a couple of methods that we can run. Um, but if you want to grab everything, then you just call all. And then it's going to take this SQL query. And then it's actually going to run it against the database and then return it. But until we call this last method, it's nothing more than just a SQL query that hasn't been run yet. All right, so now that we know how to fetch all posts, let's just go down here. Right, and let's just put in this logic. So um, this is our actual endpoint for retrieving posts. This is our get posts. And what we're going to do is I'm going to comment this out just so that uh, uh, you know later down the road, if you guys want to just take a look back how you do it with regular raw SQL, you still have that within the code base. And anytime you want to work with the database, remember, you have to pass it in to the path operation function. So this is going to make it a dependency. And you'll see by doing it like this, it'll make testing a lot easier. And then we can just copy this right here. And then we're going to return the post. So let's test that out. So now if I go to get posts, hit send, you can see that we successfully retrieved both of our posts. All right. And it really is as simple as that. Uh, and then in the next video, we'll start taking a look at how we can create posts and so on. In this video, we're going to start tackling how to create a post using a ORM or specifically SQL Alchemy. So once again, I'm going to copy out or comment out all of the SQL code. And what we're going to do is we're going to see how we can actually create a brand new object uh, or a brand new post in this case. So first things first, anytime uh, any of your path operations need to work with the database, we need to make sure that we copy this exact input argument into the path operation function. This is going to give us a access to our database object so that we can actually make queries and make changes to our database. And by passing it in like this, it's going to make it a dependency and it's going to make it a lot easier for testing and, and things like that. Technically, you don't have to do it like this. Uh, you could just import it directly in there. However, by doing it like this, like I said, uh, testing becomes a little bit easier. All right, so we've got our models, right? And we have one specific model. So this model represents our posts. 
And so to create a brand new post, we have to reference this model and pass in the specific fields that we want to create a new entry with. So first of all, we have to make sure we import that model. And you can see that we are importing all of our models by doing from dot import models. So we can access models dot um, post in this case to access that specific model. And so here I'm going to do models dot post. And then we have to pass in the properties of the brand, of the brand new post that we want to create. Uh, and so what are the properties, right? If you take a look at our SQL statement, we need the title, the content, and uh, the published Boolean, right? And that's all going to be derived from the request that we get, which is going to be stored in the post object. So I can reference all of those fields. So I can say the title for the brand new post is going to be set to whatever the title the user sent to, and that can be accessed with post.title. The content of the brand new created post is going to be uh, content equals post.content. And then the same thing is going to be for published. So it's going to be um, post.published. Right? And if you take a look at this code so far, this doesn't look too different from the SQL statement, right? This says insert into posts, and then we pass in post.title into the title, post.content into the content, and then post.published into published, right? And so this is pretty much exactly the same thing. We're not doing anything different. We're just having uh, SQL Alchemy handle all of that logic so we can do everything in just standard Python code, and there's no SQL anymore. All right, and the next thing that we want to do is, well, let's save the result as new post. And let's see what happens. So I'm going to save this. And then we're going to set a little query. So first of all, I'm going to create a new post. I'm going to call this a uh, welcome to Funland. So much fun. Okay, and so then we'll, we will send a request. And we got some data back. And so it looks like it worked. However, take a look at our, uh, our data. We're, we've got a title, we've got a content, and then we've got published, but where's the ID? Uh, where's the created at field? All the fields that the database creates. So this makes me suspect that this didn't actually work. So let's go to Postgres and then go ahead and make a query to your table. So select star from post. That's going to grab all of them. Um, and you'll see that based off of the title, Welcome to Funland, I do not have that in there. So it looks like this was not successfully able to create a post within our database. So let's take a look and see what went wrong. And uh, if you actually take a look at the, uh, the previous method, right, you could see that uh, we actually have to commit something to the database. So we can create an entry, but it doesn't actually get pushed to the database until we do a commit. And so I'm suspecting that we probably have to do a similar thing. So when it comes to SQL Alchemy, what we need to do is, First of all, we have to tap into the database object now. We want to say db.add, and then we're going to add this newly created post. So this is going to add it to the database. However, just like with the connection.commit, we have to commit those changes. So we do db.commit. And then the last thing that we need to do is, uh, if you take a look at our SQL statement, we have this returning star. So that's going to return back the uh, newly created post. Uh, with SQL Alchemy, it's a little bit different, right? Because we don't really have access to that underlying SQL code. We can't add a returning statement to this. So the way that you do this in SQL Alchemy is you do db.refresh. And then you pass in the new post object. So what this is going to do is we create a brand new post. We add it to our database. Then we commit it. And then what we're going to do is we're going to essentially retrieve that new post that we just created and store it back into the variable new underscore post. And so all of this code should be uh, identical to this code. And so now if we uh, we will just return back new post, and I think that should fix our issue. So now if I hit send, right, we do see an ID and we do see a created ad field. So it looks like it worked, but we want to double check within Postgres. So if I hit run and we can see welcome to Funland. So it looks like it's now successfully working. And before we wrap up this video, uh, there's one thing I don't like about the way we've done things, right? And this isn't necessarily going to break or cause any issues. However, you're going to see it's very inefficient uh, depending on what your models look like. Now, our model has only a couple of fields, and the user only has to really pass in um, two to three fields, which is title, content, and published. So it's not that big of a deal. But imagine if we have a model with 50 fields. Um, there's no limitation, right? You could put as many fields as you want. Well, then things are going to get a little bit more difficult because 
uh, if you see, we have to extract all the fields from our schema, right? And then we have to kind of pass it in. So we have to say, oh, title equals post.title, content equals post.content, and then published equals post.published. Now, if we have 50 fields, we're going to have to do that 50 times. And that's a little inefficient. Uh, and there's actually a much easier way to do it. And the, the way to do this is we have access to the post um, object, which is, you know, um, this is a pydantic model. So it's going to ensure that it um, matches the schema that we set. And we want to say post.dict. Now we know that's going to convert it to a regular dictionary. So if I do a print, save that, and then just send a request, right? Take a look at this. We've got a regular Python dictionary. However, we need to be able to automatically take that dictionary and convert it to this format where uh, instead of having, uh, you know, title like this and then welcome to Funland, it's going to be title equals and then post.title content equals post.content. So how do we do that? Easy. All we have to do is unpack the dictionary. So you just do a star star and it's going to put it into this exact same format. So we can remove all of this and just say star star post.dict. And that should ultimately do the same exact thing, except now if we uh, go back to our database uh, or our model and add in extra fields, it's going to automatically unpack all of those fields for us so we don't have to manually type it out. All right, we'll save that. I'm going to just uh, put in some extra text just to make sure we can verify that. And I realize we got to remove this print statement. It's going to throw an error. Then we'll hit send. It looks like everything worked. Let's go to our database, search, and it looks like it worked. So you can see that if we go back to our code, a lot cleaner uh, than having to type out each one of those fields. And we can put this all in one line so it looks a little better. All right, so now it's time to handle querying for an individual post. So a post by a specific ID. So once again, we will comment out the SQL code. And we will do this using SQL Alchemy. So once again, copy the database dependency right here, and then just pass it in. And this should actually be an integer. I don't know who changed that. I may have left that in from the previous video. Yeah, it should be an integer. Okay. Uh, and now what we want to do is, uh, just like we saw when it comes to querying all posts, we have to do db.query, pass in the specific model that we're interested in. And then uh, we're not going to do a dot all because we don't want all the posts. So we're going to have to take a look at a different uh, query operation. So I'll say db dot query models dot post. And then we want to filter. So we want to pass in a filter. So this is the equivalent of doing like a where. You can see that we filter by doing where ID equals and then we pass in the ID. In this case, we're going to filter. And then here we say uh, whatever the models dot post.id is. So this is going to look through all of the posts in our database, and it's going to take a look at all of their IDs. And we want to see whenever that is equal to the ID that the user requested. So the ID from uh, this query parameter, or this um, path parameter. So we say when they're equal, that's the one we want to return. And uh, if I do a uh, print of, first of all, let's save this to a variable. So I'll say post equals. And then I do a print of post. Save that. I'll open up the terminal. And then we'll send a request for an individual post. So I'll hit send. Um, we get a whole bunch of errors. That's OK. Let me see. And that's fully expected. All right. And then we can see the exact uh, SQL statement that this query actually made. Uh, and so here we're doing db.query and then filter. And we can see that we got uh, the select statement. Uh, and then here it's just grabbing all of the uh, all of the columns, right? But then you can see from posts, and then it says where post.id equals id underscore one. All right, and so this pretty much looks exactly uh, like we want it, right? It's, if you look at our SQL statement originally, it doesn't look any different. All right, and so at this point, I think this should be good to go. However, right now it's still just raw SQL, right? We could see what the SQL statement is, but if you recall from the previous one, we had to do a dot all to actually send the query. So for us, we can do a dot all technically, and this would work, right? It would grab all the posts who have an ID of whatever ID we passed in. However, there's one little issue with doing it like this, 
And that is that once it finds one post, it's going to keep looking through all of the posts to see if there's any other ones. But we know that only one post can have this specific ID. So it's a waste of uh, Postgres's resources to continue looking when we know there should only be one. So anytime you know there should only be one, instead of doing a dot all, it's better to do a dot first. So it's going to find the first instance and going to return that. So it's going to save us some little time. It's going to be a little bit more efficient in that case. All right, let's save this and let's try this again and let's see if this works. All right, it looks like it worked. We got a post back. No errors. So I think everything is good to go. Um, let's go back to our Postgres database. We do see that there's one with an ID of four. So it seems to work, but let's test this out with a, a random ID of like 666. And we should get the 404. So looks like that's all we need to do when it comes to fetching an individual post. And I'll remove this print statement. We don't need that anymore. And then we can just conclude this video. All right, so let's move on to handling our delete path operation. So I will comment out the SQL code once again. And then we're going to make sure that we pass in the database dependency into our path operation function. And so for our delete operation, what we're going to do is I'm going to do a query. And this query is going to look exactly like this query. So I can actually copy this one in this case. So all we're doing is we're grabbing um, the posts model, and then we're going to filter based off of ID. So we're going to look for the ID of the post that we want to delete. And I'm actually going to remove this first. So I'm going to save the query by itself. And we'll save this as a post underscore query. I'll just save it as post. It's OK. We'll understand that that's a query and not an actual post. And then our if statement to check if there actually is a post with that, what we're going to do is we're going to say if post dot how do we actually run this query well we do first so that's going to query it and so if this returns back nothing then we're going to raise a 404 so really we haven't done anything different from what we did here however uh, if it does exist so outside of this if statement i'll do a post dot delete and then we'll just say uh synchronize session equals uh, false. I believe that's the default uh, config anyways. Uh, I don't want to spend too much time going over this. Uh, it doesn't really matter too much, but if you want to read a, about it, um, just take a look at the documentation. And if you go under, you know, session basics, uh, you could see them kind of describe uh, all of them. But uh, this option is the most efficient and reliable. So I just went ahead with that one and it seems to work just fine. So this is going to delete the post. But remember, to actually make changes, we have to do a db.commit. So that'll delete it, and then um, everything else should and can remain the same. I'm going to go back to my Postgres database. We're going to delete a post with the ID of six. So we'll go to our, our postman. We'll go to our delete operation, and then we'll do a, an ID of six. All right, seems to work, but let's double check with Postgres. All right, and now we can see that there's no longer a post with an ID of six. And then let's test this out with a random post number that doesn't exist. We should get a 404. Perfect. OK, so it's time to tackle our final path operation, which is for updating posts. This is one's going to be fairly similar to you know, deleting a post uh, or even getting a post by a single ID. So first of all, comment out the previous Postgres code. And because we're going to be interacting with the database, let's make sure we copy the dependency in this case. And then what we're going to do is we're going to do the same thing. We're going to say db.query. I'm going to query models.post. And then we're going to filter on the same thing. We'll say filter models.post.id. And if that equals to the ID that we're passing here, then we're going to find the specific post we're interested in. So I'll say, I'm going to save this as post underscore query. So right now, uh, we're not actually running the query. We're just saving the query because I haven't run dot first or dot all. And we'll say the actual post equals post underscore query dot first. So this is going to grab the post if it exists. Uh, if it doesn't exist, 
So we'll say if post does not equal none, or if post equals equals none, then we're going to send a 404. However, if it does exist, then we'll, we'll grab the query again. We'll say post query dot update. So we can chain an update method. So we're basically taking this query right here, and then we're chaining the update method, which would be the equivalent of doing an update right here. So say dot update. And then what we want to do is we want to pass in the, the fields that we want to update as a dictionary. So in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to hard code the values and just to show you what that looks like. So we'll say title is going to be set to, hey, this is my updated title. And then the next one's going to be the content. We can update that to be whatever we want. And I'll say, um, this is my updated content. Then we're going to do that same synchronized session equals false as the second uh, property into the updated method. Go to synchronized session equals false. And that should handle the update. And then we would just want to do a db.commit. And right now, this updated post doesn't exist anymore, so we're just going to return uh, successful or something. doesn't matter. We're going to change this a little bit later on. All right, so let's go to our uh, update. Where is our update post? It doesn't really matter what data we pass in because we're hard coding the values. And so I'm going to update a, the post with an ID of 1 if it still exists, and it looks like it does. So you can see right now the title is new post. So we'll update this, and as successful and then let's go to back to postgres do a query and we can see that hey look it got updated hey this is my updated title and the content this is my updated content so that's all we have to do we just have to pass in a python dictionary with the updated fields uh, and so instead of passing in a uh, python dictionary right we can pass in our post schema right so that's going to have all of the updated fields and we can just say post dot that's going to return a Python dictionary. So that should be exactly what we're looking for. And then finally, when it comes to returning data, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, run another query. So we're going to say post underscore query. So we're going to grab this exact query object right here. And then we're just going to get the updated post. So we just grab the first one with that specific ID. Uh, and then it should return that. So hopefully you guys understand. Uh, and I'm just going to quickly recap exactly what we did. We set up a query to find uh, the post with a specific ID. Then we're going to actually grab that specific post. So we run that query by grabbing dot first. If it doesn't exist, we're going to run a 404. Um, but if it does exist, then we can chain the update method to the same query object so that we can update it. And we pass in the fields that we want to update. We'll commit it to our database. Then after all of that's done, we want to make sure we get the updated post and send it back to the user. So we do post underscore query dot first. So let's test this out. And I'm going to put in values because these values now matter. And I'll say, um, my name is Sanjeev. Python is fine. So let's try this. What happened here? Okay, I forgot to save. Hit send. We get an error. And I realize we have a little bit of an issue. So uh, this, the schema that we get, uh, where we extract all of the body fields is named post, but then we also save this as post as well. And so this leads to uh, issues because they're both named the same thing. And so I'm trying to I'm trying to convert this to a dictionary, which only works on the Pydantic model. It does not work on our SQL Alchemy model. So we're going to have to rename these. I'm going to name this updated underscore post. And then here, this is going to be updated underscore post. Now let's try that again. Seems to work. Let's check our database though. And we can see that it was successfully updated. And then let's try to update something that doesn't exist. And we get a 404. Perfect. Before we proceed any further, I do want to provide some clarifications on what are the difference between a schema or pedantic model uh, and our uh, ORM or SQL Alchemy model. And I think it's important that you guys understand that. And I do realize that there could be potentially some confusion as to what's the difference between them. Uh, ultimately, what are they trying to accomplish and why do we have both of them? So I've created a couple of slides 
and hopefully that helps sort things out and hope and hopefully it provides a little bit of clarification uh, if you guys were confused at that um, but just to look at our code you'll notice that in our main.py file we have one class called post here and this is extending base model which actually comes from the pydantic library and you can see we're importing pydantic right here so this is what's referred to as our schema uh, and uh, we also have our and i don't even want to explain it yet uh, hopefully you guys already know what it is but i have a couple of slides that hopefully make it a little bit more clear but just to kind of show you where this is being referenced it's being referenced in our path operations. So if you go to, you know, our create posts, which wherever that is right here, uh, you can see that we're passing that in right here and then saving it into a variable called post. So we're referencing it right here. Um, this is all about defining the shape of a request. Uh, and so that's the pydantic model. Uh, the other model is the one that we have in models.py, which is the SQL alchemy model. So this SQL alchemy model defines what our database, our specific table looks like. Um, but let me pull up the slides just to show you guys, uh, you know, with some nice diagrams. So hopefully you guys get a better idea of what that is. All right, so let's start off by going over the schema models or the pydantic model. So the schema or the pydantic model defines the structure of a request and a response. Uh, and so uh, that way, you know, when it comes to creating a post, we can define exactly what the request should look like. So when we create a brand new post, we need the user to provide what's the title of the post, what's the content of the post, and optionally, they can also provide if it's published or not, but we've provided a default value, so they don't actually have to send that. So what we do is we take the request, and then we pass it through the Pydantic model. The Pydantic model will uh, perform a little bit of validation to make sure that all the fields that we need to actually create a brand new post are there, uh, and that they are of the proper type. So if it's a title, it shouldn't be an integer, and if it's uh, uh, the published property, it shouldn't be a string or anything. It's just a simple Boolean. So that's what the Pydantic model or the schema model does. It's just there to provide some validation to ensure that the body, uh, all the data fields provided in the body of a request, match up to what we want. And that's important because we don't ever want to give the clients, which is the web browser or the mobile phones or anything like that, uh, freedom to do whatever they want. We want to tell them exactly what we need for each specific path or route. And that's for the request. However, uh, we can also do this for the response. And we haven't actually done that yet, but we can actually define exactly what that response should look like. So, you know, as our, um, as our models get more complex, as uh, our database gets more complex, there's going to be a lot of fields when it comes to your posts and your users that you may not want to send back to the client when we send a response. So we can actually define a model to dictate Fast API exactly the data fields that we should be sending back. And so that's what your schema and your pydantic models do. They just ensure that the request and response are shaped in a specific way. Now, the other model is the SQL alchemy model. So this is the one that we've been working on with the past couple of lectures, right? And these are responsible for de defining the columns of our posts table within Postgres, right? So it's gonna define all the different attributes within a specific table. And then we use that post model to perform queries to our database. We use it to create, delete, and update entries within our database. Um, but this model is fundamentally different than the Pydantic model. So that's why I created this video. I just wanted to make sure that you guys understood what were the differences between those and understand why we need them both. Technically, we don't need the Pydantic models, but um, you know, when it comes to building out APIs, you want to be as strict as possible when it comes to what kind of data can we receive and send to the user. Uh, and so Pydantic just ensures that uh, you know, everything just matches up with what we expect. So in the last video, I described the difference between a Pydantic model and a ORM model. And uh, there's a couple of things I actually want to do with our Pydantic model. So we've just got one right here where we define what a request, what a post should look like. Uh, and we use that in a couple of places. Uh, so if we go down to create posts, we can see we use it there. So it's going to define the structure of the data that we receive from the front end when we want to create a post. And I think we also provide it for um, maybe updating a post. Yep. We also use it for updating a post as well. So what I'm going to do is I want to create the schemas or I want to move the schema in this case. Remember, this is what's referred to as a schema. I want to move that to its own file just so that we don't clutter up our main.py file. So I'm going to go under app. I'm going to do new file. And I'm going to call this schemas.py. And then within schemas, if I go to my main.py file, I'm just going to cut this out. And we can paste it in here. And there's going to be a couple of things that we have to import. Uh, so if we go to our main.py, we definitely need Pydantic. That's really all we need, actually. So if I go there and then paste that into there, we should have no issues. And then, you know, this is going to actually break our application because uh, we need to actually import this specific schema. So if I go into main.py, 
Uh, we can see here I'm doing from dot import models. So that's going to import everything from the models file. But we can also then import schemas as well. And so now to actually access this specific class post, we just have to go in our main.py file and then reference schemas.post. And so anywhere we use post, uh, which should be right here, we can do schemas.post. And then in our update post as well, we can do the same thing. This is going to be schemas.post because now we're importing it from another file. And what I'm actually going to do is we're going to restructure this a little bit. So what I'm going to do is remember, these are regular Python classes. Uh, and so we get all of the abilities that we have when it comes to inheritance, uh, when you come, when it comes to working with these classes. So what I'm going to do is uh, we could define a couple things, right? We could have one for, uh, we could create a class for create post. Actually, that should be capitalized. So create post. And then that's going to extend base model. And then this is going to have all of the fields that we need from the user when it comes to creating a post. And so that's what this would be in this case. And then remember, we also need to handle updating posts. Uh, and so we could create another model for that. So in this case, I could call it update post. And once again, that's going to extend base model. And uh, when it comes to the the fields that we use for an update post, uh, it would be the same exact thing, right? Whoops, that should be right here. And I don't know why it's keep doing that. And in this case, there wouldn't be a default value for published because we want them to explicitly provide each column. Uh, and so at this point, right, we could then have two different classes for each specific request. And that's a perfectly valid use case because when it comes to creating, they should provide a certain amount of fields and then updating it might be completely different, right? Because, um, you know, let's say in our application, we wanted to make it so that the user can't ever update a post. They can only update one property and that's the publish. So they can just change whether it's published or not. We could remove this and this is going to make it so that the user isn't allowed to provide any other fields. They can only pa um, pass the published field. So that's why we would want to create different um, models uh, for each of the different requests. But what I like to do is instead of having uh, one for create post, one for update post, uh, and then one for the, you know, we have to eventually create models for the response. What we're going to do is we're actually going to delete all of this and we're going to create a class called post base. So I'll do class post base and then base model. And so this is a regular class. We can just copy all of these fields. And then we can extend that class. So I can take this post base class and I can extend it and say class post create. I want to extend post base. We can say post base. And so it's going to, by default, automatically inherit all of these fields. And so we can just say uh, for creating, we could just say pass, which means it's just going to accept whatever post base is. So post create is essentially the same thing as post base. But then we can create a brand new one called uh, class, I don't know, post update. And that's going to extend post base. And we can say that uh, for updating, uh, we can pass in whatever specific fields we want to add in as well. So that gives us flexibility because we can make use of inheritance. So for now, I'm going to remove post update and we're just going to keep it as post create uh, because, uh, you know, updating and creating is going to be fundamentally the same. Uh, and that way we can just kind of piggyback off of this post based model and then just create brand new models based off of this. So what I'm going to do is go into my main.py file and then for schemas, actually, let me save this. Then my main.py file, there's no longer a post. It's going to be post. Actually, it's going to be create post, post create. I'm going to do the same thing for update as well. That was the update actually. So then the other one is for create post. And then this is going to be schemas dot post create. All right. And then the last thing that I want to do in this video is we're going to just delete this test route that we had defined when we were learning about SQL alchemy. We don't really need that anymore. And then in the next video, what we're going to do is we're going to tackle sending a response back. All right. And as I mentioned within the slide deck, right, 
just like we can define what a request should look like, we can also define exactly what a response should look like. So we're going to do the same thing. We're going to define a pydantic model for a response for what a post should look like when we send it back to the user so that uh, it stricts to a very specific schema and then we don't end up sending data that we don't actually need to send to the user. In this lecture, we'll take a look at how we can define a pydantic or schema model to define the exact shape of a response. Because right now, if you actually see uh, any of our uh, path operations, what we do is we just return a post or multiple posts or an updated post. Uh, and whatever data we get back from the post, we just send it back to the user. And there may be times where maybe you don't want all of the properties or all of the attributes and columns from our post table to get sent back to the user because um, you know, potentially that could be sending him back information he shouldn't know about. Uh, especially when it comes to, you know, like your, your user account, right? When a user logs in, we don't want to send him back his password. He already knows his password. We don't want to continuously transmit uh, information like that. So there can be times where you do want to remove certain fields or properties. And before we actually get to performing that, we're going to do a little bit of cleanup. Because if we go to really any one of our requests, like if I go to get posts and hit send, uh, you see that we have, you know, within data, we then have the list or array of all of our posts. And then if we look at create posts, right, you can see we always have data and then the actual post. I'm going to get rid of the data field just because I think it's unnecessary and it kind of clutters things. So what we'll do is uh, within all of our path operations, we're going to just remove data. And instead of returning, you know, a dictionary, we're just going to return posts. And so it, so fast API will automatically be able to serialize that and convert that into JSON. And I'm going to do that for all of these. We're just going to remove that data keyword for all of them. We don't need to do it for delete, but we do need to do it for update. And so now, if we actually take a look at what this is going to look like, if I hit send, you can see we just get back the post and we don't get that data keyword. Same thing for get post. What does that look like? Perfect. So we don't have the, the data keyword. Now let's actually define what the response should look like. And we do that with our schemas. We do that with our pydantic models. Just like we have a pydantic model for creating posts, which happens to just inherit from post base. So post create is just saying that we expect a title, we expect a content published as optional. And if you don't provide one, it's true. And so we already know how to work with that. Let's create a brand new class for the response. So, you know, this handles the direction of the user sending data to us. And now we want to handle us sending data to the user. So I can create a brand new class. We can call this post response uh, or we, because it represents the response or we could just call it post. It doesn't really matter. I'm going to call it just post. And then we're going to extend base model because all of our pydantic models have to extend base model. Uh, and then from here, what we have to do is we have to specify all of the fields that we want uh, in the response. So we want to send back the title because that makes sense. So we'll send back the title. We'll send back the content, which is going to be of a type string. And then um, we'll send back published as well, which is going to be a Boolean. And let's see what that looks like. All right, so this still looks exactly the same as uh, the other ones. But if you actually see right now, for any of the one requests that we sent, we get back the ID as well as the created at field. But since we didn't include those two fields, we shouldn't actually send it back to the user. So let's actually try this out. And so I'm going to save this. And then to actually define the response model, under a specific request, we'll start off with um, uh, we'll start off with the create request or create posts. And then within the decorator, we just pass in another field, and this is called response model. And then you can just let VS Code automatically select it. And then here we just reference schemas dot, and then the name of the class. So let's try this out and let's see what happens. So now if I create a post, okay, we get a 500 error, and let's see what happened. Uh, it says value is not a valid dict. So it's it looks like Pydantic is saying that, you know, when we try to send the response, uh, the, the data we got back was not a valid dictionary, right? And because Pydantic, the Pydantic class works with dictionary, it takes a dictionary and then converts it to that specific model. So what exactly happened here? Why is this causing an error? Well, if you look at the documentation, and where is it? Right here. And if you go under um, SQL relational database, it says that for your models, your Pydantic models, 
we have to add this extra config called class config or a mode true. And it explains exactly why we need that, right? Because by default, the Pydentic model will only read it if it's a dictionary, right? And that's what it's expecting in our code because we see that error. It's not a valid dictionary. And that's because when we actually make this query, right, new post, this is actually not a dictionary. It's a SQL alchemy model. And so Pydantic has no idea what to do with the SQL alchemy model. It only knows how to work with dictionaries. So we have to tell it to actually convert this SQL alchemy model to be a Pydantic model. And we do that by passing in this specific text right here. So this is going to say ORM mode true. This is an ORM model. And it's going to tell Pydantic say, to you know, ignore the fact that it's not a dictionary and go ahead and convert it. So we can just copy this text and add this to our code for our post model. And that should be properly indented. So now that should be good. And let's see if we still get an error now. So let's say it send. Look at that, we got it. It seems like everything worked okay, 201 created. But take a look at the fields that we got back. We just got title, content, published. And that's because our model explicitly specified title, content, published. Now we know if we go to our Postgres database, we do have an ID field and a created at field. So if we wanted to add those, we can say um, ID, which is going to be of a type int. Let's save that and let's see what that looks like. Right now we get the ID back. Perfect. Well, do we want the created at time? I think, you know, your front end code probably wants that as well. So let's go ahead and add that. So here we'll do created at. Now, what should the type for created at be, right? It is ultimately, you know, a date and time. Well, we can, we could do, you know, something like a string, but uh, what we can do that's better than that is we can import from date time, import date time. And so now we can say that the time, the created at is going to be of type date time. And so this is an extra little bit of validation to make sure that what we send back is a actual valid date time. Just make sure that you import it on in this file. And so now if I send this back, we now get created at as well, right? So this is how we ultimately define the data that we send back. We can specify exactly the fields we want and that way we can ensure we don't unnecessarily send data that shouldn't be getting sent, right? And we can do this with anything. I can just send back the ID if I really wanted to. Now we just get the ID, right? You see, there's a lot of flexibility and a lot of power uh, when it comes to defining uh, your responses, just like we had when it comes to defining our requests. And with APIs, like I always say, make sure you explicitly define the exact data you want to receive and the exact data you want to send back to the client. Now, before we move any further and wrap up this video, uh, you'll see that there's a lot of duplication, right? Because this post model for the response Right? It needs title content published, and then we're just adding ID and create it at. Right? And like I said, when it comes to a real application, you're going to have so many more fields, so many more columns. It would be such a pain to have to repeat both of them. And so that's why I ultimately created this post base class because I can extend the post base class. And what that's going to do is, is that's going to cause me to inherit the title, content, and published fields because they're already defined in here. And so I can just remove that. And so then I could just specify ID and create it at, and then it's going to inherit the other three from the previous class. And so now if I try this again, I send it, you can see that I get the same exact result, but I only had to specify the new columns I wanted to add in the response. So this is really no different than, you know, working with any other model in Python. We get access to all of the uh, usual features like inheritance, so we can help reduce the amount of code that we actually write. All right, and so now let's go ahead and uh, update all of the other uh, path operations as well, because we can see that we only did it for create posts, but let's go ahead and do it for get an individual post. So this is going to be the same exact response model. And we can just reference schemas.post. And we'll do the same thing for our update post as well. We'll say response model equals schemas.post. And then let's just, you know, double check. So get one post. This should work just fine. Perfect. 
uh, and then update post. And it looks like that works as well. And the last thing that we need to do is get all posts, right? So right now, if we do get all posts, uh, where is that? Right here. All right, we still haven't sent that. So let's do response model equals, and then we can say schemas dot post. And then let's try that out. We hit send, we get an error and this is expected. And I want you to stop and whoops, I want you to stop and think about what exactly is happening because we are returning a list of posts and it's trying to shape that into one individual post, right? We got a list of posts. We should be sending back a list of our schema post. So how do we do that? Can we just put a, can we just put a bracket or something like that? Will that work? Let's try this. Well, it looks like there's an error. So this doesn't seem to work. So how can we specify we want a list of posts? Well, we have to import something from the typing library. So we have an optional from the typing library. We can also import list. And so now if I go back to our get posts. I can say list. And so now if I hit send, we should get back all of our posts. So here we're just specifying we want a list of our specific schema post model. And that's just going to allow us to get a list of posts. Very simple. In the next couple of sections, we're going to focus on creating user functionality. And what I mean by that is having users be able to actually create an account within our app, uh, being able to log in, as well as being able to create posts that are associated with their specific account. And so the first thing that I want to tackle is uh, handling user registration. So we need to be able to provide a way for users to create a brand new account. And the first thing that we have to do is we have to uh, define our model, or more specifically, we have to create a table within our Postgres database that's going to hold all of our user information. And so since we're using SQL Alchemy, we're going to create a new uh, ORM model, just like we did for Post, so that we can define what our Postgres table ultimately looks like. Let's create a new class, and I'm going to call this class user. And this is going to extend base. That's just a requirement for any SQL Alchemy model. And then here we're going to provide the table name uh, within Postgres. So I'm going to say the table within Postgres should be called users. Then let's go ahead and figure out what are the different columns that we need. Uh, and so we're going to handle registration um, by having the user provide an a email address. So we should have a column for us to be able to store their email. So we'll say email equals column. This is going to be of a type string. And we're going to say that this is uh, nullable is set to false. So they have to provide an email. And then on top of that, we shouldn't allow someone uh, with, an, uh, with a specific email to register twice with that email, right? There should only be one account with one specific email. So we're going to say that the unique constraint is set to true. So that's going to prevent one email from registering twice. The next thing that we need is for us to be able to store the user's password. So we'll create a column for password. This is once again going to be a string. Uh, and then once again, the nullable is going to be set to false because we shouldn't be able to let them create an account without a password. And we don't need a unique constraint because I don't care if two users have the same password. It's up to them. And then finally, just like we had with the posts uh, class, we're going to have a column for uh, ID. So every user is going to have a unique ID. So I'm just going to copy and paste that. And so at this point, I think that's all we need for our user class. If you save it, um, it's going to reload the application. And it looks like I got an error. And I realized this should not be uh, str. This should actually be string. That's my mistake. And then actually, before we do anything else, I want to create it at column as well. So we could just copy this and then paste that in there. Like I said, pretty much any time you create something in your database, you want to make sure that um, you record when it was created. It's, you never know when you'll need that information. And so we've restarted our application. Let's go to Postgres. And uh, under my tables, I'm just going to do a refresh. And it looks like it went ahead and created our users table. And if we do a users properties, we should see that it created all four columns and all of the necessary constraints should be set there as well. And so let's uh, 
you know, just play around with this in Postgres just to make sure it works. Um, because I don't really trust SQL Alchemy ever. So let's do right click uh, and then we'll do view edit data. So right now there shouldn't be any users. And let's create a new user. So I'll say this is uh, john at gmail.com. Password, uh, you know, just put whatever you want for now. And then if we save that, right, it then successfully created a user. We got the, the generated ID as well as the created at timestamp. And then let's create a new user. So I'm going to use the same exact email. So this should throw an error because we shouldn't be able to register again. You know, some random password. And then if I try to save this, we should get a unique constraint on user's email error. So perfect. So that worked. And I'm just going to change this to be cindy at gmail.com. We'll save that and it should create those users. So perfect. So we've got the first step done when it comes to um, defining our table. The next thing that I want to do is we will create a uh, new path operation so that a user can actually send his username and password to our API and then we can actually generate that user. Just like we did with posts, we're going to create a new path operation for creating a new user. So we'll go to the bottom of our main document and I'm going to create a new function. I'll say, uh, we'll call this create user. And so just like we have for creating a post, I'm going to copy this decorator and we'll rename it. So it is going to be a post request, but it's going to be sent to the URL of users because we're no longer working with posts. And keep in mind, you get to select whatever URL or path you want to use. So if you want to call this, I mean, you, it's bad practice to call it create user, um, but you can choose whatever you want. I just, I think it makes sense to call it users. And anytime you create something, remember the status code should always be the default 201. And I'll get rid of the response model for now, just to keep things simple. Now we're ultimately going to be using our database to create a brand new user. So let's go ahead and copy this DB right here from all of the other path operations, because that's going to have to go in there. And then anytime we want to, you know, receive data from the user, because the user is going to have to send the email he wants to register with, as well as his password in the body of the request, it always makes sense to define a specific schema so that we can ensure that the user does provide both of those. So just like we did with posts, we're going to create a brand new schema. And I can call this user, or we can call this user. I think this one, it makes sense to call this user create. So this is going to handle just for creating users. And we're going to inherit from base model. And for the user create, there's going to be an email field, which is going to be a string, as well as a password field, which is going to be of a type string. And when it comes to validating the user, right, it's going to check to make sure that an email is provided and a password is provided. However, we can get a little bit more granular than that. If you actually go to the Pydantic documentation, we also have a field called email string. So this is going to validate that the email property is a valid email. However, we need to have the email validator library installed, but that should automatically have already been installed for us when we installed FastAPI with the all flag. And so if you do a pip freeze, right, we should be able to see that we have our email validator already installed. Uh, if you don't have it installed for some reason, just go ahead and do a pip install email validator. And that should install that library. And so what we'll do is from the Pydantic library, we're going to import email string. And then we can say this is going to be email, uh, of type email string. So that's going to ensure that this is a valid email and not just some random text. Then back in our main.py file, just like we did before, we can say user, and then this is going to use schemas.usercreate. Uh, and so the email address and the password is going to be stored in an object called user. There's going to be a Pydantic uh, object as well. And uh, if you forgot how to save data to uh, the database or create something uh, with SQL Alchemy, just go ahead and take a look at the create posts. And we can essentially just copy this. And we're just going to rename a few things. 
So we'll say new user. And then we're going to grab models.user now. And then once again, what we want to do is we want to take the user that we get back from here, from our schema. We want to convert it to a dictionary and then unpack that dictionary. Then we're going to add it to our database. We're going to commit it. Then we're going to refresh it so we see the brand new user. And then we can go ahead and just return new user. All right, let's give that a shot. And then within our uh, Postman, we can right click on this, select Add Request. We're going to name this Create User. This is going to be a post request. And then in the body, we'll go to raw once again, and then JSON. And then here we can pass in the email. We'll give it some random email. So I'll call this carl at gmail.com. And then password. This will be password123. All right. And then for the URL, just copy posts. And then here we'll just change this to users. All right, so let's give this a shot. Let's see if this works. And it looks like it worked, right? We got the email, we got the password back, we got the created at, and we've got an ID. But just to double check, like we always do, go ahead and go to your users table, select query tool, select star from users now, because we're now querying no longer the post table, we're querying the users table. If I run this, we can see that we do get the new email that we created or the new user that we created with carl at gmail.com. Now, as a quick test, just to make sure that email validator works, uh, I'm going to change this and we'll just say some random text. This is obviously not a valid email. So let's see if it properly creates that user. And it looks like our schema validator worked and says value is not a valid email address. So you can see the powerfulness of the Pydantic library being able to automatically check to see if that's a valid email address. All right, but one thing I didn't like about creating the user is that if we change this back to a valid email, I'll say, I'll just call this new user at gmail.com. We create that user. You see that he gets his password back. Now, why in the world would he want to see his password back? There's no reason to ever send the password back to the user at any point. Uh, and so one of the things I want to do is I want to define our response model so that we never send back the user. And I think you guys should already be able to do that, but we'll walk, I'll walk you through how to do that. So let's go to our schemas. We've got our user create. Let's create our, uh, let's create a new class and I'll call this um, user out. And so this is going to be uh, the shape of our model when we send back the user uh, to the client that requested it. It's going to extend base model as well. And here we're going to send out a couple things. Uh, so there's going to be an ID now. The user should know his ID. Email. That's going to be of email string again. And then we'll just leave out password. So by leaving out password, we won't ever send it back. But just like we did with the post model, remember, this is going to be a SQL alchemy um, model that we get. And we need Pydantic to convert it to a regular Pydantic model. So we need this config right here. And then in our path operation, we can set the response model to be schemas dot user out. All right. And then now if I just change the fields up a little bit, just create a new email, you can see that we get the ID and the email as well, but there's no password. And that's exactly what we want. And so now you guys should be fairly comfortable with um, being able to define a response model as well as an, uh, a request model so that you can pick and choose whatever field you want. Uh, one last change I want to make is I want to go ahead and just add the created at field as well. And we can just copy this right here. So now just create another email. Right? And now we get the created field. So we got all the fields that we want. In the last lesson, we handled the logic for creating a new user. But for a lot of the people that are familiar with security, I'm sure you guys may have had a little bit of a heart attack 
because we did something that's very, very frowned upon. We took the user's password and we just stored it as plain text within our database. And some of you might be thinking, well, what's the problem with that? Right? It's in our secure database. Well, right, our database is secure for now, but there are hacks. There are things that can happen. You know, these, uh, all of these records could potentially get leaked in some fashion. And it's very dangerous to just have a user's password just stored in plain text like this that anyone can read. So when it comes to working with passwords and databases, what you always want to do is you want to hash the password. So we never store the actual password in our database. We just store a hash of it so that if it does get leaked, well, no biggie because it's ultimately just a hash. You can't really reverse engineer that hash and get the original password back. So in this lesson, we're going to focus on uh, hashing the password when a user first registers so that we never actually store the raw password within the database. And within our Fast API documentation, they have a good article that kind of covers how to do that. So if you go under uh, security and then OAuth2 with password, it'll show you what we actually need to do when it comes to hashing. So there's two libraries that we need to install, right? We need passlib, uh, and so that's going to kind of handle the hashing, but we need to actually specify a specific algorithm because passlib can work with different algorithms. One of the more popular ones is bcrypt. So we'll need two different libraries. We'll need the passlib and then the bcrypt library, and we can just do that by running pip install passlib bcrypt. So I'll just copy this. We'll go to our application, and I'm just going to run that command. All right, and then let's just do a pip freeze just to make sure it got installed. And we see passlib there now, and then do we see bcrypt? And we see bcrypt in there as well. So we've got both of the libraries that we need to actually perform the hashing. So let's go to our main file, and somewhere up at the top, uh, I'm going to import from passlib dot context import crypto context and then what we need to do is some place below that we have to define this setting right here so we do pwd underscore context equals and then we reference that crypto context and then here we say schemas equals brackets bcrypt and then we'll do deprecated. Equals auto. All right, and so basically all we're doing is, and this should actually be a string. Uh, all we're doing right here is we're telling passlib what is the default hashing algorithm or what hashing algorithm do we want to use? In this case, we want to use bcrypt. So that's all this is doing. Now, when we go to our user registration down here, we have to do a couple things. And so before we actually create the user, we need to actually create the hash of the password. So the first thing is, whoops, that's we're not in JavaScript land. We're going to hash the password, which can be retrieved from user.password, right? Because that's going to be stored inside this object. And so how do we exactly do that? Well, what we can do is all we have to do is reference that password context, right? If you forgot what that is, just go all the way up to the top. That's this command right here. So we reference password context and we call the hash method. So that's going to perform a hash and then we just pass in user.password. And then we can store this in a variable called uh, hashed underscore password. And then what we're going to do here is we're going to take the user.password and we're going to set that now to the new hashed password. So that's going to update the Pydantic user model. And then at that point, we can just leave everything as is, right? So we hashed the password, so we got a hash, and then we stored it under user password, and then everything else can just be kept the same. So let's actually try this out. And let me just double check to see there's no errors and there isn't. So let's create a brand new user and I'll call this mark at gmail.com. Same password, that's fine. Send it. Looks like everything worked. And then let's just run this. And then if you see that most recent user, you can see that we no longer store the raw password. We store a hash of it. And so that's going to help it be a little bit more secure because if it does leak, then you know the hackers will only get 
access to a hashed password and they can't exactly uh, convert it back to the original password. That's the great part about hashing. It's a one-way street. We hash it, we only get the final password. You can never put it back into a function to convert it back to a password. Now, one thing I want to do is I want to extract all of the hashing logic and store it in its own function. So I'm going to create a new file. I'm going to call this utils.py. These are this file is just going to hold a bunch of utility functions. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to our main file and I'm going to remove this line or cut it. And we're going to paste it into my utils file. And then we're also going to cut this out. And we're going to move all of this logic into here. And then we're going to define a function that we can call. And I'm going to call this function hash. And it's going to take a password, which is going to be of type string. And all it's going to do is it's going to return pwd context dot hash of whatever the password the user passes in. And that way we uh, really extract and place all of the hashing logic into one file or one function so we don't have to import all of this nonsense into other files. And then in our main.py file, we can import utils. And then down here, what we can do is, instead of calling this, I can just call utils.hash. And then we'll pass in the user.password again. And this shouldn't really change anything else in our code. So let's try this again. I'll create a, I'll just add a one here. Send seems to work. Let's just double check. And the second user, the password was properly hashed. The next thing I want to do is I want to set up a route or a path operation that allows you to fetch and retrieve information about a user based off of their ID. And there's a couple of different reasons why I want to do this. Uh, one of them is uh, it can be part of the authentication process. So depending on how you set up the front end, uh, if you decide to, you know, set up JWT tokens to get sent as cookies, uh, then the front end may not actually know whether it's logged in or not. And so a lot of times you'll see some APIs have an endpoint to let you kind of retrieve information about your own account. Uh, and so if you're able to access it, that means you're logged in. If you're not, then um, you know that you need to fetch a new token. Uh, also, there's other reasons why you want to do this too. Uh, you know, if you're you know, thinking, taking a look at something like Twitter, right, you need to retrieve a user's profile if you want to view it. And so uh, in your API, you're going to have to set up a route so that people can retrieve someone's profile information. Uh, and so that's why I want to set up this route. I haven't really decided what we're going to ultimately do with it, but for now, I just want to set it up so that you can retrieve uh, information about a specific user based off of their ID. So let's go to the bottom of our code here, and we'll create a new path operation. And I'll call this uh, get user. And before we do that, I'm also going to set up the decorator. So this is going to be a get operation because we're going to retrieve the information about a specific user. And the specific path is going to be slash users and then slash ID. So kind of like how we did when it comes to retrieving a specific post, we're going to pass in the ID in the URL. And then we have to extract the ID. And I'm going to make sure that we uh, validate it as an integer. And the next thing that we have to do is since we're going to be interacting with the database, we need our DB right here. So we'll copy that. And then in our uh, actual function, we're going to do a quick query. So we'll do db.query. And then we'll grab models.user. And I'll say I want to filter uh, and then look for something with models.user.id equals equals. And then it's going to match up with the ID that they requested. And because there should only be one user with a specific ID, we're going to just grab the first one so we don't spend extra resources looking through the rest of our database. And we're going to store this in a variable called user. All right, and then uh, just like we did for uh, fetching a specific uh, post, if a user was not found, so if not user, we'll say we want to raise an HTTP exception. And we'll say the status code equals 404, whoops, HTTP status dot, and then we'll grab 404. And the detail is going to be 
user with ID, and we'll pass in the ID, does not exist. Um, but if the user is properly found, we will return the user. And it looks like there's some kind of weird issue with my formatting, so... All right, there we go. And so let's just quickly test this out. So once again, I'm going to create a new request, and we're going to make sure to save this one. And I'm going to call this uh, get user. Copy this URL. It's going to be the same same route. It's just going to be a get operation, and then we want to send a specific ID. So uh, take a look at your database, and then see if you can grab uh, an ID that does exist. So we'll just say one. We'll hit send. And it looks like there's some kind of issue because I'm not getting a response yet. So let me cancel out of that and let's see what we did wrong. And I realized I forgot to do app.get. Great. So we actually got the user. Everything seems to be working. However, there's one little issue. Uh, first of all, we should not be getting the password, right? We never want to return the password to the user. The user already knows his password. And uh, also, if you want to, if this route is so that you can retrieve a user's profile, uh, kind of like you can on Twitter or Instagram, then we're sharing someone else's password. And that's a little bit of an issue. Uh, and the reason why this isn't a hash password was because I didn't clear out my database uh, before we implemented the, uh, the hashing uh, of the password. So that's why it's in clear text. But whether it's hashed or not, you never want to send this out, right? You don't want anyone else to see your password. You don't even want the user to see their own password because someone else could intercept it and potentially do malicious activity with that information. So what we're going to do is we're going to filter out that specific field, just the password field. I want them to be able to get the ID, the created app field, and the email, and any other fields outside of the password. And fortunately for us, if we go to our schemas, uh, we've actually already defined a a schema for the user out. So this is going to be uh, any information about the specific user, except we're extracting out the specific password. Uh, and so we can just set the response model to be user out. And we'll go back to main.py and we'll say response dot model. Sorry, response underscore model equals schemas dot user out. All right, we'll save this and we'll try this again. So we'll retrieve this user and we still got the password. So what happened here? And this could just be an issue of me not saving. So let's try this again. Uh, still a little bit of an issue. And let's just make sure I imported schemas. I did. And let's go to our schemas. And I've set just these fields, so this should be good to go. I'm not sure why it's giving us errors. And uh, I made a stupid mistake. This should not be uh, within the function parameters. This should actually go inside the decorator. So it wasn't actually doing anything. And now if we try this, we can see that the password field has been successfully removed. Now that we've added a couple of path operations for users, if you take a look at our main.py file, it's starting to look a little cluttered. Uh, and you'll see that we've got all of our path operations for, uh, you know, handling CRUD operations for posts. And then you'll see that we also have all of our uh, path operations for working with users. So that's creating users as well as retrieving a user by ID. And, uh, you know, as I said, this is a little messy. And as we keep adding more and more path operations, it just seems almost unmanageable to keep everything in a main.py file. And instead, what I want to do is I want to break it out and I want to create two separate files. And one file is going to be for all of the routes or path operations that work and deal with posts. And then I want a separate file that will handle all of the path operations for working with users. And, you know, it's not quite as simple as just, uh, you know, moving these path operations to different files. We, ha we do have to learn about something specific to FastAPI. And this is nothing unique about FastAPI. You'll see that every single web framework is going to have a, a way to kind of accomplish this. And it usually involves something called routers. So we'll take a look at routers in this section and how we can use them to actually split up all of our path operations so that we can organize our code a little bit better. And so what we're going to do is we're going to create a new folder. 
and I'm gonna call this routers. And then within here, I'm gonna create two files. I'm gonna create one called post.py, and I'm gonna create one uh, that's called user.py. So all of our path operations uh, dealing with users is gonna be put into this file, and all of our path operations dealing with posts is gonna be put into this file. And what I'm gonna do is we're gonna to go to our main.py file, and I'm actually just going to copy all of my specific routes that deal with posts first. So we're just gonna keep going up, and I went too far up. Oh, this thing moves quickly, here we go. All right, this is gonna grab all of our posts. And I'm gonna just cut that out, and we're gonna just paste it in here. And there should be plenty of warnings and errors within VS Code. That's to be expected. Don't worry about that. We'll fix that in a bit. I'm going to do the same thing for the users. So let's go to our main.py file and just grab the last two path operations that we have for users and then paste it into this specific file. All right, so we've got a bunch of errors. Uh, and uh, let's go ahead and actually fix those first before we actually start working with routers. Uh, and so now that all of the uh, the path operations are within these files, we're going to have to import, uh, you know, things like app. We're going to have to import, well, we'll come back to that, actually. We'll have to import status. We'll have to import our schemas. We'll have to import the session object. We'll have to import all of our database-related things, our utils. So all of these things that we see, little squiggly lines, we have to import them um, because we had already imported all of these uh, in the main.py file. And so we'll start off by importing the models, the schemas, uh, and the utils folder if we need it for one of the specific files. You'll see that we only need this for the user file. Uh, and so the way we did it in our main.py file is we say from, and then this dot means current directory. So uh, we say, hey, from this current directory we're in, which is if I kind of close that out, you can see that everything is in the app file, app folder, sorry. And we're saying from the current app directory, I want to import models, which is right here. And then I want to import schemas and utils. However, in our user.py file, in our post.py file, uh, the models, schemas, and utils folder is not in the same directory because we actually have to go up a directory to the app folder to access them. So instead of doing one dot, if you want to go up a directory, you do two dots. So that's all we have to change. So in our user.py file, we'll say from dot dot import, and we'll say models, schemas, and utils. And so right there, we cleaned up some of our uh, errors that we're getting. And let's see, we also have to import status from the fast API library. So what we can do is we'll just go up here and I'm just gonna copy this. And right above this line, we're just gonna paste that in there. And the last thing that we need to import is from the database, uh, we, uh, from the database.py file, we're gonna have to import get DB and then from SQL, uh, alchemy, we have to import session. So if we go to our main.py file again, the SQL alchemy uh, code right here, we can just copy that. And I'm going to import that as well. So that's done. And then finally, we have the get DB. And if we take a look at our main.py file, the way we got that is so we're saying uh, from the current database file, we want to import engine and get DB. And keep in mind that the database file is not in the routers directory, it's in the app directory. So we have to go up a directory to access this file. So we just put two dots, pretty simple. So from dot dot database, import get DB. And we actually don't need to import uh, engine. Uh, we're gonna leave that here in our main.py file. All right, so now that we got all of that, the last error that we see is that uh, we don't have access to the app object. And so your instinct is to go to our main.py file and then import this. And that's not exactly correct. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to make use of the routers that I mentioned. And so from the fast API library, we're going to import something called API. First three letters, actually the first four letters, the API router. And then from here, we're going to make use of the API router object. So we'll say uh, router equals API router. Uh, so we're basically creating a router object. And then what we can do is we can replace the keyword app because we don't have access to that in this file. And we just use the word router. And you'll understand why we do this in a bit. So we've got those updated. And then we're going to do the same exact thing for our post.py. So we have to get all of these imports. I'm actually going to copy most of these because most of them are going to apply here as well. 
Uh, the only thing we don't need uh, utils for sure. So we'll remove that. And then uh, you'll see that list is still getting errored out. And that's because if we go to our main.py file, that's coming from this typing import. So I'm just going to copy that and paste that in there. And it looks like we don't need optional because it's kind of grayish. And so that's just VS Code telling us that we're not using it in this file. And I think that should clear up all the errors except for, once again, uh, the app object. And so we'll do the same thing. We'll say router equals API router. And then what we're going to do is replace the word app with the word router. All right. And then finally, we have to go to our main.py file and actually make use of these routers because uh, you'll see that in our main.py file, there's no reference to anything in here. So our API won't work if we try to run it now. So in our main.py file, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say from dot routers. So from this folder, we're going to import post and user. And this should be plural routers. And then I'm going to show you some magic that we're going to do. And so above this route, we're going to say, we're going to grab the app object, right? This is once again, our fast API object that we kind of do everything with. And we're going to say include router. And then we'll grab the post dot router, right? That's what we just imported. We imported post, which is coming from here. And we're importing this router object. And so what we've basically done here is uh, I have basically said as we, you know, when we get a pat, when we get a HTTP request, uh, you know, before we had all of our path operations in here. Instead, what's going to happen is, you know, we go down the list like we normally do. And, and so we'll, as we go down our list, this is our first uh, app object that we kind of reference. And in here, it just says, I want you to include everything. Uh, I want you to include our post.router. And so the request will then go into here. And it's going to take a look at all of these routes. And it's going to see if it's a match. Right? And if it finds a match, it's going to respond like it normally does. So that's kind of how we break out our code into separate files. We use these router objects. And we can do the same thing with the user.py. So we're going to go to main. And then here I'm going to type out the same thing. I'm going to say app.include router. And this time we use, we grab the user and then we do router again. And so once again, all we're doing is we're just grabbing the router object from the user file. And that's essentially going to import all of the specific routes. And so if we save our code and then we just quickly take a look at the, the terminal just to make sure there's no errors. Uh, it looks like everything's working. Let's test this out now. So I'm going to get all posts. Let's see if this works. It looks like it works. Great. Uh, let's create a new post. Looks like it works. Get one post. Uh, well, it looks like that post doesn't exist anymore. But if I try one, looks like it works. Uh, we'll delete post with the ID of three. Great. We'll update post. Create user. Just put in a new unique email and then get user. So grab that user. And we can see that every single route works perfectly. So we didn't change the functionality of our project at all in this video. Instead, all we did was we used a, uh, a router object to be able to sp split up all of our routes or our path operations into different files. And then we import them just by calling app.includeRouter and then the specific router object of that file. And you'll see that our code looks so much cleaner now. And as our app and our API continues to grow, we can just add new files into the routers folder so that we don't continue to clutter up our main.py file. In our two router files, you'll see that we use the same URL for almost all of our specific paths. Uh, and so you'll see for the get route, we'll use slash posts. For the post, we use slash posts. Uh, from the get specific post, we do slash post and then the ID. And then the same thing goes for delete and uh, and put as well. And I think it's kind of annoying having to continuously uh, copy and paste the same exact path when it's pretty much just a copy from each one. So is there a way we can kind of remove this unnecessariness? It doesn't seem like that big of an issue, but keep in mind that our API is very simple, right? Other APIs could have very long, complex, uh, you know, uh, routes that, you know, may not look as simple as ours. So they could have, you know, multiple things. Right, so it could look something like that, and then having to kind of copy and paste all of that uh, every on every single route can seem a little unnecessary. And so, anytime you're working with routers, what we can actually do is we can pass in a 
uh, parameter into the API router uh, function or method. And so what we can say was prefix, and we're gonna say that since every single route in this file always starts with slash posts, we can say prefix equals slash posts. And so now, anytime you see a slash post, we can just remove that and just put in a slash. So this is just gonna be a slash. And then when it gets to slash post slash ID, this is where it gets a little tricky. But once again, we just remove everything but a slash. And so what this is saying is that we're going to take slash posts and then we're going to append it with ID, right? Because that's, that's what this is saying. We're saying slash ID. So it's actually appending it with slash ID. So the final thing actually looks like it's going to look like slash posts slash ID. So nothing actually changes. It's just a simpler way to do things so that we don't have to write slash posts everywhere. And so we can, rem uh, we can remove this and just do slash ID. And we can just do slash ID here as well. And we're going to do the same thing in the users file as well, because uh, both of them start with slash users. And so we're going to put in a prefix here. And we're going to say slash users. So this can just be removed to slash. And this can be removed to just slash ID. All right. And once again, we're going to test this out. We're just going to test a couple of routes. So if get routes, get posts work. And if create, well, we'll try a get one post. That works perfectly. And then let's try creating a new user. We have to give it another unique email. Looks like it works. And then finally, uh, get user. We're going to try this again. And it looks like it all works. So, uh, you know, this is a completely optional step. It doesn't change the functionality of things, but I think it does make it a little bit easier to read. Um, because we put the prefix up here so that we don't have to keep copying and pasting. Now, as I mentioned, one of my favorite features of FASTA API is the automatic documentation that comes from Swagger UI. Uh, and so if you actually navigate to the URL, but just go to slash docs like I have, that's where you're going to see the documentation. And like I said, this is interactive documentation, so you can actually make requests from here. So you didn't technically have to use Postman for a lot of things. You can just test it out right here. And it's going to do the same thing. However, I did also want to teach Postman. But the reason I bring this up again is that uh, you'll notice how we've got a couple of routes for dealing with posts. And then we've got a couple of routes for dealing with users. And then we've got this random test one that we created when we were first learning about path operations. And what I would like to do is I would like to structure this documentation so that uh, instead of kind of grouping them all together, we can kind of group them based off of uh, the, their responsibility. So I would like to create a group that handles all of the post operations. Uh, so all of these five right here. And then I would like a separate group uh, that handles all of the user-based operations so that it's a little bit easier for your clients and your users to understand what each one does by grouping them accordingly uh, based off of their specific action. And so I want to have a group that actually is titled posts and a group that's titled users so that when they see that, they say, oh, the user section is going to be dealing with users and the post section is going to be dealing with posts. Uh, and getting this fixed uh, or updated in our code is super simple with Fast API. So uh, let's go to our fast API, go to our routers. And if we go to the post.py, uh, to add a specific group name, what we call, uh, it's actually called a tag. So we say tags equals, and we just say posts. And I forgot that comma right there. And we do the same thing for users. So we'll say tags equals. users. And you see, you can see that this is a list, so you can pass more than one. Um, but we'll save that. And then I'm going to refresh this page. And so now you can see that we now have these little titles so that we can now group our specific requests uh, into categories. Uh, and so the readability of our documentation has improved tremendously with essentially one line of code. In this section, we're going to start tackling one of the most important topics when it comes to building out an API or really any application, and that is authentication. Now, when you're working with authentication on an API or in any application, there's really two main ways to tackle authentication. There's the session-based authentication, and the idea behind a session is that uh, we store something on our backend server or our API in this case to track whether a user is logged in. So there's some piece of information whether we store it in the database, whether we store it in memory, that's going to keep track of if the user has logged in and when the user logs out. So that's one way of doing things. The other way of doing things is doing it, uh, is using JWT token-based authentication. 
And the idea behind uh, JWT authentication is that it's stateless. And what I mean by that is that there's nothing on our backend. There's nothing on our API. There's nothing in our database that actually keeps track uh, or stores some sort of information about whether a user is logged in or logged out. Uh, we, and you're probably thinking, well, how do we know that they're logged in? Well, that's the power of JWT tokens is that the token itself, which we don't store in, in our database and we don't store in our API, uh, it's actually stored on the front end on our clients, uh, actually keeps track of you know whether a user is logged in or not. And when I first started learning about JWTs, it was a little bit of a complex topic. It seemed like there were so many pieces that were in play. But then when you when I actually stopped to really understand it, I realized it's one of the simplest solutions. So hopefully I can make this as easy as possible for you guys. I hope this doesn't end up kind of confusing you like it confused me at first. It really is simple and there's really only a couple of steps, but uh, you got to really understand what a JWT token is and what we're doing on the front end and the back end to make it so that we can actually use it as an authentication solution. So let's take a look at the flow for how a user logs in, how a user is essentially authenticated, and then how a user accesses a specific path operation, resource, or endpoint uh, by using the JWT token to ensure that the API knows that we're logged in so that we can actually provide them that important information. And so what's gonna happen is the client or the front end, uh, whoever it is, they're going to try and log in. So what we're gonna do is we're ultimately gonna create a path operation uh, called slash login. And, and the, the client is going to pass the username and they're gonna pass in the password. So whatever the credentials are. So it doesn't technically have to be username and password. It could be email and password. It can be uh, whatever information that you want. So technically in our application, it's gonna be email and password because uh, we don't have usernames, I guess. Uh, we mostly just have emails. Um, but they provide their credentials. And so after we get their credentials, what we're going to do is, first of all, we're going to create, well, first of all, we're going to verify if credentials are valid, right? So if the credentials are correct, if the password matches, uh, the if the username and password match with the account, we're going to create this JWT token. And we haven't talked about what the JWT token is, so don't worry too much about it. But I've created an example token right here. And so you're probably thinking it just looks like a bunch of gibberish. And for the most part, it is. So moving forward, I want you to think of this as nothing more than just a string, you know, just a regular string in Python. That's kind of fundamentally what it is, uh, but there's a little bit more information embedded in it. But think of it as a string from the perspective of the client. The client doesn't know what the token is and it, it never cares. Really, the only the API cares what's actually in the token and what it means. And so we'll send a response back with the token. And so now the client has the token and so he can start accessing uh, resources uh, that require authentication. So anytime he wants to, uh, you know, let's say our application requires a user to be logged in to retrieve posts, what he can do is he'll send a request to the slash posts endpoint, um, but he also provides the token uh, in the header of the request. And you may not know what the header of a request is, but I'll show you guys, it's very simple. You can just think of it, it's somewhere in the payload of the request. And so he sends that, uh, and what the API is gonna do, our fast API is, first of all, it's going to verify the token is valid. And there's a couple of different steps needed to actually verify if a token's valid. And we're gonna cover that in the next slide, but just know that the API just checks, hey, is this a valid token? And if it is, well, then he just sends back the data. And that's it, All right? Our authentication system is dead simple. You, you provide your credentials, you get a token, and then anytime you want to access anything that requires you to be logged in, you just send the token in the header, and that's it. So hopefully this wasn't confusing. Hopefully you guys see the simplicity in the solution. The API doesn't actually track anything. There's no information being stored on the API. Instead, the client just holds onto the token and he provides it to us. And if we verify that the token's valid, that's all we have to do. So let's break down what exactly a JWT token is and what are the components that make up a token. And so I've got an example token right here. And this is kind of the same piece of text that we saw in the previous slide. Uh, and so it, once again, just looks like a bunch of cryptic characters just jammed together. And that's kind of what it is. It looks like it's encrypted, but keep in mind, it is not encrypted. This is important to understand, and we're going to make sure I drive home this point. It is not encrypted. Um, but the token itself is made up of three individual pieces. The first thing is the header. So the header includes metadata about the token. Uh, and so we're actually going to sign this token. Uh, so we're going to think of it almost like hashing the token. Uh, and so we have to specify the algorithm that we're going to use. So in this case, the default is HS256. So we've included that in the metadata. And then you can see the type is set to JWT. So this is a JWT token. So that's why the type is set. So the metadata is going to be the same for all of our tokens. 
This is just kind of fixed. Don't worry too much about it. It's not really that important. We don't really ever touch it. Now, the payload is a little bit more interesting. So the payload of a token is ultimately up to you. You can send absolutely no payload. You can send any piece of information that you want to send uh, within the payload. You can include anything that you want. However, you want to be careful with what you put in the payload because uh, it's important to understand that the token itself is not encrypted. Uh, and so that means anybody else in the outside world can take a look at a token and they can see what's in the payload. So you don't want to put any confidential information. You, want, you don't want to put any passwords or secrets or anything like that. Uh, instead, you want to stick to some very basic things. So very common things that we put in the payload are what is the ID of the user, right? So when I log in, right, normally our API is going to create a token and then embed my user ID into the token so that when I ask to get all of my posts, the, the API will be able to take a look at the token, verify it's correct, extract the payload, and it'll automatically know the ID of the user that requested this. But we can include other things. We can include uh, the user's role. So are they an admin? Or are they just a, are they a privileged user? Are they a regular user? Um, we can technically include any information. One thing to keep in mind is that anytime we need to access anything authenticated, we have to include this token. So if we jam a lot of information in there, well, it's going to increase the size of our packet. And that's going to be a, a waste of some bandwidth. So you don't want to jam too much information, just a couple of small things here or there. And then finally, we have a signature. So a signature is a combination of three things. We've got the header. So we take the header that's already in the token. We take the payload that's already in the token. And then we add our secret. So there's a special password that we're going to keep on our API. This is only on our API. Our clients will not know it. No one else will know it. Uh, and it's probably the most important thing to our whole authentication system. So you don't ever want this secret to get out. But we take those three things, the secret, the header, the payload, and then we essentially take that information, pass it into the signing algorithm, which is the HS256, and then it's going to return a signature. And this signature is important because we're going to use this to determine if the token is valid because we don't want anyone else tampering with our tokens. We don't want them changing data. You know, I don't want some user to log in and then just start changing numbers in here to make it seem like it's a different user because then they can potentially access other user's information. Uh, and so that's why the, we have this signature. It's just to make sure that no one has uh, tampered with our specific token. And so, you know, I just want to drive home that same point. First of all, there's no encryption. So anyone can see the data. The signature is just there for uh, data integrity. And what that means is no one has changed it. That means all the data that we have in there is still what it should be. No one has messed with the data. All right. And if you're still confused as to what a signature is, we're going to take a look at how signatures work, why we use them, and how they ultimately help us detect if someone changes uh, any of the information in our token in the next slide. And then I think at that point, you guys will see it's not really a complex uh, concept. And uh, once you get that, you'll see that the whole authentication process is fairly simple. Okay, guys, so we're going to do a deep dive into why we need the signature within the token. And you'll see this, this slide may look a little complex. There seems to be a lot of boxes, a lot of things going on. But as soon as I explain this, I think you guys will see that it's not too complex of a concept. So let's break this down step by step. Let's say a user has logged into our application. He sent our credentials and our API has created the token and it's in the process of sending it back to the user. So this is going to be our token that we create on our API. And it's going to create, it's going to have three things, the same three things we discussed in the previous slide. We've got the header that's got all the metadata. It's got the payload, right? And this is going to have whatever information we want to put in the payload. And in this case, we've decided to embed the user's ID as well as his specific um, role. Uh, in this case, he's a plain user. He's not like an, a special privileged user or a staff user or an admin. He's just a regular user of our application. So he can only do very specific things. And then we have to generate a signature. And our signature is going to be uh, a combination of three things. It's going to be a combination of our header. And remember, this header is the same thing. So even though our token already has the header, what we do is we take that header, we take the payload with the specific pieces of information we've included in there, and then we include, finally, our special super secret password. Remember, this password only resides on our API servers. Nobody else has access to it. Our clients don't have access to it. The front end doesn't have access to it. Only we have access to it on our API server. And this is very important because this is the special password that no one should ever have access to. And so we take all of these three things, we pass it into a hashing function, essentially, and then we create a signature. And so we take these three things, and that's going to make up our token. And so we send that back to the user. 
Now, let's say that we've got a user who decides that he wants to do a little bit of shady things and he wants to kind of hack our application and do some bad things to our application ultimately. And so what he's figured out is like, hey, look, this token, right? It's not encrypted. I can see all the data. I can see that I'm a user. And so what he's decided to do, he changed a few bits in the token to make it now read admin instead of user. But he could have really done anything, right? He could have changed the ID so that it's someone else's ID and he could potentially have access to someone else's information. It doesn't really matter, but he's changed a few things. And so now he's got a the, this token, which has the header, signature, and payload, uh, and he's now a admin user, or the payload says he's an admin user. Now, the reason he can't actually do this is because ultimately, remember, the signature that's currently in the token was generated by having a header, the, the same header, uh, and then it, you pass in the payload with this specific ID and a role of user. And then you pass in the secret. Uh, and so this signature is no longer valid. He can't use this same signature because it's not going to match up with the data that he has. So if we actually try to create a signature from this, it's going to look different. And so what he has to do is he has to create a brand new signature so that it matches the data he's sending. However, he can't create a brand new signature because he doesn't have this super secret special password. This only resides on our API server. And so if he tries to create a brand new signature, he can only pass in the header and this payload into the hashing function to generate a new signature. And so that, once again, is not going to be a valid signature because when he sends, let, let's say he does create that signature with only the header and the payload and no secret. Well, we now have this token, right? That's made up of these three things. We send it to our API. And what our API is going to do is to verify if the token is valid. He does a super simple test. He takes the header, he takes the payload, and he takes the secret and he creates a test signature. Because remember, that's what we did in the first place to actually create the original token. We take the header, the payload, the secret, and we pass it in to our signing function. Uh, and we pass it into our hashing function and create the signature. So we do the same thing. And then we take the signature in the token that was sent by the user. And we just compare them. If they don't match, which they won't, because remember, he doesn't have access to the secret. And since we use the secret in our hashing function, right, the signatures aren't going to match. And we know that this token is not valid. So this signature, once again, only ensures that the data integrity is still valid that no one has tweaked any of the bits, no one's changed any of the data. That's all the signature can do. It can just verify that it hasn't been changed uh, since we created the token in the first place. But once again, uh, and I can't stress this enough, anybody can change the data of a token, anybody can see the data of the token, they just can't generate a brand new signature because they don't have access to the secret. And so that's why the password's so important because that's how we ensure that the token hasn't been manipulated or changed in any way, shape, or form. So hopefully that made sense. Uh, I didn't understand this at first. It took me a while to actually grasp why we needed the signature. I just kind of was like, yeah, I'll figure this out later. Um, but after a year or so, I was like, oh, this is actually a super simple concept. And hopefully I can do a slightly better job of explaining it than some of the documents that I read when I was first learning it. And hopefully this kind of, uh, you know, gets rid of some of the unnecessary uh, stress that kind of comes with learning about JWT-based authentication. So once again, let's quickly take a look at how we're going to handle logging in the user. More specifically, how do we actually verify that his credentials are correct? Because it's not going to be exactly the same way that you would think. So the user is going to uh, hit the login endpoint and he's gonna provide the email and the password. And I've colored the word password in red because this password is going to represent what the user is trying to log in as. This is his attempted password. That's what we're gonna call it. And that's going to be in red and keep in mind that when he sends this password, it's in plain text, right? It's just the regular password that he typed out. And so when it gets to our API, the first thing that we're gonna do is we're going to hit our database to try to find the user based off his email or his username. And the database is going to send back all of the information about that user, uh, which includes the password. However, if you remember how we actually created the password and stored it in the database, we actually stored a, a hashed version of the password in the database so that if anyone hacks our database, uh, the user's passwords aren't actually in plain text, so no one can really hack their passwords. But this creates a, a little bit of a problem because we have the attempted password uh, the, for the login attempt uh, in plain text. However, we've got the password in our database as a hashed password. So how exactly do we check to see that they're equal? Uh, because right now, a hashed password does not equal the same as the regular password. And your first uh, instinct is to, hey, well, let's just convert this back to a plain text password. 
And we can't exactly do that because remember, a hash is only one way. So if we hash a password, we can't get the original password from the hash. That's what's great about hashing a password. Uh, and if you think you can do that, that's actually, well, I guess what we would refer to as encryption, but we're hashing in this case. So what do we do uh, to verify if the passwords are actually equal? It's pretty simple. We take the hashed password and then we take the raw, and once again, this hashed password is the, the correct password in our database. Then we take the password attempt and we hash it again. So we hash this password. And so then we get a hashed password. And so if we have the correct password, then if we put it through the hashing function, these two should be equal. Uh, and so if they're equal, that means the password they provided us is the correct password in the database. Uh, if it's not, the, if they don't match, that means he gave us the wrong password. And so uh, if they're correct, we'll then go ahead and send it. We'll create a token first and then we'll send it to the client. So it's as simple as taking the attempted password, hashing it, and then comparing it with the hashed password in the database. Because if the passwords are correct, then the hash should equal the hash in the database. Okay, so we're going to create the login path operation. And what I'm actually going to do is you're probably thinking that we can just store the path operation in the users.py router. However, I think it would make more sense to actually store this in a authentication router. So we're actually going to create a brand new router for this so that we can keep the user routes versus the authentication routes in two different files. However, if you really wanted to, you could store it all in one file. So I'm going to call this auth.py. And the first thing that we have to do is from the uh, fast API, we're going to import a few things. Uh, we're going to import the API router. Uh, we're going to need depends, status, HTTP exception. And maybe we need the response. I haven't decided. And then we're going to define our router. So we'll say router equals API router. And we're going to pass in a tag, you know, just for the documentation. So we'll say tags equals authentication. All right. And then we're going to create our uh, login. So we'll call this, uh, well, first of all, this is going to be a post request because remember the user is going to have to provide his credentials. So uh, generally when you want to send data in one direction, it's going to be a post request. And we'll send it to the login endpoint. You can call this whatever you want. You can call it authenticate. However, I like login. And then we'll define our function and I'll just call this login as well. And because we're ultimately going to have to uh, fetch the user from the database, we're going to have to import uh, our, uh, our database session. And so from uh, SQL Alchemy, we'll say dot ORM import session. And so we'll do the same thing that we did with every other path operation. I'll say DB session equals depends. And then we're going to have to actually import our get DB function. So from here, we'll do from, and we have to go up a, a directory and I'll say database import session. Sorry, not session. Um, actually, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to say from dot dot import database. And then I can just reference it as database dot get underscore db. Right. And since the user is going to be providing the login information, I think it makes sense to set up a schema so that we can ensure that they provide the exact uh, pieces of data that we ultimately want. And what we're going to do is we're just going to create a new class and I'm going to call this user login. And this will extend the base model as usual. And the two pieces of information that we want are email, which is going to be a string, and then we can do password, which is going to be a string. Actually, I'm going to, I'm going to use an email string like we did before. And then from our auth.py, I'm also going to import schemas. And here I'm going to store the schema as a user credentials. It's going to be schemas.user login. All right. And so now we can access all the user information or the attempted login information with the user credentials variable. And we're going to make a request to our database, specifically our users table, to retrieve the user based off of his email. So we'll say db.query. And, we'll, and we have to import models now. 
so that we can access it. And we'll say models.user. And then we have to filter based off of the email. We'll say models.user once again, dot email equals equals user underscore credentials dot email. And then there's only going to be one user with that specific email. So we'll do first. And we'll store this result in a variable called user. Now, if there's no user with that specific email, then we're going to return a error or we're going to raise an exception. So we'll say if not user, we're going to raise an HTTP exception. And the status code is going to be status dot. And I'm trying to remember what code will, oh, it's going to be a 404 because that user doesn't exist. And then the detail field, we're just going to say uh, invalid credentials. Because normally with authentication, you don't want to say, hey, this is the wrong email or this is the wrong password because you don't want to make it a little bit easier for them to kind of guess other people's information. Just say this is invalid credentials. Let them figure out whether it's the email or the password. And then after this, uh, once we verify that we did actually get a user object, we have to verify that the passwords are equal. So this would be, um, you know, performing that logic of, of hashing the password that they gave us and seeing if that it compares to the password from the database. And so what we're going to do is we're going to create a new function in the utils folder that's going to be responsible for comparing the two hashes. Or actually, it's going to take in the raw password, the password attempt. It's going to hash it for us, and then it's going to compare it to the hash in the database. So we'll create a function. We'll call it a verify. And it's going to include the plain password, which is the password the user is trying to attempt. And then the hashed password, which comes from the database. And all we have to do is just return. And then we can reference the PW context, right? So if you want to hash a password, you just call the dash the dot hash method. However, it's also got a, another method for us, which is verify. So it's going to perform all this logic for us. So we just pass in the plain password and then we pass in the hashed password and it's going to figure out the rest. Now you're thinking, well, you know, what is the point of such a tiny function? Why don't we just include it in our auth.py? Well, we 100% could because you know, it's, it, it's really two lines of code. It doesn't really make sense to store it in, in another file. However, then we also have to import all of the, um, the bcrypt code. And I like to have everything kind of separate. So keeping all of the bcrypt logic in one file just makes things a little bit easier to manage. But in our auth folder, uh, we can import utils now. And we're going to run the utils.verify. And we're going to pass in the first the plain password, which is going to be uh, stored in user credentials. So we'll say user credentials.password. And then we pass in the hashed password from the database, which is stored under user. So we'll say user dot password. All right. And if they are not equal, so if, if they do not equal each other, which means they provided us the incorrect password, then we're going to raise another HTTP exception. And this is going to be the same thing. We're going to send a status code of uh, 404. And the detail is going to be the same thing. We're not going to tell them that it was the wrong password. We're just going to say invalid credentials so that it's not easy for them to kind of keep guessing passwords or emails. All right. And then at this point, what we would do is we would create a token, which, you know, we haven't really gone over how to do that. And then we would just return, return token. Um, but you know, once again, we haven't done that. So I'm just going to return. And we'll just say token. And I'm just going to say example token, right? Because we haven't implemented that logic, but I do want to make sure that the rest of the code looks good. So we'll try that out. And I'm going to go in, create a new request. This will be login user. It'll be a post request. I'm going to copy this. Actually, this is just going to be slash login. And then in our body, we're going to provide uh, some JSON. And here we're just going to say email is whatever. And password is whatever. And before I actually do anything, uh, I'm going to run a query on my database because uh, if you see, I've got a couple of users that don't have hashed passwords. So I'm actually going to delete everything 
just so I can clean up some mess. And uh, I'll just say, and what I'm actually going to do is I'm just going to delete everything. I, I think that's going to just make things simple because I don't even remember these guys' passwords. So it's going to create some issues for us. So we'll just say delete from, and I'll say users, and then I just won't provide any condition. So this should delete everything. We'll run that. And you can see that it looks like it deleted all 12 results. And that's perfectly okay. And I'll add my original query back, select star from users. And what we're going to do is we're going to just register a new user. So I'll do create user. And I'm going to call this Sanjeev at Gmail. And then the password is going to be password123. So let's create that user. Let's take a look. All right, we've created that user. And now let's log in. Uh, this user. So we'll go to login and I'm going to provide my Sanjeev at Gmail. And then we're going to provide a password, which was password one, two, three. Let's try this out. And it looks like we ran into an issue. So what, well, first of all, that's the wrong error message. I'm not sure why it gave me that. Let's just, it should say invalid credentials. So where is this actually happening? And guys, I made an absolute silly and stupid mistake. I forgot to actually wire up this router in our main.py file. So it doesn't even know about it. So let's import this. We're going to say import auth. And all we have to do is just one skin. Actually, I'm just going to copy this. And we'll just say auth.router. All right, let's try this again. All right, and we've got our example token, which means that we verified that the passwords are correct and everything was good to go. We just haven't implemented the logic for the token, but let's just make sure that uh, when we put in the wrong password, it still works, or it actually, it shouldn't work. And we get invalid credentials. Let's put the right password back in, and then let's use the wrong email. And we get invalid credentials as well. So, um, so far, we are almost done with the whole login process. The next thing that we got to do is uh, handle creating a token. It's not going to be too difficult, um, but I do want to save that for the next video. Now, if we head on over to the fast API documentation under security, there's going to be OAuth with password. Uh, and so most of the things I cover are going to be coming from this documentation right here. Uh, now, the first thing that we have to do is we have to install a library that handles signing and verifying JWT tokens. And so we're going to use this Python dash Josie library, and then we have to provide a uh, cryptography back backend. So we're just going to copy this line right here, and we're going to run this uh, in the command line. And what I'm going to do is when it comes to authentication and anything with JWT tokens, I'm going to create a new file and I'm going to call this OAuth2.py. All right. And the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to import from Josie. We're going to import JWT error and JWT. Now there's going to be three things, uh, three pieces of information for our token. Well, actually, uh, well, there's three pieces of information, but there's three other things about the token that we need to provide. So we're going to say uh, we, we're going to need the secret key, right? That's that special key that I mentioned that ultimately handles uh, verifying the data integrity of our token, which resides on our server only. So we're going to have to provide that secret key. We're also going to need to provide the algorithm that we want to use. We're going to be using HS256, and then we're going to need to provide uh, one other thing, which is uh, the expiration time of the token. So we haven't really discussed the expiration time. If we just give a plain token uh, without an expiration date, that means that user's logged in forever. And there's no application that just lets a user log in forever, I don't think. Uh, so we're going to provide a expiration time so that we can dictate exactly how long a user should be logged in after they actually perform a login operation. And so we need an expiration time. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to just save these as uh, variables. I'm going to say secret key equals, and then this is just going to be some arbitrary long text. I'm just going to paste that in here. And if you're just wondering why, uh, I mean, this, if you just follow the documentation, actually, right, you'll see that they do the same thing. So we just need to give it some really long text in this case. And it even gives you a command to kind of get a string like that for your password. Um, because you uh, you could theoretically just put, you know, hello or something here, and that's going to work just fine. However, it's not quite as secure, but for learning purposes, it doesn't matter. Just provide some kind of string. 
right? And then the algorithm is going to look like this, and then the expiration time is going to look like this. So I'm just going to copy this from the documentation. And then we're going to define our function. So this is going to be create access token. And what we're going to do is remember the access token is going to have a payload. So whatever data we want to encode into the token, we have to provide that. So I'm going to pass that in as a variable called data. And this is going to be of type dict. And what we're going to do is we're actually going to make a copy of this data because I don't want to actually change it. I want to make a copy of it because we're going to, we're going to manipulate a few things and I don't want to accidentally change the original data. So we're going to say data dot copy. So this is going to make a copy and I'm going to store it in a new variable. And it's going to be two underscore code. So this is all the data that we're going to uh, encode into our JWT token. And then now we're going to create the expiration field. So to actually do that, there's a couple of things. First of all, right now we have it set to 30 minutes. Uh, and so what we need to do is to provide the time uh, of 30 minutes from now, right? So we have to provide the time that it's going to expire in. So we have to grab the current time and then add 30 minutes. And so anytime you're working with dates and times, we have to import the date time library. So we'll say date time import date, time, and time delta. And I'm going to say expire equals date time dot now. So this is going to grab the current time. And I'm going to pass in time delta of, and then since this is in minutes, I would say minutes equals access token expire minutes. And then what we want to do is we want to grab the to encode, which is a, a copy of a dictionary. So this is also a dictionary. And I want to update it. And here we're going to pass in expiration, and then we're going to provide the expire time. So we're just adding that extra property into the, uh, into all of that data that we want to encode into our JWT. And so now our JWT will tell us when it's going to expire. And what we're going to do is we're going to call JWT um, coming from the, is it Jose? I guess it's the Jose library. So JWT.encode, so this method is actually going to create the JWT to token. And we'll say the first property is everything that we want to put into the payload. The second one is going to be the secret key with the signature. And then we have to specify the algorithm. So the algorithm equals algorithm. Algorithm right there. And then at this point, we're just going to return. Oh, well, we have to save this in a variable. And here we just do encoded JWT. And then now we can go back to our specific path operation. And since we're already importing, actually, we have to also import OAuth too. And then here we're going to create an access token. And we're going to call the, sorry, not utils, OAuth2 dot create access token. And we're going to say the data equals, and then we're going to pass in a dictionary. So here, the user ID. Remember, this is the data that we want to put in the payload. So I have decided that I'm going to put in the user ID and pretty much nothing else. I don't really care about anything else. We could give it a role, we could give something else. But for me, I just want to encode the user ID. So that's what I'm passing in here. However, if you wanted to provide some extra information about the user, if you wanted to provide uh, you know, the scope of different endpoints they can access, you can put all of that information in here. And so I'm going to say the user ID is going to be set to user.id. And so now what we can do is we're going to return a few things. I'm going to say we're going to return the access token, which equals access token. And then we're going to tell the user what kind of token this is. So this is token underscore type. And this is what's referred to as a bearer token. And I'll explain how to actually configure that on the front end. Um, but we, literally in the authorization header, we just write the word bearer and then we provide the token. So nothing special there.
All right, let's try that out. And it looks like I got an error. I don't know why I put an equal sign there. And let's try this out. So we got, we've got the login endpoint. Let's put in the correct email this time. And let's see what happens. Look at that. We got an access token. And this kind of looks like a JWT token, right? It just looks like a bunch of random text. And then it tells us it's a bearer token. So let's actually copy this. And what I want you guys to do is uh, go to your web browser. And I want you to search for JWT. And then go to the first, well, go to JWT.io. And then here, what we can do is we can paste in our JWT token. And what's really cool is it's going to decode the token for us. And so you can see this is the algorithm we used. It is a JWT token. But take a look at the user ID, right? This is the actual user ID that we passed into the token. So all of the data that we encrypted into the token are all sitting right here. So we also got the expiration time and then the signature somewhere in here as well. Um, but isn't that pretty cool, right? It was able to decode that. And it's important to understand that, you know, none of this is encrypted. Anybody can see this information, but by being able to sign it, we know that no one can kind of mess with it. And we can also specify an expiration time. So we know that how long this token is valid. So when the, the our API gets it, it's going to just verify that nobody touched the token. It's going to verify that, hey, the expiration time, you know, isn't before the current time, which would mean that it's already expired. And at that point, it already knows the token's valid. And then we can assume that uh, everything is good to go. We're going to make one small change when it comes to retrieving the user's credentials in our login route. Instead of passing it in the body, we're going to use a built-in utility in the Fast API library. So if we do from Fast API dot security dot OAuth, whoops, OAuth2, we're going to import something called OAuth2 password request form. And so what we can actually do is instead of just doing the, the usual here with the user credentials, we're actually going to delete that. And I'm going to provide a dependency. Well, actually, I need the user credentials because we have to store it someplace. But here we say this equals OAuth2 password request form equals depend. So we're setting up a dependency kind of like we do with the database. And so this is going to require us to retrieve the credentials. And then Fast API is automatically going to store it inside this variable called user credentials. However, we have to make one small change. So the username in when you retrieve the, uh, the user's attempted credentials from here, what it's going to do is it's going to store it in a field not called email, but it's going to store it in a field called username. So when we compare the models.user.email when we're querying the database, we can't compare it to user underscore credentials.email because there's no field called dot email, right? It's going to only return two things. It's going to return, whoops, it's going to return something. It's going to return our username, which equals whatever. And then it's going to return our password, which equals whatever. Uh, and so we don't have access to email. We have to use user dot, uh, sorry, user underscore credentials dot username because, uh, well, this is actually a bad example because you have to think of it as like a dictionary, right? It's coming in like this. And then there's going to be a, a user field. You're going to have username. Oh, why is that capitalized? Username, which equals, blah. You're going to have username, which equals, you know, blah. And then you're going to have password, which equals blah, right? And so we'll just tag user credentials dot, and then we'll grab the username, which in our case will happen to be the email. Uh, the OAuth2 password request form doesn't really care what, act, what the username is. It could be a username. It can be a... Uh, email, it can be an ID, it doesn't really matter, it doesn't really care. It's just whatever the user actually sends, it's just going to store it in a field called username. So those are all of the changes that we have to make uh, from our back end side. Now, when it comes to testing things, we no longer send the credentials in the body like we normally do. Like if I try to send this now, we're going to get an error, right? Because it says uh, username uh, is field required value error missing. So what we, and the password's also missing. So what it's doing is it no longer expects it here. Instead, it expects it inside form data. So here I'm gonna say username, and this is gonna be my email in this case. And then my password here. And so let's try this now. And now it successfully works. So those were the couple of changes that we have to make. 
Um, but you'll see that it makes life a little bit easier by setting up that dependency and using the built-in functionality of FastAPI. In the last lesson, we learned how to log in a user by sending a request to the login endpoint and providing the username and password. And our API will then return an access token, which the user can then use to retrieve data from our API. So anytime he needs to access a endpoint or a path operation that requires a user to be logged in, he'll just send this JWT token in the payload and then our API has to actually validate the token. So in this video, we're going to handle the logic for verifying that the token is still valid and that they didn't tamper with it, as well as verifying that the token hasn't expired. Now, before we do anything, what we're actually going to do is we're going to define a schema for the token um, because uh, we know that the user has to provide the access token. So uh, just like any other piece of data, uh, if we expect them to send something, it's best to set up a schema. So we're just going to set up a schema for access token and token type and just make sure that they uh, match accordingly. And so here we're going to do class token. And we'll say the access token is going to be of type string. And the token underscore type is going to be of type string as well. And then we can also set up a, 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 a schema for the token data. So the, the data that we embedded into our uh, access token. So we can say token data base model. And then here we did embed the ID. But I'm going to say this is optional for now. And it's going to be a type of string if it is set. So it can be optional and we got to import optional as well. And so that's going to come from the typing library. And then in our OAuth2 file, we created an access token function. And then we have to create a function to verify the access token. So let's create that function and it's going to just be called verify access token. And what we're going to do is we're going to pass in a token, which is going to be a string. And we're also going to pass in the specific credential exception. So we're going to pass in uh, what our exception should be if the credentials don't match or if there's some issue with the token. So we'll just store this in a variable called credentials underscore exception. And I'll explain this a little bit later. And so here I'm going to say JWT, right? So we're going to access the JWT library. I'm going to say JWT dot, and then it's going to have a function and if you take a look at our options, I'm sure you have an idea because creating a token, we did uh, uh, encode dot encode. I'm guessing you can figure out what is the specific method for decoding. It's going to be decode, obviously. And here we're going to pass in a couple of things. First of all, the token. Then we have to pass in the secret key so that we can decode it. And then we have to pass in the algorithm that's used. So we can just pass an algorithm. Once again, these both of these are coming from these variables right here. Not ob it's obviously not a good idea to store the secret key uh, within your actual code. Uh, but like I said, we're going to have a later section where we'll turn these into environment variables so that it's not hard coded into our code. And we're going to store this in payload in a variable called payload. All right, and so this will just store all of our payload data. And to extract the data, what we can do is we can say payload.get, and then we have to get the specific field that we put in. So if I go back to my auth.py file in my routers, and you take a look at my data, you can see that we have a field called user underscore ID, and that's going to get the ID of the user. So here we just say get, and then we just pass in that same exact name, users underscore ID. And we'll say that this is going to be stored in a variable called ID. And this should be of type string. And if there's no ID, then we're going to raise a credentials exception, right? So whatever exception we provided into this function, it's going to raise that. And then we're going to say token underscore data equals schemas dot token data with the ID equals uh, the ID that we extracted out of here. And I see that we didn't import schema, so I'll import that real quick. So we'll say from dot, 
import schemas. Right, and so all this is going to do is it's just going to validate, you know, that it matches our specific token schema. Now, it, if you look at our schema, right, it's literally one thing. So it's not super exciting and I made it optional. So we shouldn't actually make it optional, but we'll come back to fixing this in a bit. Um, but this is just going to ensure that all the data we pass in the token is actually there. And so that's why I'm using a schema for that. However, for one actual variable, you don't actually need to do that, especially since we're checking to see if it exists right here. But it's good to always make sure so that in the future, if we do add extra fields, uh, we can also validate the schema here. Now we're almost done with this function. However, there's one little issue um, because we can run into an error in any one of these lines. And so anytime you're working with code that can error out, uh, you want to do a try except block. So we'll do try. And then I'm going to indent these. And then here we'll say accept. And then we're going to pass JWT error. And this should not be capitalized. And remember, this is coming from the Jose library. And once again, we're just going to raise a credentials exception uh, if there's any kind of error that we didn't account for. All right, and the next thing that we have to do is define one last function. And this is going to be called get current user. So what this is going to do is, and so what this is ultimately going to do is that we can pass this as a dependency into any one of our path operations. And when we do that, what it's going to do is it's going to take the token from the request automatically extract the ID for us. It's going to, well, it's going to verify that the token is correct by calling the verify access token. And then it's going to extract the ID. And then if we want to, we can have it automatically fetch the user from the database and then add it uh, into, uh, add it as a parameter into our path operation function. So here, all we're going to do is we're going to pass the token. And so this is going to be a type string. And then here we just say depends which has to be imported from the fast API library. So we'll say from fast API import. We're going to import depends status and HTTP exception. So here we'll say depends and then we'll pass in a OAuth2 schema or OAuth2 scheme. So what we have to do here is it's going to be a little bit confusing. We'll say OAuth2 underscore scheme. And this is going to be equal to, and we have to import one more thing. So we'll say from fast API dot security import OAuth to password bearer. And then here we just reference OAuth to password bearer. And what we have to do is we have to provide one field called token URL. And so this is going to be the the endpoint uh, of our basically our login endpoint. And so if you go to your auth.py, you just grab whatever name this is. Uh, keep in mind, you don't have to name it login, but you just have to pass this into here. Actually, sorry, you remove the slash. So it's just login. And then we're going to grab this variable and I'm just going to pass it into here. And this is kind of just tying everything together. And then we have to define our uh, credentials exception that we're going to pass into the verify access token function. So when the credentials is wrong or there's some kind of issue with the JWT token, what uh, exception should we raise? So here I'm just going to say HTTP exception. And we'll set the status code to be a 401. So unauthorized. Detail. Uh, here I'm going to pass a string. Once again, could not validate credentials. And then we have to set some headers as well. And so just go ahead and just copy this in. And then finally, we're going to return uh, a call to our verify access token function. And since we have the token passed into the get uh, current user, we can pass it into our 
verify access token. And then we also can provide the credentials. All right, so just to quickly recap, because I know we did a lot and I think some of it may be confusing, um, but what's gonna happen is anytime we have a specific endpoint that should be protected, and what that means is that the user needs to be logged in to use it, uh, what we're gonna do is I'm going to, uh, well, as an example, let's say that uh, users who wanna be able to create a post, they need to be logged in. What we can do is we can just add in an extra dependency into the path operation function. So I can say uh, here, I would just say get, current underscore user, which would return an int. And then we'll say this equals, and then we pass in a dependency. So we'll say it depends on oauth2.get underscore current user. So this is gonna add a dependency, uh, which is gonna be that function that we created called get current user. So anytime anyone wants to access a re resource that requires them to be logged in, we're going to expect that they provide an access token. And then we provide this dependency, which is going to call this function get current, uh, sorry, where is it? Get current user. And then we pass in the token that comes from the request. We're going to then run this verify access token in this case. And then it's going to prov uh, provide all of the logic uh, for verifying that the token is okay and that there's no errors. And if there's no errors, then we go ahead and uh, return nothing essentially. And that means that they were successfully able to um, be authenticated. If we do return some kind of error uh, with the credentials exception, then it, they're going to get that appropriate 401 response back. So that's how our login works. It's nothing special, um, but there are a couple of different components that are involved. And uh, in the next lecture, we'll start to take a look at um, starting to protect our specific endpoints so that it forces users to be logged in to actually perform that operation. And guys, I made one little mistake. Uh, in the verify access token function, I forgot to return something. And so if you ran into any issues, uh, it's because of this. So what we're going to do is here is we're just going to do return token underscore data. And so what's really happening here is once again, we're going to decode the JWT. We're going to extract the ID. If there's no ID, then we're going to throw an error. Uh, and then we're going to validate uh, with a schema, the actual token data, which in this case is just an ID. So that's the only field, but if you had extra properties or, or extra information, you can pass that in. And then we want to make sure we return the token data so that we can actually make use of that data. And keep in mind, remember, the get current user is what actually calls the verify access token. So when it calls verify access token, it expects us to return the token data. And then when we get the token data, we return it to whoever calls this function. Okay, guys, so I found a few extra bugs that we need to fix. Now, the first thing that I messed up was when we actually set the expiration time under the create access token function, instead of date time dot now, it should be date time dot UTC now. This is important um, because as I was testing it, I kept getting uh, an expiration error and that's because this should be a UTC now. And the second thing is we want to put this in brackets because I guess it expects a list of algorithms. Maybe we'll put that in there. And then finally, uh, this is also a bug right here because if you take a look at the payload, when we create the token, uh, which uh, I believe should be in the auth.py. When we log in, we pass in uh, the data as user underscore ID and not users underscore ID like we did here. So remove that. And this should prevent us from running into any other potential issues in the upcoming lectures. Sorry about that. I know we ran into a couple of bugs, but that's what happens when you try and copy and paste really quickly. Before we wrap things up, there's one last change that I want to make. Inside the login route in the auth.py router file, um, I noticed that for the response or, or the exception that we raise if the, either the user's email is wrong or if their, uh, if their password is incorrect, um, I used the wrong HTTP status code for the exception. And I can't remember what I actually had it before because I went ahead and fixed it. But I want you guys to go ahead and change the two exceptions here. Uh, in both of those cases to a 403. I think that's a better representation of what we should be sending when the user doesn't provide proper credentials. So just update it here and then update it here as well. And then you guys should be good to go. Okay, guys, we're pretty much done with all of the authentication side of things. The only thing that we have to do is require the user to authenticate because right now, uh, you know, if we perform any operation like creating a post, uh, you can see that I could just create a post and that's it. I don't have to log in first. I don't have to do anything. So anyone can create posts, anyone can delete posts, anyone can do anything they want. 
Obviously, that's not how your API is going to work. Uh, you're going to want to ensure that users are logged in to perform certain operations. And there may be certain operations where they don't necessarily need to be logged in, depending on how you want to structure your application, right? Because, you know, if it's like a, a Twitter-like application, right, anyone can see anyone's tweets. I just can't delete anyone else's tweets, right? And to create a tweet, I have to be logged in. Uh, and so it depends on what you want to do for your application. But what we're going to do is we're going to start off by forcing the user to be logged in before they can create a post. And doing this is actually really simple. So let's go to our uh, post.py and let's find our create posts. Now, the first thing I want to do is I'm going to import OAuth 2, which is coming from this OAuth 2 py file. And then in our create posts path operation function, we're going to add an extra dependency. And this dependency is going to be the uh, create or sorry, get current user function that we defined in our OAuth 2 file. So we'll say is depends, and then we'll say OAuth 2.get underscore current user. And then we're going to store this in a variable called, uh, we'll say user underscore ID. And this is going to be a integer. Okay. And so all this is saying is that uh, this function is now going to be a dependency. So this is what forces the users to have to be logged in before they can actually create a post. And so when this function is called, whenever they hit this endpoint, the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to call this function. And this function, all this function does is really just call the verify access token but, and passing in the, tacken, the token which comes from the user. Uh, and so it takes the token. Uh, we first decode the token. We extract the ID from the payload. And if there's no ID, we throw an error. And then you can see we validate the schema. Uh, and then this, sorry, this is something I actually added in uh, off camera. So we can just delete that and then go back to what you guys have. Um, but we ultimately return the token data, which is nothing more than the ID, right? So we could rename this as ID for now. But like I said, in the future, you may want to add extra uh, fields into the payload. And then it's no longer just the ID. It's going to include extra information. So we're going to return the ID, which then gets returned by the get current user function. And then in our post.py, uh, in our function, we're going to return the ID and store it in a variable called user ID. And so then we can ultimately access the user ID by just calling user underscore ID. That's it. And we can do whatever we want uh, with this user ID. And you'll see we'll eventually add some more logic. Uh, but for now, I'm just going to print it out just to see what we see. And let's go ahead and try this. So first of all, I'm going to create post, and then we're going to see what happens now when I try to create a post. Look at that, not authenticated. So by putting in that extra dependency, we have ensured that the user has to be authenticated before they can use this post. Now, how do we actually provide the token so that we can actually use the create post? Well, first of all, let's get a token. So we're going to go to the login user. I'm going to hit send. I'm going to get a brand new token. And then what we want to do is we want to go to create post. And then we want to go to headers. And then we want to create a header. And you know, you can see I, can, I created one already, but uh, I'm going to type this out for you from scratch in the line below it. So we say authorization is going to be the, the key. And then the column is going to be, and you type the word in bearer because it's a bearer type token. So you do bearer with a capital B, space, don't forget the space, and then paste it in. Okay. And so now this is included in our header. And so we should be able to send a request. And so now look at this. We were now successfully able to um, send our token. The API was able to validate. It was a valid token. And it was able to then allow us to create a post. And uh, just another little postman tip. Uh, you can uncheck this for now so that it's not authorized. See, if I try to do it now, you see I get an error. You can go into authorization and then just type in, uh, go to bearer token and then paste it into here. Does the same exact thing. Uh, it's just, you don't have to type in the word bearer for yourself and then, you know, have to do all of that. You can just hit send now and it does, does the same exact thing, whichever method you prefer more. Now that we've protected our create posts route, uh, let's go ahead and do this with some of our other routes. So it's just a matter of just copying the dependency for get current user and then uh, for retrieving a post. Well, 
remember, this part is up to you. You decide ultimately what routes you want a user to be logged in to actually perform an operation. Um, but for delete posts, I'm definitely going to force a user to be logged in. And for update posts, I'm going to do the same thing. And then finally, uh, you know, like I said, for getting posts, you know, it, it's really up to you. Um, we'll say that you have to be logged in to do anything. So for get posts or getting all posts, we want to make sure that they're logged in. And then for getting an individual post, we want to make sure that they're logged in. And then finally, the last thing that we, well, it's not the last thing, but uh, one of the things I forgot to do is under auth.py, when we send our access token uh, after they log in, uh, if you remember in under schemas, we actually created a token model, uh, or sorry, token schema. We never actually used it. So let's actually use that um, by setting the response model here. And this is going to be schema dot token. Schemas dot token. So let's save this. And this should be capitalized. Sorry about that. And so now if we log in a user, we should still get no errors. So perfect. Okay. So just in case in the future we accidentally change something. Uh, we're still going to perform that validation to ensure that the token, on we only send those two fields when we return a token. Now let's quickly just test all the other routes. Uh, so if I do get posts and I hit send, you can see, well, let me save everything. Sorry about that once again. Now if I hit send, you can see I'm not authenticated. So I have to do the same thing. Uh, so once again, you can do authorization bearer, or you can go to authorization and then just select bearer token and then paste in the token. And now if I hit send, oh, sorry, I got to recopy the token again. Now if we send, it works now, get one post, let's try this, not authenticated, we'll go into authorization, bearer token, send, that works. Deleting posts, go to once again to authorization. And there's no post with an ID of three, about four. All right, that worked. And then finally, update post. We're going to do the last thing and bearer token. All right, and that works. And then let's just double check to make sure that. If there's no token, what happens? Error, perfect. Okay guys, so I think that's going to wrap up this video for now. We've pretty much done uh, all the authentication that we need to do up to this point. There's one last thing that I wanna test to verify that everything works the way it should. And uh, we probably should have tested this in one of the previous videos, but I forgot to do it. And I wanna make sure that we test the expiration process because a JWT uh, has an expiration time that we set ourselves and this just ensures that a user is logged in only for a certain amount of time. Now we set the access token expiration time to be 30 minutes. Uh, and so that means that if a user logs in and he keeps his token for more than 30 minutes, after that 30 minute mark, if he tries to use that token to access any of our endpoints, it should throw an error because it's already expired. So let's test this out. And the easiest way to test this is, first of all, we're not gonna wait 30 minutes, that's ridiculous. So what we're gonna do is, we're gonna set this to one minute. And we're just going to test this real quick. And so I'm going to log in this user. So this token is valid for exactly one minute. And so we'll go to create posts. Actually, we'll just do get posts. It doesn't really matter. And I'll paste this in here. And you'll see this works. And we're going to just wait for one full minute. And after one minute, let's just verify that we get a unauthorized error because the token has expired. Okay, so it should be about one minute now. And so if we test this, we should now get an error. So after one minute, it says it could not validate credentials. Now we could set up a log message to say that, hey, this token is expired, but um, we don't need to worry too much about that. Uh, as long as it throws an error and it gives them a 401, I think that's good enough for now. And so this confirms that our expiration functionality works. And the last thing to do is, well, let's make sure we change this back. So once again, it doesn't matter what time you choose, it's up to you. I'm just gonna do 30 minutes. Actually, I'm going to do 60 minutes just for testing purposes uh, moving forward. I don't want to have to continually uh, get a new token after every 30 minutes. So 60 minutes is a good number.
Now you might be wondering why exactly do we have this get current user function when all it really does is just call verify access token. We could completely just remove this and just call this directly whenever we want to authenticate a user. And you absolutely could at it, with the current implementation. But the idea behind the get current user function is that uh, once the verify access token uh, re uh, returns the token data, which is the ID, the get current user function should actually fetch the user from the database. Uh, and so that way we can attach the user to any path operation and then we can perform any necessary logic. Now you don't actually have to fetch the user here. Uh, it's up to you how you want to implement this. If you want each of your path operations to fetch the user themselves, they have the ID so they can do it themselves. However, if you wanted to automatically do it here, you 100% can do that. And so I'm going to show you guys how you can do that in this lesson. And so keep in mind, we get the token data back, which is going to be nothing more than an ID. And what we're going to do is, first of all, uh, we need access to our database so that we can fetch the users. So from here, I'm going to import database. And within this function, we can pass in uh, the, uh, the dependency so that we can actually get access to the DB object. So I'll say depends. And then we're going to access database dot and I already forgot the name of the, the function. What is it? Get underscore DB. So get underscore DB. And we'll say DB session equals. And then we have to import session from SQL Alchemy. And so now we can make requests to a database. And what we're going to do here is, first of all, I'm no longer going to return that directly. And I'm going to say token equals, and then we're going to call the, this function right here, verify access token. All right, and since we have access to the token, what we can do now is we can say db.query. And then we have to import models. And I'm not sure if we've done that already. We haven't, so I'll import models. I'll say models.user.filter. And then we want to filter based off of the ID. So I'll say models.user.id equals equals token. And then we just grab the ID field. And then we're going to grab the first one. And then we can return the user, which I forgot to save it. So user is going to be equal to the result of that. And if you want to, you can print user here, but um, I already know this is going to work. So we can just go and save this. And then in our post.py, right, when we call this uh, dependency right here, it's no longer returning the user ID. So I don't think it's, it's a good practice to call this user ID anymore because it represents a user. So I'm going to say, I'm going to call this current underscore user, and we're going to rename this everywhere. All right, and then here within the function, I'm going to print out current underscore user. And so if I try to create a post now, and then open up my console, you can see that it printed out the user object, which is not very helpful, but uh, what we can do real quick is, I'll just say current.user.email. We can see the email of that user, just to verify that we are actually getting the user, and we can see that it does print out the email. So that's ultimately why this function exists, because normally here, this is where you query your database to grab the user, and then you return the user. And then whatever you return here, is ultimately what allows any of your other routes to get whatever you're returning. So since we're returning a user, we're gonna store it as a variable called current user. In this video, we're gonna take a look at some of the more advanced features of Postman. And we're gonna start off by taking a look at environments. So select the environments tab, and you'll see that uh, Postman just gives you a quick description of what an environment is. It says an environment is a set of variables that allow you to switch the context of your request. So we can set up some variables that change depending on uh, what environment we work in. And uh, you're probably thinking, well, what exactly is the point of that? And let me give you a great example. 
And if you take a look at all of our requests, you can see that we hard-coded them to be 127.0.0.1 port 8000. And this is our development environment. Now, when we ultimately go to deploy our app, it's not going to be deployed on 127.0.0.1. It's going to be deployed on some server. It's going to have a public IP somewhere on the internet. And so when we want to test out our production server or make some changes to our production server, make some test requests to it, we would have to change the IP address, the port number, as well as we probably are going to be running um, HTTPS instead of HTTP. So all of our requests, we'd have to change all of them uh, and then continuously flip back and forth every time we move from dev to prod and then from prod back to dev. And so instead of having to hard code these values and then change it constantly, we can actually create a variable that changes depending on what environment we use within Postman. So let's go to environment and let's create an environment. And I'm going to call this environment, uh, we'll say this is dev and then uh, our project name, which is fast API. So this is our environment. And what we can do is we can define a variable and I'm going to call this one URL. And then here, I'm going to actually just copy this URL. And then go to our environment again, and then I'm going to give it an initial value. All right. And then our current value should update and then we can just hit save. Okay. And so we've set this variable to be this specific IP in our dev environment. And so if we go back to collections and then go to our Git posts, first of all, now moving forward, you want to make sure that you're working in some kind of environment. So we'll select the environment we just created. And then instead of hard coding this value here, I'm going to change this. And I'm going to just say to actually use a variable, you do curly brace, curly brace, the name of the variable, and then curly brace, curly brace. Okay. And it should be orange instead of red. If you get a red, it's going to mean that it wasn't able to resolve something and there's some issue. So just double check what you did. Orange is good. And then if you see this result, when you hover over, hover over it, that means that everything's working. And so just to quickly test this, you can see that it says could not validate credentials. That's perfectly fine. Uh, I didn't set up the access token or anything, but this does confirm that we're able to resolve that variable. And so that way, you know, if I go and then create a new environment and I'll just add a uh, here, and then we'll say this is prod fast API. We can then give a different URL for the um, production environment. So this could be like, you know, HTTPS colon slash slash, I don't know, you know, some domain name that you buy. I'll call this Sanjeev.xyz slash. And then I can save this. And so that way, uh, if you ever are testing your development environment, you just go to dev. And then when you want to quickly switch to your production, you just change to that. And then the URL will automatically update. So you don't have to change anything yourself. And it's super handy to set this up. And we're just going to do this for all of our requests moving forward. So I'm just going to copy this. I'm going to do this for all of them. Okay. And if you go ahead and test this yourself, uh, you should ultimately not run into any issues. Uh, I'm not going to bore you through, you know, individually testing these. You can do this yourself. Uh, and if you, you know, if you run into errors, it's just, you probably paste it in something wrong. Now that we've set up authentication on our API, testing our API has gotten a little bit more challenging. And that's because I can no longer just go to create posts and then just hit send because I have to be authenticated first to be able to actually create a post. And so what I have to do in Postman is I have to hit send. I have to log in and then get the access token. I have to copy the access token and then go to the specific endpoint I want to test. And then I want to paste that in there and then hit send. And then I can finally create post. And this is a little cumbersome and tiring. Uh, and it gets really hard if you have a, a short expiration time on your token. Imagine if you had an expiration time of five minutes. Then every five minutes, you'd have to repeat this process. Uh, but luckily, Postman has a way to actually do this uh, through an automated fashion, right? We're all developers. We all want to do things automated. So let's take a look at how we can do this. And I had to make sure that you guys understood uh, environments and variables beforehand, because uh, this, the method that we use actually makes use of environment variables. So let's go to the login user endpoint, and we're going to hit send and get a new access token. And so we've got this access token. And what I want to do is through code, I want Postman to automatically set an environment variable. So how do we do that? Well, Let's go to tests. And here we can put in whatever code we want. And so we can read the documentation on how to do this. But the ultimate goal is to uh, set an environment variable through code. So how do we do that? Well, there's a little snippet here that kind of gives you examples. 
Uh, and uh, what we want to do is we want to set an environment variable. And so to set an environment variable, you just do environment.set, provide the key, and then the variable name. And so just like we did with uh, environments, right? If you go into your environment, uh, you've got the URL, which is the key, and then the value. And so we're just going to do the same thing, but just through code. So here I'm going to set the key to be JWT. And I'm going to set the value to be this access token. So how do we actually retrieve the access token from the response of the request? Well, we can do pm.response that grabs the response object, then we'll convert it to JSON, and then we need to get the token. And the token sits on a property called access underscore token. So whatever this field is called, this is what you're going to pass in. We'll say dot access underscore token. All right, and so now if I send this again, we'll get the token, the code should have run, and it should have set a variable called access token. And so now under create post, instead of hard coding this, what I can do is I can actually uh, just reference the JWT variable. And so I set minus capitals. There looks like there's one from a previous project maybe, uh, but we want this one right here. And if you want to just double check, you could see that this ends in WYD3O. And if you want to go back into login user, you can see that this ends in WYD3O. So it looks like it did set that and update it accordingly. So we'll set that in there. And so now if we send, you can see that it uh, we can now create posts. And so anytime you log in a user, it's going to update that token. Uh, and we can verify this. If you take it the last three letters, Q0A is the new token. And then I'm going to just remove that so we can see the value. And we can see that Q0A is the last three letters as well. So this updates it dynamically so that all you have to do is now uh, just hit login user, and then you can start testing all of your other endpoints. And we're going to update all of the other endpoints as well. So for get posts, I'm going to put that in there as well. And then for getting an individual post, deleting a post, updating a post. Uh, we don't need it for create user. Um, we might want to do a forget user if we set up authentication for get user, but we haven't done that yet. So we'll hold off on doing that for now. Now, currently our application doesn't work like a traditional application would. And the reason I say that is, you know, if you take a look at how everything's been set up, um, not just in our API, but in our database, we've got two tables, a user table and a post table. So we can create, modify, delete users, however we want. We can log in. And then we can create, modify, and delete as many posts as we want, right? And you're probably thinking, well, that, that sounds perfectly fine. Yes, however, think about any other application. Think about any social media type application. When someone creates a post and you see that post on your feed, what are you gonna see next to the post? You're gonna see the user that created it, right? So every post is ultimately associated with the user account that created that post. But we have no way to actually do that in our application at the moment because there's nothing that ties a post to the user that created it, right? Take a look at all of the columns in our database. We've got uh, an ID, a title, content, published. Technically, there's a created at column that I didn't draw in this diagram, but that's okay. So how do we know what post was created by what user? And this is where relational databases really start to shine because the, the main idea behind a relational database is that you set up these relationships between tables. So we need to set up some kind of special relationship between the user's table and the post table that will allow us to associate a post with a specific user that created that post. So let's take a look at how we can do that uh, within Postgres or any SQL based database. And the way we do that is we actually create an extra column in our post table. So we've got a column, you can call it whatever you want, but I'm going to call it user ID and I'll explain why. And what we're going to do is we're going to set up a special foreign key. And a foreign key is a, how we tell SQL that this column here is connected to another table. And what we do is we specify two things. We specify the table that it should be connected to. So here I'm saying, hey, this should connect to the user's table. And then we specify what specific column it should use from that table. And here we're saying the ID column because this connection is connected to the ID column of the user's table. And so that's what we set the foreign key on. And all this is does is this is really such a simple concept. Whatever user creates this post, we just embed the ID of that specific user. So for the post with the ID of 621, the user that created this has an ID of 212. So if we take a look at what user has an ID of 212, we go here and we can see that clay at gmail.com created this post. And so that's all we have to do to set up 
a relationship between these two tables. And so now moving forward, any post we create will easily be able to tell what user created it because we're going to embed the ID of that user into this column called user underscore ID. And if you take a look at the second one as an example, we can see that this was created by a user with an ID of 378. So we go into the user table and we can see that this user is mike at gmail.com. And it really is as simple as that. And this is what's referred to as a one-to-many relationship within SQL or any relational database. Uh, and the reason why they call it that is because one user can create as many posts as they want. However, a post can only be associated with one user. Two users can't create a post. And so that's why this is referred to as a one-to-many relationship. One user can create many posts. And that's all we have to do. It is actually that simple. We just create another column, and then we have to specify this special foreign key constraint where we just tell SQL, hey, what table do we look for and what column? And keep in mind, in this case, I'm using the ID of the user's table. Um, but when you get a little bit more advanced with SQL uh, and setting up relational databases, you'll find that it sometimes you don't have to always point to the ID of another table. There's, there's going to be a lot of instances where you set up foreign keys to other columns that aren't necessarily the ID column. Depending on how your relationships are set up and how your application should work, that is a perfectly acceptable thing. There's no um, specific re uh, restriction saying that it has to point to the ID column of another table. And so I think that's enough theory behind foreign keys and relationships. So we're going to connect to our Postgres database in the next section and we'll start creating that extra column, adding the foreign keys, and then we'll start learning about how to actually work with these relationships. All right, guys, go ahead and open up PG Admin. And before we get started, I'm going to do something a little unusual. I'm going to delete everything from our post table. Now, when it comes to creating an extra column and creating a foreign key, that's not a requirement. You know, you don't need to do that in a production database. I'm just going to delete everything just to keep, just to make things a little bit more simple moving forward. Um, because if we don't delete anything, when you start to add columns that especially have a not null constraint, uh, we have to do a little magic to kind of get that to work. And I want to keep things as simple as possible. So what we're going to do is we're just going to delete everything from the post table just to make things as simple as possible. So we could just say delete from posts and that should delete everything and everything's gone. And we should be pretty much good to go to actually start setting up our foreign key. So right click on your post table and then click on properties. And the great part about these foreign keys is that, you know, we just have to do this on the post table because it's a one to many relationship. There is nothing in the users table that we have to do. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to column. And then we're going to add a new column. And I'm going to call this user underscore ID. And you can once again name this anything you want. The actual name doesn't have to make sense. But, uh, you know, I think naming it user underscore ID makes sense because this is a column that's going to represent the ID of the user that created our post. The data type. Now, this is important because the data type of this column needs to match whatever the uh, data type is of the ID column. Uh, from the users table. So we always set the ID up to be integer. So you want to match this. However, keep in mind that it, sometimes when you're working with databases, it might be uh, some other data type, right? If you use big int, you definitely want to make sure that this is also a big int. If you use a small int, make sure this is a small int. If you use UUIDs, make sure that this is a UUID as well. You just want to match up with whatever that column is in that respective table. Uh, now, we have uh, the options to set this as not null. So right now, we can create a post with a null user, which means there's no user that created this post. Uh, and if and to figure out if you should set this to be not null, it just depends on how you want to set up your application. Should the database allow you to have a post without a user? It's up to you to decide. I'm going to say no for now. I'm going to say not null, because I don't want to be able to create a post without a user. It doesn't make sense. All right, and then after that, what we can do is we have to set up our foreign key constraint. So let's go to constraints and then we want to go under foreign key. So this is where we set up that magical connection between the two tables. Hit the plus sign and then give this foreign key a name. The name of the foreign key doesn't matter, right? It doesn't impact the functionality of anything. This is more just for you as a user to be able to read it a little bit more clearly when you see it on the CLI. But there's a standard convention uh, that we like to use when it comes to naming our foreign keys. What we like to do is we like to take the table that we're working on. So it's going to be posts. And then we do underscore, then the table that we want to set a foreign key to. So it's going to be users. And then we just do underscore F key. Once again, this is just nothing more than a, a name 
to describe the foreign key. It's not actually doing anything at the moment. To actually set up the logic of the foreign key, we have to open this up and we have to go under columns. And so this is how we actually set up the relationship. So here we're saying, what is the name of the local column? Uh, the column in our posts uh, table. Well, we created our brand new user underscore ID. Then it's going to reference what table? Well, we know it's going to reference the users table. So we select the users table. And then what column from the users table is it going to reference? Well, it's going to reference the ID column of the user table. And then at that point, you just hit plus. It gets added up here. And before we move on, there's one last thing I want to cover because we're almost done. We have to go under actions. And because we're setting this relationship up between two different tables, we have to figure out, you know, what happens when uh, a user gets deleted, right? Because right now, a post is going to have the ID of the user that created it. What if we delete that user? What do we do? So if you go to the on delete section, we have a couple of different options. Uh, one of the more common ones is cascade. And so what cascade does is if I, let's say, if I have a couple posts that were created by a user with an ID of seven, if I delete that user, then Postgres will automatically go into my post table and delete any posts that were created by that user. And so that's one option. That's what I'm going to use. However, we have other options as well. We can uh, set it to the default value of a column. So if we give the column a default value, uh, maybe we create like a, like a random ID of zero or something, then it's going to assign all of those posts that were created by the deleted user to zero. We can set it to null. So if we did set null, then it's just going to set the user ID column to null if that user gets deleted. Keep in mind, if you want to be able to use set null, then you have to go back to columns to make sure this is not set to uh, allow you to set it to null. So we'd have to set it to no, or then it would throw an error when you try to delete someone. And then there's a few other options, but uh, we're going to stick to cascade. And then keep in mind, you can do the same thing with uh, uh, on update. So what actions do you want to perform when you update a specific user in that case? Um, but we'll leave it as no action for now. Uh, I just mainly care about the on delete. At this point, that's all you have to do for foreign keys. You just specify the column of the other table it should point to, and you're good to go. We'll hit save. And then we're going to go under posts. Well, actually, before we do that, we're going to go under users. We're going to view all rows. And let me clear out some of these. There's too many windows open, all right? And these columns got a little squished. Um, but right now I have three users. Uh, it's got an ID of 17, 18, 19. So go ahead and remember that. Obviously, your database is going to be different. So uh, just remember the IDs of a couple users. And what we're going to do is we're going to go under our posts and we're going to view edit. And so right now I have no posts because I deleted everything. So I'm going to create a brand new post and I'll just call this now. This is my first post. And the content is just going to be some random content. I'll leave published blank um, because we've got a default value. And then right now, if you take a look, we've got this new user ID column. So if I try to save a post right now, Take a look at what happens. It gives me an error. It says null value in column user ID vol um, violates not null constraint. So because we said that user ID cannot be null, we have to provide a user ID. So let's give it an ID. And if we go back to users, I can see that there's going to be, I can use 17, 18, or 19. So whatever user created this, I'll just say John created this. So we'll grab an ID of 17. And I'll say that this is going to be an ID of 17. And then if we save this, look at that. We now have a relationship between the users table and the post table. Let's create another entry. I'll call this second post. And it's going to have some random content. And I'll say that this was created by the user with an ID of 18. And that should work just fine. Now, what I'm going to do now is uh, what happens if I create a post and I give it an ID of a user that doesn't exist? So I have IDs of 17, 18, 19. What happens if I set the user ID column to be a value of 20? Well, let's, let's try that out. So I'll just call this third post. And then we'll set the content to be something random. And if I set this to 20, let's see what happens. If I hit save, look at this. Insert or update on table post violates foreign key constraint. There's no user with an ID of 20, right? So that doesn't exist in that table, so it's going to throw an error. So uh, that's the magic behind foreign keys that it's going to check to make sure that that user actually exists. And so this isn't going to work. So we'll just set this to 17 as well. No, save that. Right. And that's it guys. And when it comes to, you know, kind of querying these users, 
right? Let's uh, go back to our database and let's just set up a query. Now let's say I want to get all of the posts created by user 17. Well, we can do select star from posts where, and now instead of, you know, searching for based off ID, we grab the user ID column and we set that equal to 17. So this is gonna get me all of the posts that were created by user 17. If I run that, you can see that this got the two posts from user 17. And then if I change this to 18, we're gonna get the one post created by user 18. So from a SQL perspective, right, nothing's really changed. You just specify what column you wanna match on and then provide a condition. Now, what I'm gonna do now is I'm actually going to delete this user. So I'm gonna go and just say, uh, delete from users, uh, where ID equals 70. So we're going to delete John at Gmail. And we're going to actually do that here. So I'll say, first of all, select star from posts. All right, so we've got all three posts. And I'm going to run another query, except I'm going to say delete from users where ID equals 17. So what is going to happen when we delete those users because we have posts that have relationships to them. Well, since we set the on delete to cascade, it should delete these posts automatically for us. So I'm gonna leave this down here so it's gonna run another query so we can see exactly what our table looks like after we delete this user. And so if I run this, you can see that when I run a select star from posts, there's only one entry left and that's the one with the user ID of 18 because it automatically deleted all of the posts created with an ID of 17. All right, and so from a database perspective, uh, I think this is all we really need to cover for now. Uh, eventually we'll start taking a look at joins, which is how to run these complex SQL commands that allow you to uh, jam the columns of multiple tables into one result uh, to make it a little bit easier to retrieve information. Because right now, if I, if I try to get all of the posts, uh, you know, like send me every single post in my database, right? It's just gonna give me the user ID. But if I need the information about the user, like what's the name of the user, what's the, the username or the email, then I would have to individually query the, uh, the IDs of these users. So I'd have to go then, I'd have to do you know, a select, whoops, make sure I don't delete anything. I'd have to do a select star from users where ID equals 18. And I'd have to do this one by one for every single post so that I can get this specific user. And so that's when we start to make use of things like joins, um, but that's a little ahead of us at the moment, and that takes a little while to explain, so we're gonna come back to that. Um, but before we actually kind of move on from this database side of things, because we pretty much covered everything, we're going to delete that column for now, because we're gonna make sure that SQL Alchemy actually sets up all of these constraints for us automatically, so that we don't manually have to do it. So let's go to our properties, go to columns, we can just delete this column, and then I think this should automatically delete the foreign key. It does not delete the foreign key, so make sure you delete that as well. And then we can save that. And it looks like there's, it's throwing an error. So let me cancel out of that. And I think we're gonna have to do this in a two-step process. So we'll say constraints, we'll delete the foreign key first, we'll save that, and then properties, we'll delete the user ID. There we go. And so now if I do a select star from posts, right, there should no longer be a user ID column. So this put our database back into the state it was in before we started playing around with it. So now that we know how to create and set up a foreign key, within Postgres and PG Admin, we're gonna see how we can do this through code using SQL Alchemy. Because ideally, since we're already using SQL Alchemy to generate all the tables, uh, generate all the columns for each table and all the different properties, we should also set it up to the generate the foreign key for us as well. So we're going to go to the models.py file. This is where we define what the tables are gonna look like with the different classes. And we're gonna add a new user ID or owner ID column to the post class, and that's going to create a specific column within the post table. And so we can just go here and, you know, call it owner ID, user ID, whatever you want. I'm just going to call this owner ID. And this is going to be column. 
And then here we have to specify the data type of the column. And uh, as I mentioned, the data type should match up with whatever the data type of the foreign key is. So since this column is going to point to the ID column of the user table, it should match up with whatever is here. So since this is integer, this has to be integer as well. Then to set up a foreign key constraint, you just type in foreign key and then go ahead and auto import that. If you don't know where it's getting imported from, it's gonna get imported from SQL Alchemy. So uh, if you didn't automatically do it, you can go ahead and just manually type that out. And then there's going to be two fields that we're gonna pass in. So the first of all, we have to pass in the exact column uh, and table, table and column that we wanna reference. And so we want the users table and then grabbing the ID column. And so your instinct would be to use the class name, but we don't actually reference the class name. Instead, we wanna reference the table name. So it's gonna be lowercase in this case. So you say users dot, and then what's the column name? It's called ID. So we say dot ID. And then the second thing we need to do is, uh, if you recall, we have to set up what the policy is for when we delete the foreign key or the parent table. Uh, and so we always used a uh, cascade so that if the parent object gets deleted, all of the child ob objects get deleted as well. So we can do that through SQL Alchemy as well. And we'll say on delete equals, and then we just say cascade. And then finally, we want this field to be nullable equals false. So it has to be filled in. All right, and now if we save this, restart our application, we'll take a look at Postgres. And if I actually refresh this, and this is actually an old, an old panel, so I'm gonna remove that. And then if I just do, uh, we'll go to our post table, go to query tool, I'll say select star from posts, run that you can see that there is no actual owner ID column. Uh, and so the reason for this is that uh, SQL Alchemy, when, it, when we start our application, SQL Alchemy will check to see if there's a table called posts. And if there is, oh, sorry, if there isn't, it's going to then create a table based off of these rules. However, if there's already a table named posts, uh, it's not going to do anything. So if we update any properties for a pre-existing table, it's not going to change that. That's not exactly what SQL Alchemy is meant for. Instead, we would have to use a database migration tool, kind of like Alembic, uh, which we haven't covered yet. Uh, so instead for now, what we're gonna do is we have a couple of different options. We can manually just do it, go into PG Admin, add the things yourselves, or we can just take the easy way out since this is a development environment, we can just drop our post table. And that's one of the luxuries of working in development. So you can then hit save again, and that's going to cause it to restart the application the application, and then if we go to Postgres and we just hit refresh, it's going to create a new post table and then we can go into properties and we'll go into columns and we now see that we have an owner ID column, which is set to not null, that's good. And then if we go to constraints, foreign key, you'll see that we've got our foreign key and you can take a look at the details down here. And the main thing I wanna check is for actions, we do have on delete cascade. All right, and so now that we have everything set up, if I just run this query again, we should see the owner ID show up. So let's create a few entries. And um, before I do that, I need to make sure that I actually have some users um, because I kind of went in and deleted a few things. So I've got two users uh, with an ID of 20 and 21. And so what we're gonna do is we're going to make sure that the foreign key po points to one of those IDs. So we'll grab a post. I'm gonna just set this to be post one as the title. And it's going to be some gibberish. And then we can set the post, uh, the owner ID to be the ID of a user that we already have in our database. We'll save this and we can see that it's successfully created. Now, if I create a new post and this time leaving the owner ID blank, if I hit save, you can see that it throws an error because this can't be set to null. And if I try a ID of a user that doesn't exist, like 57, it should also throw an error. And so it's saying that, hey, the owner ID of 57 does not exist in the user's table. And I'll just change this to 21 and then it should work. Great. Now let's quickly check out the on delete functionality just to make sure that it works. Uh, and what we're gonna do is let's go to, well, I'll just run the query right here. So we'll do delete from, and we'll say users where ID equals, and we're gonna delete the user with an ID of 20. So if everything works, we should see just this entry also get deleted in the post table because the owner is, has an ID of 20. 
And since that owner is going to be deleted, then we should only have this one left. So if I run this, yep, we can see that the one with the owner ID of 20 is now deleted. All right. And so that kind of handles all of the database side of things. At this point, if you try to test the rest of your application, you're going to probably run into a couple of issues. Um, but that's just because, uh, you know, we've ha hard coded our schema to match a certain, you know, number of properties. And so since we've added this new property to our posts, it's going to throw a few errors. So we're going to have to update a few things in the next video. But you'll see that updating your schema is very simple. With the changes we made in the last lecture, it's inevitably going to cause some issues with our application. So there's going to be a few things that we have to update within our app. And so let's just quickly run through a couple of our requests just to see what they look like, see what changes we need to make. And so if you haven't already done so, uh, log in a user. And so once we're logged in, we should update the variable. And now we can retrieve our posts. So if I hit send here, you could say that we retrieve all of the posts in our application. I just have one in this case. But the first issue that I see is that we're not returning the owner ID, right? This is a brand new column. And I would expect this information to get sent out to the user. And the reason why it's not included in here is that uh, we have to actually update our schema because our schema probably doesn't have that owner ID because we never added that in. And you might be thinking, well, do we actually need to send it? Yeah, I think it makes sense for us to send it because in any application, the user should know who creates a post. So ultimately, they're going to have to uh, get that information. And so we should provide the owner ID. So let's go to our code. And if you actually go to the posts uh, router and take a look at the uh, get all posts, you'll see that the response model is going to reference schemas.post. So let's go to schemas.post. And you can see that this is what we're using to return. Um, this is the schema that we're going to use for returning posts to a user. And so this actually inherits from Postbase. So Postbase has title, content, published. And then we extend that, and we're going to add the ID, which gets created at the database level, as well as the date and time, or the created at field, which gets added by the database. So we can add it here. However, I'm sure you're thinking, well, could we add it at post base? Should we add it post create? Well, let's think about this. Right, the, the first thing that we have to think about is when we create a post, should we be passing in a owner ID? Well, that we 100% absolutely could do that. Uh, and that actually does kind of make sense. So in that case, if we did want it to be available uh, or require it for creating a post, then we would add it under post create here as well, or we could just add it under post base so that both of them inherit it. However, what we're going to do is we're actually not going to require the user to provide the owner ID. Uh, instead, what we're actually going to do is we're going to let the, the logic of our route to actually just grab the ID from the token and then use that as the field. So we don't actually need the user to pass that into the body. So we're not going to, we're not going to use that field or apply that field to either one of these classes. We're just going to do it for the post class which is the one that's responsible for sending the post out. So I'll add a column here and we'll call it owner ID. And I'm going to say that this is going to be a type of int. All right, let's save that and let's see if that makes a difference. So let's hit send. And so now we can see that we get the owner ID and that's really all the changes we have to make. So if we actually go to get one post and we look at our code here, and if you look at the post.py, for getting an individual post, you can see that we're returning the same exact model. And if we take a look at uh, creating a post, we return the same model. So all of those will be updated accordingly. And same thing with the update post. The update post also uses schemas.post. So since we're using the same schema for all of them, we don't have to do anything else. And we could just quickly test that out. So I'll do get one post. And I realized we have to actually get what was the ID? ID is four. So we're going to update this to be an ID of four. You can see that we now have the owner ID there. If we update it, right, we can once again get the owner ID. And at that point, it looks like everything else is good. However, if we go to create posts real quick and we create a post, right, we get a crash actually. So there is an issue with creating a post. And I'm sure you guys can guess exactly what it is. Take a look at the error when we try to create a post. Right, it's saying uh, there's some kind of SQL error, and it says there's a null value in column owner ID. And that makes sense. And that makes sense. So we'll actually tackle this in the next video, and you'll see that it's going to be pretty straightforward to actually get that resolved. So in the last video, we learned that uh, the create post functionality is broken now, because if I try to create a post, 
you can see that it sends back an, uh, a 500 status code. And if we take a look at the logs, we can see that uh, it looks like there's some issue with the SQL and it's saying that the null value in column owner ID violates the not null constraint. And so looking at our model, we obviously set the owner ID right here. And this is set to be nullable false. So we actually have to provide who the owner ID is for this new post. So how do we do that? Well, let's go to our post path operation and let's go to the create post path operation. And so it's right here. And so nowhere in this code are we actually providing a user ID or owner ID into this new, new post that we're creating. We're just grabbing the post, which comes from post create the schema. And if we look at that schema, you can see that we do not provide a owner ID. And like I said, we're not going to actually pass the owner ID into the, in the body. What we're going to do is whoever is logged in and creating the post should automatically be the owner, right? If you're logged into Twitter and you post something, Twitter knows that you're the one creating the post. So whatever ID is associated with your account, it's going to set that automatically. So we shouldn't have to pass that in the body. We should automatically retrieve it from uh, your authentication status. So within post, right, you can see that we have the current user. And so we should be able to um, get the current user uh, or the user's ID. So if I do current underscore user dot ID, and we can remove this kind, I don't need the email. And if I try to create a post, it's still going to error out. That's okay. I just want to see what it prints out though, before the error. And you can see we got a lot of errors. That's okay. And you can see that it printed out the ID of my user, which is 23. And just to double check that that's actually my user, I'm going to select star from users. And you can see that 23 is Sanjeev at Gmail. So we could just take that and just add that into a, the new post object. And so we're creating the new post right here where we reference models that post. And what we're doing is we're just spreading, whoops. We're just spreading out the uh, schema that we got from the body. And so to actually add the ID property, it's very easy. All we have to do is just say owner underscore ID is going to be set to current underscore user dot ID. So we're just grabbing um, that from the get current user function, just like we did right here. And I think we probably need a comma there. And that should be all that we have to do. So let's, I'm going to remove this code. And let's test this out now. So if I do create post, look at that, no errors. You can see that the owner ID was automatically set to the ID of my user, which is 23. Currently in our application, we do have authentication set up for delete post and update post. However, there's no check to make sure that a user is only deleting his own posts. Right now, if you're logged in, you can delete anyone's posts and no application works like that. You should only be able to delete your own post. No user should be able to come in and delete one of my posts. That doesn't make sense. So let's implement the logic for setting up a quick little just if statement just to check, hey, is the person that's logged in trying to delete a post that he owns? If he doesn't, then we're going to return an error. And so right now, if you take a look at our delete post path operation function, uh, we query the post that he's trying to delete and we check to see if there's no post. If there's no post, then we send a 404 that's expected. Um, but if we did find a post, the next check is just going to be another simple if statement. And we're going to say if post dot owner underscore ID does not equal get current user dot ID. So these two things have to match for the user to be able to delete it. If they don't match, then we're going to send another uh, HTTP exception. So we'll say raise HTTP exception. Now the exception will set the status code to be a new one. So this one's going to be a 403. So this means forbidden. That's the, that means it's a resource that they specifically aren't uh, able to access because on, we could send a 401, but they are I guess a 401 could also work, but I'm going to do 403. I think that makes more sense. And then we can set the detail. And I'm just going to say not authorized to perform requested action. And this exact same check can be used for updating posts as well, because it's the same exact logic. And I'll just do that right here right under the same check. So same logic, right? First thing we're going to do is we're going to check to see if that post exists. And then the next thing we're going to do is we're going to make sure that the owner 
of the post is whoever the user is logged in as. Now let's test this out. So right now, uh, if I do a get posts, uh, you can see that the owner, okay, so we've got a post created by both owners. And I'm currently logged in as, um, I actually can't remember who I'm logged in as, but we can see that I used uh, Sanjeev at Gmail and that's going to be user 23. And what I'm gonna do is go back to get posts and I'm gonna try to delete the post with an ID of four because that's the owner ID of 21. And keep in mind right now, I'm logged in as user 23. So let's try this. We're gonna delete post with an ID of four. Okay, it's already set there. So we should get an error in this case. And it looks like I got a server error. That's a problem. And I already see the issue. And right now, post is actually not the post itself. It's the query. And to actually get a post, I have to do post.first1. So what I'm going to do actually is I could change this to uh, post.first and then grab the owner ID. But I'm going to actually perform the query right here. I'll say post. Actually, I'll change this to post underscore query. I'm going to make a few changes, actually. And I'm going to set this to be post equals post underscore query dot first. And then I'm going to set this to be post. And this is going to be set to query. All right, and just to kind of quickly recap, uh, we define the query here. We'll then find this post. We'll check to see if it's not there. And then we'll check to see if the owner is, uh, if the user who's logged in actually owns this post. And then we're going to grab the original query and then we're just going to append a delete so that we delete it. That's all. And let's just make sure the update is set up the same way. And it looks like the update one was already working that way. So it should be good to go now. Hopefully there's no errors. And let's try this. And once again, we got an error. And it looks like function object has no attribute ID. And I realized my mistake it, again, first of all. Uh, this is getting stored as current user, not get current user. So we need to change this to be current user. I'm not sure why I did it like that. It seems pretty goofy. And then this also should be current user, right? Because we're calling that function and we're storing the result in current user. So we want to reference the variable. I'm not sure if that was like an autocomplete that did that or I just had a brain fart either way. Hopefully it's the last of our issues. So let's try this. All right, perfect. Look at that. Not authorized to perform that requested action. That's to be expected because we don't own that post. However, if I do a quick search again, um, I do own the post with an ID of eight because we can see the owner ID is 23 and that's who I'm logged in as. So let's try to delete post with the with the value of eight. Send. And we get a 204. So that means it's successfully deleted. We'll do get post just to verify. And we can see that we get those uh, just the one post now. So that seems to be working. Uh, I'm going to go back in. Actually, let me create a post real quick because I no longer have a post. All right, so we have, we created a new post. And so you can see that this is my post right here. And I'm going to just update it. So let's go to the update one. Uh, first of all, I'm going to try to update a post that I don't own. So we're going to try to update the post with an ID of four. We should get a not authorized. And then let's Grab the ID of the post that we do want to change, which is nine. Let's hit send. And it looks like it updated a little bit. Let's check our database always. So we'll say select star from posts. And the post with the nine got the updated entry. Oh, wait, wait a minute. It looks like it may have updated both of them. Uh, only one way to find out if that's actually what's happening. I'm just going to create a quick new post. I'm just going to set the ID to be 23. All right. And I'm going to update post with nine with an ID of nine. Okay. And then let's refresh this. Okay. So post with an ID of 10 is still the same. So, okay. It wasn't a bug. Um, it looks like maybe I had changed this earlier and I'm not exactly sure why I had, when I updated this post, but that's okay. And so I think that's going to wrap up this video. Um, we've uh, handled the update and delete so that we can only update and delete our own posts. All right, before we proceed any further, I do want to talk about one last thing. And that is that when we do get posts, which is an authenticated route, so it requires you to be logged in to retrieve the posts. Uh, if I try to retrieve the post, you'll see I get posts from every user. Now, this may or may not be the 
result that you want, right? It's going to depend on what your application is going to work, uh, look like. Uh, you know, if this is like a, you know, like a note taking app or something where all of your posts and things like that are all private, then you wouldn't want to return everyone else's posts. You'd only want to return the user, the user specific post. However, if this is some kind of social media app, right, then obviously your posts are public. So when you do get post, you'd want to return everyone's posts. And so it really just comes down to how you want your app to to function. I'm going to show you guys what you would need to change if you wanted to make it so that you returned your only your own posts. But after afterwards, uh, we're going to actually delete those changes because I want to leave my app like this. This is kind of how I wanted it to work, more like a social media app. But I do want to make sure that you guys understood how to make this change. And the same thing would go for get one post. We want to make sure that only the user that created a post can retrieve that specific post. And so if we go back to our path operation for getting all posts, you could see that we just do a db.query uh, dot all. And so if you only want to return the posts for a specific user that's logged in, it's very simple. All we have to do is do a filter. And here we'll say models.post dot ID equals equals. And then we just get the current user's ID. And it looks like I still left this as user ID. So this should actually be updated to be current underscore user. And if you notice the, you can see that the type is set to int, even though it's actually returning an entire user object. I found that this, whatever type you put here doesn't actually impact the code. So put whatever you want. You can put in a, you know, some sort of dictionary that actually correctly matches it. Um, but you could just leave it as well. So I'm just going to leave it like that. It, it doesn't break any logic. Uh, and then at this point, I believe I'm still logged in as user 23. If I try to retrieve all posts, it uh, looks like I got nothing. And that could be a little bit of a problem. So let's see what we broke. And the easiest way to kind of troubleshoot this is what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to remove the dot all. So that's going to return the query. It just won't actually run the query. And I'm just going to print the query. Let's see what that looks like. Sometimes it helps to see the raw SQL. So let's hit send. All right, we should get an internal server error that's to be expected. But I just want to see my print statement. All right, so let's see our, our print statement. So select, we're getting all of the columns that's expected from posts where posts ID equals this value. So that looks like it's perfect. Well, let's just quickly see uh, before we move any further, uh, what exactly is my user ID? And we'll just check our database. Okay, and we'll run this again. And then we're going to check. All right, so 23. And then if we go to our database, and I realized the exact mistake that I made, and this is a stupid mistake, right? This is, this is looking for a post with an ID, with this specific ID. We don't want the, the ID of the post. We want the owner ID. So we'll do owner underscore ID equals current user ID. All right, let's test this out now. Once again, an error, but I just realized I forgot to update this to be dot all. And then we'll try this again. And now we get all the posts with an ID of 23. If I log in as a different user, let's say uh, this is Sanjeev1, I'll log in, that should update the token. So now if I do a get all posts, it should return all posts with an ID of 21. And so that's, that's how that works. And then if you want to see how that looks like for retrieving an individual post, we'll go to get uh, underscore post. And to actually handle this logic, it's going to be the same thing as a delete. So you can just copy what we did for the delete one. And here I can just say post.owner. And this should do the same exact thing. So now if I do get one post, well, first of all, let's take a look at all of our posts. Actually, I'm going to do it in our database. So I'm logged in as user 21. So I should be able to access a post with four, but I can't access a post with an ID of 10. So let's try 10. Am I able to access him? Not authorized. Let's try ID of four. 
and I can get that one. So that's how that works. But like I said, I don't want my application to work like that. So I'm going to remove that functionality. I'm going to make all posts essentially public. And then we're going to remove this filter. And I'll remove this print statement and this print statement just to clean things up a bit. And let's just double check that we didn't break anything once again. So let's get all posts. We get all posts. And let's get an individual post, regardless of who owns it. And that's all fine and dandy now. Now, just kind of thinking ahead of what our uh, you know, front end would look like, even though we're not going to build it, uh, taking a look at any social media type application, you know, when we retrieve the posts, we usually want to embed uh, the user's ID. So we want to know who actually created the specific post. We wouldn't just put the owner ID because no, no user, none of your users understand that ID. They want to see what is your you know, Twitter handle? What is your email? Whoever created that, we want to see their user ID. So it looks like for all of the posts that we retrieve, we would have to then send a second query to retrieve, you know, hey, what is the information for user uh, with an ID of 23? And then once we get that, we would then have to kind of combine all that data so that we can figure out what post uh, it belongs to what user and what is their specific username. Now with SQL Alchemy, we can kind of set up, set it up so that it automatically does this for us. And so if we actually go to our models, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up a relationship. And so this relationship isn't a foreign key. It does nothing in the database whatsoever. But what it does is it'll tell SQL Alchemy to automatically fetch some piece of information based off of the relationship. And so here I could say, we'll create a owner. And I'm going to say owner equals relationship. And we probably have to import this. And so it did. So it imported relationship from sqlalchemy.orm. And so if you haven't done that, go ahead and do that. And what we'll say is, this is going to return uh, the class of another model. So here, I want to return the user. And this is going to be a capital U because I'm not referencing the table. I'm referencing the actual SQL Alchemy class. So what this is going to do for us automatically is that it's going to create another property for our post so that when we retrieve a post, it's going to return a owner property. And what it's going to do is it's going to figure out the relationship uh, to user. So it's going to actually fetch the user based off of the owner ID and return that for us. And there's nothing else we have to do. It actually is that simple. This is one of the great parts about SQL Alchemy is that these relationships will automatically make it so that it fetches that data for us so that we don't have to manually do it ourselves. So let's test this out. Let's see if this actually works. I'm going to go back and I'm going to retrieve all posts. And uh, it looks like nothing's changed. We don't get any user information. We do, once again, just get the owner ID. So what happened? Well, you probably can guess we need to update our schema. And so if we go to our post, we're now going to return a user. And so here, what we would do is we would just add another property called owner. And then here it would, instead of returning an int or a string or anything like that, we can actually return a pydantic model. So I can say, I want you to return a user. Whoops, a user, but I, it looks like we don't have a user class. We have user out and then we have user create. So which one do we actually want to return? Um, probably user out, because that's what we're returning. We'd, the user create is for creating a user. And you notice that we get an error actually here. And that's because this user out hasn't been defined uh, at this point in the code. So you have to read Python top down. And so user out is actually defined all the way down here. So if you wanted this to work, we would have to move all of the user stuff up a level. So I'm going to cut this and I'm going to just put it right above post. And so this should remove the error. And so now it looks like it's good. And so once again, all we did was we added a new property called owner, and this is going to return a pydantic model type called user out. And so that's all this is returning now. So let's see if this fixes our issue. And now I'm going to retrieve all posts. And so now take a look at this. It automatically fetched the owner. It got the ID, it got the email, it got when their account was created at. Um, we may not want that, but for now, I think this makes sense. We could create another class to kind of 
um, narrow down the exact fields that we specifically wanted for this situation. But I think this is good enough. Uh, these are all the informations that I want actually returned. So this is perfect. It's going to do this for every post. And if I try to get one post, it's also going to return that specific owner. And so in reality, to get this functionality, right, once again, all we had to do was just create this relationship. Uh, and so once SQL Alchemy understands the relationship, it's going to fetch that piece of information for you from the user model. In this lesson, we're going to take a look at query parameters. And if you've never worked with an API, you may not know what that is, but I guarantee you, you have worked with them before and you have seen them. You just had no idea what they were. And so I'm on Yelp.com and I'm just doing this for demonstration purposes, but I'm just going to do a quick search here. I've just picked a random city. In this case, it's Miami. We're going to search for that. And I want you to take a look at the URL. And so our URL is, first of all, we have the domain name, which is kind of like the IP address. And then we have the specific endpoint that we want to reach. So this is the slash search endpoint. And so in their API, they've set up, uh, you know, some sort of endpoint that probably is, uh, allows you to search for restaurants. And then we have a question mark. And I know you guys have seen this before because pretty much any website you've ever, uh, you know, used, uh, you'll see that question mark whenever you're, you know, searching for things. And any results you get, you'll see that in the URL. And so everything to the right of that is what's referred to as query parameters. So all of this is query parameters. And a query parameter is a optional key value pair that appears to, to the right of the question mark. And these query parameters allow us to kind of filter the results of a request. So, you know, if we're trying to retrieve posts, maybe we don't want all posts. Maybe we want to get posts that were created in the last two hours. Maybe we want to get uh, posts that, uh, you know, if it's a social media type app, maybe we want to get posts that have uh, received over 100 likes, right? These are all things that you would do using query parameters where you can say, hey, uh, you could just pass in a key and a pair and you can say, I want to find posts, you know, that are less than two hours old. And so a lot of other operations uh, that are necessary in an API, things like pagination, uh, those are all going to be done with query parameters. And if you take a look at this one, uh, since we searched for Miami, right, it looks like it passed a query parameter called find underscore loc, which probably means location. And then it says Miami, Florida. And so it's going to basically talk to the API and say, hey, listen, I need you to get me all the restaurants and I want you to filter down based off of restaurants in Miami. And so that's kind of how query parameters work. And so for us, it's, it's up to us to define what query parameters we want to allow and what we want them to do. And it's going to vary from app to app, but you'll see that most APIs have a couple of uh, query parameters that they all use. So let's go to our uh, app real quick. And what we're going to do is we're going to go to our post router. And in this case, we've got our path operation of retrieving all posts. And what I want to do is I want to let the user be able to kind of filter down on the posts that they want to see. And the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm actually going to allow them to specify how many posts they want to retrieve altogether. So I want to give them the option to say, hey, I want 10 posts, or maybe I want 100 posts, or maybe I want uh, 50 posts. We should allow the user to define that. And so to, to allow a query parameter, we could just go into our path operation function and just pass in another argument. So I'm going to do question mark. Then we give it the name of the query parameter. So this is the key, essentially. And I'm going to call this limit. So this is going to limit the number of posts they get. And this is going to be of type int. And we're going to give it a default value. So we'll say that, you know, by default, if they don't provide a limit, uh, we're going to say the limit by default is 10. And now I'm, all I'm going to do is I'm going to print out limit. All right. And I'll show you guys how to actually send that query parameter. So let's go to our get all posts. And so to send a query parameter, it's very easy. You just type in a question mark. Then you grab the name of the query parameter, which once again is limit. So we'll grab limit. And then you say it, you set it equal to whatever value you want it to be. So if I want to get a limit of three, if I hit send, right, nothing should have changed in our code, but you can see that we were able to print out the limit. So that's how we access query parameters in fast API. It's pretty simple. You just pass it in as another argument into your path operation function. But let's actually set up our query so that it now takes into account the limit. And with SQL Alchemy, uh, anytime you want to, you know, perform another operation, you usually have a built-in method. So I'm going to remove this dot all for now. And so if I want to uh, limit the number of results, I just do dot. And then let's see what uh, methods we have at our disposal. Uh, since we're looking for something that limits something, let's maybe check to see if there is a limit method. And it uh, looks like 
I don't see one here, but there actually is. We can do limit, and then here I'm just going to pass in the limit variable. And then after that, we can just do the dot all as we usually do. All right, and so now, well, first of all, in our database, we don't actually have that many posts. So I'm just going to create a couple. Well, actually, I could just do this through our API a lot quicker. So I'm just going to create a whole bunch of posts. And so that should give us five posts. Now well, let's create a few more. All right, so we've got 11 posts now. And then we'll go back to our API and we'll say, I want a limit of three. So let's send that and let's see if we only get three posts. So we get one, two, three. Perfect. And if I don't provide a limit, well, actually, let's try a different number. Let's try five now. All right, we get one, two, three, four, five. Perfect. And if we don't provide a limit altogether, it should return. 10 because our default was set to 10 posts, the limit of 10. And so we get one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. And there are 11 results. So there's one result that it didn't provide. So we've got the limit functionality down. What I want to do now is allow the user to skip results. So it grabbed, you know, depending on however Postgres has decided to return, uh, you know, 10 posts, it grabbed the first 10 based off of some criteria. And if we actually take a look at how it did, it looks like we got ID of 10, ID of four. So it's kind of just all over the place. Uh, so it's probably uh, not sorting based off of any specific field. We may want to specify that. But uh, what we're going to do is I'm going to actually set the limit equal to two. And so we'll get the first two. However, Postgres determines what are the first two it should send, we get two. But let's say we want to skip over a couple of them. Maybe we want to skip the first, the first two. Maybe we want to skip these two. Well, I want to be able to send another query parameter called skip so that we can specify how many we want to skip. And if you want to send more than one query parameter, we just do the end keyword and then we provide the next key value pair. So it would be like skip equals two. And so just taking a look at the IDs here, We've got one with an ID of 10 and one with an ID of four, and we want to skip both of those. So going back to our code, we're going to provide another path operation function. Uh, sorry, another argument into the function, and we'll call this skip. This is going to be an integer, and the default is going to be, uh, we'll say zero. We don't want to skip anything by default. And to add this to our query, uh, we use the keyword offset. So we do offset. And then here, I'm going to say offset equals skip. All right, and so we should be able to skip over both of these. And so if I provide a skip of two, you can see it first starts out at nine and then 11. If we do skip zero, it shouldn't skip any, right? 10 and then an ID of four. If we skip one, it should just skip the 10 and then start off on four. And we can see that the first one is four. So it allows us to skip over posts. And so that's ultimately how we're going to implement pagination on the front end is because the front end should be able to skip um, based off of what page they're on. So if each page returns 20 results and you want to go to page two, then you want to skip 20 results. If you want to go to page three, you would skip 40 results. Now, the last query parameter I want to set up is a search functionality. I want the user to be able to search uh, based off of, you know, some keywords in the title or maybe even the content, depending on how we want to implement searching uh, for for now, we're just going to say we'll be able to search based off of the title. And the way that the search will work is we'll have another and. And we'll say search equals and then, you know, some random text. And so once again, we're going to provide another argument called search. And this is going to be of type string. However, this is, you know, we can't exactly give a default search. So I'm going to say this is a uh, optional. It's going to be an optional string, so we don't have to provide this. And the default is uh, just an empty quotes. And it looks like I have to import optional from fast API or from typing. And so here I'll just say import optional. And this is going to give us an optional 
query parameter. And so what we're going to do here is I'll say filter. And to filter this, and just kind of like how we filtered based off of a specific uh, user ID or a specific post ID, I can say models.post. Dot title, and then we can use a method called contains. So we can say contains, and then the search keyword. So this will allow us to provide some kind of string, and it'll just search for the entire title of a post, and it'll see if the search keywords are anywhere in the post title. It doesn't have to match completely, it just has to be somewhere in the post. So this will give us a little bit of flexibility so that we don't have to match the exact name of the post. We could just provide some keywords like uh, like hot dogs or beaches or whatever, and it should be able to just see if it's contained in there. So let's take a look at our database. Uh, you can see that we've got a lot of ones that say top beaches in Florida. So I'm just going to do a search. And if I just search for beaches, it should return all of these because they all contain the word beaches. And I'm just gonna do a search and I'll, I'll get rid of the, the limits and the skip for now, we don't really need that. And all of the results should be, actually, I don't think I saved it. Let me, let me save that. And now if I do this, you can see that every result is gonna have the word beaches in, in the title. And when it comes to query parameters, you can string as many as you want. So if you wanted the, the limit as well, and we'll set the limit to two, and we can also provide a skip equals one, you can add as many of the query parameters that you want. So now you can see that we set the limit to two and we skip the first one. Now, the last thing I wanna show you guys is how to use spaces in your search query. Um, because right now uh, we just have the word beaches, but let's say I wanted, uh, you know, just going into our Postgres database, let's see what I've got. Maybe I wanna search for beaches, hello, or something beaches, right? How, do I, how would I search for that in a URL? I can't put a space in the URL. I can't say, you know, something beaches. So how do I do a space? Well, I can do percent and 20, which is reference, uh, which means space in your URL. And then you can do beaches. So then just to verify that that's actually returning what we want, I'm going to do a print. And we're going to print out the search keyword. And we're going to test this out. So if I hit send, you can see that it returned the one result that has the word something and then beaches, um, but it doesn't return anything else. What I would like to do now is do a little bit of cleanup on our main.py file. Uh, you'll see that there's a lot of unnecessary imports that we don't need, especially since we moved all of our routes uh, into their respective folders. So you'll see that a lot of these are grayed out. And so anything that's grayed out, we can move. Uh, but before we actually do that, uh, what I actually want to do first is I want to take this uh, code for connecting to our database using uh, the, you know, the regular Postgres driver, and I'm going to move that uh, to our database.py file. And keep in mind, we can just delete this because we're no longer using this and we're using SQL Alchemy to actually connect to our database. So you can actually delete this. But just for documentation purposes, I'm actually going to just cut this out and I'm going to move this into our database.py file uh, just so that you guys have this for reference. Uh, in case you ever want to, uh, you know, run raw SQL directly using this Postgres library instead of using SQL Alchemy. I want to make sure this course covers as many different, uh, you know, possible situations for you guys. Um, but moving this here, obviously, we're going to get some errors because we have to import all of these. And uh, I'm just going to go to our main and I'm going to import them from here. So here, I'll just copy these two. And we'll actually just cut it out. And then it looks like we also need time. Where is that coming from? It's just coming from the time. Okay. All right, that should uh, remove any errors. And we can just comment this out actually, because we're not gonna use that anymore. And then going back to our main, uh, you can see that both of these are grayed out. So we're not even importing anything from uh, typing anymore, or we're not using anything from typing. So I'm going to remove that. Uh, you can see that we're no longer using status. So I'll actually, we're no longer using all of these. So I can remove all of those. And I'm not using the body here anymore. I'm not using anything from Pydantic. And I'm not using anything from random. We'll just get that a little bit closer. 
Uh, we're not using session anymore either, so I'll remove that. This, whatever that is, I'm going to remove that. And then we'll remove schemas and utils. We can remove get DB as well. And then obviously the uh, the post array or list, that's no longer needed. These two functions, they're no longer needed. They were uh, before we started working with databases. And then, um, I mean, we don't actually need this route anymore, but I'll just leave that in there. But you can see that our code is a lot cleaner now after removing all of those unnecessary imports. I'm just going to structure this a little bit better so all the code's a little bit closer together. And I think that's all the cleanup that we need to do for now. I just wanted to make sure there wasn't too much uh, garbage building up in our application. When we first started working on databases, I mentioned that we should never hard code our database information or the database URL into our code, because this creates two issues. First of all, we're exposing our username and password right there in code. So anyone can see it if we check it into GitHub. Anyone who has access to it can see our password now. And at that point, we've compromised our application. But on top of that, uh, the other big issue is that right now we've set this URL to go to our development Postgres instance, which is running on our local machine. When we actually deploy this to production, our Postgres server is not going to be running on this machine. It's, it may not even be running on the machine that our application is actually deployed on. It could be on a, a completely different system. So we would need a way for the code to automatically update in, in a production environment to point to the actual production Postgres database instead of using the one that's hard coded in here. And so we need a way to do that. And keep in mind, this, uh, this isn't exclusive to just working with the databases. Any kind of uh, confidential information, any password secrets, anything that needs to get updated uh, based off of the environment that it's in uh, needs a way that will we'll run into the same exact issue. Right? And if we go to our OAuth2.file, you can see that we have our secret key hard coded in here. This is something that we don't want to do. We don't want to expose this, and we need this to get updated between our development and our production environment because they may not be the same on both. So how do we do that? Well, we're going to make use of something called environment variables. And so an environment variable is just a variable that you configure on a computer. Doesn't matter what operating system, they all support it. And when you configure an environment variable on your computer, any application that's running on that computer will be able to access it. And that includes our fast API. So your Python app will be able to access any environment variables on the machine. And so instead of hard coding the values in our code, what we'll say is, hey, retrieve an environment variable named, you know, whatever. Like we might have an environment variable called Postgres underscore URL, and that's going to contain the URL of our Postgres database. And so we don't need to hard code the actual value. We hard code just the name of the variable, and then Python will automatically pull in that, that variable. So let me show you guys how to do that. And I'm going to show you guys how to do this on Windows first, and then we'll take a look at this on a Mac or a Linux machine. Mac and Linux are the same steps. So I'm going to search for environment. And you'll see this edit the system environment variables. And what we want to do is we want to go to environment variables under the advanced tab. And here you'll see two sections. You've got system variables. This is going to be environment variables uh, that are system wide, which means any user can access them. And then we have user specific variables. So these are variables that only I can access. And you can just kind of, you know, go through these and just take a look at them. Um, but you can see that we have an environment variable called path. Don't worry about what it's used for. Uh, this is something that gets set up when you install your machine. But we're going to take a look and try to access this. So you can see that this is the key, the variable name path. And then the value is some sort of path in our operating system or in our file system. So how do we actually access that? Well, let's open up a terminal. And here I'm just going to type in echo. And then we want to access an environment variable, just do percent, and then the name of the variable. So I'll say path with a capital P. And if I run this, you can see that it prints out that specific path. And so that's how you access an environment variable on the command line. Uh, with Python code, it's going to be a little bit different, but it's still pretty simple. I'm going to open up a new file just for demonstration purposes. You don't have to actually follow along on this. And to actually access a environment variable, we have to import the OS module. And then to access that variable, you say OS dot get NV. And then within this method, you uh, just pass in the name or the key of the variable. So in this case, it's path. 
And I'm just going to store this in a variable and we can call this anything. I'll just call this path. Why not? And then I'll print out path so we can see how it see if it actually works. But now if I do pi dash three and then run example.py, you can see that it printed out that same exact path. Now to set a new environment variable, we would go to new. And maybe I create a URL, um, a variable name called Postgres, or we can just call this, how about my underscore DB underscore URL. So this is going to have the uh, URL to access our database. So I'm going to say this is at localhost colon five, four, three, two. I think that's what our, our database is running on and I'll hit okay. And so here we can see that this is our new environment variable that we created my DB underscore URL and it's set to localhost five, four, three, two. I'll hit okay. And then I'll hit okay here. And then what we're going to do is we're going to try to access that variable. So I'll do echo my underscore db underscore URL percent. And actually it should be percent percent. And you can see that it does not print out what we said. It just prints out exactly what we wrote. So what gives what happened here? Well, anytime you set a new environment variable, what you got to do is you got to close out your terminal and open up a brand new one. So I can you know, I can close this out or I can just open up a new one. And this new terminal, well, actually, I don't want a PowerShell. I want a command prompt. So this new terminal will be able to access uh, newly created environment variables because they get set uh, as soon as the terminal opens. So once the terminal is open, I can't change them. So I have to open up a new one so that it can reread and import all of those environment variables. So now if I do echo percent my underscore db underscore URL percent, It looks like I may have a mistyped this. So hold on, let me see what what it's called. And that looks like it's correct. So what's what's happening? Well, I'm going to close out all of them. That's probably what's the issue. So let me open up a new terminal. And I'll open up a new cramp command prompt. And now I'm going to try echo percent my underscore db underscore URL. And now we can see that we can read it. So we have to close out our terminals and open up a brand new one. It's kind of annoying, um, but that's just the way it works. Now, on top of that, there's an even bigger issue. And I think this is exclusive to Windows. Uh, and that is that VS Code, the terminals here, it's whenever you set a new environment variable, they never have access to it. So you could try deleting all of these terminals and then creating a new terminal and then accessing that new environment variable my db underscore URL. And if I try to if I try to access if I try to run this code, you'll see that it just says none. And if I just try to run the same echo command here, you'll see that it just spits it out. So it's not able to read it. And it's a it's a little bit of an annoying issue with VS Code and Windows. You have to close out every single VS Code window that you have and, and then reopen them. And sometimes even then that doesn't fix the issue. So know that this is just kind of a limitation with Windows. But ultimately, uh, don't worry too much about that because uh, you're going to see that, especially in a development environment, going into uh, and actually setting all of these variables yourself is unnecessary, right? I don't want to have to go in and set uh, one for my database IP, my database port, um, as well as my secret key, my password, my username. These, it's just too many to manage yourself. And you'll see that more complex applications could have 10, 20, 30 environment variables that need to be set. So instead of going into your system and actually changing it, I'm going to show you guys in the next video. I'm going to show you guys how we can get around this um, by using what's referred to as an environment file. Uh, and so you don't actually need to worry about the limitations we're running here because we're never actually going to set our own environment variables on our local machine, uh, especially in our development machine, because it's just too slow of a process and it makes things unnecessarily difficult to troubleshoot. So before we wrap things up, uh, if you want to delete that environment variable, feel free to do that, which we can just go here and I can just select that and then hit delete. And let me get, let me show you guys how to do this on a Mac to set an environment variable on a Mac machine. The command that we run in the terminal, there isn't a GUI kind of like in Windows. Uh, we actually have to use a terminal, which I actually prefer. Uh, what we do is we just type in the command export. And then we provide the name of the or 
the name of the variable or the key. So I'll say my underscore db underscore URL. Then we say equals. And then we just provide the text, uh, the value. So in this case, maybe this is localhost colon 5432. All right. And then to actually read the environment variables that have been set, you type in print NV. And here we can take a look at all the environment variables. Most of these have been set by the machine itself. And you'll see that nowhere in here do we see, well, actually we do see my DB URL right here. However, uh, just like I said in Windows, sometimes, uh, you know, depending on the terminal you're using and a few other things, sometimes you actually have to close out this terminal and open up a new one to actually get the new environment variable. Um, but here we can just access it by typing echo. And then we could just say dollar my underscore db underscore URL. And you can see it prints it out. And then within Python, uh, just like we did on the Windows machine, accessing it is the same exact way. It shouldn't matter. Depend it shouldn't matter which operating system you're on. It's the same exact thing from your code's perspective. With any project, there's going to be a certain number of environment variables. And as I said, as your project grows, you're going to have more and more of them. And one of the issues that you can run into is that you could potentially forget to set one of them, either on your development environment or your production environment. And it's probably going to cause your application to crash. And so what would be good is to perform some sort of validation to ensure that all of the right environment variables have been set for your application to actually run properly. And on top of that, it's important to understand that when you read an environment variable, it's always going to come out as a string, which, which is fine, but it just means that you have to do all of the validation in code. So if you're setting an environment variable for your uh, you know, your access token expire minutes, right? We needed this to be an int, not a string. But when we read the environment variable, it's going to come out as a string. So we have to convert this to an integer. So when it comes to verifying that all of the properties are set, as well as performing validation, we might have already kind of addressed this issue with a different part of our application, right? And that's our schemas, right? We do the same thing with all of the data we send in the body by using Pydantic to perform all of that verification to make sure that every single property that we need is there and to also perform all of the typecasting. So if we set it something to be an integer, it'll automatically convert it and validate it that it is a valid integer. And what's great about Pydantic is we can actually use Pydantic to perform all of that validation for our environment variables. And let's see how we can actually do that. So I'm going to go to main.py. And as an example, I'm just going to uh, import from the Pydantic library something called base settings. And so just like with, uh, you know, any other Pydantic model, right, we can set up a class and I'm going to call this settings. And this is going to extend base settings. And I didn't mean to accidentally import base. And here we can basically just provide all, a list of all of the environment variables that we need set. Uh, as properties on the class itself. Uh, and so, you know, maybe I need something called database underscore password. And this needs to be a of type string. And we can even give it a default value, which is localhost. And then maybe I need a database username, which is going to be string. And we can give it once again a default password. We don't actually have to give it a default value, but if you want to, you can, and I'll say this is going to be Postgres. And then maybe we want the secret key. And this is once again going to be a type string, and we can just give it, you know, some arbitrary default. And let's say these are the only environment variables that we need for our application to run. By setting it like this, it's going to automatically perform all of the validation for us to ensure that all of these have been set. And an important thing to understand is that when you set environment variables, uh, you know, if we just quickly go back to um, the environment variables on my machine, normally best practice for environment variables is to do all caps with underscores, right? It, it doesn't have to be all caps, but this is just kind of standard convention. You can see I've got some that aren't like that, but in general, you want to do it all caps. And you can see here, we reference it all in lowercase. So Pydantic will automatically handle all of this from a case insensitive per 
perspective. So it doesn't matter if you capitalize this or lowercase everything. It'll take all of your environment variables and it'll convert it to lowercase just to simplify everything. Then we create a variable called settings equals, and then we say settings. So right here, all we're doing is we're creating an instance of this settings class. And so at this point, Pydantic will read uh, all of these environment variables. And once again, it'll look for them uh, from a case insensitive perspective. So it doesn't matter if they're capitalized or not. And then it's going to, and then it's going to perform all of the validation. It's going to ensure that they're properly a string uh, and, and so on. And then finally, uh, it's going to store it in a variable called settings. So then we can access all of these variables by just saying settings dot and then the name of the property. So if I want to get the database password, I just do settings.database password. And so we can print this out. And I'll just start my application. Right, and you can see that it printed out localhost. And if I want to grab maybe the username, I just say username. Actually, sorry, it should be database underscore username. And you can see it prints out Postgres, which is the default values because I haven't actually set my system uh, environment variables to be any of these values. So it's going to use the default one. And like I said, we're going to run into that Windows issue where I can't exactly update it without closing everything. So I'm not going to bother doing that. But what I will do just to show you how this validation works is let's remove this. Let's say there's no default password. And so if there's no default password, then, you know, it's first going to check my system, uh, my, my system or user environment variables to see if there's something called database password. And since I didn't provide a default one, if there is no environment variable with that name, it's going to throw an error because the whole point of this is to validate that all of the environment variables that we have are configured here. Right, and so after I save it, if we take a look at this, you could see that we get one validation error for settings. So settings, database password, and we can see that it's missing. Right, and so having that quick check makes our life so much easier so that we don't have to figure out, you know, which environment variable is, is missing, which one's not. Because like I said, you could have 10, 20, 30, 40 of them. There's going to be a lot of them and managing them does become a little bit of a challenge. Now, one quick thing, uh, you know, let's say I go to my environment variables once more and I've got uh, something called path, right? So path is, uh, you know, some, the path to a specific directory. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, I want to access the path, but we're going to say that this needs to be of type int. So Pydantic is going to perform some validation. It's going to read it and every environment variable is always read as a string. And then it's going to try to typecast it into an int. And if it fails, it's going to throw an error. And so since this is clearly not a integer, it should throw an error. So let's try this out. And we can see that value is not a valid integer. Now, for all of the settings and the environment variables, I usually like to create a separate file to hold all of this information. So under app, I'm going to create a new file called config.py. And I'm going to move all of that code into that file. And then in our main.py file, I'll just import from .config import. settings, All right? So ultimately we're just importing that final class, the instance of the class that we created, right? And so once again, it's able to perform the validation and it's going to report an error with the path variable. All right, so having it in its own file is going to make things a little bit easier because then we could just go to the config.py file and we'll know exactly, uh, you know, where to look for all of our environment variables and all the configs related to our application. The last thing I want to do is let's go ahead and actually figure out what environment variables we want to use moving forward and actually set this up. So we're going to clear out all of these and I'm going to create one for all of the database related stuff. So database underscore hostname this is going to be a string by default. Uh, we're going to have database underscore port. Once again, a string. We'll have a database password. And then we'll have a database underscore name. So that's the database within Postgres that we're connecting to. We'll need a username. All of these will be strings. And you may be wondering why the port is set to a string, but 
Uh, the reason why it's going to be set to a string is because if we actually take a look at our database connection, it just goes into a URL, so we don't actually ever need to uh, have it be an int. I guess you could make sure that it's a valid port number and then convert it back to a string, but that seems a little unnecessary at that point. Uh, then there's a the secret key for our, for, you know, our JSON web tokens. Uh, we've got the algorithm for signing our token. And then we have the access token expire underscore minutes, which is going to be an int. All right. And if we save all of this, we should get a whole bunch of errors and that's okay because none of these have been set. So at this point you could technically, you know, whether you're on a windows or a Mac, set these on your machine and get everything to work. But like I said, that is an unacceptable thing to do because that's a lot of work and we want to simplify things. So what we can actually do is within our fast API directory, we're going to create a new file called .env. So this is kind of standard convention, but this file, and don't forget the dot, this file is going to contain all of our environment variables so we can set it much easier just by having a file do all of the work. Now in production, you're not gonna use this. Uh, in, produ in production, you're gonna actually set it on your machine, but in development, it's perfectly okay to just set everything in here. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna take all of those uh, environment variables that we defined, and we're gonna provide values. And so like I said, in real life, you generally want to capitalize everything, um, but luckily Pydantic automatically looks at everything from a case insensitive perspective. Uh, and so our database right now is running on localhost, so we can just say localhost. Our database port is gonna be 5432. The password, that's gonna be whatever you chose to use as your password. It's gonna be password123. And we've got our database name. Um, mine happens to be fast API, but yours is going to be something different. Probably the username, I'm guessing everyone probably going to be using the default Postgres, the secret key. I'm just going to grab whatever I used in my file. So I'll just grab this. The algorithm is going to be HS256. And then the access token expiration time is going to be set to 30. So we've got all the values set here. And uh, one thing to note, I didn't provide any default values and you could 100% go ahead and add default values into yours if you want to, but I'm going to leave them uh, as such. And now we have to tell Pydantic to actually import it from our .env file. And the way to do that is inside this class, we just say class config. And we say env underscore file. And then the path to our specific file. So we say .env. So we'll save this. And I forgot to save my env file. And then I'm going to run this again. And our application should start up with zero issues. And so hopefully you guys see how easy it is to work with environment variables, especially when you're allowed to set it on a file so that we don't have to worry about setting it either in the terminal or, uh, you know, uh, on a Windows machine having to go through the GUI to do that. But one thing to keep in mind is that you never want to check this ENV file into Git, right? Because this has all the credentials for your development environment. Maybe you don't want those to get out. Uh, and there's no need to ever check it into Git. So if you create a git ignore file, so it, which is dot git ignore, you want to make sure that you put in dot env. And we'll come back to the git ignore file when we start working with git in this course. Um, but you also want to make sure you remove anything with uh, underscore underscore pycache underscore underscore, which is all of these, as well as your virtual environment uh, folder. So you want to make sure none of those get checked into git so they don't get uploaded to your GitHub repo. And just to make sure that everything's working, let's go ahead and just test this out real quick, just to make sure that nothing's broken. And that seems to work. And then if we try to get all posts, everything seems to be working. So we have now successfully moved everything over to environment variables. And actually, sorry, we forgot to do one very important thing. We're not actually using the environment variables right now. 
because if I actually go to my database, you can see that it's still just a hard-coded value. So we have to make sure we actually update that to use the environment variables. So we're going to change this to be an F, an F string. And then here, this is going to be the username. This is the password. Uh, this is the host name. And then this is the database name. And then there's also going to be the port number, which would be right here, which is 5432. I believe that's, yeah, and that's going to be the port number. So what we have to do is, since we're using an F string, I can just remove this and I can say, well, first of all, we have to import our config file so we have access to it. Or we can do from config import settings. Just put a dot there. And now I can just say settings dot database, and then we'll grab the username here. And then for the password, I'm going to do the same thing. I'll say settings dot database password and the host name. This is going to be settings dot database host name. And then this is going to be the port number. And then finally, we've got the actual database name. I think everything should still work just to test this part. Let's just quickly log in now. All right, everything still works. So we our access to our database is now working just fine. Um, but there's a few other things that I want to update. And keep in mind, if you're using the, uh, the Postgres driver to actually connect and make queries, then you would just update it here with the settings dot whatever. Um, but if we go to our OAuth 2, we can... Well, first of all, let's import our config. And we'll change the secret key. Now, this is going to be settings dot secret key, not schema, secret key. The algorithm is going to be settings dot algorithm. And then finally, this is going to be settings dot access token expire minutes. All right, let's reload this. Let's uh, just double check a few things. So let's, uh, well, let's create a new user. All right, we are able to create a user. Let's log in that user. We're able to log in and then let's get posts. And we're able to get posts. And let's just double check that there's no errors. So everything looks good. And so now we have successfully migrated all of our code to using environment variables. And so when we move to production, we can just on the machine set all of these values that we have inside our config.py file. And it's going to automatically import it and then update those values wherever we reference them. In any social media type app, there's going to be some sort of a voting or likes system. So Facebook has likes. Reddit has upvotes and downvotes. Instagram has likes. Twitter has likes as well. And so we're going to implement a simple like system as well. And we're going to quickly go over the requirements for it. So the first thing is a user should be able to like a post. A user should only be able to like a post once. We shouldn't be able to like a post 10 times and then artificially cause the number of likes for that post to go up. And then finally, anytime we retrieve a post from our database, uh, or from our API, we should also fetch the total number of likes for that post. Now let's take a look at the requirements for our voting model or our like model. And so naturally, just like we have a table for users and a table for posts, it makes sense to store the votes in another table, just like we always do. And if you think about the requirements or what we should do for the columns, well, we need to have a column that's going to store the ID of the post that we're ultimately going to like. And then we're also going to need a column that references the ID of the user who liked the post. So those are the two absolute minimum number of columns that we need to get our voting system in place. 
keep in mind if you wanted to do a you know an upvote downvote type thing like reddit does then you might want to have a third column for the direction of your vote but we're going to keep this nice and simple and it's just going to be a very simple like system so it's just one direction but the most important thing of the vote table is that since a user should only be able to like a post once this means that we need to ensure that every entry every post id and voter id is a unique combination so what do i mean by that well, take a look at this. We have a post with an ID of 12, and this post was liked by a user ID of four. So this is what an entry would look like. And that's perfectly fine. And if we go, to, and we here, we've got a post ID of 28, and it looks like a user with an ID of nine like this post. And if I go all the way down to here, you'll see that post ID of 12, which you can see that there was already a row with the post ID of 12, is liked by a different user, nine. So it's perfectly okay to see a repeat in this column. And under the user ID section, it's perfectly okay to see a repeat uh, in this column as well, because we can see that a user of ID 9 voted and liked a post with an ID of 28, as well as a post with an ID of 12. And then obviously, uh, one post can be liked by different users. So a post with an ID of 12 was liked by a user with an ID of 4. And a post with the, the same post was also liked by a user with an ID of 9. Now, what we can't have is a user liking a post more than once. So you can see here, uh, user two liked a post with an ID of 55. We can't have him do that again, right? It's a duplicate. This isn't allowed or, or this shouldn't be allowed in our system because we don't want users to be able to uh, like, uh, like a post more than once. And so there's a couple of different ways of setting up this requirement, but we're gonna take a look at the simplest solution. And we're gonna learn about something called composite keys. So we've already covered what a primary key is. It's a, it's a column in your table that's going to ensure that every single entry is unique. And we always used a column um, called ID, which had a auto incrementing integer. However, what we can also do is make use of something called composite keys. And a composite key is nothing more than a primary key that spans multiple columns. So we've only worked with one column primary keys, but we can actually have it cover more than one column. We can, it can have two columns or three columns, and since a primary key must be unique, this will ultimately ensure that no user can like a post twice if we make sure that both of these columns are part of the primary key, All right? And so when you have a composite primary key, it does not care if there's duplicates in one row, it does not care if, sorry, in one column, and it does not care if there's duplicates in the other column. All it cares about is, are both of the columns the same in two different rows? So once again, you know, for a post of ID 12, we have a user of four who likes it, as well as a user of nine that likes it. And so with the composite primary key, it sees that as two different entries because it needs both of them to be the same to be considered a duplicate. So we can uniquely identify this row by saying, hey, I want the row with the post ID of 12 and a post ID of nine. There's gonna be no other rows with that combination. And the same thing goes in the other direction. The user nine can like post 28, and you can also like post 12. And so once again, we can uniquely identify either one of these rows because we can say, hey, post a 28 with the user ID, that's a unique combination, and a post ID of 12 with a user ID of nine, once again, a unique combination. However, we can't have a user with the ID of two like 55, and then once again, the user ID of two like 55 because the combination of these two is now a duplicate because one is 55 and two, and the other one's 55 and two. And so that's all a composite key is. It's just a primary key that spans two columns and ensures that across both columns, we have unique combinations for things. So let's figure out how to create our new votes table. And I'm going to first show you guys how to do this within PG admin. So just with regular Postgres, and then we'll take a look at how to do this with SQL Alchemy. And I'm just going to go under tables and I'm going to create a new table. We'll call it votes. And then under columns here, I'm going to add a column and this is going to be post underscore ID. So this is going to be the column that referenced the ID of the specific post. This should, uh, and then um, actually before we do anything else, I'm going to add a, the other column in as well. And then we're going to have the user underscore ID. And so these are both going to be integers. And then we can just select primary key, primary key. And that's gonna create that composite key. And then we have to set up the foreign keys as well. So these are gonna reference other tables. So for the post ID, we can go into uh, constraints. 
And then we'll go into foreign key. We'll add a new foreign key. And I'm going to call this votes underscore posts underscore primary, whoops, not primary key, foreign key. And actually, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. And then we're just going to go into here. For the columns, we're going to select the local column, which is going to be post ID. Sorry, it's not post ID. Yeah, post ID. And then for the referencing table, it's going to be the posts table. And then we're going to grab the ID of that. And for action uh, on delete, we're going to make sure it's set to cascade so that if the, u if the post gets deleted, we're going to delete this entry. And then we'll add that in there. Oh, it looks like it's got deleted. Let me just redo this. We'll add that. And so we've got that in there now. And that should be it for the first foreign key. Let's add another foreign key. And this is going to be called votes underscore users underscore foreign key. Columns, this is going to be user underscore ID of the local table. This is going to reference the users table, and then it's going to reference the ID. We'll hit that. Actions. Uh, this is going to be a cascade as well. And we'll save that. And then I'm going to right click on the votes table and then we can go to view edit data. We'll go to all rows. You can see it's a very simple table. So let's create a new. Uh, let's create a new uh, vote first. Uh, and so I'm going to, uh, first of all, I've got way too many of these windows. So I'm going to just quickly delete those. All right, so I got those deleted. I'm going to open up uh, a new query. And I can just go into database. We'll do query. And I'm going to do select star from posts and then select star from users just so I can get a list of uh, post IDs and user IDs. So I got user ID of 21, 23, 24. And uh, for the post, we got 10, 4, 9. So let's try those out. And I already forgot them. So let's, let's get that post ID again. Uh, so we'll just grab a post ID of 10. So this is going to be 10. And then the user ID, well, I'm going to open up a new window so I can just switch between them. So now we have the, both of these windows for querying, and I can do select star from users. Uh, 21. OK, so we'll do. And it looks like we hit a bug in PG Admin because I can't write anything here. So I'm just going to do view edit data all rows again. And that looks a little bit better. So let's get a post 10 and a user of 21. So 10. 21. And let's see if we're successfully able to get that. And looks like that worked. And then if I grab a post ID that doesn't exist, uh, so let's say like 99. And then a valid user. Let's see what happens. It's going to throw an error. That's good. And if we grab a valid post number, but a ID of a user that doesn't exist, we should also get an error. And then if any of these are blank, it's save, it should throw an error as well. Okay, so our table looks set. That's pretty much all we have to do. There's nothing else for these tables. You'll see that once you can create one table, you can really create them all. So I'm just going to drop this table for now. And in the next video, we'll take a look at defining our model in SQL Alchemy so that SQL Alchemy actually generates the table for us. In our models.py file, let's create our model for our votes table. And we'll call it votes or just vote. It's going to extend base. And then for our table name, uh, I think it just makes sense to call it votes. Then let's set up our two columns. So we're going to have a user ID. And then we're going to have a post underscore ID. So for the user underscore ID, it's going to be a column. And it's going to be of type integer. We're going to set up the foreign key. And this will be users. So it's going to reference the users table and grab the ID field. And then the second property is going to be the on delete, which is going to be set to cascade. All right, then we'll set the primary key. 
to be true. And that's pretty much it. And then I'm just going to copy this. Paste it here. We're just going to change this to be, instead of user's ID, we're going to be, it's going to be posts.id. And I don't know why I got auto-formatted to a different line. Okay, okay, it looks like that's what it prefers. And so save this. And assuming there's no errors, our application should restart. And then if we go to PG Admin and then refresh, we should see a votes table. And I'm just going to go and take a look at the properties. And you can see that we've got the user ID and the post ID. We've got the primary key set, so it's a composite key. And since it's a primary key, not null is going to be set to yes. We go to constraints. We've got, you know, once again, both the primary keys. Uh, we should have two foreign keys. And then if we just take a look at one of them real quick, we should see cascade on delete. And so if we go and view and edit data, let's test this out. 10, 21 again. Oh, so it should be 21 and 10 because the user ID is the first column now. 21, 10. Let's try saving that. Good. Let's try doing 21 and 9. Or 21 and 88. Should error out. Perfect. And then let's try 10 and some random number. Error. Perfect. Now there's going to be a couple things that we need to take into consideration when setting up the vote route. So first of all, what is the path we're going to use? Uh, and I think it makes sense just to set up a new path called slash vote. Uh, just like we have for slash users when it comes to handling anything with users, and we have slash post for handling anything with post, we're going to have the slash vote for handling voting. Now the user ID, the user who's trying to vote on a, or like a post, uh, the ID of that user is going to be extracted from the JWT token, so we don't actually have to extract that from the body. We don't need to include it in the body. However, the body itself is going to contain two pieces of information. The ID of the post we're trying to like, as well as uh, the direction of the vote. And what I mean by direction is, um, do they want to vote on the post or do they want to remove a post? Because like any application, you know, maybe you accidentally clicked on a post to like it, but you realize you don't want to like it, so you click on it again to remove that. So vote direction of one means that we're going to like the post, and then a vote direction of zero means we're going to remove our like of the post. Now in our routers folder, we're going to create a new file, which is just going to be vote.py. So this is going to handle all the routing for our voting URLs. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to copy the import statement from one of the other routers. And we'll set up our route. So let's set up the decorator first. And this is going to be a post. And I actually have to import router. And we got it. Let's create our router instance. So we'll say router equals API router. And we'll set up the prefix to be slash vote. And the tags, we're going to give it its own section, which is going to just say vote. And so now we can do at router.post. This is going to be a post operation because we have to send some information to the server. And the, the URL is just going to be slash. So it's just going to be slash vote then. And since we're going to create a vote um, by default, uh, we're going to send a different status code. We're going to send a uh, 201 instead of the default 200. Then we'll define our function, which I'll just call vote. Now, there's going to be a couple things that we have to pass in. So since we expect the user to provide some data in the body, it usually means we want to define a schema just so that we can ensure they send us the exact information. So let's set up our schema for voting. We'll create a class called vote. And so the first field should be a post ID, uh, which is going to be of type int. And then we're going to have a direction, which is going to be an integer as well. So it's either zero or one. Uh, however, I, I would like to 
be able to validate it to ensure that it's only zero or one. Uh, I couldn't exactly figure out if there was a way to do that in Pydantic, but one thing we can do is we can use uh, conint. So we'll, we'll import that from Pydantic automatically. So if you want to see the import, that's what it's going to look like. And we can say less than or equal to one. So anything less than one uh, is going to be allowed. The only problem with this is that it allows for negative numbers. Um, but that's okay. Uh, you know, if you guys figure out how to just specify zero and one, then, um, you know, go ahead and replace that and definitely leave it, uh, leave that piece of information in the comments so that anyone else who wants to set up that specific restriction, uh, then we all know how to do that moving forward. And let's import our schema now. So we'll go up a directory. And let's also import database models. And uh, we're going to have to require the user to be logged in before uh, they can vote on something. So let's import OAuth2. And so here, we're going to set up the schema. And we're also going to set up the database so that we can make queries. And then lastly, we'll get the current user. So once we get all of those dependencies, it uh, looks like we have to import session as well. And I'm actually going to move this right below the first import. Not that it matters, but. And so we're going to set up logic for when the vote direction is one. So if I, if vote.dir, so we're pulling the, the direction from the vote schema equals equals one, then we're going to perform some logic. Else, if it's zero, then we're going to perform some other logic. So if we want to uh, create a vote, the first thing we're going to do is query to see, uh, you know, does the vote already exist? And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say db.query. And we'll grab models.vote. And I'm going to filter based off of models.vote.post underscore ID. And we're going to say it equals equals vote.post underscore ID. So we're going to see if there's already a vote for this specific post ID. However, this isn't enough because remember, uh, multiple people can vote on the same post. So we actually have to do a second check. And we can add in a second condition by just doing a comma and then providing the second condition. So we have to say models.vote.userID equals equals current user.id. And I'm going to save this and we're going to call this uh, vote underscore query. So this isn't going to actually query the database yet. This is just building out the query. And it's just going to check to see if this specific user ultimately has voted for this specific post already or like this post. And I'm actually going to move this above the if statement. And you guys will see why we're going to do that in a bit. And we're going to then perform the query and just save that result under found vote equals vote underscore query dot first. All right. And so if the user wants to like a post, but we already found a post, that means he's already liked this specific post, so he can't like it again. So what we're going to say is if we already found a vote, then we're going to raise an HTTP exception. Uh, now the status code, we're going to use a new status code. I'm going to use status dot, and then this is going to be a 409 for conflict. And there's other status codes you could potentially use. I, I just decided that this is probably going to be the best fit. And then for detail, we're going to just pass an F string and say user. And then we pass in the user, which is a get whoops, current underscore user dot ID has already voted on post with an ID of vote dot post underscore ID. All right, but if we didn't find a vote, then what we're going to do is we're going to create a brand new vote. So I'll say models.vote. And so the post ID field 
is going to be set to vote.post underscore ID. And then we can grab the user ID field from current user dot ID. So this will set the two properties and we'll save this as new underscore vote. And as usual to actually perform these changes or to add this to our database, we have to do db dot add new underscore vote and then a db dot commit. And we don't actually need to send the created vote back to the user because it doesn't really provide any useful information. Uh, we're just going to send a message that says successfully added vote. Now, if the user provided a direction of zero, that means they want to delete a pre-existing vote. So first of all, we'll say if not found vote. Right, we can't delete a vote that doesn't exist. So we'll raise an HTTP exception. Status code, um, I think we could just send a 404. And for the detail, I'll just say vote does not exist. But if we did find a vote, then we have to delete it. So I'll say vote underscore query. Remember, this is the query all the way at the top. I'll say dot delete. And then we can just do our synchronized session false. And we'll do a db dot commit. And we'll just return a similar message. Successfully deleted vote. Okay, and this should kind of sum up uh, all of the logic in our path operation function. And at this point, we can just go ahead and test this out. So we'll go back to Postman. First of all, let's log in. All right, so we've logged in. And uh, what I'm going to do is create a brand new request. We'll call this vote. And this is going to be a vote. And in the body, we have to pass in the specific data. So let's actually grab a post um, or an ID of a post. So in this case, there's an ID of 10. Actually, first, let me double check who I'm logged in as. Okay, that's fine. So I'm going to grab uh, a post with an ID of 10. So here we'll say post underscore ID 10. And then we'll say dir. Actually, is that what we called it? I actually forgot. Let's go to our schemas. Yeah, it's just dir. And this is going to be, let's, to, let's, this is going to be a one so that we can actually like the post. And remember, this should be a post request. So let's try this out. Let's hit send. And it looks like we ran into an issue. So let's check. And uh, it says that this specific route was not found. Uh, and so that's obviously because we didn't wire up this specific router. So let's go back to our main.py and let's import vote. And then we can just copy this and wire up vote.router. Yep. And once again, another typo. All right, let's give this a try now. So we'll hit send. It says we're not authenticated, so let me log in user. All right, now let's try this. And it says that I'm still unauthenticated. And guys, I realized why we're getting uh, not authenticated. That's just because we have a new request and we have to make sure that we set the authorization to be bearer token. 
and then we want to pass in our JWT variable. So it wasn't actually retrieving that. So now if I try this, we can see that we successfully added vote. And, uh, you know, just to make sure that it actually did that, let's actually go into our database and take a look at our votes table. And so we liked a post, uh, and it looks like um, I have some previous ones. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to delete everything uh, from our votes table just so we can make sure it works because I forgot who I'm even logged in as. So let's go to properties. Okay, sorry. Uh, let me just do a query. I'm just going to say delete from votes. That's going to delete everything in our votes table. Perfect. And then we could just say select from votes. All right, we have nothing in there and let's try this again. All right. And so now run this. We can see that we did like post 10 and I guess our ID is uh, 24, but we can just quickly verify that. If I do select star from users. And I'm logged in as Sanjeev123, so we can see that that has an ID of 24. So that works. Now, what I'm going to do is let's test to see what happens if I try to vote on a post that I've already voted on. So I'm going to keep the vote direction to be one. And I know I've already voted on this post. So we should get user24 has already voted on post 10. Perfect. Now let's go and try to delete a post. So I'm going to set the vote dir to be zero. And let's see what happens. It says I successfully deleted the post or the vote. And let's just do a quick query. We can see nothing is there. And then if we try to delete a vote or, or a like that doesn't exist, we can see that vote does not exist. All right, guys, well, we've actually implemented all of the voting logic right there. The only other thing that we need to do is when we retrieve a post, right, whether it's through the get all posts or even a get one post, I want to have my fast API send the number of votes as a property, as a field here, so that, uh, you know, when we load up posts on our front end application, they can see the number of likes that a post has. That's usually how most applications work. And I would like it to have it automatically send that information instead of having to send another query to our backend to see, you know, what is the total number of votes. I want it to do it automatically anytime we retrieve any post. And uh, that's going to be a little bit more complex. Uh, we're going to have to learn uh, a little bit more about SQL, uh, start digging into some of the weeds of uh, SQL and Postgres. And then uh, once we learn how to do it with uh, regular SQL, we have to see if we can do this with um, SQL Alchemy. After I finished recording all of the uh, voting logic, or at least the router that handles voting, I realized there's one tiny bug. And that is that right now, there's no logic to actually detect if the user is trying to vote on a post that doesn't exist. Because if they want to vote on a post that doesn't exist, I want to ideally send a 404. So what we're going to do is we're going to implement that logic and it's going to be really simple. We're just going to query for the post based off of the ID first. If it doesn't exist, we're going to throw an exception. So just like we've done with pretty much all of our other routers, whenever someone tries to access a post that they don't, uh, that doesn't exist, then we're just going to simply send a 404. So let's start off by making our query. I'm going to do db.query. We'll say models.post. And then what we're going to do is we're going to filter based off of the post ID. So we'll say models.post dot id equals equals vote dot post underscore id and then we're going to grab the first one and we'll save this in a variable called post then we'll say if not post so if the post doesn't exist then we're going to raise an http exception And the status code is going to be a 404. And the detail will be the usual F string that says uh, post with ID. And then we'll pass in the ID. Does not exist. And that's all we have to do. And that's going to fix that little bit, that little tiny bug. And you'll see that when we get to the testing section, we can now test to see if the post doesn't exist as well. 
Up till now, we've been working with very simple queries. We've just been querying a single table. However, now that we have more than one table uh, and all of these tables have built out these relationships, you're going to see that eventually you want to be able to get information from two tables at the same exact time. And this gets a little complicated, but the way we actually do that is by using something called a join. So we join two tables together. And as an example, uh, let's say I want to get all of my posts. So I do a select star from posts. That's great and all. However, you know, when we're sending back the, the posts to the user, right, the, or our front end, our front end has no idea what uh, a owner ID of 23 is. He doesn't know what that is. And we ultimately want to display the username or the email uh, of the user that created that post on our front end. So what we would have to do if we could only, uh, you know, retrieve data from one table at a time is we'd have to then individually go and then fetch all of these users from the user table one by one so that we can actually get the email or, or the username. And that's a little in inefficient having to do multiple queries. If you ever get a chance to, uh, it's better to just do a single query uh, and get all of the pieces of information that you're interested in. So I'm going to show you guys how we can join information from two tables, because I would also like to get all of the user information based off of the owner ID field that's on the posts table. So how do we do that? Well, we start off a query just like this. And actually, before we go into this, what I would like to do is show you one of my favorite websites. Uh, so if you go to Postgres tutorial, just search for that in Google, uh, you'll see that there's a website called Postgres qltutorial.com. This is one of my favorite sites. And I want you to go to joins right here. So this is how we get information from two different tables. And this, this page uh, you know, does an absolute marvelous job of explaining how to actually uh, join two tables. And it goes over the different types of joins because there isn't just one method. Uh, you've got left joins, you have an inner joins, you got outer joins, you got right joins. Um, and I strongly suggest you guys quickly just kind of read through this just to get an idea um, because I don't want to cover every single join. I'm just going to show you the ones that we need to get the data that we're interested in. So let's go back to Postgres and let's create our first join. So here I'm do select. I'm just grabbing all of the fields and I'm going to grab it from the post table. And what we can do is I can say left join. And then we specify the other table we want to jam into my query. So now I want to get data from the users table. So I do users and then we have to find a field uh, in both tables that we need to match on or join the table on. And since we want to find the specific user associated with the person who created this post, we need to join on the owner ID. So what we say is on, so this is how we specify what it should join on. And we want to say, uh, we grab the first table's name, right? The posts table. So we grab posts and then we say dot, and then we grab the specific column we want to join on. So owner underscore ID. And then we just say it equals two. And then we grab the second table, which is called users. And then we grab the specific column from the users table we want to join on, which is users.id. So now if I run this, take a look at that. It took all of the user data and it jammed it right into one single query with the posts. And so now I get the entire post and I also get information about this specific user because we joined on owner ID and uh, the user ID uh, together. So it was able to kind of take that information from the other table and match it right up to here. Because we did a star, it's going to grab the columns from, it's going to grab every single column from every single, from both of the tables. And there may be times where maybe you don't want that. Maybe we just want a couple of columns. So let's say we want uh, the title column. Maybe we want content and maybe we want email. Right? And this should allow us to grab the title, which comes from the post table and the content, which comes from the uh, post table and then email, which comes from the user table. So let's see what happens when I run this, right? You can see I got the title content and email. Now, if I remove this and go back to everything just real quick, let's say I want to get the post ID and the email. Well, let's see what happens. I'm going to do ID and then email. Well, it looks like we have an error. It says column reference ID is ambiguous. So what exactly is happening here? Well, I'm going to remove this and show you exactly what happened. The problem is, is that the post table has a column called ID 
and the user table has a column called ID. So when I just say ID, it has no idea which column I want. So that's why it's saying it's ambiguous. So what we need to do is anytime there's a potential for confusion, we always have to specify the table name before it. So I can say posts.id, and then I can say email. Now, I don't have to say, uh, you know, user.email because only the users table has an email column. However, if there was an email column in the post table as well, then we would have to append the table name first. So you only need to do this when there's confusion. However, if you want to just kind of stick to a certain convention, you can just set up every single property to have the table name beforehand so that you know which table it's coming from. Makes it a little bit easier to read. And so now I got just the ID and the email. Now let's say I want to get every field from one of the tables. I can say posts dot star. That's going to grab every field. So it's grabbing the post table and then the star means, hey, grab every single column. And so I could do that. It's going to grab everything from the post table and then I can grab maybe just the email in this case. And so this kind of ultimately does what we had wanted it to do um, because, you know, I told you guys uh, we want to be able to get the email or the username information for each and every single post. And if we want to, you know, we can add in some of the other fields, maybe the, maybe the user.id. So the user ID, however, that's just going to match up with the owner ID. But just to show you guys, there is some flexibility. And as I mentioned before, there are different types of joins. There's left join, there's right join, inner join, outer join. I don't want to spend too much on it, but I do want to cover just a few things. All right, so the direction references which table. So right now we're working with two tables. There's the first table that's referenced by uh, from, and then the name of the table. And then there's the second table, which is referenced after the join, which is right here. And so the first table that's referenced is always referred to as the left table. And the Ref, uh, the table on the right, the second table that's mentioned is always going to be the right table. So you got the left table and the right table. And so when we do join, what it's actually doing is, well, I think this page actually gives us the best explanation. So a left join, select data from the left table. And I don't know if this is big enough for you guys, but I'll zoom in. So it's going to select data from the left table. It's going to compare the values uh, between the two columns that we have selected. And for us in this case, it's going to be uh, post.owner ID on the left side and then users.id on the right side. And it's going to find where those values match. And if they are equal, the left join creates a new row that contains the columns of both tables and adds this row to the result set. And what's important is in case the value does not equal, the left join also creates a new row that contains the column from both tables and adds it to the result set. However, on the right side, uh, the, the value is going to be set to null. So if we ever had a post that didn't have an owner ID, then what would happen is we would see the, uh, the user information all set to null in that case, or the email would be set to null. However, since the way we set up our table is that every single uh, post must have a owner ID, we're never going to run into that situation. Now, before we move any further, just to show you guys what a right join is, it's the exact same thing, but in the opposite direction. And so let's take a look. And things look a little bit different now um, because what's happening is that we're going to is that we're going to go through the two tables and find if the owner and the owner ID and the ID of the user match. And we're going to join it on that. And we're going to do this for every single entry. And then at the end, you can see that user 24 has no information on the left side. And that's because user 24 didn't create any posts. So the right join will show you instances where something exists in the right table, but it doesn't exist on the left table. The left join will show you something that exists in the left table, but doesn't necessarily exist on the right table. But I'm going to change this back to left join. And now what I would like to do is uh, it would be great if we can uh, get the number of posts by each user, right? How many posts has each user created? So is there a way to do that? Well, there is actually. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to grab the users.email, actually users.id, and maybe we want the users.email as well. Actually, we'll just get the ID. And here at the end, I'm going to say I want to group by users. 
ID. So we're going to find all of these entries in our join uh, and then group them based off of the user ID field from the user column. And so once we group them, we can then actually count up all of the columns. Uh, sorry, all of the entries on a per user basis. So if I say user ID, and then we say we can use a built in Postgres function. And here, if I put in star, and I'll come back and explain what this means, we can hit run. And we can see that the user with an ID of 21 has 11 posts, and the user with an ID of 23 has two posts. The only issue is if I actually do another query right here, and I do select star from users. There's actually three users, right? And one of them hasn't made any posts. And so that's why we don't see it in that list. And if we want to be able to see it in that list, we need to actually change our query. And like I mentioned, the right join, if I actually remove the count column right here, and we just do a star, this is going to actually uh, list every single user, even if the user has no posts. And so if I remove the group by ID real quick, right, you could see down here, I have user 24 with no posts. That's exactly what we want. And so now I can say group by users.id. And then here I'm going to say uh, select users.id. And then we grab the count. So let's see if this works. Uh, and notice how all of the post fields are completely empty. So that's, that's perfectly fine. And then we can run this. And you can see that it, it seems to have worked. Uh, right, user 21 has 11 posts, user 23 has two posts, and then we got user 24. But it says that uh, there's a value of one. And the reason for that is that when you do star right here, that means it's going to count null entries. So since we have that one null entry, it's going to count that as one. So instead, what we're going to do is we can actually pass in the name of a column. And so once again, I'm actually going to copy this, paste it into here. We're going to remove the group by. and then just do a star. So we're going to get every entry, except because we did count star, it always ends up counting this as one. So you, that user 24 is always going to have one entry, but that's not accurate because he doesn't actually have any. So instead of doing count star, we can actually pass in a column that we want to count. And so in this case, we can pick any of the posts column that we're trying to retrieve. And so I can just say posts.id. Uh, and so when you pass in a column name, it does not count columns that have a null value. So if the user doesn't have any posts, he won't have anything under posts.id. And then if I just remove this query and then run this, you can see that now I have successfully gotten the exact query that I want. And I can rename this column as uh, user underscore post underscore count or something. That's a little bit re more readable. And then, you know, I can grab any other field that I want. Maybe I also want the users.email. And so that way we get just the information that we ultimately want. So you can see that doing these queries, they do get a little bit more complex and you have to practice this a lot. And so I definitely recommend you actually just read through this document, set up a few example tables and just practice doing your queries. Um, but we're going to spend just a little bit more time on these queries so that we can uh, figure out how to get the total number of votes. It is a little bit longer of a process, but I want to make sure that you guys understand exactly what we're doing. All right, guys, so let's move on to working with our posts table and our votes table. So I'm going to do a, a join on those two. So let's start off by doing select uh, and then we'll just do star for now and we'll say select star from. And then in this case, posts and keep in mind, guys, I mentioned that the first table you reference is the left table and the second table uh, that you reference is the right table. Uh, it doesn't actually matter which one is the left or right. Uh, the only thing that matters is that you set up the right direction of the join. So if we set up posts as the left table and we want to do a left join, then if we ever rewrite our SQL query and set up our um, our votes table to be the left table instead, then we would just have to flip the join to be a right join. So it doesn't matter which table comes first. Keep that in mind. So you don't have to start your query on just the posts. You could do this on votes as well, and you just change the direction of the join. But I like to do posts. And then we're going to try a left join once again. And we'll say uh, the, the other tables can be votes and we're going to join on. Well, uh, if we take a look at our votes table, which I'm actually just going to cut this out real quick. 
and save that in my scratch pad. I'm going to just say select star from votes. We'll run that. All right, so there's going to be a user ID and a post ID. And then if I do a select star from posts, we have all these fields. So I think you guys can guess uh, the exact uh, column that we need to join on. So we need to join on post.id and then votes dot dot post underscore id so whenever those match we need to get a result so i'm going to go into my application and just run a few uh, i'm just going to vote on a few posts so that we actually have some data so i'm logged in as a user and i'm going to vote on post 10. all right we successfully added votes so i'm going to get a whole bunch of other posts i'm going to vote on post 4 and 9. All right, and um, I'm going to log in as a different user now. Let's see who else I got. All right, I'll just log in as Sanjeev, I guess. My login. All right, we've logged in. And I'm going to vote on post 10 as well on this guy. And then we'll grab some random vote uh, 15. Okay, and so we should have a decent number of votes now. And I purposely made it so that one of the users didn't vote, just so that we can take a look at what complications that add. All right, so we have all of these votes. Uh, we've got the user ID and the post ID. So now let's set up a join. So I'm going to do select star from posts. And I'm going to start off with the left join. And we'll say we want to join with the votes table. And the field that we're going to join on is on the posts. We're going to grab the dot ID and the and wherever this is equal to votes dot post underscore ID, we want to join the table. So let's run this. And let's see what results we get back. All right. And so you can see that, hey, look, uh, a post with an ID of 10, it looks like it does have uh, a vote. So this is one join right here. But then you'll notice that I, if I go down, you'll see another entry. So it, this doesn't mean in our database that we have two posts with an ID of 10. It's just saying that since we joined them, we have to go down the list, see where they match, and then print out a row. So it's going to print out a row for every single time the post ID matches the post underscore ID of the votes table. And so since we have two votes for the same exact post, that means we're going to get two different entries. Doesn't mean there's actually two posts in our table. It's just the way that the joins work. And I strongly recommend, like if this is still a little confusing, keep reading that document and play around with it. If you want to see the opposite, actually, before we take a look, let's just take a look at a few other things. Uh, you can see we've got post with four. And we can see that there's uh, one vote for that because there's no other uh, entries here uh, with for an ID of four. And then we can see all of these posts that have no votes whatsoever. So that's what the left join gives us because uh, anytime we have a post, which is the left table, since we do a left join, it's going to list those posts. Uh, and I'll just put null on the right side. Whereas if we change this to a right join, it's going to do the exact opposite. On, with the right join, right, once again, it's going to look for any time the, uh, the ID here matches the post ID, and it's going to spit out a row. And then the same thing goes for the post with an ID of four. And then once again, you can see 10 shows up twice because two users voted on it, and then 15 and so on. But then you'll see nothing else. And the reason for that is we did a right join. So it's going to show us all of the votes and their corresponding post. However, it's also going to list out any votes because it's a, it's a right join that don't, that aren't associated with the post. Now, all of our votes have to be associated with the post because we put in that constraint, that check. So that's why we don't see anything with the null on the left side, because that's just the way our tables have been set up. So hopefully that didn't confuse you guys. We're going to change this back to a left join. And what we're going to do now is we're going to do, um, I want to be able to count the total number of votes for each and every post. So we're once again going to do the group by. So we're going to group by post.id. So we'll group them together and then count them. 
And for columns, I'm just going to say, uh, we'll say post.id. And then we want the count. So we'll start off with the star. And let's see what happens. Okay, uh, so we can see that, you know, post with an ID of 10, we know it has two votes. But then everything else has a value of one. This is not correct. We know that a whole bunch of posts don't have a value of one. But like we covered in the previous lesson, uh, anytime you have a value of null, then it's going to count that as one. So I'm going to run this, the previous query, remove the group by, and I'll show you guys exactly what I mean. So now if I run this, oops, this should be a star. All right, look at all of these posts that have a value of null. It's going to count them all as one in this case. And we don't want that. Right, and that's, why, that's what happens when you do a star in the count field. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to provide a specific column to count on so it doesn't count the null values. So what column should we use? Uh, I mean, we can really use any column. I think it makes sense just to do, uh, we have to grab one of the columns that are null in this case. So we'll get votes.post underscore ID. So now, look at that. We get the post ID, and then we get how many votes they have altogether, or how many likes. And instead of just grabbing the ID, I'm going to actually grab everything from the post table. We can run that. And this is the exact query that we're looking for. We get the post information and we get the number of votes. And we can rename this because I don't like calling account. We can rename it as, you know, votes or likes. It doesn't really matter. And there you go, guys. And if you guys want to um, query for an individual post and get the total number of votes, it's actually very simple. It's the same exact query. We're just going to provide a where condition. And so here I can just say where post.id equals one. Well, actually, I don't have a post ID of one, so I'll grab a post ID of 10. And so now I get my one post, and we can see that he should have two votes. All right, and so that's how we do this with uh, raw SQL. Hopefully this wasn't too complicated. Uh, like I said, I strongly recommend you spend a little bit of time uh, going over joins and practicing it with your own tables. Don't just use posts and votes. Uh, if you can probably come up with simpler tables to work on this and, and understand it a little bit better. But I think that's going to wrap up this video. And so go ahead and just save these queries for now uh, so that we can reference them later. In the last video, we saw how we can gather information from two different tables by making use of joins. And so we saw how to do that with raw SQL. And now we're going to see how we can perform joins using SQL Alchemy. And if you go to your post router, we're going to go to the get posts path operation. Uh, and so we're going to kind of just take this step by step and see how we can slowly build out this query uh, so that we can actually perform a join. And if you take a look at the current query, uh, what we can do is just ignore all of the filter stuff first. And so really the, the meat of this query is just db.query and then you pass the model and that's going to get every single post that we have in this table. And then we perform all of these filters to kind of drill down. So we're going to start off with the same thing, and I'm going to save this new query as results. Or, or we could just say posts underscore votes, maybe, and eh, we'll just save it as results. And so we're going to start off with the same exact query. We're going to do db.query models dot post. And we're going to perform dot all. Actually, remove the dot all. And the reason I don't want to do the dot all is I don't actually want to query the table. I just want to actually see the raw SQL that's generating. And now we can do a print results. I'm going to bring this up a bit and we're going to just send a query to the get all posts. And you can see the raw SQL that it generated. So it's going to select and then basically select every column and then rename it uh, accordingly. And then it's just going to get that from the post table. So it's getting every single post. That's all. So everything is pretty straightforward at this point. And if we go back to our um, PG admin, let's actually take a look. Uh, let's take a look at what our SQL query actually looks like. Uh, and so you can see here, there's a whole bunch of things going on. But the next thing I want to do is I want to actually start to perform the join. So I want to join on the votes table. So let's take a look at how we can do that. And to perform a join with SQL Alchemy, I can just say join. 
And then we have to specify the table we want to join. So this is going to be the models.vote. And then the second thing is what is going to be our the uh, what is going to be the column that we perform a join on. So in this case, you can see that we're performing a join on post.id and votes.post underscore ID. And we're going to do the same thing here. I'm going to say models dot vote dot post underscore ID equals equals and then we'll say models dot post dot ID. Whenever they're equal, we're going to join the table. Now the thing about this join is by default with SQL Alchemy, this is going to be a left inner join. And the word inner is going to be a little bit new for you. Um, and that's because there's two different types of left joins. You've got left inner and you have left outer. And I don't want to spend too much time kind of diving into what's the difference. Just know that if you ignore the keyword, it's going to by default be an outer. So what we want is an outer join. Um, however, SQL Alchemy by default uses um, inner joins. So to actually set this as an outer join, we have to pass one more thing, which is going to be is outer equals true. So this is going to make this a uh, outer left outer join. So we've got our join at this point. And what I'm going to do now is save this again. And let's take a look at our query. So we'll send something. And now we'll take a look at our query. We can see that, okay, we're going to select everything from our post table. Then we're going to perform a left outer join with votes uh, on the table votes whenever votes.postid equals post.id. So we're almost there. Uh, the next thing that we have to do is we have to group by post.id. And then we have to perform the count on votes.post underscore ID. And so if you can take a guess as how to do group by, we can just do dot group underscore by. And then we specify the specific column. So we'll do models.post.id. And then we have to get the count. So we'll go here. And I'm going to say, well, first of all, we have to import a function. So what you're going to do is from SQL Alchemy, import func. And so this is going to give us access to functions like count. I'm going to say func dot count. And then we'll say models dot vote dot post underscore ID. We'll save this and I'm going to send this and let's take a look at the query once again. And so we've got select posts, all of the post columns. Good, 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 good. Uh, and then we get to count, right? And it's going to perform the count. That's all right. However, we're naming it as count one. I don't like that. I want to name this something that I will understand. So maybe something like votes. So we have to figure out a way to rename this column. And if you want to rename this column, you just say dot label and then the name that you want to give that column. So we're going to call this votes. And so let's test this out one last time. And now we can see that the column is called votes. So this is exactly what we want. This is the exact query that we generated in PG admin manually. We're just doing it through SQL Alchemy. And what we're going to do is, well, let's actually perform the query. We'll do dot all. I don't need the print anymore. And we're going to actually return results and let's see what happens. So now if I send a query, it's giving me a whole bunch of errors. And if we scroll to the top of the errors, uh, we can see that these are all pedantic validations. Uh, and so it's saying that, hey, there's no title, there's no content, there's no ID, there's no owner ID, there's no owner. All of these fields seem to be missing. And why exactly is that? Well, let's take a look at the response model. So the validation is happening because we use this response model of schemas.post. And so if we go to schemas and we find our post object, or post class, you can see that it expects an ID, a created at, an owner ID, an owner, uh, and all of that good stuff. And it's saying that none of these have been set. So it looks like there's something wrong with our query. But just to make this a little bit simpler, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to remove the response model. So I'm going to just comment out that. Remove the response model so we're not actually performing any validation. And we're going to see what this looks like now. So when we retrieve the data, I want you to take a look at what this looks like. So this right here is one specific post. And so after our changes, we can see that we've got a property called post. And then within there, we have ID published and so on. And then we've got a property of votes. And I'm actually going to copy this as an example. 
And I'm just going to create a new file. And I'm just going to say, uh, well, we'll just call this example.py. That's fine. It doesn't really matter. We'll delete this in a bit. So this is what it looks like. And when we go back to our path operation, I'm going to return posts. And we can actually return the response model just to see what that looks like. And so now if I do a query, I need to save. And if you take a look at the query, this is what it looks like in a working state before we set up the joins. And if I go down to my example, where's my example py file? So this is what Pydantic expects. It expects to get an object with a field of title, content, published ID, and so on. However, after our join, something odd happens. We have a field called post. And that breaks everything because it doesn't expect the ID and the published and the owner to be under this, uh, this essentially this dictionary right here. And that's why it's throwing all of these errors. So how exactly do we fix this? Well, what we're going to do is I'm actually going to go to my schemas. And I'm actually going to create a new schema. So we'll call this, um, you can call this whatever you want. Maybe post vote or I'm just going to call this post out. And it's going to be a post base. It's going to expand post base. And what we're going to do is we're just going to try to match this as close as possible. So this is going to represent a post object, and then we're going to have a field called votes, which is going to be an integer. So here I can just say uh, we have something called post. And don't forget to capitalize it because our query, for some reason, uh, returns it with a capital P. It took me a little while to figure that out. I was running into a few issues. But we can go here and we could say, I want to return, uh, I want this to be of type. And then we'll reference this post. Right, so all of these fields will be under a field named post. And then we expect something called votes, which is going to be set to an integer. So let's try this out and we'll go back to our post.py. And I'm going to call, I'm going to reference post out. And we're going to return results again. And let's just make sure there's no errors. It looks like it's good. And let's see what happens now. All right, we got a little bit of an issue. And it looks like there's a title content, title content, a whole bunch of errors. And so the title and the content are missing for both. So what did we do wrong here? This should have fixed our issue. Well, let's try adding this uh, class config ORM. Uh, I think that might actually be what's causing this problem. And now let's try this. Oh, that didn't look like it fixed it. All right, guys, so I was playing around with it and then I don't know what exactly fixed it, but all I did was uh, I had changed this to a lowercase p. And this led to, you know, us seeing this specific issue where it says, you know, hey, this post doesn't exist. And then as soon as I recapitalized it, all of a sudden it started to, to work again. It starts to work again. now. So I'm not really sure why it broke in the first place. I didn't change any other code. Uh, just looking back at my path operation, you can see that I'm now changing my response model to be schemas.post out. And then we're performing the same results query and then returning it. For some reason or another, it's now properly working. I have no idea what changed. I have no idea exactly what changed, but it's working now. So hopefully you guys don't run into any issues and hopefully it was just some kind of issue on my machine. But if you do run into the same issue, just try moving it to a lowercase, try restarting the application, then changing it back. I have no idea why that would fix it, but it seems to have done something. And so now our results are perfect. We get the post information. We still fetch the owner, which is fantastic. And then we have the votes. And then just double check to make sure that all of your votes uh, are all okay. Uh, and so it looks like they all look good. I know that one had two, and then the rest should all have zero. So everything's looking pretty, pretty good. The next thing that we need to do is actually uh, go ahead and add our filters back in. So let's see if I can still filter on all of these. And so I'm just going to copy this. And then before I perform the, the dot all, I'm going to paste that in there. Whoops, I forgot to. Uh, I forgot to copy.
All right, and then let's test this out again. All right, things are still working, but let's just add a few extra uh, query parameters. So I'll say search equals beaches. All right, and then it looks like it should only return posts with the word beaches. And then let's try limit equals two. Remove the search for now. And that works too. So it looks like we get to keep all of the same functionality that we had before. So I'm going to just write this as posts. We're going to comment this out just for reference. And then we're going to return posts like we normally do. Send it one more time. And it looks like everything is still working just fine. Perfect. So we finished the uh, get multiple posts path operation or get all posts. And I noticed that we do have to go ahead and update the get individual post because right now, if we go to get one post, you can see that we do not actually get the votes vote count for that. So we definitely want to see that in here. And we're going to have to perform the same exact join. So I'm just going to copy the previous query all the way up to uh, before the filter. So just copy that part. Say post equals, paste that in there. And then we can filter, copy this filter at the end. And that should ultimately get us what we want. I'm going to comment this one out. And keep in mind, we have to return post out instead of post now because we want the, uh, the new format with the votes. So now if I hit send, Name post is not defined. Oh, okay. <laughs> Misspelled that. And looks like we fixed that one. And then it's really up to you to see if you want to, um, you know, kind of worry about creating posts and updating posts uh, to make sure that, you know, when they create an update that they uh, return the number of votes, but it's ultimately up to you. I, I think we don't need it in those. Uh, this more of just kind of returning back uh, just the main information about the post and then, you know, the queries for updating uh, a specific post and then grabbing the votes gets a little complicated. So we're going to ignore that for the update and the uh, and the create post functionality.